suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. From Hollywood, we bring you a star, Mr. Orson Welles, who this evening begins a four-week engagement as guest of these proceedings. In the interest of prime suspense, Mr. Welles and the producer of this series have scheduled four radio stories, which they feel are particularly distinguished in our chosen field. The first of these is The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Garnell. And so with the performance of Orson Welles in the character of General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn as Sanger Rainsford, who learned from Zaroff what was the most dangerous game, we again hope to keep you in suspense. come in, and when he does, I'm going to kill him. It's him or me, and I'm going to do my best to make it him. Well, maybe it sounds crazy to you. I guess it does. It would have sounded crazy to me a few days ago when I was with Whitney on the yacht. I was on a pleasure trip. Ha! A pleasure trip! How or I, how could I or anyone realize then the horror and torment I was to go through? How was I to know of Yvonne and the death swamp and the hounds? How was I to know of... Zaroff. Think of it. It was only four nights ago that the ship went down. We'd been talking about this island, Ship Trap Island, Whitney said it was called in the charts. I was sleepy and started on down below to turn in. I was mixing myself a nightcap when I looked up and saw it. A tremendous reef racing at us out of the fog. I screamed out a warning, but it was too late. We were right upon it. safe out on the prowl, but the force of the explosion hurled me into the blood-warm waters. Terrified at the suddenness and surprise, my stomach weak and sick at the thought of the others. The sea was eddying furiously around the sinking remnants of the ship, and a certain cool-headedness came to me and made me swim desperately away, or I might not have lived to go through the horror which was soon to come. I struck out to the right in the direction of the island about which Whitney had been telling me. I had no recollection of how long I swam... But all at once I heard the muttering and growling of the sea breaking on the rocky shore. With my remaining strength, I dragged myself from the swirling waters. All in, gasping, my hands raw, I at last reached a flat place at the top. I flung myself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of my life. When I awoke, I was in a strange place, having no idea how I had done it. Our friend seems to be awakening. I... Where, where is this? Where am I? Do not where be are... alarmed, my friend. My man Ivan found you out on the cliff and brought you here to be taken care of. Uh, 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 uh. Oh. Well, thank God there's life on this island. I hardly believed. Few uh, people do. Yes, you aren't quite safe here in my castle, Mr... Uh, uh, Rainsford. Yes. Rainsford. I'm Sanger Rainsford of New York. Rainsford? Sanger Rainsford? Yes. Well, it is indeed a very great pleasure and honor to welcome you, Mr. Sanger Rainsford. You're the celebrated hunter, are you not? Yes, yes. You know me? Uh, by reputation only. I've read your book about hunting snow leopards in Tibet, you see. My name is General Zaroff. I am not English, Mr. Rainsford, but I went to a good school. Perhaps you recognize the colors of my tie. Uh, no, it makes no difference. I've lived too long in the jungle to be a snob. <laughs> well, I... Uh, well, I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, General. And I can't tell you how happy I am to meet you, Mr. Rainsford. 
But come, we shouldn't be chatting here. We can talk later. You must be hungry. Yes, I am, rather. <laughs> what? Uh, Ivan thought you'd like a robe. He's drying your clothes for you. Oh, thank you. Ivan's an incredibly strong fellow, but you mustn't mind his looks. His ears were cut off in battle, and he has the misfortune to be deaf and dumb. He is sensitive about his appearance. A simple fellow, really, but I'm afraid a bit savage. Oh? He's been in our family for years. <laughs> Follow Ivan, if you please, Mr. Rainsford. I was about to have my luncheon just before you awoke. We can have it together now. Does the robe fit you all right? Oh, yes, yes, perfectly, thanks. I'm so glad. You uh, have quite a collection of heads here. Lions, tigers, mm. elephants, moose, bears... Oh, I don't believe I've ever seen a more perfect specimen. They are nice. I take great pride in them. You have good cause. Coming from you, Mr. Rainsford, that is a great compliment. And here we are. You sit over there. Thank you. Not at all. Right, Ivan. <laughs> we do our best to preserve the amenities of civilization here. Please forgive many lapses. Oh, of course. Yes. Well off the beaten track, you know. Uh, Shushu. 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 <laughs> This is my little pet, Mr. Rainsford. As a hunting falcon, Shushu is of no further usefulness in the field. But I am fond of its company. My not little sweetheart. <coughs> Patience, my darling. I know you're hungry, my dear. We hunt tonight. Your, uh... Your heads are really remarkable, General. Mm. That, uh... That Cape Buffalo is the largest I've ever seen. Ah, it's that fellow. He's a monster. Mm, did he charge you? Hurled me against a tree, fractured my skull, left me the scar. And I got the brute. <laughs> I've, uh, I've always thought the Cape Buffalo is the most dangerous of all games. Oh, uh, no, no. You're wrong. Wrong, sir. The Cape Buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Ivan, the wine. Uh, how does he understand you? He reads my lips. <laughs> I think you like this champagne, Mr. Rainsford. Ivan chills it expertly. Uh, no, no, the, the cave of buffalo is not the most dangerous game. Here in my preserve on this island, I hunt more dangerous game. Oh, well, is there a big game on this island? The biggest. Oh, really? Oh, it isn't here naturally, of course. I have to stock the island. Uh, what have you imported, General? Uh, jaguars? Mm, jaguars. I hope you like filet mignon, Mr. Ray. I do very much, thank you. Uh, is it jaguars, General? No, 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 no. Hunting jaguars ceased to interest me some years ago. I exhausted their possibilities, you see. I... No thrill left in jaguars, you understand? No real danger. I live for danger, Mr. Rainsford. <clears throat> we will have some capital hunting. You and I... I shall be most glad to have your company. Yes, but I'll okay. tell you, you'll be amused, I know. I think you may say in all modesty that I've done a rare thing. Yes, I've invented a new sensation. May I pour you another glass of champagne, Mr. Rainsford? Thank you, General. God makes some men poets. Some he makes kings, some beggars. Me, he made a hunter. My hand was made for the trigger. My father once said that. Made for the trigger. My whole life has been one prolonged hunt. I've hunted every kind of game in every land. It'd be impossible for me to tell you how many animals I've killed. Grizzlies in your Rockies, crocodiles in the Ganges, rhinoceroses in East Africa. This is in Africa, by the way. That Cape Buffalo hit me and made me up for six months. Mm. As soon as I recovered, I started for the Amazon to hunt jaguars, for I'd heard they were unusually cunning. <laughs> they weren't. They were no match at all for a hunter with his wits about him, the high-powered rifle. I was bitterly disappointed. I was lying in my tent with a splitting headache one night, and a terrible thought pushed its way into my head. Hunting was beginning to bore me, and hunting, remember, had been my life. I've heard that in America, businessmen often go to pieces when they give up the business that's been their life. Yes, yes, that's uh, so. Uh, I had no wish to go to pieces. <laughs> I, I, I must do something. Uh, now, mine is an analytical mind, Mr. Rainsford. Doubtless, that is why I enjoy the problems of the chase. Oh, no doubt, General. So I ask myself why the hunt no longer fascinated me. You are much younger than I am, Mr. Rainsford, and have not hunted as much, but you perhaps can guess the answer. Well, what is it? Simply this. 
Hunting had ceased to be what you call a sporting proposition. It had become too easy. I always got my quarry. Always. There's no greater bore than perfection. Cigarette? No, thank you. Uh, no animal had a chance with me anymore. Not a chance. That is no boast. It is a mathematical certainty. The animal had nothing but his legs and his instinct. Instinct is no match for reason. When I thought of this... It was a tragic moment for me, I can tell you. It came to me as an inspiration. What I must do. And that was? I had to invent a new animal to hunt. A new animal? Oh, you're joking. Not at all. I never joke about hunting. I needed a new animal. I found one. So I bought this island, built this castle, and here I do my hunting. The island's perfect for my purposes. There are jungles with a maze of trails in them. Hills, swamps... Yes, but the terrain. animal... The animal, General Zara. It surprised me with the most exciting hunting in the world. No other hunting compares with it for an instant. Every day I hunt. I never grow bored now. For I have a quarry with which I can match my wits. Yes, but you still have I wanted the ideal animal to hunt, so I said... What are the attributes of an ideal quarry? And the answer was, of course, it must have courage, cunning, and above all, it must be able to reason. Well, no animal can reason. My dear fellow, there is one that can. One? But you can't mean... And why not? Well, I... I can't believe you're serious, General Zaroff. You're just joking. Joking? I'm quite serious. Speaking about hunting. Hunting? You're speaking about murder. Oh, dear me, that unpleasant word. I think I can show you that your scruples are quite ill-founded. Yes? I hunt the scum of the earth. Sailors from tramp ships, lascars, japs, mongrels, a thoroughbred horse, a hound is worth more than a squirrel. But these are men. Precisely, that is why I use them. It gives me pleasure. They can reason after a fashion, so they are dangerous. But where do you get them? Oh, we visit my training school. It is in the cellar. I have about a dozen pupils down there now. They're from the Spanish park San Lucar that had the bad luck to go to the rocks out there. A very inferior lot, I regret to say. Poor specimens, more accustomed to the deck than to the jungle. Another glass? No. It's a game, you see sort of game. I, I suggest to one of them that we go hunting. Uh, you give, I give him a supply of food and uh, an excellent hunting knife. I give him three hours start. I am to follow, armed only with a pistol of the smallest caliber and range. If my quarry eludes me for three whole days, he wins the game. If I find him, he loses. Suppose he refuses to be hunted. Oh, I give him his choice, of course. He need not play that game if he does not wish to. If he does not wish to hunt, I turn him over to Ivan. Mm, Ivan once had the honor of serving as official knouter to my old king, and he has his own ideas of sport. The invariably, Mr. Rainsford, invariably they choose the hunt. And if they win? Uh, to date, I have not lost. I do not wish you to think me a braggart, Mr. Rainsford. Many of them afford only the most elementary sort of problem, I assure you. Occasionally, I strike a tartar. <laughs> so, so remembers the tartar, don't you, darling? Yes. Yes, he almost did win. I eventually had to use the hounds. You see? Wait a moment. I'll open the window. Hello, boys! <laughs> a rather good lot, I think. They're let out at seven every night. If anyone should try to get into my castle or out of it, something extremely regrettable to occur to you. Uh, but enough of this. Come, I want to show you a collection of heads I'm quite sure you've never seen before. Join me in the library for coffee. 
I uh, hope that you will excuse me tonight, General. Oh. I, I'm really not feeling well at all. Indeed. I know what it is. My old complaint. <laughs> Ennui, boredom. You need some excitement. Tonight we'll hunt. Hey, Mr. Rainsford. You and I. You're wrong, General. I won't hunt. I won't murder. As you wish, my friend. The choice rests entirely with you. But may I not venture to suggest that you will find my idea of sport more diverting than Ivan's? <laughs> you, my dear fellow, you don't mean that you plan to hunt me. My dear fellow, have I not told you I always mean what I say about hunting? This is really an inspiration. I drink to a foeman worthy of my steel at last. But I simply can't believe it. This must be some sort of dream. You'll find the game worth playing, Mr. Rainsford. Think of it, your brain against mine, your woodcraft against mine, your strength, your stamina against mine. Outdoor chess. <laughs> and the stake is not without value, eh? And if I win... I'll cheerfully acknowledge myself defeated if I do not find you by midnight of the third day. My sloop will place you on the mainland near a town. Oh, well, you can trust me. I give you my word as a gentleman and a sportsman. Of course, you in turn must agree to say nothing of your visit here. I will agree to nothing of the kind. Oh. Well, in that case... Hmm, but why discuss that now? Uh, three days hence, we can discuss it over a bottle of Vufrico, unless... Uh... Well... Your choice, Mr. Rainsford. I'm a hunter. You know my choice. Mm -hmm. Ivan here will supply you with hunting clothes, food, and knife. I suggest you wear moccasins. They leave a poorer trail. I suggest, too, that you avoid the big swamp in the southeast corner of the island. We call it Death Swamp. There's quicksand there. Well, I must beg you to excuse me now. We always take our siesta after our lunch. Don't we, Shushu? <laughs> Ah, my little pet. You'll hardly have time for a nap, I fear, Mr. Rainsford. Uh, you, you'll want to start, of course. I shall not follow till dusk. Hunting at night is so much more exciting than by day, don't you think? <clears throat> well, au revoir, Mr. Rainsford. Au revoir. I... <laughs> <laughs> I'd fought my way through the bush for two hours, repeating to myself over and over again, I must keep my nerve, I must keep my nerve. My whole idea at first was to put distance between myself and General Zarov. And to this end, I had plunged along through the thicket spurred on by the sharp rowls of something very much like panic. Now I had got a grip on myself. I'd stopped. I was taking stock of the situation. I saw that straight flight was futile. Inevitably, it would bring me face to face with the sea. Well, I'll give him a trail, I muttered. And I struck off from the rude path I had been following and into the trackless wilderness. I made a series of intricate loops. I doubled back on my trail again and again, recalling all the lore of the fox hunt, all the dodges of the fox. Night found me exhausted, my hands and face lashed by the branches on a thickly wooded ridge. My need for rest was imperative, and I thought, I played the fox, now I must play the cat of the fable. A big tree with a thick trunk and outspread branches was nearby, and taking care not to leave the slightest mark, I climbed up and stretched out among the broad limbs. Rest brought me new confidence and almost a feeling of security. Even so expert a hunter as General Zaroff cannot face me here, I assured myself. An apprehensive night crawled slowly by, my mind keenly alert for any sound, any warning. Towards the dawn, an instinct I never knew existed, like an animal must possess, impelled me to look far off in the distance in a westerly direction. Sure enough, following the trail with the sureness of a bloodhound came General Zaroff. Nothing escaped those searching black eyes. No cracked blade of grass, no bent twig, no mark, no matter how fine in the moss. My heart pounding furiously, I slid down quickly from the tree and struck off again into the woods. I knew I had to do something desperate. I knew that I had little time in which to do it. Three hundred yards from my hiding place, I stopped where a huge dead tree leaned precariously on a smaller living one. Throwing off my sack of food, I took my knife from its sheath and began to work with all my energy. The job was finished at last, and I threw myself down behind a fallen log 300 feet away. 
I did not have to wait long. I, too, have hunted in Malacca. You are proving interesting, Mr. Rainsford. Mm. Very interesting. The tree brushed my shoulders. I jumped back. I'm going to have the wound rest. It's only slight. But I shall be back, Mr. Rainsford. I shall be back. <laughs> It was flight now, a desperate, hopeless flight that carried me on for hours. I don't know where I got the strength. I kept telling myself over and over again that I must keep my nerve. That I was competing with a monster, a super huntsman. Dusk came, then darkness, and still I managed to press on. The ground grew softer under my moccasins. The vegetation grew ranker, denser. Insects bit at me savagely. Suddenly, as I stepped forward, my foot sank into the ooze. I tried to wrench it back, but the muck sucked viciously at my foot like a giant leech. With a violent effort, I tore my foot loose. I knew where I was then. Death swamp and its quicksand. But the softness of the earth had given me an idea. I stepped back from the quicksand a dozen feet or so and began to dig. When the pit was above my shoulders, I climbed out and from some hard saplings cut stakes and sharpened them to fine points. These stakes I planted in the bottom of the pit with the points sticking upwards. As fast as I could, I wove a rough carpet of weeds and branches and with it covered the mouth of the pit. And wet with sweat and aching with tiredness, I crouched behind the stump of a lightning charmed tree. Oh, I knew Zaroff was coming. I could hear the paddling sound of his feet on the soft earth. Zaroff was coming and coming fast. He was not feeling his way along foot by foot. Crouching there, I couldn't either see him nor see the pit. I lived a year and a minute, frozen, every muscle tensed. awakened by a sound that made me know I had new things to learn about fear. It was a distant sound, faint and wavering, but I knew it. It was the baying of a pack of hounds. I could do one of two things. I could stay where I was and wait. That was suicide. I could flee. That was postponing the inevitable. I had put my very last hope into that tiger pit. For a moment, I stood there thinking. All at once, an idea that held a wild chance came to me, and tightening my belt, I headed away from the swamp. The baying of the hounds drew nearer. They would be on me any minute now. My mind worked frantically. I thought of a native trick I had learned in Uganda. I caught hold of a springy young sapling and to it fastened my hunting knife with the blade pointing down the trail. With a bit of wild grapevine, I tied back the sapling. Then I ran for my life. I raised their terrifying voices as they heard them and felt the fresh scent. I knew then how an animal at bay feels. At last I had to stop to get my breath. The baying of the hounds stopped just as suddenly. And with it, my heart stopped too. They must have reached the knife. 
Excitedly, I shinned up a tree and looked back. My pursuers had stopped all right, but the hope that had been in my brain when I climbed died. For in the shallow valley, I saw that General Zaroff was still on his feet. But Ivan was not. Apparently, he had come along to hold the hounds. The knife, driven by the recoil of the springing tree, had splintered through his chest. I'd hardly tumbled to the ground when the pack took off the cry again. Nerve, 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 I panted as I dashed along. A blue gap showed between the trees dead ahead. The hounds were almost on top of me. I forced myself on towards that gap. I reached it. It was the shore of the sea. Across the cove, I could see the gloomy gray stone of the castle. Twenty feet below me, the sea rumbled and hissed. I hesitated. I heard the hounds. Then I leaped far out into the sea. good to me. And I'm here safe in the general's bedroom waiting for him. Three days are up and I've eluded him. But now I must go further. In a moment we will meet, he and I, and he will be unarmed. Only one of us is going to live. You understand that now. patient, dear. You must forgive me. You're hungry, I know. <laughs> Shushu. Rainsford. Jen. Rainsford. How on earth did you get it? Swam. I found it easier and quicker than walking through the jungle. I congratulate you. Extraordinary. You've won the game. Oh, no, General. I'm still a beast at bay here. <coughs> Get ready, General Zaroff. Swords? Yes, two of them. I see. Oh, very good. Very good, Rainsford. One of us, then, is to furnish a repast for the hounds. The other will sleep in this, this very excellent bed. Huh. Excellent. On guard, Rainsford. my late host said it would be. A very excellent bed. And so closes The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, starring Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Mr. Wells was General Zaroff and Keenan Wynn Rainsford. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense next week, same time, when Orson Wells will again be our star in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Lost Special. The producer of suspense is William Spear, who tonight also directed the broadcast. And who with Bernard Herman, the conductor, Lucian Marowick, who composed the original score, and Private Jack Anson Fink, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Come in. 
Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There is more than the fear of the supernatural, the unknown. There is the terror that stalks the streets of our cities. And the nightmare of sudden accident that can erode a man's soul and destroy faith and hope. This story begins in an old limestone house, once an extravagant mansion, now a walk-up apartment building. And we start at the top, in the tiny two-room flat occupied by an elderly single lady as she opens the door after the long climb. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Blind Man's Bluff, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mason Adams and Augusta Dabney. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Say, do you know what happens this time of year? The swallows come back to Capistrano. Nope. The buzzards come back to Hinkley Ridge, Ohio? No. Bulldogs all over the world begin to shed? Not even close. Oh. This, my friend, is the time of year when you can get a super little deal on the practical but elegant Buick Apollo. And just between you and me, it may very well be the best chance you'll ever have to buy a Buick. I could have sworn this was buzzard day in Hinkley. Hinkley. Most appetizers you eat, but there's one appetizer you drink. Dubonnet. Before that's the time to think about some Dubonnet to drink. Before a meal by day or night, it helps to whet your appetite. Before you have a part, it's the time before the Dubonnet. Think of Dubonnet as an appetizer. It's the wine you drink before meals, before lunch, before dinner at cocktail time, before whatever you've got cooking. It helps to whet your appetite. Whether you serve it straight, on the rocks, with a twist, or soda. Dubonnet before makes what comes after that much better. Dubonnet. It all started in France, of course. Before, yeah, before. The time before for Dubonnet. Product of USA. Dubonnet Company, New York, New York. Hi, Dave Herman here reminding you that my analysis of this Sunday afternoon's football game, the Jets against the Buffalo Bills, is brought to you in part by your local Chevron dealer. Broadcast time is at 12.35 over WOR Radio. Not so long ago, 821 Green Street was a good place to live. From the landlord who lived in the basement to Mrs. Schofield, the elderly lady who lived on the top floor in the single tiny apartment with a flower terrace outside. Certainly nobody was happier to move into the building than Fran and Dave Miller. How could they have even guessed that in it Dave would lose himself as a man? Or that a savage, reckless, vicious killer would be the magic key to him finding himself again? It's quite a climb, three flights. Only one person lives higher. Mrs. Schofield. Quiet as a mouse. She won't ever bother you. Ah, here we are. Wow, how clean and well kept up everything is, isn't it, Dave? Yeah, mm. somebody takes a lot of pride in the work put into this. Mm -hmm. My grandfather had this house built for him. Mm -hmm. 1894. People took a power of pride in what they worked at then. Can't find anyone who wants to work with his hands these days. Oh, yes, you can. My Dave. And nobody takes more pride in what he does. Huh? What's your profession, Mr. Miller? I'm a jackhammer man, Mr. Stone, a riveter. Yes, hmm. he works on all the big ones. Why, he doesn't care how high he goes. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, there is one drawback to the apartment I feel that I've got to tell you. You mean the big apartment job they're breaking ground for at the corner? Yes, yes. There's going to be an awful lot of noise for a while. <laughs> well, that's no drawback for us mm. because we're both out working all day. As a matter of fact, I may be even working on that building, huh? so I'm the one who'd be apologizing to you. Well, I'm glad that's out of the way. Now, let's have a look at the apartment and, uh, and see what you think, eh? I've got that feeling, Dave. It's going to be lucky for us. <gasps> oh, my. Oh! Well, if the rest is as good as this, we're home, Dave. Mar 
morning, Mrs. Schofield. Not off babysitting with your grandson today. Oh, Sergeant Hennessy. Now, how would you know today's my day? Because it is Friday. And your habits are as regular as clockwork. <laughs> the sergeant knows the habits of everyone in the precinct. <laughs> it's what I get for being a beat cop the most of my life and sticking to it. Well, don't think we're all not grateful, Mr. Rivera. It's why we all think this is the safest neighborhood in the city. But uh, my son and his family are off on vacation for two weeks. I'm surprised you didn't go along. Oh, too far. Besides, my plants need me. Well, bye now, Sergeant Hennessy and Mr. Rivera. Bye. <laughs> I like that, mister. A uh, lady only had titled friends. And who's the big guy following her up the stairs there? Huh? i never seen him before. It's okay, Juan. He and his little bride just moved in. Nice people. Oh, yes. yes. I have seen his wife. Something to look at, huh, Sergeant? <laughs> Pretty as a picture. <laughs> Which is more than you look like, leaving your big fat rump against the building. Too many tortillas, Juan. Come on, let's go patrol. And you know, it's a funny thing. The longer the day goes on, the heavier these boots get. <laughs> <laughs> just thank himself up there. You live in Queens on the first floor. And not up four long flights like poor Mrs. Schofield is climbing now. You'll never make it. Can I give you a hand? Oh, oh thank you, young man. I, I'm afraid these stairs are beginning to get the better of me. Uh, I'm David uh, Miller. My wife and I just moved on the fourth floor, apartment B. Oh, well, I, I'm Letitia Schofield, top floor. Oh, well... Just one more now, if I ever make it. Well, I'd be glad to see you home safe. Safe? Oh, Lord bless you, son. In, in this house, that's never anything to worry about. Seven years I've been here, and it's as safe as a church. Are you sure you can make it now? Oh, don't you worry. I fly this last flight like a bird. Fran, it's me. I got the cup hooks and the other stuff. Hi, darling. Oh, I've just been fixing and fiddling, and it's all just as perfect and wonderful as I knew it would be that first day when we took it. Oh. Hey, take it easy. You want to break me in half? <laughs> no, I just want to hug you as hard as I can to let you know how happy I am. Mm. Oh. Nothing could break you anyway. You're as hard as steel. Yeah. <laughs> Not inside. Not when you're this close. Well, I want to be as close as... as close. I love the apartment, darling. I love you. I love us. Do you love me? You know I do. I, all I do is have to look at you. You're so beautiful, Fran. Okay, you just keep wearing those rose-colored spectacles and I'll stay that way. I don't need spectacles. Nothing the matter with my eyes. <laughs> you'll be working on today, Dave. 76. Just started to frame up. Oh, darling. See, I wonder at you sometimes. Aren't you ever afraid? I wouldn't want to take time to think about it. You can't. Fear's like rust. Once you let it start, it corrodes everything. Oh, I'd be afraid of losing you. Uh, you. You start thinking that way and you destroy the way we love each other. Don't you forget yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. Well... I see you around four. And it's an eternity. But it's worth living through, just so we can see each other again. And I'm the one who gets the best part of that bargain. What are you, Juan? The bird of ill omen? You're always hovering over the bulletin. Hey, that fellow top dog. If I could catch that piece of filth, then all the rest of being a cop, the other dirt and waste... And most of the time being too late to stop it. It would be worth it all. Yeah, I know how you feel. He's a, a maniac. He kills too often. But me, I I just hope he stays out of our precinct. <sighs> he seems to be working in the other side of town. Now, here's a bulletin in from the 13th. Looks just like him. Mm. But I am not like you. I want him in our precinct. So I can find him and destroy him. Anyone catches him is really going to have their eyes peeled. In the meantime, we'd better hit the beat. So far, we're... Lo What's that? Uh, it's our precinct. Uh, fire, 
on that big new Haverford casualty building. All personnel alerted for fire department support. Okay, Juan, I'll check with the lieutenant. You'll see what squad cars might be available in case we need to ride. What caused the fire, Sergeant? Well, I, I got it from the crew boss. Your uh, your husband's been breaking in a new bucket. Yeah, man. I know. His regular partner, Duke Max, he sprained his ankle. That's right. And, and I know the new guy's a scatter arm, but, but th- this wasn't the first rivet he's thrown out of day's reach. No, no, man. And even as, as red hot as they are, Sergeant, even on wood floor, the rivets aren't likely to start a fire. Yeah, well, well this one did. You see, they were just about to start welding on one of the joints, and yeah. the, the welder had just brought up his tank and uncoiled the hose. The rivet your husband couldn't catch landed right on the rubber hose, burned through it like that. Oh, and flash fired back to the tank. Yeah, that was pure oxygen, ma'am, and it went off like a bomb. Oh. It's a lucky thing for Mr. Miller. The welder was kind of between him and the tank, a, uh, a human shield like. Oh, poor man, how awful. I hope he wasn't hurt too bad. He, uh, he didn't feel no pain. He's dead? Yes, am And Dave? Uh, here comes the doc now. Uh, she's the one to ask. Uh, Dr. Beinfield, this is Mrs. David Miller. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. How's Miller? my husband, doctor? Is he hurt bad? Well, not in general, Mrs. Miller. Do you know what Yes, happened? yes, the sergeant told me about the explosion and, and, and the other man, the welder, yes. Well, he absorbed... Almost all of the flame and the flying metal. Almost all? Uh, unfortunately, it... <clears throat> well, one of your husband's eyes was badly burned. Oh, uh, plastically, we can patch him up as good as new, but oh, no. I'm afraid the sight... Oh, is... no. No. Oh, but Dr. The Other Eye, that's all right, isn't it? Please, isn't it? Mrs. Miller, I... I have to ask you to be brave. The other eye was hit by a piece of the tank that we've been operating. Fortunately, your husband was far enough away so that most of its force was spent. There was no injury to the brain. But the optic nerve... Go on, doctor. Well, I'm afraid it... It was completely destroyed. You mean that... You mean my Dave is blind? Oh, I... Mrs. Miller, I... Oh. I'm sorry. You had to walk in and see me. No. Just keep your mouth shut and do like I tell, mister. And just walk over to that wall. Away from the door. Keep your hands up. Say nothing, right? Not a peep. Not even to beg and crawl and tell me you never seen me. <laughs> you never seen nothing. You didn't see nothing, mister. Nobody sees Top Dog and lives. <laughs> A vicious killer on the other side of town from an unconscious young man who doesn't know yet that he will never wake to light again. A psychopath who doesn't deserve to be alive and a fine young man tragically turned into a someone else he will find hard to live with. What do these two have in common? Why do they belong in the same story? We shall begin to find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Give your hand to a friend Give your heart to your love But give your cold To contact The sooner the better The common cold is a rotten thing You miss so much Sneezing, drips, and congestion can drag you down Then, ask yourself the contact question Six or three or one You'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact 
for up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms. That's daytime, then nighttime relief. Both the others have things for aches and fever, and the liquid, something for coughs. Not found in contact 600 tiny time pills. Here's your code to contact. Six or three or one. Take contact. Only as directed. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? Here's this week's dinner winners from your ShopRite supermarket. Fresh American whole leg of lamb, just 97 cents a pound. Shoulder lamb chops, $1.27 a pound. First cut beef chuck steaks, 59 cents a pound. Semi-boneless beef chuck roast, 99 cents a pound. Fresh pork spare ribs, 89 cents a pound. Fresh honeydew melons, just 69 cents each. Lots of variety for your menus and savings, too. So get a lot more for a little less. Throughout your ShopRite's door, it's ShopRite. She loves her family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. This is WOR New York, an RKO General Station. In the long weeks that followed, Dave tried to make his adjustment. He faithfully followed all the instructions of his teacher who came daily. Most difficult was persuading Dave to leave the house, to learn to walk on foot, to carry the white cane that was the badge of his condition. One thing only he did willingly enough, exercises. He kept himself as fit and hard as he had always been. Outside, he was still the same Dave Miller, alive and vital. But inside, something at the very core of him had died. Particularly after the riveters came to the building at the corner. Oh, Mr. What? Miller, can I give you a hand upstairs? No, I don't need a hand up. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Scoff. Mrs. Schofield, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and I'm the one that's sorry. I, I spoke before I thought. It's it's just that you don't know how I dread those stairs, so I... Oh, I'll do the helping. <laughs> huh? i got to find some use for myself. Um, you got groceries there? Oh, just a few. Most I can manage at one time. Well, you, you give me those. Come on, come on here now. Let me have them and take my other arm. Oh. <laughs> and this time I am taking you right to your door. Oh, my. Oh, well, that's the easiest trip I've ever made, I think. Oh, thank you, Mr... Uh, no, no, I, I think I'm old enough to say thank you, Dave. Sure, Mrs. Schofield. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll give you the shopping bag now. Uh, oh, good. Oh, won't you come in a minute? And knock over your furniture or bust something? Don't forget I'm blind. Oh, you wouldn't let me forget. But... I wanted to show you my terrace. I waited too long to see it, I'm afraid. Oh, well, you can still smell the flowers and feel how cool it is and hear my little fountain splashing. Even with all the other racket, I can still go out there and and feel at peace. Terrace, huh? Mm-hmm. And I'll even make you some lunch. Friends at work, isn't she? Well, somebody has to make it to pay the bills. Okay, just, uh... Just guide me so that I don't make a fool of myself. Well, now you just give me your hand and I'll guide you. Now, that's my silver tea caddy that Fred, he was my husband, he gave me for a special wedding present. He knew I always... Oh, watch out for the chair. Here. Uh, he always knew I liked to set a good table. And Oh, that's my corner cupboard with my bells. Fred gave me one every new year to ring it in. Thirty-five of them. He... He died before he... Could give me the last. Oh, now, here's the terrace. I'll get the door and watch out for the step over. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Hey, hey, something smells good. Oh, that's honeysuckle. It, it's just like a weed, really. It takes so much pruning, but I can't bear to get rid of it. Oh, they're good smells, too. Mm hmm. Mm. Roses, gardenia, carnations. That honeysuckle is getting stronger. Oh, that's because you're right near the edge. Now, careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel a coping. 
What's, uh, what's down below? Oh, the sidewalk and the areaway. Long drop. Huh. That's what drives me real crazy. Oh, I don't blame you. It bothers me a lot. No, no, not for the same reason. That's where I ought to be. Up there, with my gun. <laughs> Watch it, Juan. He's got a gun. We know that. Did you hit him? I never even saw him. He went over the fire escape so fast. Let's get after him. That's too late. He was four or five rooftops away, and between two of them, a jump neither you nor I could make. <laughs> it was top dog, wasn't it? Huh? By all the signs. Another top floor apartment, another corpse. And something new I don't like at all. What? He's moved his territory. He's in our precinct now. Drive that river home. Uh, what? The, oh, who, who, who's that? Fr- uh, fr- fr- Fran? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry about the riveting gun. Oh, well, they'll be jack gutting all day. Well, I should have closed the bedroom window when I got up. I'll get it now. No, no, I'll, I'll do it. What, uh, what time is it? Five after eight. Darling? What? Why didn't you go on back to bed? No, I couldn't sleep now. You must be so tired. Why should I be tired? Because you were up half the night again. You were prowling about in the... So say it. In the dark. What else is there? Ah, uh, I got things on my mind. Oh! Oh, what are you looking for, darling? My slippers. Well, I'll get them for you. I can get them for myself. Will you stop treating me like a baby? Never mind, I got him. Dave, don't find it so hard to ask him for things. I'm your wife. I, I want to be everything to you. I've always tried to be. Is it so hard to let me be? Dave, can't I be your eyes? I'd give them to you if I could. Oh, honey, come here. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Just just try to bear with the bear, huh? <laughs> That's not much of a joke. I think it is. To hear you cracking one again. Second best thing you could do for me. Uh, what's the first? Well, as long as you are up, couldn't you kiss me good morning? Oh, darling, forgive me. <laughs> I love you. Good morning. Good morning. I love you. Mm. Sit down, honey. Oh, Dave, I haven't time. And it's payday today. I'll be home real early. Okay. Can't do anything to interfere with the old take-home. Somebody's got to keep a roof over our heads. Honey, listen. Don't get down in the dumps again. What is the point? I feel so useless. i got to do something. i got to find something to keep me busy instead of hanging around in the apartment all day, twiddling my thumbs and going nuts. Well, you, you ought to be taking your walk, getting some air. Sure. I tried that yesterday, bumping into everyone, bumping into everything, having little kids help me across the street. I tell you, I tell you, when I went up with Mrs. Schofield, I was ready to... Take a dive off her terrace. Oh, listen, now, I can't leave you like this, Dave. Why don't you listen to the teacher and you get a dog? No, no, um, no. How many times are we going to have to go around that again? I, I, ah, uh, gee, forget it, honey. Look, 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 look. Maybe I will look into it. Don't, don't worry about me. Worry about yourself, huh? Hey, hey, what, what's the time? <gasps> After eight. I've got to get my coat and fly. Yeah, any hot coffee left in the kitchen? Oh, no. Oh. And, and Dave? Yeah? Well, you'll have to make instant. The electric pot is on the fritz again. Darling, it shorted out the whole house when I plugged it in this morning. Did you put in a new fuse? Oh, sure, sure. Where's my bag? <laughs> I'm the last person to ask. Well, I'll fix the percolator. It's just a loose connection. And Fran. Yes, darling. While I'm at it, I'll try to rewire myself. Oh, <laughs> Oh, darling, I hate to leave you in this mood. Yeah, in this mood, I ought to be left. I'll see you around five. Okay, maybe earlier. Oh, and there's fried chicken and corn on the cob for dinner. Well, that ought to bring out a grin. From ear to ear. Oh. <laughs> Just look at me. <laughs> My favorite sight. 
Bye now. Bye bye. Good morning, Mrs. Schofield. Oh, Mrs. Miller. Oh, I'm so glad someone's going downstairs. You know, they'll be the death of me. Well, yet. here, you lean on my arm. Oh, thank you. How, how's Mr. Miller? Oh, Dave's coming along fine. How's your son? Well, I, I don't see so much of him. He's off at business so much. Well, I should think you'd want to live with your family. Oh, no, I, I'd only be in the way. My son and his wife have their life to live. And three is a crowd. Besides, it's it's good for old people to be independent. If we have to hold on to our pride, we'd fall apart without it. Not only old people. Hmm? Oh, what? I was just thinking, I was just thinking, what what can you do for someone who's lost it? Well, you can't. Just just count on time for Dave. I'll try to remember. There, there, that's the last. Step. Oh, good. I'll get the front door. Oh, that, that's awful riveting. <laughs> I'll be glad to get away from it for a day. Good uh, morning, Mrs. Schofield. Mrs. Miller. Oh, good morning, Sergeant Henderson. Good morning. Uh, could I remind you that me and Juan Rivera are collecting again for the Police Boys Fund? Uh, could I put just a wee bite on your board? Well, not on me now. I've only a subway token and lunch money till I get paid. But I'll be back early. Before five this afternoon, could you stop by? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, could you wait for me till then, too? I, I, I've got to catch my bus. Well, I wouldn't bother either of you, except in a good cause. But uh, I wonder now, uh, should I be troubling Mrs. Miller at all under the circumstances? You let her contribute her bit. Don't undermine her pride. Well, it's Dave Miller's pride I'm thinking about. Now that he can't work. Yeah, I was laid up once with a bullet and I thought I'd never be a whole man again. But I had the chance to recover. Yeah, what has he got? For heaven's sake, Dave, it's Bedlam in here. What did you say, Brian? You mind if I turn off the TV? Be my guest. I can't look at it anyway. That hammer was driving me up the wall. I had to kill the noise. Oh, baby. Ah, uh, I'm gonna have to get a dog, friend. You're right. At least it, at least it'd get me out of the house more often. Why, hon, that's what you need. You've got to start living again. Living. <laughs> living. That. That was living for me. Fran, you just don't know. Slung in a rig, feet braced against a column, whacking home those red-hot nails, or straddling a crossbeam as a bucket man and picking those sizzling babies out of the air and lobbing them up to the gun hog in his funnel or passing them on with the tongs. I tell you, a guy felt like a king. I mean, you own the world. You were building a whole city. You, you could turn any which way on your perch and, and you could see the... Dave, uh, darling. Uh, darling. You forget it. It's over. It's done with. And so am I. I'm no good to you. You're my world, darling. You're all I want. Do you know? You're acting like a baby. It's about time... It's about time that you started acting like a man again. How? By facing your problems. By realizing that, well, in spite of what's happened, you're as good as any other man. And for me, you're a darn sight better when you're yourself. I'm going out and make a cup of coffee. You can't. I used up all the instant. You didn't fix the percolator? I tried to, but it's in the elements somewhere. And guess what? I couldn't fix it because I couldn't see where. Dave, where are you going? I'm going out. I'm no good to you. I'm no good to me, to nobody. Just let me figure my own way out. I should climb up to Mrs. Schofield's and just take the big step over that honeysuckle off of the terrace. What? That was a gun. Hey, who's there? Did you hear a gunshot? Drop that white cane. I, I need it. I can't see. Hey, 
Hey, you mean you're blind, man? Yeah, but who... Oh, poor boy, this is your lucky day. I almost let you have it, too. Okay, okay, now move away. Who are you? Move away. I said move it. I got a gun in my hand and I'm busting clear out of here. It's okay, Juan. If you tried to lug that lump of lard on your rump up four flights, you'd be liable to have a heart attack. Cops. Okay, Mac. Is this your apartment, huh? Yeah. Do you feel that? Yeah. That's a rod. It's loaded, and I ain't got no cause not to use it again. So open up your door and get me inside. Why should I? The name's Top Dog, man. That bring you in a line? You heard of me? Huh? Yeah, I've heard of you. And you know I don't mind using this. That's just what I was thinking about. Maybe I should just let you go ahead. My best way out. What would you say if I just said, go ahead, shoot? It's taken a while, but these uneven antagonists have met. By sheer chance. Now the smell of fear hangs heavy in the air. The desperate criminal about to be caught red-handed. The hopeless young man who thinks he has so little left to live for. A moment of desperate decision for both. Which we will return to shortly with Act Three. Ever see a beer drinker pour his beer real easy down the side of the glass? Maybe you do it yourself. If so, the Budweiser Brewmaster thinks you're missing something. Especially if you're a Budweiser drinker. You see, Bud is brewed, so it will kick up a healthy head of foam. Exclusive beechwood aging and natural carbonation make it a lively brew. Well, anyway, pouring Bud plunk down the middle of the glass helps bring out the best in that clean white Budweiser foam and real beer aroma. It also helps you get the full benefit of a taste, smoothness, and drinkability you'll find in no other beer at any price. Remember, brewing beer right does make a difference. Next time, pour that Budweiser right down the middle and see for yourself. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. At Suburban Savings in northern New Jersey, you're always the tops. So to help you reach the top, Suburban is offering you a top 7.90% effective annual yield on their 7.50% savings certificates. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Just a $2,500 minimum is all you need to get your savings straight to the top. Federal regulations allow premature withdrawals on savings certificates, provided prescribed federal penalties are adhered to. Of course, Suburban also has other ways to top off your day with a wide selection of other savings plans to choose from. Your savings will always come out on top because we offer you the highest interest rates allowed by law. Come into any Suburban Savings Office conveniently located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne and choose the right savings plan for you. This Sunday afternoon's clash between the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills is brought to you in part by M&M Mars, the fun-sized candy people. And I'm Dave Herman for all the commentaries throughout the game. Broadcast time over WOR Radio is 12.35. On the fourth floor landing, Top Dog looks in awe at the first person he has ever met who shows no fear of the lethal weapon that is killed without mercy so often. From below... Approaching gradually is the measured tread of the sergeant of police as he toils up the stairs towards them. Above is the woman Top Dog has just murdered. And he knows there is no rooftop escape from this house. You open that door, man, or you die. I suppose that's just what I want. Someone to do for me what I haven't got the guts to do myself. Oh, that's just where you get it if you don't open that. Dave! Shh, shh. Okay, lady. Okay, that's it. I got a gun. Now back in the house, or I'll let your husband have it. Please, please, please don't. Same goes for you, mister. Now you don't move, or the lady gets it. Okay, okay, don't shoot. I'm with you. Is this your wife? Yeah, I said, so help me if you... Shut up. 
Now, nobody's going to get hurt if I get out of here okay, but I'm warning you. I got nothing to lose. Now, I just knocked off that old dame upstairs. So the both of you just freeze and keep your mouth buttoned real tight. Or I start blasting. Now, shh, shh. Hey, Juan. Yes, Juan. Yes. I was just looking out the second floor hall window. There's an old heap parked on the other side of the street. Uh, oh, yeah, I see. Hey, check that plate, will you? Looks like a stolen car to me. Lousy copper. What's he want? Maybe he heard the shot. Oh, come on. Over that rivet gun? Hey, what's that lousy cop on here anyways? Huh? Every cop in this city is looking for you, top dog. Dave, don't bait him. That's okay, lady. I know it. I am number one. Sure. Something to be really proud of. Did you really shoot Mrs. Schofield? Ah, she caught me. Caught me going through her apartment. You shoot an old woman in cold blood? Well, she seen me, didn't she? No. Listen, baby, I'm a three-time loser. Now, I got nothing to lose. But that poor little thing, you... Gosh, she could have pulled me out of the file. She seen me. And anybody sees me on a job gets it. Anybody catches me on a job gets it. Hey, that's where you get a break, man. Now, ain't you glad you're blind, huh? You couldn't give him a make on me. Hmm? Hey, lady. Hey, lady, you blind like your husband? No, no, yes, I'm... Yes, yes, we're both blind. So, you've seen me too, lady, huh? Well, that's kind of too bad now, ain't it? Hold it down, everyone. Who's that? I, um, I guess it's the sergeant. What's he want here? Um, Mrs. Schofield and I promised him a contribution for the for the police force league this afternoon. Well, ma- 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 maybe he'll figure you ain't home, huh? No, he knows I'm here. I, I just said hello to him at the corner. You see? So pay him off. You're hurting me. Now look, you, you just cool it, man. Now look, Jake, you've got one other job to do. Now you keep that cop from going upstairs, huh? And no funny business. Ah. If you do anything to my wife. Ah, button it up, helpless. You're the first to get it if anything goes wrong. Now you get it, lady? Yes. Then go on. Oh, afternoon, Mrs. Miller. That I knocked and got no answer. But I rang the bell because, well, I'm sorry, but I uh, I knew you were home. Y- yes, I uh, uh, went to get my bag. Something wrong? No, um, no, um, uh, I'm, I'm just still a little out of breath after the stairs. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I took my own sweet time on them. It's one tough climb. Here's the money. Oh, thank you. And now I'll just make out the receipt. Oh, that, that w- w- won't be necessary. Oh, it won't take a moment. We're supposed to, you know. If I could just step in a minute, I'd like to say hi to Dave. Oh, you can't. Are you all right? You're acting kind of funny for you. It's it, it's just Dave. He's um he's not feeling so well, but he's lying down, and you know um he well he has his bad day. Oh yes, I understand. Poor guy, lousy thing to happen. I'll, uh, I'll just scribble this against the wall. <sighs> well, just one more flight to go, and I've done my bit for the PBL. <laughs> if I can make it. To Mrs. Schofield? Yep. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't believe she's home yet. Why, sure she is. I saw her in the corner grocery not ten minutes ago, and she was on her way back then. Here's your receipt. Uh, I'll be seeing you. Why didn't you stop him? How could I? Before he finds out what you've done, now is your chance to make your break. Oh, no, you, you, you keep your distance. Uh, help us. I don't trust you. What harm can I do you if you get away? I don't know what you look like. Uh, your wife here does. Uh, let me think. Uh, let me think. If I close the old lady's door, maybe he'll think. Maybe he'll think she went out again when she doesn't answer. Uh, did I close the door? I don't remember. Or were her keys still in the lock? Come here, Fran. Now, you better make it quick if you're getting out of here. And don't try any shooting. You can't hit Fran with her behind me. You lousy... One! Why are you down there? You bet. And then where's the stolen car? Never mind that. You get out to our car and put in the 1020. Hey, you got a DOA? It looks like a homicide. And Juan? Yes, Sergeant. Cover the front door. Nobody goes in or out. There's a chance whoever did it is still in the building. Hey, what's your step, Dave? This one looks like your boy top dog. 
Come to my ear. Just get on the horn, will you, and get us some help. That tears it. Stay, look out. Uh, oh. Oh. Stay. Don't scream, Mrs. Miller. One peep, and it won't be a little pistol whipping for your hubby. I'll lay his brains open. <gasps> Okay, help us. You can hear me, right? Yes. Well, then on your feet and in the bedroom. Hey, wait a minute. Ah, no fire escape. Fine, fine, let's go. What? What about my wife? Oh, she stays with me. I need her. Now, listen to both of you. This is a 38. I got my hand. Now, I don't want to use it. Now, when that cop come around to check up, there ain't a sound from either one of you. Now, if he does come in... I'm in the closet. But and I want you should listen close, Mrs. Miller. I can still blow that hole through your husband and the cop. And then you, if you don't follow orders. There he is now. Now it's up to you, Mrs. Miller. Get in there, help us. On your face in the bed. Mrs. Miller. I ain't closing the bedroom door. Mrs. Miller. Now I can watch every move you make. Go ahead, Mrs. Miller. If anything goes wrong, I might even shoot them Mrs. first. Mr. Miller! I understand. Oh. Well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry to bother you again, Mrs. Miller. What's the matter, Sergeant Henderson? No, no, are you all right? Why, has something happened? I, I was in the kitchen, and I thought I heard shouting. That was me and Patrolman Rivera. No, 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 I don't want to upset you, but... But there's been an accident upstairs. Mrs. Schofield, is she... She's, she's dead. She was killed by a gunshot and, 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 and oh. robbed. Probably by a professional who goes by the name of Top Dog. He's a vicious, psychopathic killer, and there may be a possibility he's still in the building. Oh. If only we knew exactly when the shot was fired, we'd have a better idea. Maybe... Maybe I'd better ask Mr. Miller. Oh, he, he couldn't have heard anything. Hmm? I told you, Sergeant, he isn't feeling well, and and I'd given him a sleeping pill, and so he was, well, he was dead to the world. Oh, well, God knows I wouldn't want to disturb him. I'll go on checking, and I, I just be sure uh, to keep that door closed and bolted, and don't open it to anyone till you're sure who it is. Well, that was close. Now, what do you expect to do? Right now, we're all going to sit down and relax until the excitement's over. And I'm just going to walk right up. Suppose they put a watch on the building. Sit down, sit down, everyone. Now, I've been thinking about that. Comes out easy. Once the cop gives Mrs. Miller the all clear, I get me a real good disguise and just the right kind of protection to get me a wink clear. What's that? Huh? Well, your wife here is going to take her poor blind husband for a little breath of air. Nice walk around the block. Only it'll be me in your turtleneck sweater behind the dark glasses and carrying the white cane. You can't get away with it. Why not? <laughs> Once it's good and dark. You lousy cups. Still hanging around. It's almost dark. Hey, you. Hey, baby. Yes? Turn on the light so I can see. Okay. Now. Pull a shade. And you can shove them shutters closed as well. Come on, come on. Hey. <laughs> Bet it's dark as, as the bottom of a well in here without lights, huh? Hey, how, how, how come a blind guy wants it so dark? Huh? Mike wasn't always blind. In fact, he used to be so sensitive to light. Oh, that... Okay, spare the sob story now. Get me some more lights on while we're waiting for the coppers to take off, huh? Yes. Oh. oh, now, wouldn't you just like to have your hands in my throat? No gun? Pair of eyes to see? <laughs> I bet you think if we was on equal terms, you, you could take me. I'd sure like the chance to try. And you ain't getting it, baby. Hey, how's for some coffee, huh? Coffee? Hmm? No, I'm afraid of I can't. Of course you can, friend. But you said we were out of instant. Yeah, we are, but you can always make some in a percolator. But the perco... But... Yeah, just plug it in. It's just what we need. Oh. Oh, well, if you think... Oh, yes. come on, come on. No tricks. I'm standing right here where I can watch the both of you. Huh? Okay. Oh, what are you waiting for? Now, plug it in. Come on. What's this? Lock yourself in, friend. Hey, how did you fix the lights? I can't see. How do you like it? Ah! 
<laughs> come on. Come on, where are you, helpless? You, you come near me, I fill you full of lead. Keep away from me or I'll shoot. That won't do you no good. I'll get to the window. I'm going to give me some light now. Yeah, you're having a chance, not on even terms. If I could see you, if I could only see. If I could only... On my turf now, buddy. I still got my gun. Some light. I'm in my wrist. Just one little more move and I'll break your arm with pleasure. All right, honey, I got him. I could handle six pumps like this. Get his gun. It's right by my foot. Uh, Let me go, mister. I'll give you a break. Yeah, I'll give you a break. You shut your mouth or I'll break both of your arms. I was so scared when I heard the shots. I thought it was all over. All over. All over. Fran, honey, it's just beginning. No one is ever going to call me helpless again. First of all, myself. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. That's my element. And you'll see. You'll see. I'll find a way to make it work for me. But you better put in a new fuse. <laughs> the police will need some light when they get here. Those shots will bring them running. Oh, Dave, I'm so proud of you. Oh, it's even better, Fran. So am I. I got my own pride back. There are none of us without handicaps to overcome. And in the battle against them, pride is a good and just weapon. Dave Miller's is a great one. But he'll conquer now that he knows the way and has found the desire... Excuse me, sir, but do you know what happens this time of year? Right on, pal. I happen to know that right about now, a freak blizzard falls on Dumont, New Jersey. Uh, and no. they're snowed in for the rest of the summer. Uh, happens every year. No, 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 nope. Uh, you see, what happens this time of year is that you can get a particularly good deal on what is perhaps the most luxurious midsize car on the market. The midsize Buick Century Regal. Well, what good's a car when you're hopelessly snowed in? Uh, well, that's a point. Our cast included Mason Adams, Augusta Dabney, Bryna Rayburn, Leon Janney, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. We present another play in the Flora Robson Festival series. Dangerous Corner by J.B. Priestley. Flora Robson plays the part she created when the play was first produced in 1932. Flora Robson as Alwyn Peel in Dangerous Corner. Especially written for broadcasting by Mr. Humphrey Stoke. The actors taking part were... And um, that's that. I hope we didn't bore you, Miss Mockridge. Not in the least. I don't like the plays and the stuffy talks. I like the dance music, and so does Gordon. <laughs> dance fiends. You know, Miss Mockridge, every time my brother Gordon comes here, he annoys us by fiddling about trying to get dance music. I adore switching off the solemn, pompous lecturers. Just exactly. Distinguishing them. <laughs> what did they call that play? The Sleeping Dog. Why the Sleeping Dog? Because you had to let him lie. <laughs> let who lie? Well, they were all telling lies, weren't they? Or they had been. How many scenes did we miss? Five, I think. I suppose they must have been telling a lot of lies in those scenes. That's why that man was so angry. The husband, I mean. <laughs> oh, listen to the men. They're probably laughing at something very improper. No, just gossip. Men gossip like anything. Of course they do. Quite right. 
I insist upon my publishers gossiping. Yes, but the men pretend it's business. Well, I think it's a marvellous excuse now that there are all three directors of the firm. Mm. Yes, of course. Miss Peel, I think you ought to marry Mr. Stanton. Oh, why should I? To complete the pattern here. Then there'd be three pairs of adoring husbands and wives. I was thinking... Presentation interruption. End of spur three. Out and over to the fourth spur now. B. Priestley, featuring Flora Robson, in the part she created in 1932. Already on the penultimate spur preceding, we have recorded about two minutes of the play. We pick up and press on here with Dangerous Corner by J.B. Priestley, featuring Flora Robson. Three pairs of adoring husbands and wives. I was thinking so all through dinner. There you are, Albert. <laughs> I'm always prepared to marry Charles Stanton myself to one of your charmed circle. What a snug little group you are. <laughs> are we? Well, aren't you? The snug little group. <laughs> Oh, awful. Not awful at all. I think it's charming. It sounds disgusting. Yes, like Dickens or a Christmas card. And very nice things to be, and these days almost too good to be true. Uh, why should it be? I didn't know you were such a pessimist, Miss Mockridge. Didn't you? Certainly I'm a pessimist. But I didn't mean it in that way. Of course, I think it's wonderful. It is rather nice here. Yeah. We've been lucky. Enchanting. I hate to leave it. You know, I'm in the town office now, not down here at the press. But I come back as often as I can. I'm sure you do. It must be so comforting to be all so settled. Mm, pretty good. But I suppose you all miss your brother-in-law. You mean Robert's brother, Martin? Yes, Martin Kaplan. I was in America at the time and never quite understood what happened. Something rather dreadful, wasn't it? Oh, have I dropped a brick? I'm always dropping bricks. <laughs> no, not at all. Martin shot himself. It happened nearly a year ago. Last June, in fact. Not here, but at Fallow's End, about 20 miles away. He'd taken a cottage there. Oh, yes. Dreadful business, of course. He was very handsome, wasn't he? Yes, very handsome. Who was very handsome? <laughs> Not you, Charles. Well, may we know? Or is it some grand secret between you? They were talking about me. Betty, why do you allow them to talk about your husband in this fulsome fashion? <laughs> you know shame, girl. <laughs> now, how's the new novel going? Splendidly. Gordon, <laughs> darling, I'm sure you've had too much manly gossip and old brandy. A typical financier. Without the... Sorry uh... to be so late, Frida. But it's that wretched puppy of yours. Oh, what's he been doing now? It was eating the script of Sonia Williams' new novel. And I thought it might make him sick. <laughs> oh, darling. <laughs> I've just been saying what a charming, cosy little group you've made here, all of you. I'm glad you think so. I think you've all been lucky. I agree, we have. Ah, oh, but it's not all luck, Miss Mockridge. You see, we all happen to be nice, easy-going people. Except Betty. She's terribly wild. Oh, well, that's only because Gordon doesn't beat her often enough. Oh. Uh, yet. You see, Miss Peel, Mr. Stanton is still the cynical bachelor. I'm afraid he rather spoils the picture. Oh, well, Miss Peel can't afford to talk. She's transferred herself to the London office and deserted us. Oh, I come back here as often as I'm asked. But whether it's to see me or Robert, we can't yet decide. <laughs> anyway, Betty's getting jealous. Oh, right, <laughs> What's disturbing the ether tonight? Anybody know? Oh, I'll find something for you. Here's the radio time. Oh, Gordon, don't start it again. We've only just turned it off. Uh, what did you hear? The last half of a play. It was called The Sleeping Dog. Why? We're not sure. Something to do with lies and a gentleman shooting himself. What fun they have at the BBC. Yes, don't they? Shots and things. You know, I believe I understand that play now. The sleeping dog was the truth, do you see, and that man, the husband, insisted upon disturbing it. He was quite right to disturb it. Was he, I wonder? You know, I think it's a very sound idea, the truth as a sleeping dog. Of course, we do spend too much of our time telling lies and acting them. Oh. Very likely. But I'm all for it coming out. It's healthy. Well, I think telling the truth is about as healthy as skidding round a corner at 60. And life's got a lot of dangerous corners, hasn't it, Charles? Can have, if you don't choose your route well. To lie or not to lie? What do you think, Alwyn? You're looking terribly wise. I agree with you. I think telling everything is dangerous. The point is, I think, 
There's truth and truth. I always agree to that. Something and something. Oh, shut up, Gordon. <laughs> Go on, Holmes. Oh. Yes, go on. Well, the real truth, that is, every single little thing with nothing missing at all, wouldn't be dangerous. I suppose that's God's truth. But what most people mean by truth, what that man meant in the wireless play, is only half the real truth. It doesn't tell you all that went on inside everybody. It's rather treacherous stuff. I'm not convinced, Miss Peel. I'm ready to welcome what you call half the truth. The fact. So am I. I'm all for it. Well, you would be, Robert. What do you mean by that, Frida? <laughs> Anything, nothing. Oh, let's talk about something more amusing. Who wants a drink? Uh, drinks, Robert. Yes. And cigarettes. Uh, Miss Mockridge? No, thank you. Oh, then. A cigarette? Oh, I remember that box. It plays a tune at you, doesn't it? I remember the tune. Um, La Traviata. Good, isn't it? Well, it? It can't have been this box you remember, Alwyn. This is the first time I've had it out. It, it belonged to someone else. It belonged to Martin, didn't it? He showed it to me. Oh, he couldn't have shown it to you, Alwyn. He hadn't got it when you last saw him. Martin couldn't have shown you this box, Alwyn. Couldn't he? Uh, no. No, perhaps he couldn't. I, oh, I suppose I got mixed up. Alwyn, mm. I'm going to be rather rude, but I know you won't mind. You know, you suddenly stopped telling the truth then, didn't you? You're absolutely positive that this is the box Martin showed you, just as Frida is equally positive it isn't. Well, does that matter? Not a hoot, I'd say. I tried to find some dance music, but this thing has suddenly decided not to function. Right, uh, Gordon, then don't fiddle about with it. Don't bully Gordon. Well, you stop it. No, I don't suppose it does matter, Alwyn. But after what we'd been saying, I couldn't help thinking that it was uh, rather an odd, provoking situation. Well, just what I was thinking. It's all terribly provoking. More about the cigarette box, please. <laughs> it's all perfectly simple. Wait a minute, please, Frida. I don't think it is all perfectly simple, but I can't see that it matters now. I don't understand you. Neither do I. First you say that it can't have been the same box, and now you say it's not all perfectly simple and begin to hint at grand mysteries. I believe you're hiding something, Alwyn. That isn't like you. Either that box you saw was Martin's or it wasn't. Oh, damn the box. Oh, but Mr. Oh, Mr. Stanton, Look, sorry, it. but I hate a box that plays <coughs> tunes at you like that anyway. Let's forget it. Yes, and Martin, too. He's not here, and we are. All warm and cosy. Such a charming group. Oh, shut up, Gordon. Well, don't let's mention Martin or think about him. It's bad form. He's dead. Well, there's no need to be hysterical about it, Gordon. One would think you owned Martin to hear you talk. Instead of which, nobody owned Martin. He belonged to himself. He'd some sense. Oh, what does all that mean, Betty? Oh, it means that I'm being rather stupid, and I think I'm going to have a headache any minute. Is that all? Isn't that quite enough, Robert? Well, go on, Frida, about the box. The cigarette box came to us with some other of Martin's things from the cottage. I put it away. This is the first time it's been out here. Now, the last time Alwyn was at the cottage was that Saturday when we all went over. Gordon, you remember? Gosh, yes. What a day it was. Yes, it, it was a good day. Though I had no idea you had been so excited about it, Gordon. Not than anybody else. Gordon seems to have decided that he ought to be hysterical every time Martin is mentioned. The point is, then, that that first Saturday in June was the last time Alwyn was at Martin's cottage. Yes. And I know that he hadn't got that cigarette box then. So there you are, Alwyn. There I am. Yes, but... Hang it all. Where are you? Oh, you are a baby, Robert. I don't know where I am. Out of the dock or the witness box, I hope. Oh, no, please. That would be too disappointing. You know, that wasn't the last time you were at the cottage, Alwyn. Don't you remember you and I ran over the next Sunday afternoon to see Martin about those little etchings? Yes. Yes, that's true. But I don't remember him showing us this cigarette box. In fact, I've never seen it before. I've never seen it before, and I don't think I ever want to see it again. i never heard such a lot of fuss about nothing. Oh, I wouldn't be too sure about this, Charles, but uh, I may as well tell you that Martin couldn't have shown you the box that Sunday anyhow, because he hadn't got it then. You seem to know a lot about that box, Frida. It's just what I was going to say. Why are you so grand and knowing about it? I know why, Frida. 
You gave it to him. Did you, Frida? Yes, I gave it to him. Oh, that's queer. When did you give it to him? Where did you pick it up? That's all quite simple. I happened to see the cigarette box at Calthrop's. And Calthrop sent it to Martin down at Fallow's End so that he never got it until that last Saturday? Yes. Well, that's that. I'm sorry, Frida, but it's not quite so simple as that. You mustn't forget that I was with Martin at the cottage that very Saturday morning. Well, what about it? Well, I was there when the parcel post came, with the letters in the morning. I remember Martin had a parcel of books from Jack Brookfield. But he didn't have that cigarette box. I suppose he must have arrived by the afternoon post then. What does it matter? It doesn't matter at all, Frida, darling. Except that at Fallow's End, parcels are never delivered in the afternoon post. Oh, yes, they are. No. Well, how do you know? Because Martin used to grumble about it and say that he always got books and manuscripts a day late. That cigarette box didn't arrive in the morning because I saw the post opened. It couldn't have been delivered in the afternoon. Frida, I don't believe those shop people in town ever sent the box. You took it to Martin yourself. You did, didn't you? You're a fool, Gordon. Possibly. Did you, Frida? <laughs> you must know, I did. Frida. I thought so. But, Frida, if you went to the cottage to give Martin the box after Gordon had left, you must have seen Martin later than anybody. Only a few hours before he... Before he shot himself. I did. I saw him between tea and dinner. But why have you never said anything about it? What good would it have done? It, it was bad enough Gordon having to do it. It was hell. Uh, if it could have helped Martin, I'd have gone. But, well, it couldn't have helped anybody. That's true. You were quite right. Yes, I can understand that. But why didn't you tell me? You were the very last person to talk to Martin. Was I the last person? You must have been. And what about Alwyn? Alwyn? Oh, the cigarette box. Yes, of course, the cigarette box. Martin didn't get that box until after tea on that Saturday afternoon, and Alwyn's admitted that he showed it to her. No, she didn't. She said it was some other box, and I vote we believe her and have done with no, it. No, no, Mrs. White. Yes, I do. It's all wrong going on and on like this. And I second that. And I don't. Oh, but what? I'm sorry, Betty. Though, after all, you don't come into this and it can't hurt you. But Martin was my brother, and I don't like all these mysteries, and I've a right to know. All right, Robert. But must you know now? I didn't see the necessity, but then I didn't see the necessity why I should have been cross-examined with the entire approval of the company, apparently. But now that it's... now that it's your turn, Owen, I've no doubt that Robert will relent. I don't see why you should say that, Frida. I'm sure you don't, Robert. And you might as well admit it, Owen. Martin showed you that box, and I didn't he? So you must have seen him. You must have been to the cottage that Saturday night. Yes, he did show me the box. That was after dinner, about nine o'clock on that Saturday night. You were there too? But this is crazy. First Frida, then you, and neither of you has said a word about it. I'm sorry, Robert, I just couldn't. But what were you doing there? I'd been worried about something... something that I'd heard. It had been worrying me for days, and at last I couldn't stand it any longer. I felt I had to see Martin to ask him about it. Oh, man. So I ran over to Fallow's End. Nobody saw me go, nobody saw me leave. You know how quiet it was there. Like Frida, I thought it wouldn't serve any good purpose to come forward at the inquest, so I didn't. That's all. But you can't dismiss it like that. You must have been the very last person to talk to Martin. You must know something about it. Oh, it's all over and done with. Let's leave it alone, please, but... Robert. Besides, I'm sure we must be boring Miss Mockridge with all this stuff. Oh, no, I'm enjoying it. Very much. We don't mean to discuss it, do we, Frida? There's nothing to discuss. All but, over. But look here, Alwyn, you must tell me this. Had your visit to Martin that night anything to do with the firm? Was that something to do with that missing 500 pounds? Oh, for God's sake, don't drag that money into it. We don't have to go over that all over again. Martin's gone. Leave him alone, can't you, and shut up about the rotten money. Gordon, be quiet. <laughs> You're behaving like an hysterical child tonight. I'm sorry, Miss Mockridge. No, not at all. But I think, if you don't mind, <coughs> it must be getting late. Oh, no. No, it's early yet. Oh, must you really go, Miss Mockridge? Yes, I really think I ought. It's at least half an hour's run to the Pattersons, and I don't suppose they'd like their car and chauffeur to be kept out too late. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been so delightful seeing you all again. Such a charming group you make here. Goodbye, Mrs. Whitehouse. Mm. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm. I 
that you left your wrap in my room. I'll get it for you. Goodbye. Bye. Good night, Miss Mulcrich. For this relief, much thanks. Oh, good Lord, yes. I'm sorry, but I can't bear that woman. Yeah, it's very rum, but uh, nevertheless, she's not at all a bad novelist. Why is it there seems to be always something rather unpleasant about good novelists? I give it up. I don't call Maud Mockridge a good novelist, Stanton. I bet she's a gossiper. Oh, she is. She's notorious for it. Must have been agony for her to go away and not hear any more. She wouldn't have gone if she'd thought she'd have heard any more. But she's got something to be going on with. She'll probably start a new novel in the morning and we'll all be in it. She can't really do much with what she's just heard, you know. After all, why shouldn't Frida have taken Martin a cigarette box and why shouldn't Alwyn have gone to see him? Yes, why not? Uh, oh, I'd forgotten you were there, Alwyn. Can I ask you something? After all, I don't think I've asked anybody anything so far, have I? You can ask. I don't promise to answer. I'll risk it then. Were you in love with Martin, Alwyn? Not in the least. I thought you weren't. As a matter of fact, to be absolutely candid, I rather disliked him. Yes, I thought so. Oh, rot. I'll never believe that, Alwyn. You couldn't dislike Martin. Oh. Nobody could. I don't mean he hadn't any faults or anything. But with him, they just didn't matter. You had to like him. He was Martin. In other words, your God. You know, Gordon literally adored him, didn't you, darling? Well, he could be fascinating, and he was certainly very clever. I must admit, the firm's never been the same without him. I should think not. How could it be? Come along, Frida. Now we can thrash this out. Oh, no, please, Robert. I'm sorry, Alvin, but I want to know the truth now. There's something very queer about all this. First Frida going to see Martin and never saying a word about it, and then you going to see him too, Alwyn, and never saying a word about it either. It's, it's not good enough. It seems to me it's about time some of us began telling the truth for a change. Do you always tell the truth, Robert? I try to. Noble fellow. But don't expect too much of us ordinary mortals. Spare our weaknesses. What weaknesses? Anything you like, my dear Frida. Buying... Musical cigarette boxes, for instance, I'm sure that's a weakness. No making rather too much use of one's little country cottage. I think that too, in certain circumstances, might be described as a weakness. Did you mean Martin's cottage? I hardly ever went there. No, I wasn't thinking of Martin's. Must be thinking of another one. Perhaps your own? No, I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, care. what's all this about? Are you starting now, Stanton? Oh, certainly not. Well, I want to get to the bottom of this Martin business. And it's up to you, Alwyn. You were the last to see Martin. Why did you go to see him like that? Was it about the missing money? Yes, it was. Gordon, I want to go home now. Oh, so soon, Betty. Well, I'm going to have an awful headache if I stay any longer. I'm going home to bed. All right, just a minute. Well, I'll take you along, Betty, if Gordon wants to stay on. No, I want Gordon to come along too. All right, I'll come along, but hang on a minute. I, I tell you, I want to go now. Take me home. Well, what's the matter, Betty? Well, I don't know. I'm stupid, I suppose. All right, we'll go. Well, I'll come along too. Betty, I I'm awfully sorry if all this stuff has upset you. I, I know it's nothing to do with yeah. you anyway. Oh, don't go on and on about well, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Well, I'll see these infants home and then turn in myself. Very good of you. Yes, isn't it? Good night. Good night, Charles. And now, Alwyn, you can tell me exactly why you rushed to see Martin like that about the missing money. We're all being truthful now, are we? I want to be. What about you, Frida? Yes, 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 I don't care. What does it matter? Queer way of putting it. Is it? You started all this, you know, Robert. Now it's your turn. Will you be truthful with me? Good God, yes, of course I will. But it's not my turn. I asked you a question that you haven't answered. I know you have. But I'm going to ask you one before I do answer yours. I've been wanting to do it for some time, but I've never had the chance or never dared. Now I don't care. It might as well come out. Robert, did you take that money? Did I take the money? Yes. Of course not. You must be crazy, Alwyn. Oh. <laughs> but do you think even if I had taken it, I'd have let poor Martin shoulder the blame like that? But Martin took it, of course. We all know that. Oh, what a fool I've been. I don't understand. 
Surely you must have known that Martin took it. You can't have been thinking all this time that I did. Yes, I have. And I've not been thinking it. I've been torturing myself with it. But why? Why? Oh. Damn it all, it doesn't make sense. Well, I, I might have taken the money, but never on earth could I have let somebody else, and especially Martin, take the blame for it. I thought you were a friend of mine, or one of my best and oldest friends. Might as well know, Robert. Oh, no, Frida, please, please. Oh, why not? What does it matter? You might as well know, Robert. And how you can be just so dense baffles me that Alwyn is not a friend of yours. Oh, of course she She's is. She's not. She's a woman who's in love with you. Oh. A very different thing. She's been in love with you for ages. Frida, that's damnably unfair. It's cruel, cruel. Well, it's not going to hurt you. And he wanted the truth. Let him have it. I, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Alwyn. I suppose I've been stupid. We've always been very good friends, and I've always been very fond of you. Stop, stop. Oh, Frida, that was unforgivable. You'd no right to say that. But it's true, isn't it? Alwyn's been in love with you for ages. Wives always are aware of these things, you know. And not only that, I'll tell you now what I've longed to tell you for some time, that... I think you're a fool for not being aware of it yourself. For not having responded to it. For not having done something drastic about it long before this. If somebody loves you like that, for God's sake, enjoy it. Make the most of it. Hold on to it before it's too late. Frida, I understand now. Understand what? About you. I ought to have understood before. If you mean by that that you understand now that Frida doesn't care for me very much, you're right. We've not been very happy together. Somehow our marriage hasn't worked. Nobody knows. Of course they know. Do you mean you've told them? No, of course I haven't told them. They didn't need to be told. But Alwyn here has just said she understood about it for the first time. No, I knew about that before, Robert. It was something else I've just... Well, what is it? I'd rather not explain. Being noble now, Alwyn? You needn't, you know, we're past that. No, it's not that. It's, it's because I couldn't talk about it. There's something horrible to me about it. And I can't tell you why. Oh, I'm when... sorry I said I understood. It slipped out, please. Very well. But you've got to talk about that money now. You said you believed all along that Robert had taken it. It looked to me as if he must have done. But if you believed that, why didn't you say something? Oh, Robert, can't you see why she couldn't? You mean she was shielding me? Yes, of course. Alwyn, I'm terribly sorry. I, I had no idea. No, it's fantastic, I must say. It's what yes, I it's said. I've been torturing myself with If you're in love with somebody, you're in love with them. They can be as mean as hell and you'll forget them or just not bother about it. Well, at least some women will. I don't see you doing it, Frida. Don't you? There are a lot of things about me you don't see. This is what I wanted to say, Alwyn. If you thought that Robert had taken that money, then you knew that Martin didn't. Yes, I was sure, after I'd talked to him that last night, that Martin hadn't taken it. But you let us all think he had. I know, I know. But it didn't seem to matter then. It couldn't hurt Martin anymore. He wasn't there to be hurt. And I felt I had to keep quiet. Because of me? Yes, because of you, Robert. But Martin must have taken no. it. That's why he did what he did. He thought he'd be found out. No, it wasn't that at all. You must believe me. I'm positive that Martin never touched that money. I've always thought it queer that he should. Oh, I know he could be wild and rather cruel sometimes, but... He couldn't be a cautious, cunning little sneak thief. It wasn't his style at all, and he didn't care enough about money. He spent enough of it. He was badly in debt, you know. Yes, but that's just the point. He didn't mind being in debt. He could have cheerfully gone on being in debt. Money simply didn't matter to him. Now, you loathe being in debt. You're entirely different. Yes, that was one of the reasons I thought that you... Yes, I, I see that. Though I think those fellows who don't care about money, who don't mind being in debt, are just the sort of fellows who help themselves to other people's. Yes, but not in a cautious, sneaky way. That wasn't like Martin at all. I wonder... Alwyn, where did you get the idea that I'd taken it? 
Why, because Martin himself was sure that you had taken it. He told me so. Martin told you so? Yes. Why should he have thought that? Well, you thought he'd been the thief. You didn't know him any better, it is. Yes, but that's different. There were special circumstances. And I'd been told something. You say you'd been told something? But then Martin had been told something, too. He'd practically been told that you'd taken the check. My God. And do you know who told him that you'd taken the check? I can guess now. Who? Stanton, wasn't it, Alvin? Yes, Stanton. But Stanton told me that Martin had taken that check. My oh, but He God. practically he... proved it to me. He said he didn't want Martin given away, said we'd all stand in together, all that sort of thing. Don't you see, he told Martin all that, too. And Martin would never have told me if he hadn't known, well, that I would never give you away. Stanton. It was Stanton himself who got that money. It looks like it. I'm sure it was, and he's capable of it. You see, he played Martin and Robert against one another. Mm. <laughs> Could you have anything more vile? You know, it doesn't follow that Stanton himself was the thief. Of course he was. Wait, let's get this clear. Old Slater wanted some money, and your father signed a bearer check for 500. A check was on your father's desk. Slater didn't turn up the next morning, as he said he would, and when he did turn up three days afterwards, the check wasn't there. Meanwhile, it had been taken to the bank and cashed. Only Stanton, Martin, or I could have got at the check, except dear old Watson, who certainly didn't take it. And this is the point. They said the fellow who cashed the check was about Martin's age or mine. They were rather vague, I gathered, but what they did remember of him certainly ruled out Stanton himself. Mr. Whitehouse wouldn't have you identified at the bank, I remember. No. Father was too fond of them all and too hurt. But what made you believe Martin had taken the check? The evidence pointed to Martin and me, and I knew I hadn't taken it. And Stanton told Stanton you... Stanton told me he'd seen Martin coming out of your father's room. Stanton told Martin he'd seen you coming out of that room. Stanton took the money himself. Whether he took the money or not, Stanton's got to explain this. No wonder he didn't approve of this business and was glad to get out of it. He's got too much to hide. We've all got too much to hide. Then we'll get some daylight into it for once, if it kills us. Stanton's got to explain this. Chantbury one, too. They've probably all gone to bed. Are you going to get them all to come back, Robert? Yes. Uh, hello, is that you, Gordon? Has Stanton gone to bed yet? He hasn't. Well, I want you both to come back here. Yes, more and more of it. It's damned important. Yes, we're all in it. Oh, no, of course not. We can keep Betty out of it. All right, then. Be as quick as you can. They're coming back. All of them? No, not Betty. She's going to bed. Wise little Betty. I don't see why you should use that tone of voice, Alvin. As if Betty was cleverly dodging something. You know very well she's not mixed up in this business. Do I? No, but hang it all, Alwyn. You've no right to sneer at Betty like that. You know very well it's better to keep her out of all this. No, we mustn't soil her pure young mind. That was Obviously, you dislike her, Alwyn. I can't imagine why. She's always had a great admiration for you. Well, I'm sorry, Robert, but I can't return her admiration, except for her looks. I don't dislike her, but... Well, I can't be as sorry for her as I'd like to be or ought to be. You can't be sorry for her. Is it necessary for you or anybody else to be sorry for? You're talking wildly now, Alwyn. I suspect not, Robert. And anyhow, it seems to be our evening for talking wildly. <laughs> also, I'm now facing a most urgent problem. The sort of problem that only women have to face. If a man has been dragged back to your house to be told he's a liar and a cad and a sneak and possibly a thief, ought you to make a few sandwiches for him? You'll get no sandwiches from me. No sincerity, no sandwiches. That's your motto, isn't it? No? <laughs> oh, dear. How heavy we are without Martin. Oh, don't look so dreadfully solemn, you two. It might be a bit brighter, just for a minute. I'm afraid we haven't got your light touch, my dear Frida. I suppose I feel like this because, in spite of everything, I feel like a hostess expecting company, and I can't help thinking about bright remarks and sandwiches. Here they are. You let them in, Robert. Right. Have you really known a long time? 
guess. It is more than a year. I've often wanted to say something to you about it. What would you have said? I don't quite know. Something idiotic. Friendly. Very friendly. And I only guessed about you tonight, Frida. And now it all seems so obvious. I can't think why I never guessed before. Neither can I. <laughs> this is quite mad, isn't it? Quite mad. And rapidly getting madder. I don't care, do you? It's rather a relief. Yes, it is, in a way. But it's rather frightening, too. Like being in a car when the brakes are gone. And there are crossroads and corners ahead. Uh, I can't see why. Well, I'm sorry about this, Frida, but it's Robert's doing. He insisted on our coming back. Well, I think Robert was right. That's a change, anyway. Well, what's all this about? Chiefly about that money, Gordon. Well, hell, I thought as much. Why can't you leave poor Martin alone? Wait a minute, Gordon. Martin didn't take that check. What? Is this true, Robert? Are you sure? Yes, we are sure. You know, I never could understand that. It wasn't like Martin. Do you really believe that Martin didn't get that money? And if he didn't, who did? And if he didn't, why did he shoot himself? Stanton, we don't know. But we're hoping that you'll tell us. Being funny, Robert? Not a bit. I wouldn't have dragged you back here to be funny. You told me, didn't you, that you were practically certain that Martin took that check? Certainly I did. And I told you why I thought so. All the evidence pointed that way. What happened afterwards proved that I was right. And if it did, then why did you tell Martin that you thought Robert had done it? Don't be ridiculous, Frida. Why should I tell Martin that I thought Robert had done it? Yes, why should you? That's what we want to know. Of course I didn't. Yes, you did. Alwyn, are you in this too? Yes, I'm in it too. Because you lied like that to Martin, telling him you were sure that Robert took the check, you've given me hours and hours and hours of misery. But I never meant to, Alwyn. It was a mean, vile lie. After this, I feel that I never want to speak to you again. I'm sorry, Alwyn. I'd rather anything have happened than that. You'd better stop lying now, Stanton. You've done enough. Why did you play off Martin and me against each other like that? Well, there can only be one explanation, because he took the check himself. My God. You didn't, did you, Stanton? Yes, I did. Then you're a rotten swine, Stanton. Oh, I don't care about the money. But you let Martin take the blame. You let everybody think he was a thief. Don't be such a hysterical young fool. Keep quiet and stop waving your hands at me. You don't want this to develop into a free fight. But you let Martin... I did not let Martin take the blame, as you call it. It happened that in the middle of all the fuss about this money, he went and shot himself. You all jumped to the conclusion that it was because he'd taken the money and was afraid of being found out. I let you go on thinking it, that's all. But you deliberately tried to fasten the blame onto Martin or me. Of course he did. It makes it so foul. Not really. I had not the least intention of letting anybody else be punished for what I'd done. I knew I could square it up in a week, and I knew, too, that if necessary, I could make it all right with old Slater, who's a sportsman. But when it all came out, I'd got to play for time, and that seemed to me the easiest way of doing it. But you couldn't have cashed the cheque at the bank yourself. No, I got somebody else to do that. Huh? A fellow who could keep his mouth shut. It was pure coincidence that he was a fellow about the same age and build as you and Martin. Don't go thinking there was any deep laid plot there wasn't. There never is in real life. It was all improvised and haphazard and damn stupid. Why didn't you confess to this before? Why the devil should I? Martin's suicide put paid to the whole thing. Nobody wanted to talk about it after that. Dear Martin must have done it, so we won't mention it. That was the line. It wasn't the 500. I'd have been glad to replace that. But I knew damned well that if I confessed, the old man would have had me out of the firm in two minutes. I wasn't one of his pets like you and Martin. If the old man had thought for a minute that I'd done it, there'd have been none of this hush-hush business. He'd have felt like calling the police. Don't forget, I'd been a junior clerk in the office. You fellows hadn't. Oh, it makes a difference, I can tell you. But my father's been retired from the firm for six months. Well, what if he has? The whole thing was over and done with. Why open it up again? It might never have been mentioned if you hadn't started on this damn fool inquisition tonight. 
Robert Gordon and I were all working well together in the firm. What would have happened if I'd confessed? Where are we? Who's better off because of this? Well, you're not, it's true, but Martin is. And the people who cared about Martin. Are they? Well, of course they are. Don't be too sure. At least we know now that he wasn't a mean thief. And that's all you do know. But for all that, he went and shot himself. Martin shot himself. And he did it knowing that he'd never touched the money. So it must have been something else. Well, what was it? You see what you've started now? Well, what have we started? I'm talking now as if you knew a lot more about Martin than we did. What I do know is that he must have had some reason for doing what he did. And that if it wasn't the money, it must have been something else. Perhaps he did it because he thought I'd taken the money. Oh, and then again, perhaps not. If you think Martin would have shot himself because he thought you'd taken some money, then you didn't know your own brother. Why, he laughed when I told him it amused him. A lot of things amused that young man. That's true, I know. He didn't care. He didn't care at all. Look here. Do you know why Martin did shoot himself? No. How should I? You talk as if you do. I can imagine reasons. And what do you mean by that? I mean he was that sort of chap. He'd got his life into a mess. Well, I don't think... I that it... don't blame him. Oh, you don't blame him. And who are you to blame him or not to blame him? You're not fit to mention his name. You hung your mean little piece of thieving around his neck, tried to poison our memory of him, and now, when you're found out and Martin's name is cleared of it, you want to begin all over again and start hinting that he was a criminal or a lunatic or something. That's true. The less you say now, the better. The less we all say, the better. You should have thought of that before... I told you as much before you began dragging all this stuff out. Like a fool, you wouldn't leave well alone. Anyway, I've cleared Martin's name. You've cleared nothing yet. And if you'd a glimmer of sense, you'd see it. But now I don't give a damn. You're going to get all you ask for. Well, the things we shall ask for is to be rid of you. Do you really think you'll be able to stay on at the firm after this? I don't know and I don't care. Well, you did a year ago. Yes, but now I don't. I can get along better now without the firm than they can without me. Well, after this, at least it will be a pleasure to try. You always hated Martin, and I knew it. I had my reasons. Unlike the White House family, father, daughter, and son, who all fell in love with him. Does that mean anything, Stanton? If it doesn't, just take it back now. If it does, you'll kindly explain yourself. I'll take nothing back. Stanton, please, don't let's have any more of this. We've all said too much already. I'm sorry, Alvin, but you can't blame me. I'm waiting for your explanation. And don't you see? It's me he's getting at. Is that true, Stanton? Well, I'm certainly not leaving her out. Be careful. It's too late to be careful. Why do you think Frida's been so angry with me? There's only one reason that I've known it for a long time. She was in love with Martin. Frida, <laughs> is it true? Yes. Has that been the trouble all along? Yes, all along. When did it begin? Mm, a long time ago. Or oh, it seems a long time ago, ages. Before we were married? Yes. I thought I could break it then. I did for a little time. But it came back worse than ever. I wish you'd told me. Why didn't you tell me? I wanted to. Uh, oh, hundreds of times I seem to have tried to. I, I said the opening words to myself, you know. Sometimes I've hardly known whether I didn't actually say them out loud to you. Oh, I wish you had. I wish you had. Oh, why didn't I see it for myself? It seems plain enough now. Oh, I must have been a fool. I know now when it began. It was when we were all down at Tintagel that summer. Yes, that's where it began. Tintagel. That lovely, lovely summer. <laughs> Nothing's ever been quite real since. Martin went away walking, and you said you'd stay a few days with the Hutchinsons. Yes. Was that? 
Martin and I spent that little time together, of course. <laughs> it was the only time we really did spend together. It didn't mean much to him. A sort of experiment, that's all. But didn't Martin care? No, not really. Oh, if he had have done, it would have been all so simple. That's why I never told you. And I thought that when we were married, it would be different. It wasn't fair to you, I know. But I thought it would be all right. So did Martin. But it wasn't. You know that too. But why didn't Martin himself tell me he knew how unhappy I was? He couldn't. He was rather afraid of you. Martin? Afraid of me? Yes, he was. Nonsense. He wasn't afraid of anybody. Certainly not of me. Oh, yes, he was in a queer way. That's true, Robert. He was. I knew that. So did I. He told me that when you're really angry, you'll stop at nothing. Queer. I never knew Martin felt like that. But it was he who... I wonder why. What was it? Frida, it, it, it couldn't have no, been this. No, no, he didn't care. Don't. That's how it goes on, you see, Kaplan. A good evening's work, this. I'm not regretting it. I'm glad all this has come out. I wish to God I'd known earlier, that's all. What difference would it have made? You couldn't have done anything? To begin with, I'd have known the truth. And then something might have been done about it. I wouldn't have stood in their way. Oh, yeah. you didn't stand in their way. No, it was Martin himself, you see. He didn't care, Streeter says. I knew told me about it. Martin told you? Yes. Frieda's brother. Well, why should I lie about it? Martin told me. He used to tell me everything. Oh, rubbish. He thought you were a little nuisance. Always hanging about That's him. That's not true. It is. He told me so that that very last Saturday when I took him the cigarette box. Frieda, you're making this up. Every word of it. I know you are. Martin would never have said that about me. You're just saying this because you're jealous. I'm not. You've always been jealous of Martin's interest in me. God, that, that's simply disgusting. Now, it isn't. It is. He told me himself how tired he was of your hanging about him and suddenly becoming hysterical. Oh, I see what he meant now. Every time he's been mentioned tonight, you've been hysterical. What are you trying to persuade me into believing you are? Frida, you're mad. It's all jealousy. Jealousy. If he thought I was a nuisance, Martin wouldn't have kept asking me down to the cottage. But he was tired of you pestering him and worrying him all the time. He didn't care for women. He was sick of them. He told me so. He wanted me to tell you so that you'd leave him alone. Oh, you make me feel sick. Well, you just leave me Stop alone. Stop it. Stop it. Both of you. Oh, let them have it out. They might as well now they've started. And I was going to tell you too, Frida. Only then he killed himself. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, Gordon. I... Martin couldn't have been so cruel. Couldn't he? Well, what did he say to you that afternoon when you took in the cigarette box? Oh, what does it matter what he said? You're, you're just making up these abominable lies. Look here, I'm not having any more of this. You're like a pair of lunatics, screaming at each other like that over a dead man. I understand about you, Frida, and I'm sorry. But for God's sake, keep quiet about it now. I can't stand any more. As for you, Gordon, you, you must be tight or something. I'm not. I'm as sober as you are. Well, behave as if you were. You're not a child. I know Martin was a friend of yours. Friend of mine? He wasn't a friend of mine. He talked like a fish. Martin was the only person on earth I really cared about. I couldn't help it. There it was. I'd have done anything for him. Five hundred pounds. My God, I'd have stolen five thousand pounds from the firm if Martin had asked me to. He was the most marvellous person I'd ever known. Sometimes I tried to hate him. Sometimes he gave me a hell of a time. But it didn't really matter. He was Martin. And I'd rather be with him, even if he was just jeering at me, than with anybody else I've ever known. He didn't really care about women at all. He tried to amuse himself with them. But he really distrusted them, disliked them. He told me so many a time. Martin told me everything. And that was the finest thing that ever happened to me. And now you can call me any, any name you like. I don't care. What about Betty? You can leave her out of it. I want to. 
I can't help thinking about her. Well, you needn't. She can look after herself. That's just what she can't do, and she oughtn't to have to do. You ought to see that. Well, I don't see it. And I know Betty better than you do. Oh, you know everybody better than anybody else does, don't you? You would say that, wouldn't you? I can't help it if Martin liked me better than he liked you. How do you know that he liked... Oh, stop that. Stop it. Both of you. Can't you see that Martin was making mischief just to amuse himself? No, I can't. He wasn't like that. Oh, no. Not at all like that. You couldn't ask for a quieter, simpler, more sincere fellow. Nobody's going to pretend that he was that. But at least he didn't steal money and then try to put the blame on other people. We could all start talking like that, you know, Frida, just throwing things at each other's heads, but I suggest we don't. I agree. But I do want Frida and Gordon to understand that it's simply madness quarrelling over anything Martin ever said to them. He was a born mischief maker and as cruel as a cat. That's one of the reasons why I disliked him so much. Disliked him? Yes, I'm sorry, Robert, but I didn't like Martin. I detested him. You ought to have seen that. I saw it. And you were quite right. I'm afraid you always are, Owen. No, I'm not. I trust your judgment. So would I, for that matter. No, no. And you're the only one of us who will come out of this as sound as you went in. No, that's not true. No. It was Alwyn in that damned cigarette box that began the whole business. Oh, that was nothing. I knew all about that all along. You knew about that? I knew you'd been to see Martin Kaplan that Saturday night. You knew? Yes. But how could you? I don't understand. I was spending that weekend at my own cottage. You remember that garage where the road forks? You stopped there that night for some petrol. Yes, I believe I did. They told me. And said you'd taken the Fallows End Road, and so I knew you must have been going to see Martin. You couldn't have been going anywhere else, could you? Quite simple. And you've known all this time? Yes. All this time. I suppose, Stanton, it's no use asking you why you've never said a word about it. I'm afraid not. I think I've done my share in the confession box tonight. Well, I wish I'd known a bit more about it, that's all. There was I dragged into this foul inquest. Did I know this? Did I know that? My God. And all the time I wasn't the last person he talked to at all. Freed had been there sometime in the afternoon, and Alwyn was there that very night, at the very moment, for all we oh, know. don't talk rubbish. Well, is it rubbish? After all, what do we know? What was Alwyn doing there? She's told us that. She was there to talk to Martin about the money. And how far does that take us? What do you mean by that? He means, I imagine, that Alwyn hasn't told us very much so far. We know she went to Martin to talk to him about the missing money. We know that Martin thought Robert had taken it. And that she thought so, too. And that is all we do know. Yes. We don't know how long she was there. Or what Martin said to her. Or anything. It's a good job she wasn't pushed in front of that coroner. Or he'd have had it out of her in no time. I think it's up to her to tell us just a little bit more. Well, there's no need to sound so damned vindictive about it. Oh. Hello. What's the matter, Alwyn? There's someone outside the window. There's nobody there now. No, they darted away, but I swear there was somebody. They've been listening. Well, they couldn't have chosen a better night for it. It's impossible, Alwyn. And there isn't a sign of anybody. Thank the Lord for that. Oh, oh on earth can this be? Oh, don't ask me. I have the least idea. Go and see. Yes, I know, but we don't want anybody interrupting well, us now. Well, don't let them interrupt us, whoever they are. I have to see who it is. I thought you'd gone to bed, Betty. What's the matter? You're, you're talking about me, all of you. I know you are. I wanted to go to bed. I started to go. And then I couldn't. I knew you were all talking about me. I couldn't stand it. I had to come back. Well, you were wrong. As a matter of fact, you're the one person we haven't been talking about. Is that true, Robert? Yes, of course. You were outside just now, weren't you, Betty? Outside the window, listening. No, I wasn't listening. I was trying to peep in. To see exactly who was here and what you all looked like. You see, I was sure you were all saying things about me. And I meant to go to bed and I was tired, but 
I felt too excited inside to sleep, and so I took three of those tablets I have to make me sleep, and now I feel absolutely dopey. God knows what I shall be saying in a minute. You mustn't mind me. I'm so sorry, Betty. Uh, can I get you anything? No. Sure? And not a word's been said about you. In fact, we all wanted to keep you out of this. It's all rather unpleasant. Mm, yet seeing Betty's married into one of the family's concerned, I think she ought not to be too carefully protected from the sordid truth. Oh, shut up, Frida. I won't, and why should I? Oh, and I thought we should see a different Robert now. After what you've said tonight, Frida, I can't see that it matters much to you how different I may be. Perhaps not, but I still like reasonably decent manners. Then set us an example. Oh, shut up, both of you. But what have you been talking about, then? Began about the money. Y you mean that Martin took? Martin didn't take it. We know that now. Stanton took that money. He's admitted it. Admitted it? St but surely that's impossible. Oh, it sounds impossible, doesn't it, Betty? But it isn't. Oh, I'm sorry to go down with such a bump in your estimation, my dear Betty, but uh, this is our night for telling the truth, and I've had to admit that I took that money. Terrible, isn't it? But if Martin didn't take the money, then why... why did he shoot himself? That's what we all want to know. Alwyn saw him last of all that very evening, and she knew he hadn't taken the money. And that's all she's told us. I've told you that he thought Robert had taken the money. And that was enough in the state he was in then throw him clean off his balance. You've told me yourselves that he he was secretly rather frightened of me. It was because Martin had a respect for me. He thought I was the solid, steady one. I was one of the very few people he had a respect for. I tell you, it must have been a hell of a shock to poor Martin. I don't think it was, Robert. Uh, neither do I. But neither of you knew him as I did. Oh, what's the good of talking? He was in a wretched state, all run down and neurotic, and when he heard that I'd taken the cheque, he must have felt that there was nobody left he could depend on. That I'd let him down. He'd probably been brooding over it day and night. He was that sort. He wouldn't let you see it, Alwyn. But it would be there all the time, giving him hell. Oh, what a fool I was. You? Yes, of course, I ought to have gone straight to Martin and told him what Stanton had told me. If this is true, then the person really responsible is Stanton. Yes. Rubbish. It isn't. Don't you see what you did? No, because I don't believe it. No, because you don't choose to, that's all. Oh, talk sense. Can't you see Martin had his own reason? No, what drove Martin to suicide was my stupidity and your damned lying, Stanton. Oh. Sorry, Betty, but this has got to be settled once and for all. You're none of you in a state to settle anything. Listen to me, Oh, Stanton. drop it, man. Now you've got to answer. I'll never forgive you for telling Martin what you did. By God, I won't. You've got it all wrong. They haven't, you rotten liar. Oh, get out. You made Martin shoot himself. Wait a minute, Gordon. Martin didn't shoot himself. Ma Martin did. Of course he didn't. I shot him. Oh, that's ridiculous, Alwyn. You couldn't have done. Is this your idea of a joke? I wish it was. Alwyn. She must be hysterical or something. I, I believe people often confess to all sorts of mad things in that state, things they couldn't possibly have done. Alwyn. Not hysterical. She means it. But she can't mean... She murdered him, can she? You might as well tell us exactly what happened now, Alwyn, if you can stand it. And I might as well tell you before you begin that I'm not at all surprised. I suspected it was you at the first. You suspected I'd done it? Stanton, why? For three reasons. The first was that I couldn't understand why Martin should shoot himself. You see, I knew he hadn't taken the money, and though he was in every kind of mess, he didn't seem to me the sort of chap who'd get out of it that way. Then I knew you'd been with him quite late, because, as I said before, I'd been told you'd gone that way. And the third reason... Oh, well, that'll keep. You'd better tell us what happened, huh? It was an accident, wasn't it? Yes. It was really an accident. I'll tell you what happened, but I can't go into details. It's all too muddled and horrible. But I'll tell you the complete truth. I won't hide anything more, I promise you. I think we'd all better tell everything we know now. Really speak our minds. I agree. Wait a minute, Owen. Will you have a drink before you begin? I'll just have a little soda water, if you don't mind. Sit here. Thank you. 
I went to see Martin that Saturday night, as you know, to talk to him about the missing money. Mr. Whitehouse had told me about it. He thought that either Martin or Robert must have taken it. I gathered it was more likely Robert, so I went to see Martin. I didn't like Martin, and he knew it. But he knew, too, what I felt about Robert, and after all, he was Robert's brother. He believed that Robert had taken the money, and he wasn't a bit worried about it. I'm sorry, Robert, but he wasn't. I hated him for that, too. He was rather maliciously amused. The good brother fallen at last, that sort of thing. I can believe that. I hate to, but I know he could be like that sometimes. He was that day. You found that, too, that day? Yes, he was in one of his worst moods. He could be cruel, torturing sometimes. I've never seen him as bad as he was that night. He wasn't really sane. Colwyn. I'm sorry, Robert. I, I didn't want you to know all this, but there's no help for it now. You see, Martin had been taking some sort of drug. Drug? Do you mean dope stuff? Yes, he'd had a lot of it. Are you sure? I can't believe it. It's true, Kaplan. I knew it. So did I. He made me try some once. But I didn't like it. This made me feel rather sick. When was this? You remember when he went to Berlin and how nervy he was just then? Yes, I remember. Well, a fellow he met there put him onto it. Uh, some new drug that a lot of the literary and theatrical set were doping themselves with. But did Martin? Where... Yes. He liked it. Took more and more of it. But where did he get it? Well, through some German he knew in town. When he couldn't get it, he was pretty rotten. Not as bad as those dope fiends one reads about, you know, but nevertheless pretty rotten. But didn't you try to stop him? Of course. He only laughed. I don't blame him, really. None of you can understand what life was like to Martin. He was so sensitive and nervy. He was one of those people who are meant to be happy. We are all those people who are meant to be happy. Martin's no exception. Yes, that's true, but I know what Gordon means. You couldn't help knowing what he means if you knew Martin. No sort of middle state, no easy jog trot for him. Either he had to be gay, and when he was gay, he was gayer than anybody else. Or he was intensely miserable. I'm like that. Well, everybody is, aren't they? Except old and stuffy people. But what about this drug, Alwyn? Well, he took some. It was in little white tablets while I was there. And it had a horrible effect on him. It gave him a sort of devilish gaiety. I can see him now. His eyes were queer. Oh, he wasn't really sane. What happened? It's horrible to talk about. I've tried not to think about it. He knew I disliked him, but he couldn't believe I really disliked him. He was frightfully conceited about himself. He seemed to think that everybody young, male or female, ought to be falling in love with him. He saw himself as a sort of pan, you know. Yes, he did. And he'd every reason to. He began taunting me. He thought of me, or pretended to, as a priggish spinster full of repressions who'd never really lived. Oh, rubbish, because I'm really not that type at all. But he pretended to think I was and kept telling me that my dislike of him showed that I was trying to repress a great fascination he had for me. I'd never lived, never would live, and all the rest of it. He talked a lot about that. I ought to have run out and left him, but I felt I couldn't while he was in that state. In a way... I was sorry for him because, really, he was ill, sick in mind and body, and I thought perhaps I could calm him down. I might dislike him, but after all, he wasn't a stranger. He was one of our set, mixed up with most of the people I liked best in the world. I tried hard to stop him, but everything I said to him seemed to make him worse. I suppose it would when he was in that excited, abnormal state... Well, he talked about my repressions, and when I pretended to laugh at him, he got more and more excited. And then he tried to show me some beastly, foul drawings he had. Horrible, obscene things by some mad Belgian artist. Oh, oh, Frida, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I know how this must be hurting you. Oh, what? Don't listen to any more. I'll stop if you like. Go, go and lie down. Really? Well, if you'd known him as I'd known him before. I know that. We all do. He was different. He was ill. Go on, Alwyn. Yes, Alwyn. You can't stop now. 
Oh, there isn't a lot to tell now. When I pushed his beastly drawings away and was rather indignant about them, he got still more excited, completely unbalanced, and shouted out things about my repressions. And then I found he was telling me to take my clothes off. I told him not to be a fool and that I was going. But then he stood between me and the door, and he had a revolver in his hand and was shouting something about danger and terror and love. He wasn't threatening me with it or himself. He was just waving it about, being dramatic. I didn't even believe it was loaded. But by this time, I'd had more than enough of him. I couldn't be sorry for him anymore, and I told him to get out of the way. And when he wouldn't, I tried to push him out of the way. And then we had a struggle. He tried to tear my clothes, and we really fought one another. It was horrible. He wasn't any stronger than I was. I'd grabbed the hand with the revolver in it. I'd turned the revolver towards him. His finger must have been on the trigger. I must have given it a jerk. The revolver went off. Oh, horrible, horrible. I tried and tried to forget that. If he'd just been wounded, I'm sure I would have stopped with him, even though I was in such panic. But he wasn't. He was dead. God! You can't be blamed, Dolwyn. Of course she can't be blamed. And there must never be a word spoken about this, not to anybody. We must all promise that. Give me a cigarette, Robert. It's a pity we can't all be as cool and businesslike about this as you are, Stanton. I don't feel very cool and businesslike about it. But you see, it's not as big a surprise to me as it is to you people. I guessed long ago that something like this had happened. But it looked so much like suicide that nobody bothered to suggest it wasn't. It never seemed to me to be anything else. All the evidence pointed that way. I can't think how you could have guessed, even though you knew Alwyn had been there. And I told you I had a third reason. I was over fairly early next morning. The postmistress at Fallow's End rang me up. And I was there before anybody but the village constable and the doctor. And I spotted something on the floor that the village Bobby had missed. And I picked it up when he wasn't looking. I kept it in my pocketbook ever since. I'm rather observant about such things. Let me see. Yes. That's a piece of the dress I was wearing. It was torn in the struggle we had. I'll chuck it on the fire. Oh. So that's how you knew. That's how I knew. But why didn't you say anything? I can tell you that. He didn't say anything because he wanted everybody to think that Martin had shot himself. You see, that meant that Martin must have taken the money. That's about it, I suppose. It falls into line with everything we've heard from him tonight. No. No, there happened to be another reason, much more important. I knew that if Alwyn had had a hand in Martin's death, then something like that must have happened. And so Alwyn couldn't be blamed. I knew her better than any of you. I felt I did. And I trusted her. She's about the only person I would trust. She knows all about that. I've told her often enough. She's not interested, but there it is. You never even hinted to me that you knew. <laughs> Surprising, isn't it? What a chance I missed to capture your interest for a few minutes. But I couldn't take that line with you. I suppose even nowadays, when everybody's so damn tough, there, there's got to be one person that you behave to always as if you were Sir Roger de Coverley. And with me, you've been that person for a long time now. And I knew all along that you were saying nothing because you thought Robert here had taken the money and that 
he was safe after everybody put it down to Martin. And that didn't always make it any easier for me. No? What a shame. But what a fine, romantic character you are, aren't you? Steady, Betty, you don't understand. How could she? Why do you say that in that tone of voice? Oh, why does one say anything in any tone of voice? You know, Stanton, I nearly did take you into my confidence. And that might have made a difference. But I chose a bad moment. Why? When was this? Tell me. I told you I sat in my car that night for some time, not able to do anything. But then, when I felt a little better, I felt I had to tell somebody. And you were the nearest person. But you didn't go there that night? Yes, I did. I drove over to your cottage at Church Marley that very Saturday night. I got there about 11 o'clock or just afterwards. I left my car at the bottom of that tiny narrow lane and walked up to your cottage. And then I walked back again. You walked up to the cottage? Yes, yes. Don't be stupid about it, please, Stanton. I walked right up to your cottage and saw enough to set me walking straight back again. So that's when you came. <laughs> and after that, it was hopeless, I suppose. Quite hopeless. I think that added the last touch to that night. I don't think I've ever felt the same about people. Not just here, but everybody, even the people who walk into the office or sit opposite one in buses and trains since that night. I know that's stupid, but I couldn't help it. And you must all have noticed that I've been completely off country cottages. Yes. Even Betty has noticed that. <laughs> Why, what's the matter, Betty? <laughs> what a little liar you are, Betty. <laughs> We all been liars. But you haven't, Betty. Oh, don't be such a <laughs> fool, Robert. Of course she has. She's lied like fury. What about? Why don't you ask? Oh, what does it matter? Leave the child alone. I'm not a child. That's the mistake you've all made. Not, not you and, and Stanton. Is that what they mean? Why don't you tell them it's ridiculous? Oh, can she? Don't be absurd. You I... see, Robert, I saw them both in Stanton's cottage that night. I'm sorry, Alwyn, but I won't take even your word for this. Besides, there are other possible explanations. Oh, drop this, Captain. We've had too much already. I'm going. You're not going. Don't be a fool. It's no business of yours. Oh, that's where you're wrong, Stanton. This is where Robert's business rarely begins. I'm waiting for an answer, Betty. What do you want me to say? Were you with Stanton at his cottage? Yes. Were you his mistress? Yes. My God, I could... Why? Why, in God's name, why? Could you? Could you? How could I? Because I'm not a child and I'm not a little stuffed doll, that's why. You would drag all this out and now you can damn well have it. Yes, I stayed with Stanton that night and I've stayed with him other nights. And he's not in love with me and I know it and I'm not in love with him. I wouldn't marry him if I could. But I've got to make something happen. Gordon was driving me mad. If you want to call someone a child, then call him one, for that's all he is. This damn marriage of ours that you all got so sentimental about, it's the biggest sham there's ever been. It isn't a marriage at all, it's just nothing. Pretense, pretense, pretense. Betty, darling, Gordon, darling. But all the time he's mooning over his Martin. I was in love with him when we were married, and I thought everything was going to be marvellous. I wouldn't have looked at anybody else if he'd been real. But he just isn't there. He can't even talk to me. God's sake, shut up, Betty. I won't shut up. They want to know the truth and they can have it. I don't care. I've had nothing, nothing out of my marriage but shame and misery. Betty, that's simply nonsense. If I were the nice little doll you all thought me, perhaps it wouldn't have mattered. But I'm not. And I'm not a child either. I'm a woman. And Stanton was the one person who guessed what was happening and treated me like a woman. I wouldn't have blamed you if you'd gone and fallen in love properly with somebody. But this was just a, a low, sordid intrigue, a dirty little affair. Not worth all your silly lies. I suppose Stanton was the rich uncle in America who kept giving you all those fine presents. Yes, he was. You couldn't even be generous, though you'd have given your precious Martin everything we'd got. I knew Stanton didn't really care for me, so I got what I could out of him. Betty. Oh, it served you right. 
Men who say they're in love with one woman and keep spending their weekends with another deserve all they get. Is that why you suddenly found yourself so short of money that you had to have that 500 pounds? Yes. Queer how it works out, isn't it? Then Betty's responsible for everything. For all this misery. For Martin. You see, always Martin. If I was responsible for all that, then it's your fault, really, Gordon. Because you're responsible for everything that happened to me. You ought never to have married me. I didn't know. It was a mistake seem to make that kind of mistake in our family. I'm going to have a drink. I ought to have left you long before this. That was my mistake. Staying on. Trying to make the best of it. Pretending to be married to somebody who wasn't there. Simply dead. Yes. I think I am dead. I think I died last summer. Baldwin shot me. Oh, Gordon, I think that's unfair and also rather stupid and effective. It may have sounded like that, but it wasn't. I meant it, Alwyn. I began this, didn't I? Well, I'll finish it. I'll say something now. Betty, I worshipped you. I suppose you knew that. If she didn't. She must have been very dense. I'm talking to Betty now. You might leave us alone for a minute. Did you realise that I felt like that, Betty? Yes. But I didn't care very much. No, why should you? No, it isn't that. But I knew you weren't in love with me. You don't know me. You were only worshipping somebody you'd invented who looked like me. That's not the same thing at all. I didn't do much about it. I couldn't, you see. I thought you and Gordon were reasonably happy together. Yes, we put up a good show, didn't we? You did. Yes, we did. And what would have happened if we'd gone on pretending like hell to be happy together? Nothing. No? If we'd gone on pretending long enough, I believe we might have been happy together, sometimes. It often works out like that. Never. Yes, it does. That's why all this is so wrong, really. The real truth is something so deep you can't get at it this way. And all this half-truth does is to blow everything up. It isn't civilised. I agree. Well, you agree. You might as well. Oh, you'll get no sympathy from me, Captain. Sympathy from you? I never want to set eyes on you again, Stanton. You're a thief, a cheat, a liar, and a dirty chief seducer. And you're a fool, Kaplan. You look solid, but you're not. You, you've a good deal in common with that cracked brother of yours. You won't face up to real things. You've been living in a fool's paradise. And now, having got yourself out of it by tonight's efforts, all you're doing, you're busy building yourself a fool's hell to live in. I think this was your glass, Stanton. And now take yourself after it. Get out. Good night, Alvin. I'm sorry about all this. So am I. Good night. Good night, Frida. Good night, Charles. I suppose you're coming along, Gordon? Not with you, I'm afraid. And don't forget, Stanton, you owe the firm 500 pounds and a resignation. Oh, you're... Going to take it that way, are you? Yes, I'm going to take it that way. You'll regret it. Good night. Oh, no, don't trouble. I can find my way out. Don't be too hasty, Gordon. Whatever his faults, Stanton's a first-class man at his job. If he goes, the firm will suffer. I can't help it. I couldn't work with him after this. The firm will just have to suffer, that's all. Don't worry, it's not a case of the firm suffering. The firm's smashed to hell now. Nonsense. Is it? I don't think so. Well, Betty, darling, I think we'd better return to our happy little home. Our dear little nest. Oh, don't, Gordon. I'll let you out. Goodbye. Good... Why do you look like that? I'm not saying goodbye to you. I don't know you. I never did, it seems. I'm saying goodbye to your body, that's all. Robert, I can't bear seeing you like this. You don't know how it hurts me. I'm sorry, Alwyn. I really am sorry. You're the only one who's really come out of this. I know that. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? That you should have been feeling like that about me all the time. Yes, all the time. I'm sorry. I'm not. 
I mean about myself. I suppose I ought to be, but I'm not. It's hurt like anything sometimes, but it's kept me going, too. I know. And you see, now I've stopped going. Something's broken inside. It won't seem bad tomorrow. It never does. All this isn't going to seem any better tomorrow, Alwyn. Frida will help, too. After all, Robert, she's fond of you. No, not really. It isn't that she dislikes me steadily. But every now and then she hates me. And now I see why, of course. She hates me because I'm Robert Kaplan and not Martin. Oh. Because he's dead and I'm alive. She may feel differently after tonight. She may. I doubt it. She doesn't change easily. That's the trouble. And then again, you see, I don't care anymore. That's the point. Whether she changes or doesn't change, I don't care now. And you know, there's nothing I wouldn't do, Robert. I... I run away this very minute with you, if you like. I'm terribly grateful, Alvin. And nothing happens here, inside. That's the damned awful, cruel thing. Nothing happens. All hollow, empty. I'm sure it's not at all the proper thing to say at such a moment, but the fact remains I feel rather hungry. What about you all, when you, Robert? Uh, have you been drinking too much? Yes, I've been drinking too much. Well, it's very silly of you. Yes. And you did ask for all this. I asked for it. And I got it. I doubt if you minded very much until it came to Betty. Oh, that's not true. But I can understand your thinking so. You see, as more and more of this rotten stuff came out, so more and more I came to depend on my secret thoughts of Betty. I've known for some time, of course, that you were getting pretty sentimental and noble about her. And I've known some time, too, all about Betty. Of telling you. I'm not sorry you didn't. You ought to be. Why? Well, that kind of self deception is rather stupid. What about you and Martin? I didn't deceive myself. Well, I knew everything. Or nearly everything about him. I wasn't in love with somebody who really wasn't there, somebody I'd made up. I think you were. Probably we always are. And it's not so bad then. You can always build up another image for yourself to fall in love with. No, you can't. That's the trouble. You, you lose the capacity for building. You run short of the stuff that creates beautiful illusions, just as if a gland had stopped working. Then you have to learn to live without illusions. It can't be done. Not for us. We started life too early for that. Or possibly they're breeding people now who can live without illusions. I hope so. But I can't do it. I've lived among illusions. You have. Well, what if I have? They've given me hope and courage. They've helped me to live. I suppose we ought to get all that from faith in life. But I haven't got any, no religion or anything. Just this damned farmyard to live in, that's all. And just a few bloody glands and secretions and nerves to do it with. But it didn't look too bad. I'd my little illusions, you see. Why didn't you leave them alone instead of clamouring for the truth all night like a fool? Because I am a fool. Stanton was right. That's the only answer. I had to meddle like a child with a file. I began this evening with something to keep me going. I had good memories of Martin. I had a wife who didn't love me, but at least seemed too good for me. I had two partners I liked and respected. There was a girl I could idealise. Oh, no, and now... no, please, we know. No, but you don't know. You can't know. Not as I know. You wouldn't stand there like that as if we'd only just had some damn silly little squabble about a hand oh, at bridge. Frida, can't, can't you, you see? We're not living in the same world now. Oh. Everything's gone. My brother was an obscene lunatic. Oh, stop that. And my wife doted on him and pestered him. One of my partners is a liar and a cheat and a thief, and the other, God knows what he is, some sort of hysterical young pervert, and the girl's a greedy little cat oh, on the tiles. Robert, no, this is horrible, mad. Please, please don't go on. It won't seem like this tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow? I tell you, I'm through, I'm through. There can't be a tomorrow. <gasps> He's got a revolver in his bedroom. Stop, Robert, stop. Stop! Da 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 da. How many scenes did we miss? 
five, I think. I suppose he must have been telling a lot of lies in those scenes. That's why that man was so angry, the husband, I mean. Oh, listen to the men. <laughs> They're probably laughing at something very improper. No, mm. just gossip. <laughs> men gossip like anything. Of course they do. They've got a marvellous excuse now that they're all three directors of the firm. <laughs> what a snug little group you are. Snug little group. <laughs> Sounds disgusting. Enchanting. I hate to leave it. I should think you do. It must be so comforting to be all so settled. Mm, pretty good. But I suppose, Frida, you all miss your brother-in-law. He used to be down here with you too, didn't he? You mean Robert's brother, Martin? <laughs> I say, have I dropped a brick? I'm always dropping bricks. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. It was very distressing at the time, but it's all right now. Martin shot himself. Oh, yes, yes. Dreadful business, of course. He was very handsome, wasn't he? Yes, very handsome. Uh, Who was very handsome? May we know? Not uh, you, Charles. They were talking about me. Betty, why do you allow them to talk about your husband in this fulsome fashion? <laughs> you no know shame, girl. Gordon, darling, I'm sure you've had too much manly gossip and old brandy. Sorry to be so late, Frida, but it's that wretched puppy of yours. <laughs> What's he been doing now? He was trying to eat the script of Sonia Williams' new novel. I was afraid it might make him sick. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Miss Markridge, how we talk of you novelists? Yes, I hear you. I've just been saying what a charming, cosy little group you've made here. I think you've been lucky. Oh, it's not all luck, Miss Markridge. See, we all happen to be nice, easygoing people. Except Betty. She's terribly wild. Oh, that's only because Gordon doesn't beat her often enough. Oh. Yet. <laughs> we'll see, Miss Peel. Mr. Stanton is still a cynical bachelor. I'm afraid he rather spoils the picture. What's disturbing the ether tonight? Anybody know? Oh, Gordon, don't start it again. We've only just turned it off. What did you hear? The last part of a play. It's called The Sleeping Dog. Oh, why? We're not sure, but it ends with a gentleman shooting himself. What fun they have at the BBC. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> shot some things. I think I understand that play now. The Sleeping Dog was the truth, you see, and that man, the husband, insisted upon disturbing it. He was quite right to disturb it. Well, see, I wonder... I think telling the truth is about as healthy as skidding at 60 around a corner. And life's got a lot of dangerous corners, hasn't it, Charles? You can have, if you don't choose your route well. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. Who wants a drink? A drinks, Robert. Yes. And cigarettes. Oh, this box is empty. Oh, there's some in this one. Uh, Miss Mockridge? No, thank you. I'll win a cigarette. Oh, I remember that box. It plays a tune at you, doesn't it? Well, I remember the tune. Uh, La Traviata. I say, wait a minute, listen to this. Oh, I adore that tune. Uh, what is it? Can't we talk it over? What? Can't we talk it over? Oh. <laughs> Miss Markridge, will you dance? No, thank you, Gordon. I will. Come on, Gordon, let's dance. <laughs> that was Dangerous Corner, a play by J.B. Priestley with Flora Robson as Alwyn Peel. Frida Kaplan was played by Gudrun Yeur, Miss Mockridge, the novelist, by Mary Grew, Betty Whitehouse, Elizabeth Proud, Charles Stanton, Garrard Green, Gordon Whitehouse, Noel Davis, and Robert Kaplan, by David March. Harry Mason, brought to you by Tide, T-I-D-E, Tide. Procter and Gamble's new wash day miracle. Harry Mason, the famous character created by Earl Stanley Gardner, dramatized by Irving Bendig. Harry Mason, defender of human rights, champion of all those who seek justice. Tide is Procter and Gamble's new Wash Day Miracle. Tide is dirt. Dirt outside gets close to the 
find any soap. Hold on now, Franny. There's some pretty wonderful new soaps. I know it. And some absolutely sensational new sudsing products. I know that too, Bob. But I also know that Tide gets clothes cleaner than all of them. Yes, and I know it too, Franny. Tide gets clothes cleaner than any soap, any other suds, any other washing product known. That's because Procter & Gamble's Tide not only leaves clothes free from dirt, it removes dingy soap film too. Yet, with all this extraordinary cleaning power, Tide is safe, truly safe, for all your washable colors. What's more, Tide actually brightens soap-dulled colors. And in hardest water, Tide gets sheets, pillowcases, and towels whiter than any other washing product known. Keeps them white, too, week after week, never turns them yellow. And all this goes for your whole family wash, too. So, when you choose a washing product, remember this, no soap. No other suds, no other washing product known will get your clothes as clean as Procter & Gamble's Tide. Tide in, dirt out, T-I-D-E, Tide. Justice is fast catching up with him as taking quick countermeasures. These countermeasures involve Elise Scott, the girl who is so amazingly like Helen Henderson. And as you know, psychologist Dr. Marilyn Irma Schneider. We're going to visit Walter in a few moments, hear more of his strange and terrible scheme, but first to Perry Mason, who's making plans of his own. A moment ago, Perry, accompanied by his secretary, Dollar Street, walked into the office of Homicide Lieutenant Tragg, where we hear... <coughs> You two sit down any place. <coughs> Lieutenant Track? Yeah? Would you like to make me very, very grateful? Sure, if I don't have to move. Then would you say it's all right if I open a window? No, oh, I'll do it for you. You too warm? Oh, it's... Oh, it's a gar smoke. Really? Is it that bad? Oh. I realized it was so thick. <coughs> no, in a way, it's a shame to open it, Track. Huh? Think of the cigars you'd save. Yes, all you have to do now is inhale. You don't need to light another one. Uh, very funny. Well, anyway, thanks. I'm certainly grateful. And it's uh, not only cigar smoke you smell. Oh? Yeah. Uh, the deputy commissioner just paid me a visit. Oh, how nice. Yeah, nice. What you smell is my hide burning. <laughs> Trouble, huh? Plenty. All upset about no progress on Golick's murder. Oh, but couldn't you... Couldn't I tell the commissioner the case is about to break, that in a few hours we're going to arrest the killer, and the killer is probably the most important crook in the country? I could not must have been quite a temptation. Mm, it was. Probably would have been safe to tell him. Probably. Trag feels that the promise is promised, Ellen. Yeah, and, well, I think this deputy commissioner would have kept quiet, but, you know, guys talk. Uh, since we're this close to where we're going, he used very good judgment, Trag. Huh? We're all set? Grand jury meets in the morning. Good. So, after you and I iron out a few details... My men are already, Mason. We'll pick up Walter Bott as soon as I get a flash. The indictment has been returned. Good. And in line with that? Yeah. You have Bot followed? No, it's been a loose surveillance. Mm-hmm. We've kept up with him pretty well. We didn't want to make him suspicious. No, I understand. However, in the morning... Yeah? You can have your men start to move in. Expecting something, Perry? No, no, not expecting, but uh, Bot has interests all over the country. Yes, I'll say. And we don't want him leaving on a business trip just before an indictment is returned. Uh-huh. All right, Mason, I'll pass the word. And there's another angle track. You know, of course, that Helen Henderson will most likely <clears throat> have to appear before the grand jury. Yeah, I've been thinking about her. Uh-huh. Couldn't you present her sworn statement, keep her out of sight? Well, I'm going to try, but I'm afraid that's a little like your experience with the deputy commissioner. What? Helen's deposition saying that she saw Bot commit murder might be enough, but I think they'll want to hear it from her own mouth. And when you come right down to it, once we go before the grand jury, the cat is out of the bag. Mm. Be no chance for secrecy then. So I don't want Bot to have even an hour's notice if we can help it. Well, there won't be any delay at my end. Good. 
I'm going to get rolling as fast as possible. Of course, Helen will have a stronger effect on the jury than any statement. Mm. Yeah, I guess you're right. She's got to be there. Yeah, she has to be there. And she has to be protected. Now, I'll need another detail of your men, Trag. All right, how many and where? Well, use the detail at Trainer Street. They can escort Helen to and from the courtroom. But you'll need at least one more detail. For cars in front and cars behind. The whole treatment, huh, Perry? Yes. Now, as for the schedule. The jury meets at 9.30. Our party should arrive at the East Corridor... At 9.28. Yeah, I got it. The detail you've posted in the building can take over then. All right. Go, you sound like you're planning a military campaign. We can't take chances, but we'll make a move, Della. I should say not. So, can you think of anything else, Trag? Mm, no, that should cover it. Della, think of anything we haven't covered? No. No, I can't, Perry. Okay, Trag, you handle the details. We'll see you later. And so as Perry Mason and Homicide Lieutenant Trag complete their final arrangements... Lawyer Joseph Gerhardt Frederick Camp leads a tall, angular woman into Walter Bott's luxurious apartment. Now, they enter the vestibule. You'll have to wait here for a moment, Dr. Schneider. I'll tell them we've arrived. All right. Ah, Joseph. She's outside, Walter. Dr. Schneider? Mm -hmm. Good. Bring her in. All right. But, Walter. Yeah? You won't like her. She's a cold fish. Bring her in, Joseph. All right, Dr. Schneider. He'll see you now. Just walk right up to the desk, Doctor. So, you're Marilyn Irma Schneider, Ph.D., I believe. I don't know your name. That's true. But I assume that you're responsible for my freedom. To be scientifically accurate, my money is responsible. Even more accurately, about $25,000 of your money, if Mr. Kemp is to be believed. To say nothing of what you paid Mr. Kemp. It all comes to a sizable amount, Doctor. Well, I don't say thank you. What? I said I don't say thank you. Well, the boy... Wait, Joseph. It really doesn't matter, Doctor, but now that you've made a point of it, why not? You're no philanthropist. Analyzing my character, Doctor. Looking at facts. Psychologists deal in facts. Mm. And the fact is obvious that I'm expected to repay you. Well, didn't Mr. Camp explain? In a way... But I wanted you to know that I understand the arrangement perfectly. You affected my release. Therefore, I am in your debt. I'll work to discharge my obligation. But you're telling me you have no feeling of gratitude. I do not. You've bought my services. That's all. You know what I want you to do, Doctor? In a way. Camp said something about training a girl to serve as a double. And? Doesn't that interest you? It might, under certain conditions. Under certain conditions, it could be an interesting experiment. A very interesting experiment. But... Dr. Schneider, I believe when you fully understand, you'll be very grateful. Yes. I doubt that Mr. Camp explained the extent of the task we're going to put before you. Uh, just the outline, Walter. I see. Dr. Schneider, you're correct. Basically, ours is a business relationship. I repaid the uh, rather sizable amount you embezzled. Mr. Camp had the charges against you dropped. And in return, we expect... You have a task to perform, but quite aside from the business aspect, I think you'll be very pleased with this job. Oh? Why? Because I'm offering you the greatest experiment of your career. An opportunity an experimental psychologist has never had before. There are no limitations. No limitations. I want you to remake a personality, to remake a life. Your task will be to rip away the existing patterns of reaction and thinking, to rebuild, to recreate a totally different human being. I'm offering you clay, Dr. Schneider. Living clay for you to mold. Now, are you interested? Yes. Yes, I am. 
Yes, I'm very interested. But... What is it? It could be dangerous. Dangerous? To whom? The clay. Oh. You're speaking of fundamentals. Structure of the psyche. It could be... Dangerous to the clay. If you meant what you said. You meant what you said. Dr. Schneider, I always mean what I say. It's understood that I'll have a free hand. You will. And the danger? Danger? I don't care as long as the job gets done. Do you care about the danger to the clay? No. I thought not. There's something else, too. Yes. I've changed my mind. Oh. You were right. Now that I do understand, I am grateful. <laughs> Of course, the clay Walter Bott and Dr. Schneider referred to is Elise Scott. The girl Walter Bott once molded and trained in the image of Helen Henderson. So it's obvious that Perry Mason's precautions for his witness's safety are vitally important. But will they be enough? You better listen to us on Monday. With so many really good washing products being used, a woman has to be given a mighty good reason before she'll switch to a new one. Well, we think we can give you the best reason in the world for changing to Tide. Listen, Procter & Gamble's Tide will get your clothes cleaner than any soap, any other suds, any other washing product known. Tide leaves clothes free from dirt and more. Tide removes dingy soap film, too. Yet, with all this amazing cleaning power... Tide is truly safe for all your washable colors. In fact, Tide actually brightens soap dull colors. And in hardest water, Tide gets white things whiter than any other washing product known. So try Tide. Watch those suds billow up. Notice how different they look and feel. And see your family wash at its cleanest best. No soap, no other suds, no other washing product known will get your clothes as clean as Tide. Tide gets clothes cleaner than all of them. T-I-D-E, Tide. Harry Mason, the famous character created by Earl Stanley Gardner, is brought to you by Tide. Procter and Gamble's amazing new discovery for your whole family wash. Try Tide yourself. And you, too, will agree you've never used anything like it. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Perry Mason, brought to you by Tide. T-I-D-E, Tide. Procter and Gamble's new wash day miracle. Perry Mason, the famous character created by Earl Stanley Gardner, dramatized by Irving Bendig. Perry Mason, defender of human rights, champion of all those who seek justice. new soaps. I know it. And some absolutely sensational new sudsing products. I know that too, Bob. But I also know that Tide gets clothes cleaner than all of them. Yes, and I know it too, Franny. Tide gets clothes cleaner than any soap, any other suds, any other washing product known. That's because Procter & Gamble's Tide not only leaves clothes free from dirt, it removes dingy soap film too. Yet, with all this extraordinary cleaning power, Tide is safe. Truly safe for all your washable colors. What's more, Tide actually brightens soap-dulled colors. And in hardest water, Tide gets sheets, pillowcases, and towels whiter than any other washing product known. 
keeps them white, too, week after week, never turns them yellow. And all this goes for your whole family wash, too. So when you choose a washing product, remember this. No soap, no other suds, no other washing product known will get your clothes as clean as Procter & Gamble's Tide. Tide dirt of T-I-D-E, Tide. is all smiles. She nods a bright goodbye to Perry and Della as they detach themselves from the marching group. Now, as the lawyer and his secretary watch the group disappear around a turn in the corridor, Mason says, You spoke to Trag personally, Della? Mm-hmm. Told him that an indictment has been returned? Uh-huh. Well, what did he say? Oh, boy. <laughs> is that all? If he said any more, I didn't hear it because the good lieutenant hung up. Well, I guess he was in a hurry to get started. Very much of a hurry. He should be at Waterbots in no more than 15 minutes, Chief. Well, you're right. It has started. Mm-hmm. Let's get back to the office, huh? All right. What's the matter, Della? I don't know. Reaction, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, here we've been working like mad to get enough evidence against Walter Bott. Working like mad to get started. And what do I do? Make a phone call to Trag and we are started. <sighs> I guess that getting ready for something like this is always harder than the actual fight itself. Hmm? What's on your mind, Ella? Just told you. Mm-hmm. No, come on now. I know you better than that. What's on your mind? Helen. I thought so. She'll be safe. Even after Bart knows she saw him kill Goldie? Mr. Bart is going to jail. I well, know, Chief. And if it's humanly possible, I'm going to keep him in jail. Oh, in line with that. Yes? I wonder if it wouldn't be wise to phone the assistant district attorney. Oh, look at the clock. Hmm? 9.45. Noble won't be in his office until 10. Oh. Well, all right. Get back to our office. We'll phone him from there. Now, as Perry Mason and Dollar return to their office, Helen Henderson, under heavy guard, returns to the house on Trainer Street where Mason is keeping her. As homicide Lieutenant Tragg, armed with a murder warrant, approaches Walter Bott's apartment. Inside that apartment, we hear... Walter. Walter. Yes, Joseph? I came as soon as I heard. Oh, I know. The police are on their way with a warrant for my arrest. On a murder charge. So Huey informed me. And you sit there and play the piano? Joseph, now you're talking like truck. I uh, attended to several matters before I started to play. For example, these reports. We got them. Dr. Schneider... Well, she hasn't started training that girl yet. Well, not quite, but she's almost ready to start. Dr. Schneider is a methodical woman, Joseph. She believes in leaving as little to chance as I believe in leaving the chance. So, as these reports testify, before she starts making Miss Scott over in the image of Helen Henderson, she made a complete series of psychological tests. For example, this personality profile. What? Uh, outline of Miss Scott's character. Here we have the highlights and the low spots. The strengths and weaknesses of Miss Scott's character. Uh, very interesting, I'm sure, Walter, but don't you think we should discuss what's going to happen? While I'm gone? Truck has his instructions. Yes, yes, I know, but Truck isn't qualified. Truck has taken care of things for a few hours before. A few hours? I said I don't believe in leaving things to chance. I thought certainly you knew. No, I couldn't get bail. Not just you, Walter. But anyone indicted for first-degree murder is denied bail. 
I'll get bail. I'll get bail just because I'm me. Uh, what are you getting at, Walter? Joseph, my arrest is going to surprise a lot of people. Some who thought I was too powerful to be touched are going to be shocked. That's true. After this shock will come a thought. Can't you guess what it'll be? Why, uh, I don't know, Walter. That is... You mean you don't like to say? Well... You don't like to say because some of my men are going to begin thinking and wondering if Walter Bott is finished. They'll wonder when I'm arrested. And if I'm kept in jail like a common criminal, refused bail, the thinking could become more definite. Dangerous ideas, Joseph. Well... This is no time for my organization to be weakened by lack of faith in me. So? So, I'll demonstrate that Walter Bott is just as powerful as he was before he was charged with murder. I'll get bail. But I will because I must. I can see the necessity, Walter. But you don't see how I'll arrange it? Frankly, I don't. It's all a matter of being methodical, not leaving anything to chance. Excuse me. Yes? Oh, send him in. Who is it, Walter? Dr. Leslie Bruce. Who? Heart specialist. You must have heard of him. The heart specialist? Of course, but uh, what's he doing here? He wants to do me a favor. Bruce, do you a favor? (laughs) Is it so incredible, Joseph? Well, uh, well, no, no, Walter, but uh, Bruce is a big man. That's Bruce, all right. Well, Mr. Bart? I... Oh, doctor, this is my lawyer, Joseph Kent. It's a pleasure, sir. I... Thought I was to see you in private, Mr. Bott. Oh, don't be concerned about camp, Doctor. I really... Mr. Camp is my trusted associate. This is a confidential matter. It will remain confidential. And as I said, I want to see you alone. You don't understand, Bruce. I trust Mr. Camp. In fact, I was just telling Mr. Camp why you're helping me. No. No, you can't. No, Dr. Bruce. Can't I tell him about the investigation I had quashed for you, oh, so many years ago? That, uh, that slight irregularity in your narcotics inventory. You shouldn't have repeated that, Mr. Bott. Let's get down to business. Have you the preparation? Bruce! Yes, I brought it. What is this, Walter? You'll see. I have it in my bag. In this small green vial. Here. All right. There are two tablets in the vial, Mr. Bott. Mm. They're tasteless, odorless. Take them with water. You know their effect. Yeah. What are they, Walter? Why, uh, an amatol derivative, it I doesn't believe. matter what they are, Mr. Camp. Suffice it to say, they will accomplish the desired effect. As long as I take them with water... Well, I suppose that's all. Almost. I'll be leaving. I... What did you say? I want you available when I call. See that you are available. But, Mr. Butt, couldn't you get someone else? That is it. I... It's no, really Bruce, I... I'm counting on your eminent reputation to smooth the way. Well, just remain in your office. I will. Oh, and Bruce, I hope you didn't do anything foolish, such as providing a dangerous overdose. No, Mr. Bott. I would have if I dared. But I don't dare. That's all. You may go. Well, goodbye, Dr. Bruce. Well, that should take care of everything, Joseph. Well, then, I think I know what you're up to with those tablets. And I think it can work. As long as no hitch develops when you're booked. Isn't Sergeant Davis in charge of the desk at Central Station? Davis, uh, well, yes, but... Uh, oh, I know Davis is honest, but he's friendly to us. Mm-hmm. And... Yes? I see. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, don't try to stop. Yes, I want to see them. Show them. We'll soon learn how my scheme works, Joseph. 
Tell it, yes. They're outside now with the warrant. Joseph, it started. In actual truth, the fight between Perry Mason and Walter Bott started long, long ago. Walter Bott is correct. The final battle has now begun. And as we know, this is a battle to the finish. With so many really good washing products being used, a woman has to be given a mighty good reason before she'll switch to a new one. Well, we think we can give you the best reason in the world for changing to Tide. Listen, Procter & Gamble's Tide will get your clothes cleaner than any soap, any other suds, any other washing product known. Tide leaves clothes free from dirt and more. Tide removes dingy soap film, too. Yet, with all this amazing cleaning power, Tide is truly safe for all your washable colors. In fact, Tide actually brightens soap dull colors. And in hardest water, Tide gets white things whiter than any other washing product known. So try Tide. Watch those suds billow up. Notice how different they look and feel. And see your family wash at its cleanest best. No soap, no other suds, no other washing product known will get your clothes as clean as Tide. Tide gets clothes cleaner than all of them. T-I-D-E, Tide. Mason, the famous character created by Earl Stanley Gardner, is brought to you by Tide, Procter and Gamble's amazing new discovery for your whole family wash. Try Tide yourself, and you too will agree you've never used anything like it. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Madeline Carroll and Donna Michi in Dangerous with Heather Angel. Lux presents Hollywood. And our cordial thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, who make these programs possible by your loyalty to Lux Flakes. Two weeks ago, we made an announcement at the end of our program. By popular request... We are making that announcement again at the end of our program tonight. So please listen carefully and have your pencils ready at the close of this performance. Starred tonight are Madeline Carroll and Don Amici with Heather Angel in Dangerous, the gripping drama of a hard luck girl, a girl who unintentionally brings misfortune to those who know her, and how romance and happiness finally find a place in her life. Our guest is Miss Thelma Saxton, who has one of Hollywood's oldest odd jobs, and... Conducting our orchestra is Louis Silvers. Tonight, we welcome back to our stage our regular producer and host. Completely recovered from his illness, he'll be with us now as heretofore every Monday night. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Hollywood's pioneer, star maker, and director, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. And after nearly four weeks in the hospital, there's a new thrill in saying that old phrase. With these greetings, my sincere thanks go out to the hundreds of you whose thoughtful letters came like the voices of friends to brighten the long days. I know now what radio really means to the thousands of people imprisoned by illness. Lying there, I realized the great power of radio to cheer and comfort. And I was proud to be a part of it. And I thought, too, of the importance of 1938 as a milestone in motion picture progress. For this is the 35th anniversary of that historic film, The Great Train Robbery, which created the first screen star, Bronco Billy Anderson. Today, Bronco Billy's almost forgotten. And stars like Madeline Carroll and Donna Michi have inherited the royal ermine of international popularity. 
frequently termed the screen's most beautiful actress, wife of Captain Philip Astley, one of the personal guards of the King of England. It's difficult to picture Miss Carroll as the ex-school teacher who once went to London yearning to become an actress and ended up by tutoring again for $3.50 a week and meals. Hollywood knows Miss Carroll not only as a splendid actress, but as one of our most sincere and vigorous workers for world peace. Don Amici, son of a coal miner, left his law studies to become a stock company actor. Turning to radio, his success won him a screen test at MGM. The test was discouraging. And Don was soon back in Chicago, resuming his radio work. But 20th Century Fox brought him out for another try. And this time, stardom came rapidly. Now seen in, in old Chicago, Don's new film is called Josette. Our play is taken from the highly successful Warner Brothers film. Don Amici is Don Bellows. Miss Carroll plays Joyce Heath. And Heather Angel is Gail Armitage. And now, the Lux Radio Theater presents Dangerous. Bachelor apartment in New York City. In the tastefully furnished living room, Don Bellows, a rising young architect, stands at the telephone table. He's in a hurry. With the receiver propped between his shoulder and his ear, he wriggles out of his coat and hands it to his Filipino houseboy. Yes, of course, Miss Linder. Uh, here, take my coat, Carlos. Yes, sir. Oh, we'll be there, all right, Miss Linder. Yes, I'm stopping by to pick up Gail. All right, goodbye, Miss Linder. You out to dinner tonight, Mr. Bellow? Yeah, I'm late right now. Snap into it, will you, Carlos? Lay out my dinner jacket, draw a bath. Uh, no, never mind the bath. Did you ever try putting celluloid fish in the tub to entice him into it, Carlos? Gail, what are you doing here? I thought I'd save you the trouble of picking me up. Well, darling, you're a lifesaver. Uh, go ahead, Carlos. I'll have time for that bath now. Yes, sir. Oh, let me look at you, Gail. Oh, you're gorgeous, you know. Thank you. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> oh, what do you think? Did I love you? Well, I'm a little fond of myself this evening. The bank is going to make that building loan for the estates. John, oh, that's marvelous. Oh, miraculous is the word. All I have to do is put $100,000 in escrow. That much? But every cent you have is in that land now, John. Oh, don't worry about the petty cash. I'll come out all right. Unless I fall down, it'll be the most beautiful estates in the country. And I can't fall down. I've waited too long. I've worked too hard. It seems as though it's all going to come true, doesn't it, Don? Yes, I guess we have everything, young lady. Best of all, we have us. Yeah, the very best of all. Happy. Oh, hysterically. Why? Well, because... because I have very good sense. Mr. Bellows, you're a cad. <laughs> now hurry up and get dressed. We don't want to be late to the Linders. Oh, uh, uh, I don't suppose we could get out of, uh... We could not. Uh, no. You'll meet people there who can afford to buy your houses. <laughs> people who go to the Linders don't need houses. They need tombs. <laughs> <laughs> So nice to have you. Thank you, Miss Linden. Good night, Miss Linden. Good night, my dear. Good night. Well, that's over. Being the extra man at a Linder dinner party is like being the spare corpse at a wake. I could kiss you for getting us out, Ted. Well, now that we're out, what happens? You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go down and do the shooting galleries and honky tonks and things. Oh, slummy. Say, that's an idea. Of a sort. Say, I know a swell little dive over near the tracks on 10th Avenue. Sawdust on the floor? Up to your knees. Come on. <laughs> Well, uh, why doesn't somebody say something? Is this what's known as a den of iniquity, Ted? Well, sure, this place is tops in iniquity. Why? Well, I thought it'd be picturesque. It's, well, it's only sordid. Want to get out? Hmm, I think so. Well, let's go. Hey, Don. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. What are you looking at, Don? Uh, that girl over there. The one sitting alone. What about her? Oh, nothing much. She, uh... Just doesn't seem to belong here somehow. I noticed her before. She tosses them off like a stevedore. Let's get out. It's depressing. I'm ready. Well, it was a good idea, but it fizzled. I'm sorry I suggested it. Are you going to take me home, Ted? Sure. Then you won't have to make the trip, Don. We can drop you at the apartment. Hmm? Oh, oh, thanks, thanks. Hey, what's the matter with you? I was, uh, I was just thinking... Did you ever hear of Joyce Heath? Joyce Heath, the actress? Well, of course I have. She was a star about three years ago. I think I saw her in Camille. Yes, I did too. Whatever happened to her? I was speaking to a producer the other day, and her name came up. 
This fellow said she was never a star. She was a comet. She appeared suddenly, fell spectacularly, and disappeared completely. Uh, very poetical, but uh, why? Well, fantastic as it sounds, it was because of a jinx, one she put on other people. A jinx? Yes. It started when one of her leading men was killed on opening night. From then on, everyone who had anything to do with her seemed to run into bad luck. Divorces, failures, scandals, even suicide. It got so producers were afraid to use her. Actors wouldn't play, play with her. She got to believe it herself, finally, and she just disappeared. It's almost unbelievable. Yes, except for one thing. That woman I pointed out to you in that place. That woman was Joyce Heath. What? Darn, are you sure? I'm positive. I'd never forget her face. Oh, it's terrible. Well, why doesn't somebody help her? Uh, you can't help a jinx woman. I wonder. Well, this is you, Don. Oh, thanks. Uh, look, uh, just let me out at the corner. I'll, uh, I'll walk. Well, sister, what do you say? Want anything else? What's the matter? Can't I sit here? It's getting late, and you ain't paid for the last one yet. You'll get it. Take your time. Excuse me, uh, mind if I sit down here? No, not if you take her check. I wasn't speaking to you. Do you mind, miss? Do what you want. Thanks. Uh, two or whatever the lady's having. Right. I, um, uh, I've seen you before. Which doesn't exactly make us old friends. <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have had a more original opening. But I uh, came all the way back here just to tell you. It really doesn't interest me, if you don't mind. Uh, please, please don't leave. I want to speak to you, Miss Heath. What did you say? Joyce Heath. I? <laughs> Joyce Heath sitting alone in a dive like this. You must be crazy. Maybe. I have a very vivid recollection of her face, though. You see, Joyce Heath helped me once. It was a long time ago, and she never knew it, of course. I was just getting my start in architecture, and things were going pretty badly. I was discouraged, ready to quit. And then one night, I went alone to the theater. Joyce Heath was playing in Camille. I'll never know exactly what happened to me that night, but somehow it gave me strength, gave me the courage to go on. She was a magnificent artist. I'll always be grateful to her. Now you're a success, I suppose. Oh, fair one. Well, you don't have to thank me. No. There isn't much similarity, except in appearance. Lots of people look alike. Joyce Heath was electric, terribly alive. That's the way I saw her that night. Do you remember the deathbed scene? There was a dim light on the stage. You were lying on a couch. Armand is on his knees beside the bed. Your hand goes out and caresses his head. You say, I'm dying. Remember? I'm dying. I'm dying. But I'm happy, too. And my happiness conceals my death. But you will speak of me sometimes, won't you, Armand? Give me your hand. It isn't hard to die. I do not suffer now. One would say that life was restored to me. I experience a relief I never felt. I shall live. I shall... Miss Heath. Miss Heath. What's the matter? Is she out? Uh... Yeah, help help me get her out of here. Uh, get a cab, will you? Okay. I'm going to take her home. Right. Yes? <clears throat> Who is this? Good morning. Still in bed, men? You look very poorly. Do I? It won't surprise you to be told that I feel very poorly. Nope, it won't. Figuring the condition you arrived in last night. And just where did I arrive, if I'm not asking you to betray a confidence? Mr. Bellow's place. His country place. He's an architect. One of them fellows that draws pictures. Thank you. And I suppose you're Mrs. Bellows. Or are you just one of his sketches? Nope, I ain't. I'm his housekeeper when he comes down for weekends. How cozy. And Mr. Bellows, where's he? Eating his breakfast. And if you want to see him, you better perk right along, because he's got to get into town. Yes. I'm rather looking forward to seeing Mr. Bellows. Get out of here. Let me get dressed. Good 
Good morning. How are you, Miss Eve? Feeling better? No. I'm sorry. How did I get here? I brought you. I looked in your purse for your address, and there wasn't any. You had to have some place to go, Oh, so... don't bother with an alibi. It really doesn't matter. If I were looking for an alibi, I think you'd supply it. Look at yourself in the mirror. Take a good look. The only feeling you could arouse in a man is pity. Pity? You have the nerve to feel sorry for me. You, with your fat little soul and smug face, picking your way so cautiously through a pastel existence. Why, I've lived more in a day than you'll ever dare live. Pity for me. <laughs> That's very funny, because I've never had any for men like you. I've never... Oh, what the difference. Just now, you were as I'd imagined you'd be. Yes, playing a second-act speech at a third-act curtain. There might be a fourth act, you know. Not for me. And when you boast to your friends about how you brought me here, I wouldn't mention it was after I'd become a has-been. It might detract from the glamour of your adventure. Look, Miss Heath, I brought you here because... Because you were sorry for me. You already said that. It was more than that. Let's just say I brought you here because you're an actress whom I've always admired and to whom I'm grateful for some of the finest performances I've ever seen. I'm humiliated to the point where I must thank you. Well, now what? That depends upon you. Here. Take a look out that window. It's a nice country up here, isn't it? It's quiet and restful. A person could find peace here. You can only find peace in yourself. <laughs> and when you do, you might as well be dead. Rest in peace. It's for tombstones. And for the living? Desire. To want something. To work for it and get it. To live up every moment of it and then go on, leaving yesterday behind. On and on, higher and higher. Frustrated actress reads lines for small audience. No, oh, no, no, no. You'll go on. Talent like yours doesn't die. You were a star once and you can be again. Yes, an evil star, a jinx. You better run for your life. Oh, you can't possibly believe that superstition. Two men who loved me are dead. Some have been ruined financially. Successful shows are folded. How can I ignore it when everyone else believes it? When no producer in the country will risk giving me a part. Breakfast is ready. Uh, in a minute, Miss Williams. You'll, uh... You'll have some breakfast, won't you? No, thank you. If you're going into town, you can take me with you. Won't you stay out the week? No one's going to be using the house, and I can come down and bring you in Saturday. The rest will do you good. Helping Joyce Heath is like shaking hands with the devil. The worst luck in the world. I don't believe that. Do you really want to go back to the city? I don't care. Well, then you won't feel obligated if you stay, will you? Why should I? It doesn't make any difference. No, of course it doesn't. And you'll stay? Yes, yes, yes. But stop asking me questions. Go on, go back and boast to your friends about fishing joy teeth out of the gutter. You shouldn't say things like that. It isn't fair. I didn't ask you to help me. Of course you didn't. Goodbye, Miss Heath. I'll, I'll see you Saturday. So ends Act One of Dangerous. In a moment, Madeline Carroll and Don Amici will be back to continue with Act Two. Meanwhile, we've some fun for you. See how good your guess is on the odd knowledge questions I'm going to read to you. And just to make it more interesting, I've asked one of the ladies in our audience if she won't be good enough to come up here to the microphone and try her luck on them. I know we all like someone else to try his luck. Well, at least you can try your luck in the privacy of your own mind. And now I'm going to ask Miss Catherine Carlton of Portland, Oregon, who has just come up from the audience... Four simple questions. Here's the first question, Miss Carlton. In some countries, elephants wear silk stockings. Right or wrong, Miss Carlton? Well, that one's easy. Surely I'd say wrong. Well, strangely enough, the statement is right. In Borneo, sacred elephants wear hand-knitted silk stockings over their feet, and their stockings are changed daily. Number two, right or wrong? Good stockings, when new, will ordinarily stretch to 11 inches at the top, outsizes to 14. Well, on that one, I'd guess right. That statement is right. Good stockings, if they haven't lost their elasticity by careless washing, will ordinarily stretch to 11 inches at the top, outsizes to 14. Number three, answer right or wrong. Nobody wears stockings made of wire. Right. The statement is wrong. If you ever go to the Congo, look up Princess Watutsi. She wears a knee-length skirt and her hosiery is made of wire. Number four, 
For many women, stockings are the greatest single item of expense in their wardrobe. You said it. With a great many women I know, that's certainly right. Yes, that statement is correct. Five out of six women asked said they pay more to keep themselves in stockings than they pay for any other single item in their clothes budgets. But more and more women are reducing stocking expense by caring for stockings with Lux Flakes. Lux saves stocking elasticity, keeps stockings live and stretchable, so they give instead of breaking so easily into runs. Get a big package of Lux Flakes tomorrow. Lux your stockings after every wearing. Then they'll look lovelier, fit better, wear longer. Please listen carefully for the announcement which will come at the end of our program. Mr. DeMille. We continue with Dangerous, starring Madeline Carroll and Donna Michi. A few days have passed since Don left Joyce Heath at his cottage in the country. It's early Saturday afternoon, and he's returned to drive her back to the city. In the spacious kitchen, Mrs. Williams goes about her preparations for dinner as Don questions her concerning Joyce. Well, is that all you've got to tell me? She ate and she slept. Didn't she say anything? Well, she ain't what you call a chatty body. You could get more folksy conversation out of a snowman. <laughs> well, where is she now? Went walking toward the hill on the north meadow. Eh, I guess I better find her. That looks like rain to yes, me. it's going to rain right enough. When you're fetching her home. Well, whenever she wants to go. Why? <laughs> Lands, I was just talking, but I... I sort of wish she was gone. Why? Because it's different with a man like you. But a woman can tell a lot about another woman. She's dangerous, Mr. Don. A bad woman's got something that a good one ain't. Good women are jealous of that something and afraid of it. You can't say exactly what it is. But she's got it, and I'm afraid of her. For your sake. Sounds to me as if you've been reading some trashy novels, Mrs. Williams. In the first place, I don't find Miss Heath particularly charming off the stage. And in the second place, there's no concern of yours. I'll go and find her. She'll be out of your way by this evening. Miss Heath? Where are you? Miss Heath? Oh, there you are. Miss Heath. Wake up. Hey, come on, wake up. <laughs> oh. Oh, it's you. Yes, it is. It's you, and it's Saturday, and I went to sleep in a haystack. It all comes back to me now. It's also going to rain, and it's supposed to show very good sense to come in out of it. That's merely hearsay. <laughs> Gosh, you look much better. I feel it. I've enjoyed it here. Going barefooted, sleeping in the sun, and, and playing naiad in general. Now, just what is a naiad? Some sort of a wood nymph, I think, but I'm a little mixed up on my sprites. Well, even at that, a naiad becomes you more than a mainad. Fancy, and just what is a mainad? Well, Maynads were mythical women renowned for their beauty and charm. They attended the Dionysian revels and were always so carried away by the wild madness that they ended up by dancing hysterically over the edge of a cliff to destruction. Sorry, I'm too tired to be hysterical and my feet are much too sore from going barefooted to stand the job dancing off cliffs. Mm. By the way, I got the sermon. Thank you. I didn't mean to preach. I probably deserve it. Oh, here it comes. Come on, we'll have to run for it. Woo! Nyad and Maine had nothing. Mermaid, come on. <laughs> yes, just look at that rain. You know, I'm uh, afraid we won't make it tonight. I don't mind. I don't mind anything. I've had a good dinner, the fire's warm, and... Don't be surprised if you hear me purr. Did I tell you I saw you the opening night of Hedda Gabler? No. I think it was one of your best things. Do you? Which play would you prefer to do above all others? One I've never done. It's called But to Die. I wouldn't have to act it. I could live it. Well, why hasn't someone produced it with you? Well, the jinx woman of the theater? I noticed another play on your bookshelf. I'd like to play that sometime, too. Which one was it? A thing called Forever Ends at Dawn. Forever Ends at Dawn? I don't think I've ever read it. It has a beautiful last act. Wouldn't read it to me, would you? Sure you want to hear it? Oh, it'd be a treat. Well, just the last scene, then. All right. The locale is behind the front lines of the aviation post during the war. The principal characters are an aviator and a woman. She's not a nice person, but fascinating. 
The man has a wife or a, or a fiancé, I've forgotten which, with whom he's very much in love. However, he's intrigued by the woman, but quite nobly resists her charms. The second act ends with him receiving orders to leave at dawn. That's where the title line comes from. Here it is. Here. You may find some of the dialogue a little awkward in spots, but I'll try and make it convincing. I've never heard you yet when you weren't. Thank you. <laughs> Here we are. It's midnight. The room is illuminated by a floor lamp. Joan sits reading. There's a knock at the door center. She opens it to Richard. Joan. You at this hour? Richard, it was my last chance. You see, we're moving up at dawn. I've come to say goodbye and tell you what grand fun it was knowing you. It was, wasn't it? Joan, yes. Yes, of course. Only... I thought our goodbye would be different from this. Richard, it might have been, but you see, there was always... Joan, the girl in the back of your watch. It doesn't matter. Richard, it does matter, I tell you. It matters all the difference between you and her. Tonight and forever. Joan, her forever lasts until death do you part. Mine but till dawn. Tomorrow is where regrets lie, Richard. But there'll be no tomorrow for us, only tonight, which we steal from no one and forget as a dream which was no part of our normal lives, over which we had no control and for which we need feel no obligation. Is that the end of the play? Almost. May I, may I see that book, please? Of course. Thank you. It's not forever dies at dawn, is it? There is no such play, is there? You are making it up. Yes. You should be a writer, too. Where are you going, Don? For a walk. In this rain? I like walking in the rain. I'll go with you. I'd rather you didn't. Would you? Would you like me to leave here now? Would you like never to see me again? I'll go if you say so. You can't go. Because of the rain... No, because... Because I want you to stay. Oh, Don. Joyce, what... What's happened to us? I don't... I don't understand. Must we understand? It's happened. That's enough. Kiss me, Don. Don. Joyce, I'm... I'm going to take that walk by myself, I've got to think. I'll, I'll be back later. Will you have some more coffee, Mr. Bellows? No. Toast? No. Thank no. you. I've had enough. Is there anything wrong, sir? Wrong? What should be wrong? Uh, nothing, sir. Excuse me. Good morning. Joyce. How are you, Joyce? May I have some coffee, please? Of course. He didn't come back last night. No. Why? Joyce, I hate loose hands. They, they tangle your life and then trip you up. I... Yes, Don? Last night, I... I'm sorry I kissed you. I'm sorry I said what I did. If you didn't mean it, then I am too. Joyce, you... You don't understand. I'm engaged to someone. I'm in love with her. It's very gallant of you to tell me now. I was unfair to you too. I just lost my... sense of values. I regained them this morning, and I'm asking you to forgive me for last night. And for what I'm saying now, if it hurts. Hurts me? You delight me. You have the most amazing lack of humor I've ever known. Perhaps you think I meant it last night. I almost laughed in your face. Made me a little sick to think anyone could be so stupid to be taken in by a lot of old tricks. I thought you at least might be amusing. Instead, you turned out to be dull, stupid, and so afraid. But you needn't be. I won't upset your Sunday school romance or your oh-so-nice career. Hurt me. <laughs> Get out before you give me hysterics. Get out! Get out! Don, you 
came back, I was praying you would. I tried to leave. I drove halfway into town. They stopped me on the road. The bridge was out. I had to turn around and come back. And I was glad, Joyce. You didn't believe what I said. Please tell me you didn't. Perhaps I had it coming. No, no, you didn't, Don. No, it was a lie. Shall we forget it? Yes. But there's something I want you to remember. I know you belong to somebody else. And I don't want you, Don. But last night was mine, and I made it ugly this morning. I don't want you to think of it that way. I won't. You will, unless you know the truth. That night I came here. You took me in out of pity. That hurt my pride. And because I'm a good deal of a shrew, I wanted to hurt yours. I was going to tease you with all the tawdry tricks I knew until you tried to kiss me. And then I was going to laugh in your face. I was an actress playing a part, but I played it too well. Because when you took me in your arms, I didn't want to laugh. I wanted to cry. Oh, Joyce, darling, I'm... I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm glad. Last night was beautiful. It'll always be beautiful. And now that it's over... It I... isn't over, Joyce. It's got to be over. You've got everything ahead of you. Someone you love who can help you. I couldn't do that. I'm the kind of a woman who destroys, not builds. I'm Joyce Heathstone, a maynard who doesn't want to dance over the cliff with anybody as fine as you. Mr. Bellows. Yes? They just sent word up from town. You can get through now. Oh, um, thank you. You're welcome. You're going to go? Oh, I, I don't know. You've got to, because if you stay, it'll be too late. I'm bad for people. I'm a jinx. I don't want to be, but I am. So I'm being generous, Don. Kinder than I've ever been. And I can't be much longer. So go. Get away. Leave me. You can leave me, can't you? I don't know. I've, I've got to find out. Mr. Bellows? Oh, did Mr. Bellows leave? Yes. Is he coming back? Yes. Yes, I think he will. Oh, good evening, Mr. Bellows. Good evening, Anna. Is Miss Gale in? Oh, yes, sir. In the living room, sir. Thank you. Well, hello there, Mr. B. It was about time you were getting back. Yes, I know. I'm sorry, Gail. I... I was delayed. Well, at least I know what to expect when we're married. Sit down. Gail, I... I want to speak to you. It's going to be a little difficult, but... Has something happened? Yes, something's happened. Go on. Gail, there's... There's no woman in the world who... I'd be prouder to have as my wife... than you. And more than that, I... I have respect for you, for your integrity, your pride. If I could make myself respect you a little less, it would be all very simple. But I can't. So I've got to ask you a question. And I'm afraid I already know the answer. What is it, Don? If we were married, Gail, you know that... You, you know I'd live up to it, don't you? That I'd live only for you. I know that. I would, Gail. But if there were someone that, that, that I'd never see again, someone who had a, a strange fascination for me, with, which I couldn't destroy, would that make a difference to you? Even though I'd, I'd never see her? Yes, Don, it would. Whether you ever went to her or not wouldn't matter. But the fact that you'd want to would... It might make me love you any less. Perhaps more. But the agony of wondering when you kissed me, if you were thinking of her, the hate and dread I'd have of that other woman, the terrible loneliness for that part of your life I didn't own, that would be unendurable. Is... is that what you wanted to know? Yes, Gail. I can't tell you how much I admire you for being honest, Don. And... And thank you for coming to say goodbye. Gail, I... Goodbye. Oh, God. Oh. 
Who is it? Excuse me, miss. Will Mr. Bellows be staying for dinner? Mr. Bellows is gone, Anna. Oh, uh, will he be coming back, miss? Yes. Yes, I have a feeling that he will. You knew I'd be back. I've been waiting out here for you. Let's go inside. I want to talk to you, and I've got to drive back. Tonight? Yes. Go in. Well done. Sit down and listen to me. You and I are artists, Joyce. I'm an architect, and you're a great actress. I deal in permanency, things that endure. You and emotions, moments. I want to know, is there any consistency in the way you feel toward me? Tonight I love you so much that nothing else matters. Tomorrow should be the same. But tomorrows have betrayed me too often to promise them. That's the only answer I can give you. Well, it's an honest answer, Joyce. I'm not lady enough to lie. No, I don't think you would. Joyce, I broke my engagement. Why? Because of you. What about her? You ought to never mention her again. Except that I want you to know that she's finer and stronger than either of us. If she weren't, I wouldn't be here. Then I'm glad I'm weaker. And you are too, aren't you? Say you are. No. But I'm here. That's all I care about. Well, there are other things that are important to me. First, your career. Why should you concern yourself with that? They won't let me in a theater for fear it'll fall down. I've killed that superstition. You start rehearsing but to die for George Sheffield Monday morning. I? You're mad. Sheffield wouldn't risk it. You're to get the script from him tomorrow. Don, how did you do it? You didn't put your money in it? Yes. You fool, you crazy fool. Something will happen. I won't let you. I'm a jinx, I tell you. You're no such thing. You're a great actress. I'm so sure of it that I'm risking the money that was going to realize the one dream I've ever had. You're going to be greater than you ever were. Because if I'm going to... To marry Joyce Heath, it's going to be the Joyce Heath. Marry? As soon as the play opens, maybe even before. We can't. Why not? Because, because I won't let you. Not so soon. Don't tempt fate, Don. You don't know the chance you're taking. I don't believe in fate. I do. It was fate that brought us together. Then it'll keep us together. Oh, I hope so. Darling, I hope so. <laughs> Pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The curtain comes down on the second act of Dangerous. Our stars will be heard in Act 3 after the short intermission. Now we call forth another from that unsung group who helped make motion pictures, but whose names are little known outside of Hollywood. Tonight it's Thelma Saxton, who has appeared in nearly 50 films. And a touch of mystery is added when you realize that you've never seen her face and never heard her speak, but you have seen her hands, hands that have doubled for many of our loveliest stars. And I'm going to explain all that, Mr. DeMille, because if I don't, people are apt to get the impression that the hands of the stars are not beautiful enough for close-up shots. And, of course, most stars do have beautiful hands. First, Mr. DeMille, how much money is represented in a single scene of a big picture? Anywhere from a few hundred to many thousands of dollars, depending upon who and how many are involved in the making of it. And now will you tell us about how many minutes of a picture can be shot in an average eight-hour day? Well, yes, but who's interviewing whom, Miss Saxton? If we shoot five minutes of the final film, we're doing remarkably well. And that's where I come in. Now, suppose there's a scene in a picture involving, let's say, a letter. And suppose that the audience is first going to see that letter from a distance, and then in a close-up, in which the star holds it in her hands. For the first shot, the set would have to be arranged so the camera could shoot the letter from a distance. 
Then to take the close-up, the stars and all the people would have to wait around until the lights and the camera were rearranged. That minor detail might require anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, plus all the money represented in an idle cast. And to avoid that, Miss Saxton, we turn the letter over to the special effects department, which shoots it from the desired angle without requiring the star's presence. Exactly. And incidentally gives me a job. For special effects shots, my hands have held a basket for Carol Lombard and shown a manicure for Claudette Colbert. They've been tied to a stake for Gail Patrick and have dropped a cigarette lighter for Ida Lupino. They've turned a travel booklet for Sylvia Sidney, lifted the pages of a scrapbook for Francis Langford, and have written a sign with a cigar dipped in ink for Gracie Allen. They've dialed phone numbers, picked up flowers, unlocked doors, worn rings, and have stolen jewels. And with hands so valuable, you ought to protect them with steel mittens. No, Mr. DeMille, I expose them to as much wear and tear as the average girl, and perhaps a little more, because, being married, I run my own home, do my own dishes, and a little of my own washing. Naturally, though, I'm very careful of my hands, and when it comes to washing dishes, I wouldn't think of using anything except Lux Flakes. All you say about Lux on this program is absolutely true. When you wash dishes in Lux Flakes, you're really giving your hands a beauty treatment. They don't get a bit red and rough looking. I'm very happy to say a word for Lux because it's such a real help to me. I'm sure every woman will value your advice about Lux for beautiful hands, Miss Sexton. Have you any other suggestions? The only other thing I can remember doing to develop nice hands was a long time ago when I was a little girl. My father said that if I didn't stop biting my nails, the boys wouldn't like me, so believe me, I stopped. You, you've never had more than a finger in the motion picture pie, have you? Well, I played in Bulldog Drum and Strikes Back, but the girl was dead, so they covered me up with a sheet, and all you could really see was my hand holding a piece of evidence. The most work I ever did in a single picture was for Carol Lombard in Hands Across the Table. She was a manicurist, you know, and I held hands with so many nice-looking actors that I was almost ashamed to take my paycheck. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> Thanks for the helping hand, Miss Jackson. Madeline Carroll and Donna Michi in Dangerous. Months have passed, and the play which done back for Joyce Heath is nearly ready to open. In the back of the darkened theater, Don sits alone watching the dress rehearsal. Suddenly, Sheffield, the producer, calls a halt and walks up the aisle. That's four o'clock tomorrow. Everybody on time, please. All right, four o'clock. Oh, hello, Don. Get a cigarette? Sure. Well, what do you think, Sheffield? I think it's terrific. You know, Don, I've spent a fortune and misspent a life in the theater. But this is the only time that on the night of a dress rehearsal I've had nerve enough to say I had a hit. <laughs> You're pretty positive. So positive, I'll buy your piece of it for 100000 Ah, there's one angel who isn't afraid to tread. Gosh, she's magnificent, isn't she? Even in rehearsal. It's the greatest performance I've ever seen. She'll be a sensation Monday night. Oh, say, uh, what about the jinx? Oh, nothing could jinx a talent like that. Hello, <laughs> no, Don. Well, Chef, how does it look? Huh? Oh, all right, I guess. Needs a lot of work, though. You know, Don, if I got away down to the country and went over the script tomorrow, I think I could get a better perspective. Would you run me down tonight? Why, of course. Shall we go? I want to stop at my apartment for some clothes. Right. Night, Chef. Night. And, Don, keep her out of the poison ivy in the fresh air. I don't want her to open in a whisper. <laughs> <laughs> that bag over there, darling. I think that's all I'll need. Well, what are you standing around for? Come on, darling. Just wait. We can't go on like this. I could forever. No, no, don't, don't be evasive. You know what I mean. Getting married, of course. But now there's the show to think there's of. There's always some reason to change the subject, isn't there? Tell me the truth, Joyce. Why are you putting me off? Oh, Don, don't be so intense. You know I love you, that there's no one else. Isn't that enough? No, it isn't enough. What's the matter? Are, are, are you afraid to marry me? Afraid? Why should I be? I don't know. Unless you think marriage would make me a little harder to get rid of. Don, don't say that! Oh, I'm sorry, darling. Hold me, Don. Hold me close to you. Why? Why are you shaking? Oh, now, Joyce, darling. It's nothing. Excitement. Nerves, that's all. Look, dear, I, I'm going to be rotten company and I want to be alone. Let me take your roadster and go down to the country alone. Well, if you like. Thank you, darling. Now get out of here like a good boy or, or you'll see me cry. 
What's the matter? Nothing, I tell you. Stage fright. Go on now. There's always a taxi out front. All right. Good night, dear. Drive carefully. And uh, when you come back, leave the jitters behind you, will you? I will, darling. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Is it? It's Joyce. Open the door. Joyce. Come in. Oh, it's, it's a long time since I've seen you, Joyce. Oh, sit down. I haven't much of a place here, but I guess I don't have to tell you that. Gordon, Let I... Let me look at you. I've hoped you'd come like this so many times. I've come on business, Gordon. Oh. I've got to go down to the country tonight. I haven't much time. You still hate me, don't you, Joyce? I never hated you. And you never loved me either. Did you ever love me, Gordon? Really love me? When a man ruins his life because of something, it must be pretty real. I'm a bookkeeper now in that company I used to own, Joyce. And the worst part of it all is, I can't hate you. I don't suppose you understand that. I can now. I love someone that way too, Gordon. Heaven help you. Yes, heaven help me if you don't. You want me to divorce you. Is that it? Yes, Gordon. I've told you time and time again I won't. You're my wife, understand? My wife. Something you'll never be to any other man. Being your husband is the only thing I have left. And I won't lose it. You'll be my wife till the day I die. Then I'll divorce you. You can't, Joyce. You haven't any grounds and you never will have. Gordon, I know I've ruined your happiness. Don't ruin mine. If it's revenge you want, I'll give it to you. I'll beg, I'll crawl, I'll do anything. Look at me, Gordon. If you want to humiliate me, you know how. But set me free. Give me one chance at happiness. Please, Gordon, please. No, no. Gordon, will you do one thing for me? I want you to come with me. Where? To the country. I want you to meet him, speak to him. He has to know sometime. If I meet him, you think I'll take pity on you, don't you? You think I'll let you go? Yes, Gordon. Are you driving down? Yes. I'll be ready in a few minutes. Hadn't you better let me drive, Gordon? You're not doing very well. Mm, I thought you always liked speed. I do. But you'll never take the turns at this rate. And there's a tree in the middle of the road just ahead. Is there? You know the road well, don't you? He lives at the end of it. Is there nothing in the world that would make you drop the idea of this marriage? Nothing. Not even to save your life? My life? I'm desperate, Joyce. I love you, do you understand? And if I can't have you, I'd rather be dead. We'll take that tree in the road, the both of us. I'll smash both of us to hell. Good. Take it. Go on. Go faster. Do you think I care? You can't live without me. Well, I can't live without him. Go on. Faster. Go faster. 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 <laughs> Joyce Heath and Smash. Accident and Smash up. Man identified as husband. Paper. Read all about it. Actress and husband will live. Accident reveals triangle. Triangle. John Bellows is a scandal. 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 And the board thinks it would be best, Mr. Bellows, if you'd resign from the club. Resign? But why do I have to... Sorry, re Mr. Bellows. It's tough, Tom, but that dough you sunk in the show is all red ink now. A total loss. Yes, I expected that. Too bad, fellow. Bank just can't see its way clear to making that loan. We're sorry, Bellows, but we've got to be pretty conservative. But you can't do this. I put every cent I have in those estates. I need that loan or I'll lose everything. I'm afraid you'll have to lose it then. Sorry, Mr. Bellows. Dr. Halloway. Calling Dr. Halloway. Dr. Jarvis. You'll find Miss Heath in Dr. room 1006, Jarvis. Mr. Bellows. Thank you. Dr. Gray. Don. Calling. Hello, Joyce. Oh, Don, you waited so long to come. Did you expect anything else? You, you blame me for what's happened, don't you? I knew you would, that's why you didn't come. Yes, I blame you. Don, don't say that, don't. It's the jinx, I warned you, I can't help it, I can't. You mean you can't help being mean and selfish? You do anything to gain your own desire and go on, leaving someone else to pay the bill. That's the jinx you put on people. I was willing to give my life for you. Is that selfishness? Yes. 
because you're afraid to risk losing me by saying you had a husband. So instead, you lied and ruined me. And your husband, what's it cost him to love you? You've never bought any happiness in your life. You owe for it. It cost everybody else but you. Well, I can't afford any more. But there's one thing I know. If you're ever going to be anything but a jinx, you'd better start paying off. Because you're in debt for the rest of your life. Don. Goodbye, Joyce. Don, don't leave me like this. I'll die if you do. I'll kill myself. I mean it. You don't mean it. If you did, you'd be more of a coward than I think you are. Don. A coward. I'll be a coward then. I'll be one. Miss Heath! Miss Heath, what are you doing out of bed? Get away from that window. You'll catch cold. Leave me alone. Get out. Oh, no, no. Now behave yourself. Get back there. I was just in to see your husband. He was asking for you. My... My husband? Yes. My husband. Nurse, I've got to get up today. Oh, you can't. It's much too soon. I must. I've some debts to pay. To reopen a play that's failed and make a success of it is next to impossible, Joyce. The play didn't fail, Chef. The only failure was mine. I can make that play a success. Hmm. You're very confident. More than confident. I'm positive. Why? Four distinct reasons, any one of which is so important to me that it makes failure impossible. First, because I'm a good actress. Second, because Don must get his money back. Third, because I have an injured husband to support. He may not be able to walk for a year. And the last and the most important is that I found out how to break my jinx by paying my debt. You know, it's a pity you're an actress, Miss Heath, because you're most convincing when you don't act. You are strong enough to start rehearsing Monday? Yes. Monday morning at 10, then? Monday morning at 10. Goodbye, Chef. You can go in now, Mr. Bellows. Thank you. Oh. oh. Pardon the coincidence. Joyce, what are you doing out of the hospital? I'm much better. I've, I've quite recovered. I was coming to see you tonight. I, I was pretty rotten to you this afternoon. You were frank. You've got to forgive me, Joyce. You mustn't let it make any difference. Things will turn out right. We'll make them turn out right. We can't. I'm going to be just as honest and frank as you were. You're no longer important to me, Don. Your importance ended when the show folded. You mean that I was only the means to an end? Yes. I don't believe that. Believe it or not, it's the truth. You might as well know it now. I'm sorry if I've hurt you, but we all get hurt sometimes. Yes, we do. What hurts me most is that you're making yourself so cheap, Joyce. Oh, no, I'm rather expensive. Remember what it cost you? Goodbye, Joyce. Hello. Miss Heath. Miss Heath, are you all right? Yes. Yes, thank you. But to die in 39th week. Never before has a theatre audience paid such tribute to an actress, both in acclaim and in attendance, as has been paid to Joyce Heath in her performance in But to Die. That's very flattering. Uh, there's something else in the paper, Joyce. On the society page. Oh, is there? Don Bellows weds Gail Armitage at noon today. That's just as it should be, isn't it, Gordon? It, it's too late for the divorce to do any good. I'm sorry, Joyce. There's not going to be any divorce. We're going to stay married, Gordon. How else can I take care of you? Joyce, this means more than life to me. That makes me very happy. Because I have a lifetime to pay back. Our 
producer brings our stars back for a curtain call, and then we will make the announcement we mentioned earlier. Mr. DeMille. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, Madeline Carroll and Donna Michi. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. And goodbye. Well, that was quick. Well, I don't like to mince words either, Madeline, but I do like the idea of coming back after the play and splitting an infinitive or two with Mr. DeMille. Why, why the quick brush? <laughs> You've got me all wrong, Don. I'm just saying goodbye because I'll be leaving Hollywood in a few days on my way to London and Paris and Rome. In fact, I'm going with the rising tide. Walter Wanger just sent it to me, wrapped up very beautifully in several cans. Well, what do you think of that? Canned ocean. <laughs> What's the matter with Don, Mr. DeMille? He's twisting everything I say around. Well, I, I, I think we're all getting a little twisted, Madeline. It couldn't be that, uh, that you're the one who's just a little uh, vague. After all, you just said that Walter Wanger... Oh, you... I see. I, I'm taking a little too much for granted, I think. The Rising Tide is the name of my new picture. Oh. oh. <laughs> you, uh, you probably thought that one up while you were marooned at Malibu during the flood a few weeks back. Oh, no, it's got nothing to do with water. It's a modern story based on what we read today in the headlines. With conditions as they are all over the world, Hollywood, I really believe, can help by making pictures that will indirectly promote better understanding. So I'm taking the rising tide abroad with me to find out how pictures of this type will be received and what we can do to make the screen a medium for world peace. I can't imagine a lovelier ambassador. Right. And I'm with you 100%, Madeline. Congratulations. Thank you, gentlemen. And now, before I say goodbye in earnest, I want you to know, Mr. DeMille, how glad I am to find you well and back here in the Lux Radio Theater. And don't you dare get sick again. Both radio and the screen need your presence. Well, I don't want to sound like the echo around here, but that goes for all the Amici's too, C.B. Good night. I'm very grateful to you both. Bon voyage, Madeline. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline Carroll and Don Amici. And now, while we are waiting for Mr. DeMille to come back and tell us what has been planned for next week's performance, I'm going to make our special announcement to you. Two weeks ago, I told you that the Lux Radio Theater would send six, a full half dozen, original Roger Silver Plate full-sized teaspoons, guaranteed by the International Silver Company, to any of our listeners for a remarkably low charge as a special souvenir to the listeners of the Lux Radio Theater. As a result, an avalanche of requests has poured in, thousands upon thousands of them. And after the spoons were delivered came the most enthusiastic letters telling us how delighted you ladies were to get these spoons and asking for additional half dozens. Now, because we don't want a single listener to miss this opportunity, we are repeating our offer tonight. For, as one woman put it, it's the greatest bargain I have run into in ages. These teaspoons are made and guaranteed by the International Silver Company, the world's largest silversmiths. They are original Rogers silver plate with an extra heavy deposit of pure silver, reinforced plate on the part most often exposed to wear. Just let me read one sentence from the guarantee which accompanies each half dozen spoons. Every piece is guaranteed to give satisfaction in family use and will be replaced without charge at any time it doesn't conform to this guarantee. Now, here's how to get these spoons. Have you your pencil ready? Now then, simply send the top from a large package of Lux. Print your name and address clearly on a piece of paper. Wrap 50 cents in coin in the paper and mail to Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. That's Lux... Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Meriden, Connecticut. This offer is good only in the United States. These spoons, of course, have no advertising of any kind on them and have been especially designed in an exclusive pattern called Allure. This pattern is new, dainty, and modern. Its delicate design sweeps gracefully from bowl to tip. It is not ornate, but has just enough design to add character to the sparkling beauty of the silver. I just wish you could see this set of six beautiful original Roger silver plate teaspoons. Truly, they are magnificent. Now remember, first come, first served, so be sure and mail your request at once. When you get these full-size teaspoons, you will never cease wondering at the bargain you have received. You are paying only a trifle more than eight cents a spoon, but of course, the spoons are available only in sets of six. Simply send the top from a package of Lux, large size. Print your name and address clearly on a piece of paper, wrap 50 cents in coin in the paper, and mail to Lux, Meriden, Connecticut, and you will receive the whole half dozen spoons. You may have as many sets as you care for on this basis. And remember, these spoons are accompanied by a written guarantee from the world's largest silversmith, the International Silver Company. And more than that, Lux itself guarantees that these spoons will delight you. If they don't, 
If for any reason at all you are not pleased beyond your fondest expectations, simply return them, and your money will be refunded at once without question. And here's more news. Many local dealers have sales on Lux Flakes right now, so you can save money on buying Lux at the same time you obtain your teaspoons. So send the top from a package of Lux, large size, print your name and address clearly on a piece of paper, wrap 50 cents in coin in the paper, and mail to Lux, Meriden, Connecticut. That's Lux, Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Meriden, Connecticut. This offer is good only in the United States. And now Mr. DeMille will tell us about next week's program. The colorful pages of American history spring to life next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents The Prisoner of Shark Island. France had its Dreyfus case, and the United States the case of Dr. Samuel A. Mudd, falsely accused of complicity in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. How this young country doctor returned his nation's hatred with sacrifice and gallantry, and how justice at last triumph make an unforgettable drama. I'm especially pleased, pleased to announce that the title role will be played by one of the most popular actors the screen has ever known, Gary Cooper. And with Mr. Cooper... We shall present Miss Fay Ray and Mr. Walter Connolly. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gary Cooper, Fay Ray, and Walter Connolly in The Prisoner of Shark Island. And as a special guest, you'll hear Dr. Mudd's daughter, Mrs. Nettie Mudd Monroe. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Are you familiar with the old expression when they made you they threw away the mold, or there's nobody else like you in the whole world. What is it inside every human being that makes him or her unique, one of a kind? What kind of a doctor are you? What kind of a place is this? Why won't anyone believe me? Now, Susan, <laughs> this is the last time I'm going to ask you. Calm yourself. Calm myself. How many times do I have to tell you I'm not Susan? That's enough. Uh, take a... No, room. Susan, it's all a mistake. Uh, Susan, stop I'm it. I'm telling you the truth. I'm a leader. I'm a leader. You'll feel better tomorrow. Leave me, please. I'm not Susan. I'm not Susan. <laughs> mystery drama, The Deadly Double, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Vicki Dan and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Her name is Anita Gregory. And she leads a quiet life, an almost solitary life, except for a single casual friendship. It isn't that she likes being alone. She has her painting to keep her occupied and a considerable sum of money in the bank to ensure her independence. It's just that she prefers a peaceful existence. For there are certain things, things that happened long ago that uh, she would prefer to forget. She has no way of knowing, however, that tonight those certain things are about to intrude unexpectedly from the past and totally disrupt the serenity of the present. Look, Anita, th there's this great old slick on, on Channel 9. I don't I care, Max. Now, why don't you go home? 
Well, it's not even one o'clock. Not even one o'clock. Max, I want to go to sleep. Why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. You're using me as an excuse. Well, what are you talking about? You haven't written so much as a sentence in the past month. Anita, I've explained that to you. There comes a time in every writer's creative life when he reaches a, an impasse, what you might call a, a writer's oh, block. Get off it, Max. You like the idea of being a writer, but deep inside, you are basically a bum. Huh? I'm your friend, so I can tell you. Why do you delude yourself? Well, I need fresh ideas. I, I need fresh ideas to rejuvenate me. Good night, Max. Well, it's not like you and your painting. All you have to do is look out the window at some tree and you're inspired. My pictures are good, Max, because I don't sit around waiting to be inspired. I paint what I see, a face, a tree in the wind, a leaf. Anita, you don't understand. You... Who would call this late? Hello? What? But, but how... How... Now? Well, I... Yes, where? Yes. All right. Yes, I promise, I promise. Alida? You okay? Who was that? I can't believe it. Who was that on the phone? My sister. Your sister? Susan. Susan, the nut? Oh, don't call her that. She's just disturbed. Well, she's in an institution, isn't she? It's a rest home, Max. How many times do I have to tell you? It's a, a rest home. Well, call it what you want. You're the one who pays the bill. Hey, you really look shook up. What's the matter? I haven't... I haven't seen Susan. It's been five years. And now she... she now she, she... She... What? She's out. She's out? When they release her? They didn't. They didn't? Wait a minute. You mean she escaped? She left. I'll call the police. No, no, don't do that. What? No police. No, no, there can't be anybody else. I... I know where she is, and I'll take care of this in my own way. Uh, Anita, I, I don't want to be difficult, but you're the one who signed the commitment papers. You're the one who had her declared insane. I never even went up there to Westbrook. I couldn't. But five years is a long time. People change. Anita... A lot you... of things can happen in five years. She said she was trying to get in touch with me for a long time. They wouldn't let her write or phone or anything. Anita, where are you going? Lock the door when you leave, Max. Uh, let me come with you? No, I have to go alone. It'll be all right. I know what I'm doing. Call me when you get back? Sure. I'll be waiting up for you. Remember, I'm just down the hall. I've got to go. Anita. What? I hope you know what you're doing. So do I. <laughs> said there'd be a phone booth. God, where is she? Susan? Susan? It's me, Anita. Where are you? Susan? Is that you? Who's there? Susan, is that you? Oh. Yes, Anita, it's me. Susan, thanks for being stupid enough to come. Miss? Taking a nap, miss? Mm hmm? What? Where am I? Well, you're a mile off Highway 25 at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. Oh, she must have knocked me off. Oh, where's my car? Huh? What car? Say, you better get into my car. You must be freezing in that thin dress. Dress? Could have sworn I was wearing... Oh. Well, she did 
is it? She changed clothes with me on top of everything. What are you talking about, miss? My sister, she took my car. My wallet, she even changed into... Wait, are, are you a policeman? No, no, we don't have policemen here, miss. I'm the sheriff. Uh, my name's Tom Wiley. Oh, I'm Anita Gregory. Well, pleased to meet you, Miss Gregory. Well, now, why don't you get in my car before you get pneumonia? <laughs> are you taking me down to the station or, or whatever it is that you call it around here? Well, actually, we call it the sheriff's office. Well, I don't mean to inconvenience you or anything. Oh, no, no, it's my job. Now, suppose you start all over again and, and tell me exactly what happened. You say Susan is your sister? Twin sister. Oh, all twin sister. Uh, Miss Gregory, I... I still don't understand how you could agree to meet her on a deserted highway. Didn't you know she was dangerous? No. Well, I... I wasn't sure. I... You were sure? Well, you see, she sounded so upset. And I was so surprised to hear from her in the first place. It's been five years. How, how did I know if she'd gotten better or not? Now, Miss Gregory, don't Call you think Call me that... Anita. I hate Miss Gregory. That sounds so hard. <laughs> no, I never liked formality myself. Wait a minute. This... This doesn't look like a sheriff's... That sign says Westbrook. Why are we stopping here? Hey, Doc. Sheriff, where'd you find her? Well, you know where that phone booth is off X-11? Well, she was, she was frankly lying in the road. Lucky I came by when I did. Susan, you might have gotten killed. My name is Anita Gregory. I don't think we've met. And I don't see why it's any of your Susan, business. Susan, do you realize that because of your little escapade, everybody's been up half the night trying to find you? Wait a minute. I don't think you heard me. I'm not... I heard what you said. Eric... Take Susan Gregory back to her room. Sure. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I had to bring you back. Bring me back? We really appreciate it, Sheriff. Thank back? you. Back? This is all a mistake. I think you need a sedative. Need a what? what? Who do you think you are? Uh, that's not our problem. The problem is, who do you think you are, Susan? You think that I'm Susan? Eric? And you, Sheriff? You brought me here deliberately. You don't believe me either. That whole time in the car, you were playing along with me. All the time thinking I'm somebody else. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but you might have gotten hurt. This is insane. <laughs> it isn't really happening. Tomorrow, I'll wake up and... It... Let go of me. Take her to her room, Eric. Restrain her if necessary. Doctor, please, this is all a mistake. It's a horrible mistake. <laughs> if I'm here, then Susan is out there somewhere. Miles away now in my car. Susan, you must Wait a stop. Minute. No, no, look. Find her before she hurts somebody, please. Sheriff, listen. Listen to me. My name is Anita Gregory. I live at 420 Oakleaf Terrace. Look, if you don't believe me, ask Max. That's right, Max knows. He was there when Susan called. Max will tell you. Please believe me, please. Please. Yeah. That poor girl. It's really a shame about people like her. In the car, she seemed so normal. Uh, she's schizoid. Thinks she's two people. You mean this Anita character? Oh, that's the sad part. She does have a sister, a sister, Anita, who put her here. There is a sister? That's right. Twin sister. As a matter of fact, I think that's part of the reason she has such a serious identity problem. Twin? <laughs> Uh, is, it, is it remotely possible that the girl I brought back is the other sister? Sheriff, sure, you're not serious. Well, I know I'm no psychiatrist, but but looking back on it, she, she didn't seem that crazy to me. That girl was Susan. She couldn't fool me for a minute. A perfect example of being in the wrong place at the right time. As far as Dr. Cooper is concerned, Susan is back where she can't harm anybody. As far as Sheriff Wiley is concerned, he has just apprehended a dangerous lunatic. But what about Anita? 
she is about to discover that while it is relatively easy to prove a person is insane, it is quite a different matter to prove that a person is sane. I'll be back in a moment with Act Two. By all physical appearances, Anita Gregory is identical to her sister Susan. Same eyes, same hair, same voice, but the similarity ends there because no two minds can ever be the same. It is merely logical that Dr. Cooper will presently recognize her for what she really is. Or is it? Good morning, Susan. Uh, How do you feel? What? Oh, is it morning? Yes, morning, more or less. It's 11.30, but you had a rather late night. Oh, no. Oh, I thought I'd dreamt all this. Oh. No, Susan. And that's why after last night, we must make an even more determined effort to face reality. Call me, Susan, ahead. once more, and I'm going to scream. Good. Go right ahead. It's good therapy. Let out all your hostility. Isn't it at all conceivable to you that being identical twins, Susan and I might have changed places? Well, yes, there is that possibility. Good. We're getting somewhere. Now, what about a phone call? I'm afraid that's our question. We could clear this matter up entirely with a single phone call. Ah, oh, you know the rules about phone calls. Besides, after last night's escapade, you had all privileges suspended. Doctor, when I get out of here, I'll make sure you never practice again. Oh, that's excellent. Redirected hostility. Must be calm. I must <laughs> maintain my cool. Doctor, <clears throat> explain to me about my case. You know all about your case. Please, humor me. Yeah, very well. Your name is Susan Gregory. Five years ago, following a series of incidents where you repeatedly attempted to kill your sister, Anita, you were declared legally insane. Now, those incidents, couldn't they have been merely frustration or anger of the moment? Mm, unfortunately, no. You see, it's been inside you since you were a child. No matter what you did, your sister did it better. The years went on and you watched as Anita became a successful artist. You grew more and more resentful. Your jealousy became an obsession. Even now, you're often jealous enough to try to be her. In this way, you can have what she's always had. All right. Now, taking this a step further. Just pretend, pretend now that the real Susan Gregory is out there, living in Anita's apartment and driving her car, pretending to be her. How long do you suppose she'll be able to carry it off before she gets caught? Not very long, of course. Little things, traits unique to Anita would be missing. Close friends notice these things. That is, if Anita has any close friends. Oh, she has. Uh, we'll discuss it all later. It's time for your treatment. What kind of treatment? Eric is waiting outside to take you to therapy three. I asked you, what kind of treatment? Eric, would you take her, please? I'll be down in a few minutes. Look, I'm not stupid. I took psychology in college. I know a little bit about behavior modification and the things they do in places like this. Now, what is it? Is it electric shock therapy? No, I, I don't know why you're so upset. You'll feel much better. You always do afterwards. It is. Now, listen. Staying here for a few days is, is one thing. Now, I've tried discussing the whole thing rationally with you, and what happens? You aren't going to give me any shock treatment. Eric, you call yourself a doctor. You're a charlatan. You're a quack. Now, you see, Susan, it's just a matter of time before your true nature comes through. You're hysterical. Just wait till I get out of here. I'm going to sue you. I'll, I'll sue this hospital. I'll sue everybody. <laughs> well, 
sister Anita, you've done all right for yourself. Hmm. This is a nice little apartment. <laughs> I think I'm going to like it here. Mustn't get excited. I can pull this off, just remember. I'm Anita now. Yes? Well, aren't you going to let me in? Look, don't be mad. I can explain why I didn't wait up for you. I fell asleep. I just went out like a light the minute I hit the couch. Well, anyhow, tell me what happened. With what? Well, Anita, don't keep me in suspense like this. What happened with your crazy sister? I... I sent her back to Westbrook. We had a long chat, and then I drove her back. And that was it? Yeah, she just wanted to talk. So, everything's all right now? Everything's fine. Hey, this is your old friend Max. If something's bothering you, you, you can Max, tell me. of course not. I'm just tired. You sure nothing's bothering you? You're not mad at me? Oh, of course not. Come here. Here? Closer. Uh, Anita. See? I'm not mad at you. Why? Why did, did you kiss me? Why? You never kissed me before. You said I wasn't ready for a serious relationship. You wanted to keep it platonic. I did? Oh. Well, I... Sorry, Max. If you don't like it, I... I won't do it again. Oh, well, no. I'm... I'm not sorry. Oh, yeah, Max, I have a, a headache. You asking me to leave, Anita? Yes. Do you mind? No. No, sure. I... Sure, I understand. Maybe some other time. Okay? Sure. Bye now. Bye. I hope that dummy swallowed it. Susan, how do we feel today? We? How do we feel? <laughs> I only wish you could feel like I feel right now. I have a surprise for you. You have a visitor. What did you say? Mm -hmm. Someone's here to see you. He says he's an old friend. Max Hogan. Max? Max is here? You want to see him? Max! Oh, wonderful, beautiful Max! Ah, I'll send him in. You can come in, Mr. Hogan. I'll be right outside. Max! Anita. Oh, I'm so glad you came. I thought I was going crazy. Anita, it is you. Well, of course it's me. Well, I, I wasn't sure. Max, I've got to get out of this place. Don't worry. Never fear, Max is here. <laughs> uh, wow, this is wild. But it isn't funny. Now, how did you figure I was here? Ah, uh, give me credit, honey. I had her pegged for Susan the minute she opened the door. She's in my apartment? Well, sure. Making like she's you. But she didn't fool me for a minute. No? What really did it was when she kissed me. She was? Now, you see... You'd never do that. I mean, she assumed I was your boyfriend. Oh, I can't wait to see the look on that doctor's face when you tell him. Max, would you get Dr. Cooper and tell him who I really am? Hey, what an idea for a story. Two sisters, twin sisters, who change places. Yes, you have my permission to write the story. Now get Dr. Cooper and we can discuss it on the way home. Sure, of course. I, I have to go into greater depth, take more time to evolve my characters. You aren't thinking what I think you're thinking. I could come up a couple of times a week with a tape recorder. Oh, no, you can't be thinking that. Anita, please, just give me a few weeks. That's all I need. No! But can't you see? It's perfect. 
I haven't been inspired for months. You said so yourself. Absolutely not. And the story would practically write itself. It's a bestseller. We ripped the facade off mental institutions. What an expose. I said no. Oh, how can you be so selfish? Selfish? I'm being selfish? Can't you see? I'm 36 years old and I've never been published. You don't seem to understand that every day I'm in this place, I lose a little bit more of my grip. There's drugs, there's shock therapy. Do you know what that can do to a person? Oh, come on. Now, it can't be that I'm bad. Through to you. This place can drive anybody crazy. I thought that I could live through anything. Nothing ever really moved me or excited me. Well, that's just why you could pull it off. But even if my mind was made of concrete, this place would erode it. We'd be rich, both of us. Hey, well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 50%. And you're forgetting something else. Susan. All right. She'll get a percentage, too. Now, listen, Max. Forget about me for a minute. You can't let an insane person loose in the normal world. Why not? It's all relative, isn't it? <laughs> isn't the whole world going crazy? Who, who, who are we to say what is and what isn't normal? What a theme. Listen, hey. you don't know Susan. She's dangerous. She seemed all right. Besides, weren't you the one who said that maybe the doctors were well, wrong? I made a mistake. She hasn't changed at all. She's vicious. She could even kill. Don't try to talk me out of it. Listen, take me seriously for once. When we were little, even then, she did vicious things. She broke the heads off all my dolls. She took the goldfish out of the bowl and she watched them die. Typical healthy tomboy. I don't want to discuss it anymore. Now get me out of here, please. All right, Anita. Sure. That's how you want it. Doctor? I'm ready to go now. All right, now tell him, Max. Tell the doctor. Tell him what? Who I am. Doctor, Max knows. I think this has been too much of a strain for her. <sighs> You'd better go immediately. Of course. Max! Goodbye, Max! Doctor. Goodbye, no, Susan. Oh, no, Max, she'll kill you. When she finds out that you know, she'll kill you. We live in a world ravaged with fear. A world where the voices of logic and common sense seldom find a sympathetic listener. It is not so very unlike the purgatory in which Anita Gregory is now imprisoned. Today, into that dim world, a candle of hope has briefly flickered and finally been extinguished. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Je pense, donc je suis. I think, therefore I am. So said the great philosopher René Descartes. It was this brilliant Frenchman who logically demonstrated that there is only one thing of which a man can be sure of, and that is his own existence. After all, most people accept what they see as truth. They do not question the obvious. They leave that for the philosophers. Hello, Doctor. Chef, what brings you here? Well, you know what happened was I I was typing up the week's report and I, I suddenly realized that I never got you to sign this release for that Gregory girl. I, it, it was such a hectic night, it, it totally slipped my mind. Of course. Also, could you fill in her sister's full name and address? I, I need it for the records. I'm glad you stopped by. She was asking for you. For me? Yeah, she says there's something she'd like to tell you. Now, you don't have to see her if you don't want to. Hmm? I'm sure it isn't anything important. Oh, well, as long as I'm here, I... Well, I'd like to see how she's doing. Hello, Susan. Sheriff? Yeah. Uh, how you been? Just wonderful, can't you tell? Uh, Doc Cooper said you, you wanted to see me. I did? Hmm. What was it you wanted to tell me? I forget. I think there was... something. Why can't I remember? Oh, now, now take your time. I want to tell you. Uh, nice paintings on the wall. Oh, 
That's the doctor's idea. <laughs> he feels by giving us a creative outlet, it's releasing hostility. We're very good. Well, I'm a professional yeah. artist. I mean, Anita's a professional artist. I'm supposed to be Susan. Susan can't paint. Susan cooks. Anita paints. It's always been that way. Well, I, I, I'm sure no art critic, but I think you're very good. Yes, you know I am. Look at that wall. Hmm. Look at the girl in the picture there. Her hands. Her arms there, there by her neck. Do you know how many years of training it takes? The discipline anatomy classes, live models to get the bones, the muscles, the skin tones just right to understand the shading. Well, like I said, it's, it's, it's very good. Would you say I have a, a style? Style? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd say so. You see, it takes years to develop a style. I spent two years in Paris... That's heaven for an artist. And that's what influenced me, those early impressionists. But but Max says I still have a distinctive style. Oh, Max, Max, Max. That's what I wanted to tell you. Ooh, what about Max? She's going to kill Max. Who's going to kill Max? That's right. Now, Max is writing a book about us, how we changed places. And I warned him. I said... Max, Susan hates to be tricked, and she hates people fooling her. And when she finds out that you know who she is, she's going to get really mad, and she'll kill you. That's, that's very interesting. You think I'm crazy, don't you? Oh, no, no, I didn't say that. That's all right. <laughs> it's quite all right. I tried. I did my best. I warned him. And he didn't believe me either. <laughs> when Max has found... Dead. Maybe then you'll believe me. That's all I wanted to tell you. Thanks for coming. Oh, there's no trouble. I, uh, I, I wanted to see how you were doing. Now, if you'll excuse me. I'm very tired. Sure, sure. I, I was just leaving. Well, uh, bye, Susan. Uh, Sheriff, hmm? uh, well, wait a minute. Don't you want this back? Hmm? Oh, the release form. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. I I don't know what's with me these days. Look, I I, uh, I want to ask you about Susan's sister, uh, Nita Gregory. What about her? I was wondering when you saw her last. Last? Hmm. Oh, well, I really don't think that's very important. Well, what is your impression of the sister, uh, Nita? Mm, I hear she's an excellent artist. You hear? Yeah, well, naturally, I've never met her. You what? There really wasn't any need to. I mean, she pays the bills on time, and she never comes to visit. Well, when did Susan start painting? Just recently. How recently? Well, I don't see why. Well, about a week ago... She isn't bad for a beginner. Matter of fact, she's pretty good. Did it occur to you that maybe she was too good? Chapter 2. The Second Week. Oh, that's good. Now let's see what we've got so far. Meanwhile, Susan Gregory... In the guise of Anita, continued more and more to assume the identity of her sister. The door wasn't locked, so I just thought I'd come in. Ah, uh, I never lock my door. What are you writing? Uh, nothing, just the usual junk. Can I see? No. I never show an unfinished work to anybody. It just isn't done. Why not? Well, it's bad luck. Hey! Hey, give me that back. I just want to see. Come on, don't be... Give it back. Come, Come on, on, Max. Just let me see a little. Give it to me. <laughs> oh. oh, now look what you've done. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, Max. I'm really sorry. Sure. I mean it. You're so funny. 
You get so excited about a silly piece of paper. No, I wouldn't expect you to understand. Why not? Well, it's very personal. When a writer writes, what you did just now is almost like... like tearing me in half physically. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see what's so funny. <laughs> you don't... It's very funny. <laughs> it's a scream. <laughs> it's a scream. <laughs> you know, it's a scream. No, I... You know that? As a matter of fact, <laughs> you're playing crazy. Me? Crazy? Oh, look so shocked. <laughs> Don't fight it. It's no crime to be crazy. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, I, I know. Hey, you're not taking me seriously, are you, Max? I'm only kidding. <laughs> Can't you take a joke? Oh, no, sure, sure, sure. I tell you what. You come over about six, and I'll make you some chili. You'd like that, wouldn't you? I, yes, I would. Okay. Six, then. Max? Just a minute. Max, I told you I... Oh. Miss, uh, Anita Gregory? Yes. Huh. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I beg your pardon? Oh, the, the, the resemblance. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, oh, between you and your sister, I mean. My sister? Susan Gregory. I, I, I'm an acquaintance of hers. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me introduce myself. Well, I wish you I, would. The name's Wiley. Tom Wiley. I'm sheriff up in Clay County. Uh, near Westbrook, where your sister is... Uh, Staying. Sheriff? Huh. Uh, could I come in for a minute? Oh, well, of course. Please. Thank you. Well, you have a very nice apartment, Miss Gregory. Well, thank you. Well, what can I do for you, Sheriff? You see, I I'm the officer who apprehended your sister after she escaped from Westbrook, and I, uh... Well, she was really nice and, uh, and likable and, uh... Well, to be perfectly honest, I... Uh, yes, be perfectly honest. Well, I have to admit, there was a... a remote possibility that... well, she might have been a victim of mistaken identity. Oh. You know, you're... you're not at all what I expected you to be. Oh, what were you expecting, an ogre? Oh, <laughs> I, I don't know, really. Are you disappointed? I, well, kind of, I... Oh... Something wrong? Well, these paintings. Yes. Uh, you uh, painted them? Oh, well, I almost hate to admit it, but look, I can't expect everyone to love my work. Oh, I, I, I didn't say that I didn't like them. It's just the well, uh, you uh, have a style. It's it's. Very distinctive. Oh, 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 here it comes. Everyone's a critic. I, I honestly like your work, uh, Anita. Eh. Well, I, I really better get back. Thanks. Uh, thanks for everything. Yes, sure. Oh, oh, by the way, uh, you wouldn't happen to know a guy named Max? Max? Mm. Oh, sure. He lives down the hall. I thought it was him at the door before. Why? Well, I'm wondering if, uh, if it's the same Max. The same Max? Hmm. Your sister had a visitor the other day, a guy named Max, and I... Well, I was just wondering if it could be the same... No, I... Uh, well, uh, no. The, the Max that I know uh, never met Susan. You see, I don't... I don't like to let new friends... Know that my sister... You understand. I mean... It... Oh, sure, sure. I, I understand, sure. Well, it was just a thought. Thanks anyway. Bye. Goodbye. So, Max does know. All this time I trusted that idiot. 
And he knew all along. That must have been what he was writing about, wanted to hide from me. It all fits. All this time he made a fool of me. He tricked me. Hey, Anita. Why'd you lock your door? It's only old Max. <laughs> oh, Max, just a minute. Hello, Max. Why'd you lock me out? Here. I, I brought some wine. I thought we'd have a nice evening. Thank you, Max. I guarantee you this is going to be an evening you'll never forget. <laughs> I must say, Anita, you... Oh, you really outdid yourself. That chili was fantastic. Well, you certainly ate enough. Yeah, well, I'm positively stuffed. <laughs> uh, let's have some more wine. But you finished it all. Oh. <laughs> By the way, Max, how's your book coming? My book? Yeah, your book. You never did tell me what it was about. Well, it's uh, just Tell about... me something, Max. Did you put me in it? You? Yeah, me. I'm your inspiration, aren't I? What's gotten into you, Anita? Don't call me Anita. I hate that name. You know very well I'm Susan. What? Oh, don't play dumb, Max. You knew all the time, didn't you? Didn't you? I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm I... Susan and you knew all about it. Oh, quit playing dumb. I happen to know all about your little visit to Westbrook. Oh, look, I can explain. I don't want to hear it. I... I'm not interested. I'm more interested in this bookend. Did you know, Max, that there are only two like it in the whole world? That they belong to my grandfather? That they came all the way from Spain? They're made of mahogany. They're hand-carved. But look... Notice the base. That solid bronze. Hey, what are you doing? I really I... thought you liked me. But you were just using me, making a fool of me. You tricked me. Susan. And I just... Wait a second, let me explain. Get mad when people fool me. I get really mad. Susan. No, put, put that down. You, you, you could kill somebody with that. I intend to kill you. Oh, no, no. See, Max, you're such an easy target. Hey, you're crazy. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Please. Kill you. 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 Stand still. Don't move. You're too late. Sure, he's dead. I killed him. No, he's not dead. He just fainted. No, he's dead. He's alive, Susan. Not that I really care after what he did to your sister. I wanted to kill him. I'm not sorry. He tricked me, you know. I know, I know. Now, are you ready to go back now, Susan? <gasps> Susan. But you... You... No. How? You told me. With your paintings. You see, your sister has a distinctive style. She tried to tell me that in Westbrook. She duplicated from memory those three paintings on that wall. Exactly. <laughs> and Anita's the artist. But I don't care. Max, I didn't really mean to hurt him. I understand. But I'm, I'm still not sorry. I'm not sorry about anything. You can take me back now. All right, all right, Susan. Susan. <laughs> Susan. <laughs> that's, that's a nice name. <laughs> The sheriff took Susan home to Westbrook. And Anita, after many embarrassed apologies, is back at work. I understand she's been commissioned to do a mural inside the sheriff's office. For those of you wondering about the unfortunate Max, 
It seems Dr. Cooper was very interested to learn of his book. So interested, in fact, that he's made Max a permanent fixture up at Westbrook. You could call him the resident author. I'll be right back. To any of you who are asking if there is a moral, a lesson to be learned from our little story, let me assure you, we do not attempt to moralize. We do not presume to teach. However, if you happen to be close friends with a writer who is hard up for a story, I would just say, be prepared for anything. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I saw it happen. I saw it happen. Now, Mary, you must get a hold of yourself. He was shot just as he turned the corner. His revolver was still in his holster. He never had a chance. Joe never had a chance. I know how hard it is, Mary. I saw it happen. Oh, why? Why did I see it happen? I saw it happen. As if I were sitting in a theater. And it was all taking place on a giant screen. And from that night on, I saw it happen. Every night. Every night I was condemned to relive it again. And again. And again. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Singapore. At all the places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. The National Broadcasting Company presents the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Steve. Hmm. You're going to run this pretty little boat right onto the rocks if you don't put your hands on the wheel. Uh-uh. Automatic pilot. W5, WRS, <laughs> calling w 2 I should have known you'd have one of those on your boat. <laughs> so help me. First time in my life I've ever used it, Evelyn. Eloise. Hello, sure, sure. Mm. W5, WRS, calling w 2 BYR. Steve. Mm. Why don't you turn that radio off, hmm? I never should have turned it on. What's all that W stuff? Hmm? Who's that silly woman trying to get, anyway? Oh, W5, me. WRS, what? calling W2BYR. That's the ship-to-shore operator. <laughs> Brother, you know them all. What does she want with you? I'm afraid I know. <laughs> well, I guess I better answer before they send the Coast Guard. <clears throat> W5WRS from W2BYR. Go ahead. Stand by, W2BYR. I have a call for you. Go ahead. This is Ruth, Steve. The commissioner wants to see you right away. Over. Now look, Ruth. I said only call me in an emergency. Over. The commissioner says this is an emergency. Over. But I'm in the middle of a big deal, Ruth. I'm tied up. Over. Just a minute, Steve. He says untie her and get into the office. But tell him... Oh, okay. I'll come back. Out. 
Eloise, I'm afraid And you'll... for this, I broke another day. Now, look, Eloise, I'm sorry. So what do I do? I go out and buy a new sunsuit. And I... it's a very nice sunsuit. I even fry some chicken for the first time in my life. I fry some chicken. But this probably won't take long. And what am I supposed to do in the meantime? And what am I going to do with all that fried chicken? Uh, well, keep it on ice for me, huh? <laughs> Hello, Commissioner. Steve, I trust you concluded your big deal satisfactorily. Uh, well, I... Uh -huh. <laughs> Steve, ever hear of the Throp Foundation? Throp Foundation? Sure. That's the private charity that's been sending a lot of relief shipments to Europe. Right. They've done quite a job over there. Tons of food and medical supplies. Yeah, that's the outfit. What about them? Their last three shipments to Sicily have been stolen. Oh, uh, you mean off the boat? No, from the foundation's warehouse in Messina, Sicily. I see. We've been instructed to get to the bottom of it. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Ruth has your credentials in order. Okay. On the surface, your assignment will be to write a story about the stolen shipments. Actually, I want you to find out who's been stealing those shipments. And to be frank, Steve, I'm sending you into a pretty nasty situation over there. What do you mean? The Throp Foundation has had two men working on this case... One of them has been missing for two weeks. Mm. What about the other one? Oh, they found him all right. His throat had been cut. Well, that's reassuring. We're sending you because we think you can take care of yourself and handle the danger. When do you want me to leave? Good. As soon as possible. Now, if you need help or information once you get to Sicily, contact Emilio Donati in Messina. Who's Emilio Donati? He runs a bar in Messina. We think he's a friend of ours. Okay. There's just uh, one more thing I should warn you about, Steve. You know, you're making this assignment sound real attractive, Commissioner. <laughs> what is it? I guess you've heard of the Sicilian bandit they call Lorenzo. Yeah, who hasn't? He's got the whole countryside terrorized. Steve, I don't know whether he has anything to do with all this or not, but if he has, now watch yourself. Yep, yeah. well, looks like I got a real honey this time. You did. But it's vital to us that those relief shipments get through. Trouble usually starts from empty stomachs. Yeah. That's all. You've got your assignment, Steve. Your plane leaves in two hours. Good luck. Eduardo, this is Dino speaking. The American just landed. See, si. report it to the chief at once. Ah, senor, taxi, eh? You want a taxi, senor? Yeah. Hey, uh, look, driver, you know your way around Messina pretty well, huh? Mas, you. I live here most of my life, senor. At the age of three, I was brought here from Palermo. So I know every house, every street, every building, every bar. Yeah, everything. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know your city. Now, take me to the Throp Foundation Warehouse. Again? Throp Foundation Warehouse. You know where it is? Throp? No, no. Throp. It's a... Ah, well, never mind. Just take me to the Rienzi Hotel. I'm sure you must have heard of that. Why, <laughs> sure. I'm going to put your baggage in the car, senor. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry I'm late. Hmm? <laughs> You're not late. You're just in time. I heard you inquiring for the Throp Foundation, so you must be Ralph Gillette. I'm Helen Collier. I was supposed to meet you here at the airport, and I... Uh, look, I'm afraid there's been a mistake. My name's not Gillette. It's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Oh, oh, I, I thought you were the one I was supposed to meet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Believe me, I'm sorry, too. Couldn't we just pretend I was? I'm afraid Mr. Archer wouldn't understand. <laughs> Already I don't like Mr. Archer. Don't even know him. Who is he? My boss. He's in charge of the foundation's office here in Messina. Oh, wait a minute. Do you work for the Throp Foundation? Mm-hmm. Mr. Archer's been expecting a new man to fly down from Rome, uh, Mr. Gillette. I thought you were he. Oh, I wonder if you'd tell me where the foundation office is. I'm a foreign correspondent, and I'd like an interview with your boss. Oh, well, I could go with you and show you where it is, because it doesn't look like Mr. Gillette is on the plane anyway. Fine. I have a cab over here. You say you're a foreign correspondent. I suppose you want to do a story on the stolen relief shipments. Yep. Well, good luck. Mr. Archer doesn't want any publicity about it. Mm -hmm. It would have an adverse effect on donations from the States. Oh, well, here we are. 
Uh, pardon us, gentlemen. Uh, si, senor. Eduardo, out of the man's way. Of course, your pardon, senor. Well, I'll see if I can get some kind of a statement from him. Are there just the two of you in the Messina office? Yes, right now. There were three of us. Paul Wainwright was the third, but he... Well, he got fired a few days ago. At the Hotel Rienzi, no? No. Trop Foundation. Tropa? Tropa? Oh, Via Delgada. Oh, si, senorina. Hey, you must have the magic touch. Uh, this Paul Wainwright, he was fired by Mr. Archer? Yes, three days ago. Senor, you ready, huh? See. Si. <laughs> Did you hear what the signorina told the driver? Si, Eduardo. Via Delgada. That is the address of the Throp Foundation. I will report it. You follow the American. Mr. Mitchell, you must understand my position. It's not that I don't want to cooperate with you and your press association, but at the same... The uh, stolen shipments are news, Mr. Archer, and news is my job. Well, I know all that, but just stop and think what's going to happen if the news spreads around back in the States. Our donations would probably stop coming in. We think it's vital that these shipments continue. I see. Well, in that case, could you give me an off-the-record statement about it? Hmm, I might, if I were sure it would be treated as such. I'll make a deal with you. We won't break the story unless or until the thieves are rounded up. Hmm. Well, all right. I guess that's fair enough. There have been three shipments stolen, right? Yes, from our warehouse. It's right downstairs. Yes, I noticed it as I came up. Did you have anyone guarding the shipments? Of course. We kept doubling the guard, but each time they were overpowered. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the thieves have a pretty large outfit. Yes, apparently they do. I suppose you've heard of the bandit they call Lorenzo. Oh, certainly. Everybody in Sicily's heard of him. He's got the whole country terrorized. He's supposed to have a hideout up in the mountains. Uh, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Mitchell. That Lorenzo's men could have stolen the shipments. I thought of that right away myself. Well, it's possible, isn't it? Yes, it's possible. Personally, I don't think Lorenzo had anything to do with it. With Lorenzo's reputation what it is, it would be relatively easy for someone else to make it look as if Lorenzo had done it. That's an interesting thought. Incidentally, you fired one of your men a few days ago, didn't you? Paul Wainwright? That is something that I'd rather not discuss. Oh? Of course, I don't want to persecute the man just because some of his actions appeared vaguely suspicious to me. I, uh, I have no proof of anything at all. I see. Well, thanks for the information. I'll see you later. <laughs> You wish a table, senor? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Please. Right here. Hmm. Thanks. I am Carlotta. What will you have? Beer. But it is after dark. It's time to drink wine. <laughs> Emily Post may not like it, but I still want beer. Anything you wish. I will bring it. <laughs> Look, uh, is the boss in, Carlotta? Emilio Tomati. See, he's here. Why? I like the scenery. I might set up a charge account. <laughs> Where is he? The fat one. Over at the bar. I will tell him to come over. No, no, no. Never Hello, mind. Sir. I'll go over there. I see, see. I'm coming. Emilio Donati? Eh? So I'm called, senor. I uh, told a friend of mine in the States I'd say hello to you. So? I know many people in the States, senor. I'm pretty sure you'll know my friend, the commissioner. Commissioner? Yeah. I think you're expecting me. I'm Steve Mitchell. A name can be used by anyone, senor. Here. You recognize the handwriting? Ah, see. Si. You are Steve Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Well, how can I help? I'm working on the theft of the relief shipments. Yeah, I thought that would be it. Oh, that's a very bad thing, Steve. There are so many people are hungry here in Sicily. Yeah. Uh, look, a fellow named Paul Wainwright was fired from the Throp Foundation a few days ago, and Archer acts like he thinks Wainwright's involved in the theft. Paul Wainwright, I know who he is. I'd like to talk to him. Can you arrange it? See, si. 
In an hour or two, I will send the word for him to come to the back room of my bar off the alley. We can talk to him there. Quarter after 11. Wainwright ought to be showing up pretty soon, hadn't he? See, si. He should have been here by now, Steve. Mm. There's another lead I want to run down to, Emilio. Hmm? Do you have any idea where the bandit Lorenzo's headquarters are? Oh, si. In the mountains to the west over here. Think you could furnish me a guide? A, a guide? Yeah. Just to get me into the general area. After that, I'll go it alone and do a little reconnoitering undercover. Steve, you must not try a thing like that. Look. It's the quickest way of proving whether Lorenzo's involved in these thefts or not. If he is, he's probably got a lot of the supplies hidden away in those mountains. But his men would capture you. He has lookouts all over the mountains. Well, just last month, an entire division went up there and... Sure, they... sure, that's the point. There were so many Lorenzo's men spotted them easy. But one man alone in the brush could be hard to find. But Steve, Lorenzo has a small army of cutthroats up there. They are fanatically loyal to him. Can you get me a guide? But look, the danger. You must realize the danger. Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo isn't stupid enough to kill an American correspondent. Ah, uh-huh. that must be Paul Wainwright. Oh, come in, uh, Senor Wainwright. No, thanks. Look, Donati, and you too, whatever your name is. There's a waste of time. We've got nothing to talk about. Oh! Wainwright. Uh, Knife in the back. Emilio, get out of the light. Get down. Yeah. Someone's running down the alley. Don't follow him, Steve. Huh? It may be a trap. There may be others waiting in the dark. Yeah, I guess you're right. Wainwright, see... He's a dead, Steve. Now perhaps you realize that there's a real danger here for you. They know you are not a correspondent. Do you still wish a guide? I'll be waiting in room 23, Rienze Hotel. All right. I will send a man over. <laughs> Senor Mitchell? Yeah, who are you? Casella. Casella? That's supposed to mean something to me? Emilio Donati sent me to you. Oh, oh, you're the guide. Si, senor. I am to conduct you to the mountain where Lorenzo and his band are hiding. Oh, Emilio didn't lose any time, did he? It was thought best to travel at night, so that we may be in the mountains before the sun comes up. Yeah, I guess that would be best. We will drive to the foot of the mountains by car. Then we'll use horses on the trails. It is all arranged. Good. When do you want to start? As soon as possible. Okay, let's go. Hey, pretty narrow trail up here, Casella. Uh, si, senor. About time for sunrise, isn't it? But a few more minutes and it will be light. Hmm. You say, you think Lorenzo's hiding out somewhere on that mountain up there ahead of us? See, si, uh, that is what I have heard. Okay, let's stop here a minute. I'll go it alone from here, Casella. There's no point in your going any farther. Thanks very much. Si, senor. You're right. There is no point in going any farther. Put your hands in front of you. What? Do as I say, senor. I am going to tie your hands. Look, what is this anyway? Hey, wait a minute. You're one of Lorenzo's men. So true, senor. It will do you no good to resist. Do not try to escape. There's a man blocking your trail. See? He has a gun. Okay, I'll try it through you. Stop! Come on! Stop! I'm coming through! Eduardo, quick! Come and help me! Eduardo, help! Okay, Casella. That's for the double cross, bub. Senor, I have a gun! I said, stop! Uh, Okay. Looks like you win. Good. Now I tie you. Hold your hands up. Okay. Here's one of them. All right, senor. I will use the gun this way. So, Senor Mitchell. Casella, are you all right? See, si, I, I think so. Except my nose. It is bleeding. Fool, you deserve it. Come, we'll take the American to Lorenzo. He's coming to Eduardo. Go tell Lorenzo. See? Si. Oh. oh. Casella. See, si, Casella. This is for the bloody nose you gave me, senor. Well, thanks. 
Looks like I got taken for the well-known ride. I thought Emilio Donato was a friend. <laughs> Sometimes it is difficult to know who your friends are. You're so right. Uh, here, here is Lorenzo now. Well, Senor Mitchell, you're feeling better now, huh? Not much. <laughs> Welcome to my camp. Thanks. So you're Lorenzo. See, si, I have that honor. Honor? Of course. Hmm. Where are we? Walk with me and I will show you. As you see, you're on top of a mountain. This is my headquarters. Mm -hmm. Hey, you can see a hundred miles from here. See, this is why I choose this place. But where are the guards? Guards? <laughs> you are not my prisoner, you are my guest. Mm -hmm. But see, below us, my men are camped there. Is it not a reassuring sight? Hey, that looks like a small army. One hundred and twenty patriots. <laughs> Patriots, you call them. Of course, they serve Lorenzo. <laughs> Got a pretty good opinion of yourself, huh? <laughs> I am one of the most brilliant men I have ever met. Really? <laughs> you know, you don't talk like you've spent your whole life in these mountains. Oh, I have, as you say, been around. I attended a university in Italy for two years. But you came back to this. How come? A sense of duty, senor. I rub the rich and give to the poor. Yeah? That sounds pretty, Lorenzo. But are you sure it's not just because you're a thief at heart? <laughs> you are shrewd, senor. Well, why not? From my experience in the world, I have learned that one must look out for oneself. Oh? Consider the recent war. Nobody won it. Consider the peace. Again, nobody wins it. Everyone quarrels and fights. Now, is it not much more clever to take what one wants, to be concerned only with oneself? You know... Your kind of thinking isn't helping things any. Perhaps not, but it is profitable to me. Uh, Senor, this conversation is pleasant, but I still do not understand why you were so anxious to spy on my camp. No? You ever hear of the Throp Foundation? No. What is it, Senor? A relief outfit that's been shipping food and medical supplies here to Sicily. Oh? Huh? Does this concern me? That's what I'm wondering. At least three shipments have been stolen from a warehouse in Messina. <laughs> and of course you think that I stole them. It's a pretty good bet. Well, I am sorry to disappoint you, senor, but as you see, there are no supplies here. Look around you. I have nothing to hide. No? Uh, it is my fate, senor. Whenever a crime is committed in Sicily, I am immediately accused. I suppose I should feel flattered. It has often occurred to me that the police must find me very convenient. How so? Uh, it would be most embarrassing for them if I were captured then they would have no one to blame for all their unsolved crimes. Well, I'm sorry you made this trip for nothing, senor. Well, if you've got nothing to hide, how come you went to so much trouble to capture me? I was told you wanted to see Lorenzo, so I thought I would make it easy. You were very rough with my men, senor. But uh, no matter. We will be friends. And you will go back to America and tell everyone what a gracious host is Lorenzo. Oh, huh? you want a press agent, huh? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Huh? That girl coming up the trail. She looks awfully familiar. Oh, her name is Carlotta. Yeah, yeah, now I recognize her. She works at Emilio Donati's bar. See, hmm. Everything's starting to add up. I am afraid Carlotta is not very happy with me at present. No? She has been very useful to me in the past, but she is so uh, possessive. She is very upset to learn that there had been another woman here. There, you see how she sulks? I believe she thinks that she is punishing me. Ah, Carlotta, my dear. Oh, speak to me, Lorenzo. Do not speak to me. You climbed up here to tell me that. I am true with you. You have not been true to me. Oh, you are not very flattering, my dear. Of course I have not been true to you. That would be to deprive others. Oh, so good for nothing, <laughs> you. I think I'd better leave you here to take out your temper on the American. I have other affairs to look after. The beast. I lie for him. I steal for him. Uh, maybe you ought to pick your friends a little more carefully. So, you're the one that put the bee on me at Donati's, huh? You had Lorenzo send that phony guide to my room. Treat me this way after all I do for him. Oh, the beast. I do not think you would treat me that way. Huh? I think if you were my friend, you would treat me nice. Now, look... Would you like to be Carlotta's friend? It's okay with me if you're trying to make Lorenzo jealous, but use somebody else. Kiss me. They cut it out. Ah, now on. Kiss me. Hey. You like it? Huh? Well, under other circumstances, maybe. Right now, no. You should not have done that, Carlotta. Lorenzo, Perhaps look. that will show you you cannot treat me as you have. 
If you do not want me, there are others who do. Uh, you are such a child, Carlotta. I am afraid this presents a problem. Look, there's no problem. I've got no interest in Carlotta, believe me. Oh, I'm aware of that. But some of my men there below may have seen her kiss you, senor, and that is the problem. I must not allow anything to shake their confidence in me. The appearance is everything. No, it is not Carlotta I am thinking about. She is nothing. Oh, dog, that you should talk about me like that. What if I were to tell the American about... Shut up, Carlotta. Wait a minute. What did you say, Carlotta? Then you would wish you had not treated me that way. I told you to keep your mouth shut. I will tell. Carlotta! On the other side of the mountain is a cave. Lorenzo has hidden the relief shipments there. Oh, well, people. Lorenzo, so you've got nothing to hide. Now, indeed, I have no choice, senor. Carlotta, give me your scarf. You are going to fight with the knives over me. Fool! To think it is you I am considering. Hey, look, how let's consider me for a minute. I did not intend to kill you, senor, but as you see, now I must. Here, take this knife. Now, wait a minute. Put the end of this scarf between your teeth. Huh? There, as I do the other end. Oh, what so, fool? now we circle slowly. Hey, look, let's cut out this foolishness, will you? Do not hold the knife that way. Huh? Use the underhand grip. Do you know nothing at all about knife fighting? As much as I want to know. Not for the last time. I am sorry. Defend yourself. Okay, you ask for it. <clears throat> you twist the knife from my hand. Yeah. You may know knife fighting, but you're pretty sad on judo. <clears throat> oh, Lorenzo! You've killed Lorenzo! Just a rabbit punch, lady. Won't even leave a scar. So long. Dog of a dog! Oh, God. Carissimo. Oh. He has killed you. Oh. Oh, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. Will you stop that silly babbling? Lorenzo, you are all right. See, si, except the back of my neck. I will tell your men to go after him. No, this is a personal matter. They might find it hard to understand how the American escaped from me. I will go after him alone. I will go with you. You will wait here, Carlotta. I will attend to you when I return. Lorenzo. I may be gone until dark, because if I do not find the American, then there is someone in Messina I must talk to. Now get me my horse. Oh, boy, my wind is shot. Maybe it's the altitude. Hey, my horse. Ahead of me somewhere. I better play it safe. Donati! What? Over here, Emilio. Steve, Steve Mitchell, you are safe. Yeah. I sent a guide to your room the first thing this morning. He said you were gone. Yeah, one of Lorenzo's men got there first. Your waiter, Carlotta, tipped them off about me. Carlotta? Yeah. Think that horse of yours can carry both of us? Ma, Lorenzo's men, they will be after you. Yeah, yeah, that's a good reason for not hanging around here any longer. All right, come. I, I'm going to help you up in it. Wait, listen. That horse is coming. Come on, get your horse into the brush here. Uh, uh, Cover up his nose so he won't whinny. Uh, Lorenzo, he's alone. Yeah, heading towards Messina, too. Look, I have a gun. We can capture him. No, no, not yet, Emilio. Come on, we'll give him the lead, then follow him into Messina. It's possible he's got more on his mind than just finding me. If so, I want to know what it is. Lorenzo. Your arch. Why, you, you fool, coming here to the foundation office. My secretary will be back any minute. The American escaped. What? How could he? We will not go into that. Oh, you stupid fool. You've ruined everything. Mitchell must know all about the stolen shipments now. See, he knows I stole them, but he does not know that you are involved, Archer. He might as well. We're through now, Lorenzo. Through. And all because of your stupidity. Do not talk that way to me, Archer. I planned it so well. Even when Paul Wainwright became suspicious, I fired him. Then I had his mouth shut permanently. And now you've ruined it, you blundering half-breed. You keep your mouth shut. This will help you. Lorenzo, I'll kill you. This gun is quicker than your knife. Well, Lorenzo and Archer, <laughs> the gold dust twins. Mitchell. <laughs> Very neat. So you two did work it together, huh? You're, you're wrong, Mitchell. I, I've just captured a notorious bandit. Huh? Uh, you lying dog. It was you who arranged me. Get, hey. get back, get back, Mitchell. Give me that. That gun's safer with me, Archer. Uh, you, you've got nothing on me. You mean because Lorenzo can't talk? 
you want to put it that way? There's one witness you overlooked, Archer. Carlotta. Yeah. When she finds out you killed Lorenzo, she'll sing plenty, and it's a song you're not going to like. Well, did you send your report to the commissioner, Steve? Yeah, I called him. He said the prop foundation had sent a new man over to head up the office here. Well... And now you can relax for a few days. We, we're going to eat and drink and have a good time. You will have such a food as you never tasted. Scalopini, escarole, a peach. I, I, peach I, 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 that I, melts in I, your that, mouth. That sounds fine, Emilio, but I, I think I'll be heading back to the States. But what's the hurry? Well, someone back there is keeping some fried chicken on ice for me. Well, it, 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 fried chicken? Yeah. It's got to be eaten on a boat, too. Steve, I don't understand. What's so special about eating a fried chicken on a boat? Well, you see, she's uh, not the chicken. That is, I... Oh, well, just take my word for it, huh? So long, Emilio. just heard the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy and written by Bob Wright. This program was directed by Bill Karn with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, as Steve Mitchell, embarks on another Dangerous Assignment. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly, welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The story you are about to hear is a love story. But a love story which begins at the point where many love stories end. It begins after the wedding march has been played after the vows of love and fidelity exchanged. It begins on the honeymoon in a strange and terrifying fashion. Don't! Don't! Don't come near me! Stay! Stay away from me, Dad! Susan, are you out of your head? I saw her picture! Do you hear me? I found her picture! On our honeymoon! <laughs> mystery drama, Deadly Honeymoon, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser, and stars Betsy von Furstenberg and Michael Wager. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K Cereal. I'll return shortly with Act One. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with drinking Budweiser sip by sip, is there? Well, the brewers of Budweiser think there's a better way. Sipping's fine if you're drinking wine. But Bud is the king of beers, a hearty drink. Look, rinse a 10 or 12 ounce glass with cold water. Then open a can or bottle of Bud and pour it right down the middle so it kicks up a good head of foam. Now, take a big drink and then swallow big. No sips. That's how it should be done. More taste, more beer-drinking enjoyment. Thanks to exclusive Beechwood aging, Budweiser has a smoothness that lets it go down especially easy. Sure, it's an expensive way to brew beer, but brewing beer right does make a difference. That's why when you say Budweiser, you've said it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. This is WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. 
shop right does the can can selling shop right brand of vegetables and can can for quality that you can trust for tasty corn asparagus for peas and beans at gourmet scenes for beef that beat all other treats the only vegetables that can compare at all with shop right brand are vegetables you think yourself instead of picking off our shelf Shop at Shoprite Can Can Blast. You'll go time to the stock up while the value grabs. Stock up on Shoprite Soda. Tell 12 ounce cans for 79 cents. Potatoes that will make the meal. And carrots that have big appeal. A pack of cash that makes the splash. Spinach that won't finish last. begins 36,000 feet in the air on a flight which departed from New York's Kennedy Airport and in another hour will be touching down at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. There are almost a hundred passengers on this flight, but an observant stewardess is giving special attention to that handsome couple in seats 18A and 18B. Perhaps it's because all honeymooners have a special radiance. Are you sure you wouldn't like some more coffee? Oh, no, thanks. Not for me. I wouldn't mind a cup. Here you are. Thanks. Just ring if you need anything else. You'd think we were the only people on this flight. As far as I'm concerned, we are. Oh, Dan, I feel absolutely drunk with happiness. Is that a funny word for the way I feel? No. It's a great word, Susan. I was flying hours before we got on the plane. Oh, what time did you say we land in Chicago? About 2.30. Is it, is it far from the airport to the hotel? No, oh, actually, it's only about a half an hour from O'Hare to downtown. About uh, 16 miles. Still, I don't think we'll have time to make Evanston today, do you? Hmm. Well, it might be better to go in the morning. You can call your aunt from the hotel. Dan, you sure you don't mind going to Evanston? I mean, I just couldn't possibly be a few miles away and not see Aunt Clara. Besides... I want to show off my new husband to somebody, and she's all the family I have. Was she your mother's sister? No, no, my father's. She came east when my parents were killed in that crash. Stayed with me for a month or so. <laughs> that was about the most that either one of us could stand. She sounds like a holy terror. Oh, no, she's just crotchety, that's <laughs> all. But she'll only be more crotchety if she learns that I passed through Chicago and didn't even stop by. <laughs> What kind of work are you in, Mr. Carey? All right. Now, we like to say we're management consultants, Mrs. Rowland. But we also do a, quite a bit of executive recruitment. I don't understand a word of that. Dan helps corporations find the right people for important jobs, Aunt Clara. His firm is the biggest in the field. Isn't it, Dan? Well, it's always hard to measure business like ours. But it has offices everywhere, doesn't it? In most of the major cities, yes. And now Dan is going to take over the branch in San Francisco. He's going to manage the entire thing. Is that some kind of a promotion? Oh, of course it is. I asked the gentleman, Susan, to speak when you're spoken to. Oh, sorry. Yes, Mrs. Rowland, it is a promotion. Truth is, it's a job that everyone in my office has been after. Oh, it's just worked out so beautifully for us. I mean, Dan having to move to San Francisco... We're sort of combining a business trip with a cross-country honeymoon. And where do you go from here? Well, we're planning to stay two days in Chicago, and then we're going to Dallas. We're going to cross the Rio Grande in New Mexico. I know a great little hotel in Monterey. Then we're going to Las Vegas. To gamble, I suppose? Well, it's no fun going to Las Vegas if you don't gamble a little. Your father never gambled for so much as a dime, Susan. That wasn't the way he made his fortune. Well, I promise not to bankrupt the family, Aunt Clara. Anyway, we're just staying in Las Vegas overnight, and then going to Los Angeles. Three days later, I report to work. Thoroughly exhausted, of course. <laughs> well, that's your idea of a honeymoon. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Susan, I suppose lunch is almost ready. You want to help me bring it out? Oh, yes, of course. Kitchen's this way in case you've forgotten. The truth is, I have. I'm glad to be able to talk to you alone for a minute, Susan. Did you like Dan, Aunt Clara? Isn't he good-looking? Older than you, isn't he? What difference does that make? How long did you know him? 
Oh, we we met at a party at the Williamson's. Do you remember my friend, Tracy Williamson? Didn't ask you where you met. I'm asking you when. Well, <laughs> it was about three weeks ago. Three weeks? Oh, for the love of heaven, Susan. Aunt Clara, the time you know somebody isn't always the most important thing. He's practically a stranger. How can you be sure of anything about a man you've known for three weeks? From the time we met, I saw Dan every single day. Susan, when a girl is all alone in the world, when she has independent means Please, of her own... Please, don't start in about Dan being a fortune hunter. I don't have that much money, and it's all in trust anyway. And I assure you, Dan earns enough income to take care of us both very well. Well, I'm sorry, Susan. I know I don't have any control over what you do. You're too old for that. But I've seen something to the world, too, you know. And the most important lesson I've ever learned is never trust a stranger. Oh, Aunt Clara, that's ridiculous. Now, can we bring out the lunch? I don't know. I just, I just have the feeling that Chicago wasn't all you expected it to be. Well, we weren't there very long, Dan. And don't forget, we, we spend half the time with your business associates. Oh, honey, I, I am sorry about that. I suppose I never should have called Bill Kincaid to say we're in town. Should have known he'd insist on getting together. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I just didn't know what he was talking about half the time. All those office politics. <laughs> yes. Well, Bill loves to gossip. But you can see what I mean about the San Francisco job. Everybody in the company wanted it. They'll never get over resenting me for being picked. But I am sorry if you were bored. It's all right, Dan, really. After all, I inflicted Aunt Clara on you. She was okay. Well, I know you didn't find her very friendly. Well, why should she be? I think she's a very protective type. Anybody you married would get her job if die. <laughs> yes, I suppose that's true enough. Dan, how long did you know Terry Williamson? Who? Oh. Terry, my ex-roommate. We met each other at her house. Or have you forgotten that already? Tell you the truth, darling. I didn't know whose house I was at that night. Oh, so Terry wasn't the one who invited you? No. It was a man named Bob Chambers, one of the executive types. I got placed at General Utilities. So don't ask me who invited him, because I don't know. I see. So it was all sort of roundabout. What's the difference? It still turned out to be the best party I ever attended. Yeah. Hey, something the matter? Oh, no, of course not. Nothing at all. Uh, Dan, where did you say we were staying in Dallas? It's a little hotel called the Lazy Sea. It's kind of rustic, but I think you'll like it. Besides, we'll only be there one night. We'll rent a car in the morning and drive down to Monterey. You really know all the offbeat places, don't you? Well, when you travel around enough, I, I guess you begin looking for them. But you haven't done that much traveling on the job, have you? Huh? Well, no, not that much. <laughs> Say... Do you know the name of the airport in Dallas? Um, I forget. It's called Love Field. Isn't that a great name for honeymooners? Yes. Hi, Susan. Oh, there you are. I was starting to worry. No, I had a little trouble with the phone lines back to New York, but I got through okay. Everything all right? Yeah, sure, everything's fine. Hey, <laughs> you look a little strange, though. Oh, no, I'm all right. I had a drink while I was waiting for you. Say, you better watch that taquilla. It sneaks up on you like a bandito. Actually, uh, something sort of funny happened. What do you mean? Dan, when we were in Chicago in that, in that restaurant, I forget the name of it, the place we went to with Bill? Yes, when you and your friend were talking about all the office politics back in New York. I saw this, this man looking at us. What man? Well, he was at the bar. I'm not even sure why I noticed him. He was wearing this plaid raincoat. I remember wondering if it had started to rain. I guess you were just bored with all our talk. Anyway, I saw him turn to look at us. Probably to look at you. Can't blame him for that. The funny thing is, as soon as you turned around, he got up very quickly and left. Susan... I don't remember seeing anyone in a plaid raincoat. And I'm afraid I don't see anything unusual about it. Well, I guess I didn't either. I probably wouldn't have given it another thought, but I... I think I saw that same man here again today. In Monterey? Oh, you're kidding. 
But I can't swear it was him. I didn't get a good look at his face the first time. All I really noticed was the coat. And you saw the coat again? Is that it? Yes. He was carrying it over his arm. Oh, darling. You know the story about the airport truck? Airport truck? No. Well, this guy on a plane looks out the window and sees one of those a little red airport trucks. You know, fueling a plane, bringing food aboard, something like that. Anyway, the plane takes off from New York and lands in Chicago. Another little red truck comes out to meet it. The guy next to him says, Hey, we made good time, didn't we? And he says, Yeah, but that little red truck really made time. <laughs> well, I can see that I didn't marry a great audience. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. It, it's just, it, it bothered me a little. Oh, forget it. And speaking of airports, next up, the City of Angels. <laughs> Oh, I see. Excuse me. Yes? You're Mrs. Daniel Carey, aren't you? Why, yes, I am. Do I know you? No, Mrs. Carey, but I know you. Saw your husband leaving the hotel about half an hour ago. Are you planning on meeting him? Uh, wait a minute. I've seen you before. Have you? You're the man with the coat, the plaid raincoat. Well, you happen to be right. I do own a plaid raincoat, but with this nice sunny weather... Excuse me. Look, Mrs. Carey, I know it seems as if I'm following Yes, it does. Well, okay, it's true, but I've had a reason. Such as? Could we talk about it someplace? There's a coffee shop in the hotel. I'm sorry. I don't even know who you are. Maybe it would help if I introduced myself. My name is Harrington, Lieutenant Gail Harrington, attached to New York City Police Department. Police? That's right, Mrs. Carey. So you see, what I have to discuss with you is police business. But what what have I done? It's nothing you've done. It concerns your husband. And what he might do. like Dan and Susan Carey's honeymoon is in for a surprise. Or perhaps more than one. Maybe Susan will soon wonder if her Aunt Clara wasn't right about a number of things, including her cynical advice about trusting no strangers. We'll find out about the new stranger in Susan's life when I return shortly with Act Two. Now another tale of the bar and chain. At Kellogg's Special K presents... Presents Last Tango in Pittsburgh. There I was at Raoul's All Right Tango Lounge. My little orchid, will you tango with me? It was Raoul. You're a splendid dancer. But what was that? I was what? That sound effect. Oh, I'm a few pounds overweight. And this ball and chain points out how my extra weight can get in the way. I'm pointing you back to your chair. Our heroine decided to lose that extra weight. She exercised and ate smart at every meal, starting with a special K breakfast. A bowl of special K, skim milk, tomato juice, and coffee. It's less than 240 calories, 99% fat-free, and 100% delicious. After a while, she was rid of the ball and chain and back at Raoul's. Darling, you're looking fantastic. What a happy ending. What an ending. We're just getting started. Raoul, hmm? get lost. Your happy ending could begin with the Kellogg's Special K breakfast. And that's another tale of the ball and chain. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. <laughs> Suburban Savings for Suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta.
In the pleasant, cheerful atmosphere of a coffee shop in a large Los Angeles hotel, newlywed Susan Carey finds herself facing a man she has never seen before. A man whose solemn eyes look at her over a steaming cup of coffee and seem to warn her of nightmares to come. But so far, Lieutenant Gail Harrington of the New York Police Department is merely asking questions. How long have you been married now? Only about ten days. Was it a long engagement? Did you know your husband for some time before? No. No, not very long. Well, could you, could you be more specific? How long ago did you meet him? And where? Well, it's a month now. Just about that. A month. Hmm. Then you really don't know much about him, do you? Oh, you and Aunt Clara. Beg your pardon? Lieutenant, will you please tell me what this is about? Has my husband committed some crime? Is that what you're implying? Oh, I didn't say that, Mrs. Carey. But believe me, it would be helpful to both of us. If you could just tell me a little bit about the circumstances. You know, I don't see why this has to be so one-sided. Now, please bear with me. All right. I met Dan at a party at a friend's house about a month ago. We talked a lot. We liked each other. We started dating. I saw him every single day. Uh, what business did he tell you was in? Oh, you make it sound as if he lied to me. No, I didn't mean to do that. He's a management consultant. I know he is. He's just gotten a very important job in San Francisco. Head of the entire office. We're going there tomorrow. So that was the purpose of the trip. Yes. But since you've been married ten days... I gather it's a honeymoon as well. Well, naturally it is. Yes, naturally. Lieutenant. Miss Carey, do you know if your husband was ever married before? Married? No. Are you really certain? It's police business. But tell me that Dan's a bigger mister or something? No, Mrs. Carey, certainly not that. Then what is it? I've got to tell you, but you have to... have to understand one thing. Now, I am not assigned to this case anymore. My interest is strictly unofficial. I may be completely mistaken, but you're the only one who can prove it one way or another. Prove what? About whether your husband ever called himself Don Crawford. And once, four years ago, David Chase. See? All the same initials, like Dan Carey. You are saying he's a criminal. Not just a criminal, Mrs. Carey. A wife killer. You're crazy. I hope so. Believe me, I do. Let me start at the beginning. If you still think I'm crazy by the time I'm finished, I'll be happy to buy you that coffee and go on my way. But if you think I'm not, if you have any doubts, then I want you to tell me so and let me help you. All right. Go on. I know you're wrong, but go on. I first heard of Don Crawford back in 1965 when I was attached to the homicide detail in the Los Angeles PD. Mrs. Crawford was the former Edith Burbank. She was the youngest daughter of a wealthy family in Baltimore. Only when I saw her, she was never going to enjoy her money anymore. She was dead. Her throat had been cut by one of those, quote, mysterious intruders, unquote, that the papers liked to write about. Her husband, Don, was broken-hearted, naturally. They'd only been married four weeks. But her death also made him some money. Uh, not a fortune, really. There was a mix-up about her will, and he ended up with nothing but a handsome payoff from the family. Mrs. Carey, are you okay? I... I can't believe I'm sitting here listening to this... I won't be long, I promise. Anyway, I was assigned to the Crawford case, and I didn't exactly cover myself with glory. You mean you never found the mysterious intruder? That's right. So naturally, you decided that maybe there wasn't any. Let me go on, Mrs. Carey. Okay? Yes. Yes, go on. Anyway, I ran into a similar case about four years ago. The murder of a young bride, fresh from her honeymoon. A broken-hearted groom named David Chase. I thought Chase and Crawford were one and the same man. But I couldn't convince the district attorney of the resemblance. But I am still convinced, Mrs. Carey... And you think Dan is the same person? Oh, he's changed again, of course. His hair is lighter than Chase's. He's thinner and paler. But there's something about the face I can't forget. And even if it's true, you still have no proof. Is that it? 
You couldn't solve your case, so you're holding on to your first solution. Wait, Mrs. Carey. Let me tell you why I was so sure that Crawford and Chase were the same man. It was because of the honeymoon. What? It's my theory that their honeymoons were identical. A compulsive honeymoon, you might say. That is ridiculous. Criminals are like that. Creatures of habit, most of them. Afraid to change a pattern, maybe for fear that their luck will change with it. What do you mean by it? I stumbled on the coincidence accidentally. But as far as I could trace it, Don Crawford and David Chase took their brides to the same places. They did the same things. And I knew that if I ever saw that pattern duplicated, I would have my killer. I hope I'm wrong, Mrs. Carey. But you are the only one who can tell me. And my first question is this. Was your first stop Chicago? Yes. Yes, of course it was. And you knew that. That's where we first saw you, in Chicago, in that restaurant. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure. You can't possibly make something out of that. Dan wanted to see people in the Chicago office, and I thought it would be nice to visit my aunt in Evanston. She's my family. Was your next stop after Chicago in Texas? Yes, we went to Dallas. Dallas is a wonderful place to visit, Lieutenant. I don't see anything so peculiar about that. Both Chase and Crawford went to Dallas. They chose offbeat hotels. I guess they didn't care to be seen very much. Where did you stay in Dallas? It was a perfectly nice hotel. I, I don't think you could describe it as offbeat. <sighs> All right. And then the next stop would be Monterey. You knew we were in Monterey because that's where I saw you the second time. By that time, Mrs. Carey, I'd made up my mind to follow you. Are you saying that these these supposed white killers you're talking about also went to Monterey? Yes, they did, and from Monterey to Las Vegas. Well, then you're wrong, Lieutenant. You're completely wrong. You mean you didn't go to Vegas? No. So there goes your famous theory, doesn't it? Well, I... I admit I'm We spies. changed our mind about Vegas. We decided that we might be too tempted to gamble away all the money we had for the trip. Ah, so you did have it on the schedule. Well, yes. Yes, we did, but we didn't go. <laughs> I really think that changes the pattern. The fact that you didn't go. Oh, please, I... I can't stand any more of it. I... I don't want to hear any more of it. Mrs. Carey, Edith Burbank was killed in Los Angeles in her hotel room. This hotel. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. I'm Mrs. leaving right Carey, now. Mrs. Carey, wait. You're wrong. You're wrong. You've got Dan mixed up with someone else. Let me finish, please. Just one more moment. Oh, please. No, no, no. Please let me go. Well, there you are. Oh. I didn't realize that, that you were back already. Yeah. I, I told you I wouldn't be gone more than half an hour. I, I thought you'd be in the room. I, uh, I went downstairs to get a magazine. Didn't they have any? <laughs> well, I, I guess I forgot to buy one. I got to looking in the windows of the dress shops, and I, I forgot my original purpose completely. Susan, are, are you okay? Of course. Why do you ask? I don't know. You... You've got that funny look in your eyes again. Have I? Doesn't matter. There's still the two most beautiful eyes in the world. Hey. What is this? Don't tell me the honeymoon's over so soon. Why do you say that? Uh, that was like kissing a snowman. I guess I... I just don't feel like myself today. I think maybe... Oh. Oh, all this traveling has worn me down a little. Oh, I am. I'm sorry. Well, we, we don't have much further to go. Just one more plane trip to San Francisco. Yes. Look, maybe you'd rather not go out tonight. Maybe you ought to stay in, order some dinner in the room. I don't mind. But you wanted to go to that restaurant, the one you told me about. You've been looking forward to it. The landmark? Yeah, yeah. Well, I did want to try the place. It was supposed to be really spectacular. But you've never eaten there before. Well, no, how could I? I've never been in L.A. before. I was thinking today that, well, you seemed to know the city so well when we drove around. You, you didn't seem to have the slightest trouble. The streets are very well marked in this town. It's really a pleasure to drive here. I... Look, you know what I think? I 
talking to you ought to take a nap before dinner. Yes. I was thinking of lying down, but I don't think I can sleep. Okay, then. Just just read your magazine. Wait a minute. You haven't got one. I'll take care of that. Where are you going? Going to get my bride something to read. How about a nice magazine about cooking? You know, I never did ask you if you can cook. Just get me a news magazine of some kind, all right? Uh Uh-huh, the brainy type. (laughs) I should have known. See you in ten minutes. I'll take the key so, so you won't have to get up. Yes. All right. Oh, dear God. It can't be true. There just can't be any truth to what that man said. He, he's made a mistake. A terrible mistake. Down his luggage. His initials, D.C. Oh, but anyone could have those initials. Anyone. I wonder if... It's open. Oh, for heaven's sake, what am I doing? Searching my husband's luggage like... Like some kind of hotel thief. No. I won't do it. I won't. I'm not going to believe any of it. I won't. (gasps) Who's that? Hello? Mrs. Carey, it's Gail Harrington. Leave me alone. Stop bothering me. You shouldn't have run off like that, Mrs. Carey. You didn't give me a chance to finish what I was saying. I told you, I, I don't want to hear any more. It, it isn't true. You've made a mistake, Lieutenant. Your husband is at the newsstand right now, Mrs. Carey. I can see him from where I'm standing at the house phones. And the more I look at him, the more sure I am that I'm right. No, you're wrong. I want you to hear the rest of the story about Crawford and David Chase and what they did on their honeymoon. Maybe what I told you before didn't convince you, but if you heard a few more things... I'm going to hang up, Lieutenant, right now. I wanted you to know where Don Crawford took his wife the night she was murdered in a room. He took her to a restaurant called The Landmark. You ever hear of it? Mrs. Carey? Hey, are you listening? No. No, I'm not listening. I won't listen. And so, Susan Carey seems to have a date at the Landmark Restaurant in Los Angeles with her loving husband, Dan. If she keeps the date, something tells me that she's not going to do their cuisine very much justice. Because one needs peace of mind to enjoy good food. Fear affects the salivary glands, and terror ruins the taste buds. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. I'm High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater, and I'm most enthusiastic about this new adventure in modern radio. Here's what listeners are telling us. Your program was absolutely great. Don't oil the door. Or again, you've got yourself a winning show. We'd like your reactions, too. Right now, we're in the last week of our drawing for 50 prizes a week. Two AM FM stereo phonos, two travel clock radios, and 46 anthologies of modern suspense. Just mail your name and address, and you're eligible, to Mystery Theater, Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. That's Box 50, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. Entries must be postmarked no later than Saturday, January 26th. Offer good everywhere unless locally prohibited. This is WOR New York, your mystery theater station. An invitation. This is Peter Roberts. Join us Sunday morning, 8.15 to 10 here on WOR for Rambling with Roberts. Two hours of music, uh, specially selected for Sunday morning listening pleasure, along with uh, full bits of weather information, news headlines, Uh, Bits of trivia, such as the fact that uh, a man from Onoa, Iowa, received a patent for what he called Eskimo pie, which was ice cream coated with chocolate. It all happened in 1922. It may not seem like very much in the way of history, 
but it does take place, these little bits of trivia and information, on Rambling with Roberts. So, of a Sunday morning, make a note. 8.15 to 10, right here at 7.10 on your dial, come Rambling with Roberts. You don't have to give us an RSVP, just be on hand. Thank you. A quiet meal for two at the Landmark Restaurant? No. We seem to be in a hotel room. The same room in which we last saw our honeymooning couple, Susan and Dan Carey. Obviously, there's been a change of plan. Room service has provided the meal for the two lovers this evening. Can it be that Susan Carey has decided that if there is a pattern, it must be broken? Have some more wine, honey. No. I really don't think I want any. Hey, come on. You know what this bottle cost. <laughs> you shouldn't have been so extravagant. Uh-oh. That sounds more like a wife than a bride. Well, $18 is an awful lot for a wine, Dan. Especially when I... I really can't drink that much of it. I just wanted to make up... Well, well never mind. You mean for not taking me to the landmark? No, it doesn't really matter. I told you, it's, it's fun to eat in the room. It's very elegant. I'm sure you were disappointed at... No, I, I really wasn't. Look, we're not going to be very far from Los Angeles. We'll probably fly down from San Francisco a few times a year. There are dozens of wonderful restaurants in San Francisco, too, aren't there? So they tell me. I'll ask the guys at the office for recommendations. I think this food is quite good, don't you? Yeah, sure, it's, it's fine. It tastes even better with the wine. Well... All right. I'll have some more, I guess. That a girl. Now, look, I'm not trying to get you drunk, you understand, so I can take advantage of you. Although, come to think of it... Dad, oh, don't. You almost knocked the table over. Sorry, I guess I got a little carried away. You look very delectable in that robe. Oh, did you really like it? Irresistible. I didn't take much of a wardrobe with me. You said you were going to buy clothes in San Francisco. Yes, if I can find out where to go, I... I'll take you down to Union Square. I hear that's the place. Oh, I have told you about the weekend, haven't I? No. What about it? Well, I thought we'd get our first look at the town by taking one of those Circle Line cruises. that okay with you? Oh, yes, that, that sounds lovely. Ah. I love to see places by water. And if we can squeeze it in, we might go picnicking in Golden Gate Park. They've got this Japanese tea garden that's supposed to be very nice. Yes. All sounds wonderful, Dan. Susan, I... I just wish you felt better. Listen, I... Maybe you ought to check with the hotel doctor in, in case you picked up a bug or something. Do I look that bad to you? No. You look just... great to me. Darling. <laughs> Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea, honey. Reserve the car ahead of time. We, then we can pick it up right away in San Francisco. Whatever you think, Dan. You wait right here. I'll go over to the counter. He's all right. Be back in ten minutes. All right, Dan. Mrs. Carey. Oh, no. Not you again. I didn't mean to startle you. Go away. Please go away. I don't want to see you anymore. I hear anything you have to say. Now, I know that I seem to be persecuting you or something. As you can see, Lieutenant, I am in perfectly good health. I was not murdered in my sleep in that hotel room. Look, Mrs. Carey, I've only got a few minutes before your husband gets back. I just wanted to finish my story about this other guy, this David Chase. I don't care if you are a policeman. I'll call someone and have you arrested for bothering me. David Chase's wife didn't get killed in Los Angeles. She died in San Francisco. Where? In a hotel room? No, not there. But they stayed at the San Remo. Is that where you're staying? Yes. But millions of people do. No, there wasn't any mysterious intruder this time. In fact, Mrs. Chase's death was listed officially as an accident. She had a little too much to drink at dinner, and her feet got tangled up on top of a very steep hill. The fall broke her neck. It was her very first day in San Francisco. She and her husband had quite a day, too. They took one of those boat cruises to see the city. Then they went to Golden Gate Park to the Japanese tea garden. 
Miss Carey, are you okay? No. No, I'm... I'm not okay. How could I be? That night they went to a restaurant called the Vendôme. That's where the lady drank too much, at least according to her husband. Oh, dear God. Listen, Mrs. Carey, I can't follow you anymore. I've got a job to get back to. I want you to take this. Con. Quiet. Don't draw anyone's attention to us. Just take it. If I'm wrong and you don't need it, fine. Just throw it away. No. I don't want I it. I cannot have you on my conscience, don't you understand? All right. Yes, all right. I'll take it. I still say you're wrong. I hope so. But I don't think I am. Hello? Mrs. Carey? Yes? This is the message desk. Your husband left a message here for you at 4 o'clock. Oh, I've been out until now. Hey, would you like me to read it to you? Uh, yes, please. It says... We'll be at the office until 6. Should be there no later than 6.30, Love, Dan. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Welcome. Bye. 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 6.30. 6.20 now. Oh, God. Why do I keep staring at his luggage? Why can't I just forget about it? It isn't dishonest. It's just something I have to do. No, no, nothing in this one but clothing. This one has papers and things. All his documents. Birth certificate. Honorable discharge. U.S. Navy. Daniel Eldon Carey. That is his name. It is. That Matt Harrington was wrong. Doesn't this mean he was wrong? Or does it just mean that... No. I'm not going to start thinking that way. These look like... photographs. Maybe his family... Oh, no, wait. This picture is signed. It's your pretty girl. To Dan... All my love forever, Edith. Edith. What was the name he said? That policeman, what was the name that man's wife was? Wasn't it Edith? Oh, no. Who is it? It's me, honey. Oh, uh, one second. Hi, sweetheart. Sorry. I forgot to take my key. Hey, I'm not late, am I? I told him at the desk I'd be back at 6... Well, it's not even that. Hey, why is it so dark in here, Susan? Oh, I, I just... I just got back myself. I... I didn't think of turning on all the lights. Susan, I have a confession to make. <laughs> I wasn't at the office at all. My new staff thought they ought to christen the new boss. I tell you one thing about San Francisco... It's a hard-drinking town. <laughs> Susan, what's the matter? Dan. I found her picture. What? I found her picture. Your first wife's. What are you talking about? I was never married. Then what's her picture doing in your luggage? Hey, 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 what's going on here? You must be drunk as I am. Look, near me. Stay away from me, Dan. Susan, are you out of your head? I saw her picture. Do you hear me? I found her picture. On our honeymoon. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you, do you mean Edith? I know all about her. Yes, and about the other one. She drank too much, too, didn't she? She was drunk, too. Now, look, will you calm down? Is that what you were planning to do tonight? Get me drunk at the restaurant? You were going to take me out to dinner tonight, weren't you? Of course I was. I asked one of the guys at the... Now, I can tell you the restaurant he picked. Do you want me to tell you the name of the restaurant, Dan? It's the Von Dome, isn't it? What? What? Well, yes. I mean, it is. How did you know that? Because 
I know it all. I know everything. Oh! No, 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 don't. No, don't come here. I'll call the police. Susan, look, look. I don't know what the trouble is, but you've got to be sick. You need help. No, don't come any closer. You've been acting funny ever since we left Chicago. I warn you. Look. Look. My God. I've got a gun. Susan, put that down. I'm not going to end up like them. Give me that thing, Susan. Don't. Oh, don't, Susan. Susan. I don't Susan. want to shoot you. <laughs> One second. Well. Mr. Harvey. Mrs. Carey. I didn't know that you were... Um, look, let me just get a shirt on. I was just shaving. I'm sure you're surprised to see me, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I... I didn't expect that you'd... Uh, what, what brings you back to L.A.? I'm sure you know, Mr. Harvey. That is the right name, isn't it? Not... Harrington? <laughs> I guess that means you know all about my little joke. The gun wasn't a joke, was it? The gun was real. Now, look, I can tell you're upset, but I didn't mean any harm. I mean, I like Dan. I really you do. You despised my husband, Mr. Harvey. Why don't you admit it? You hated the fact that he got the job you wanted in San Francisco. And all you got was an assistant manager's job in Chicago. Uh, you are wrong. I just thought it would be a good gag, a good joke on Danny Boy. Yes. I've heard about your reputation. The great practical joker. You thought of a great one this time. Yeah, but that's all it was. You gave Dan the itinerary for our honeymoon trip. You were just being helpful, of course. You gave him all the names and places... All the benefit of your traveling experience. That was the gag. See, I thought if Dan took you to all the places I listed for you him... You even knew about Edith, the girl he was once engaged to, the one who died. She became his murder victim in your little fantasy. What did you think would happen, Mr. Harvey? Did I get frightened enough to kill Dan so that you might get the job he took away from you? Uh, listen, is, 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 is Dan all right? I thought you might want this back, Mr. Harvey. Your gun. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't do anything stupid. Oh, you don't have to worry. I found out that I'm a terrible shot. That... that Dan's alive? See for yourself. Hello, Marty. Dan! Thank heavens you're okay. Look, Dan, I didn't mean for anything serious to happen. See the bandage, Marty? Just a flesh wound in my arm. I'll be okay. I'm glad to hear it, Danny. Honest, I am. Mm -hmm. But I am learning to use my left arm, though. Like wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, no, no, don't, please. I didn't mean to, don't, don't hit me again. Relax, Marty. I've got better things to do. I've got a honeymoon to finish. Although with any luck, it'll never end. <laughs> see, even murder stories can have a happy ending. Martin Harvey may have spoiled Susan and Dan's honeymoon, but that doesn't mean he managed to spoil their marriage. No. If that's going to happen, Susan and Dan will take care of that all by themselves. I'll be back shortly. Hello, this is Joe Franklin. Ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls, for the very latest in nostalgia, for the ultimate in remembering, please join with me on Saturday nights from 9.05 to 11 o'clock, where memories are truly happening right here over WOR Radio. It is my privilege to present radio's original memory lane program, but positively the original. And whether it's Al Jolson or Benny Goodman or Louis Armstrong or Eddie Cantor or Harry James or the Dorseys, Mario Lanza, Gene Krupa, the young Frank Sinatra, George M. Cohan, Bing Crosby, Bogart, Lombard, Cagney, and all those happy times of radios, comedy, and drama, and soap opera. We have it. We have it fascinatingly, and all the sounds are reproduced crystal clear Saturday nights from 9.05 till 11 over WOR Radio. You're truly Joe Franklin hosting Memory Lane. Tune in. WOR New York, your station for Mystery Theater. This is Sherry Henry. All New York knows it lost its governor recently when Rockefeller resigned. And we all know he's concerned now with his new commission on critical choices for America. 
But not many of us really understand what that commission is all about. Well, we'll all know more tomorrow afternoon when Henry Diamond, the executive director of that commission, divulges goals and directions. It's on the Sherry Henry program at 2.15 on WOR Radio. A purist might claim that the story you have just heard isn't a murder story since no one was actually killed. The murders which took place were all in the imagination of Martin Harvey, who passed them on to the mind of Susan Carey. But it's a good demonstration of the point we've tried to make all along, that the most terrifying crimes can happen within the theater of the mind. Our cast included Betsy von Furstenberg, Michael Wager, Elspeth Eric, and Mason Adams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. What are you thinking about, child? The day you said it was bad luck for us to see each other before the wedding. Nobody believes those old wives' tales. Nobody believes so many things that are outside the ordinary. Did you see Michael's body after? Don't talk about that, Lars. I knew they said the horse trampled him. I asked Dr. Ferguson about the hooves and he wouldn't tell me. You'd tell me, wouldn't you, Jeannie? Oh, tell you what? Were they like horseshoes or were they cleft in two? Were they cloven hooves? In the name of God, what are you saying? I'm not speaking of God. I'm speaking of the devil. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams. The WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Lana Turner and Chief Bosons mate Victor Mature of the United States Coast Guard in Slightly Dangerous with Gene Lockhart. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When a manuscript called Slightly Dangerous turned up at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, everyone must have stood up and shouted in unison, This is for Lana Turner. And I'd have joined in the shout if I'd been there. Certain stories seem to be made just for certain stars, and Slightly Dangerous was made for the lady who's known as Lana. Certain stars go well together, too. And I believe we have an ideal combination tonight with Victor Mature helping Lana to make the evening slightly dangerous. This is the story of a young lady who thinks she has a dull job and hankers for adventure, but finds a little more of it than she'd bargained for. The play's a delightful mixture of gaiety and drama, and that's a team we've always found unbeatable. After tonight's performance, Lana Turner goes back to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer to begin work in her new picture, Marriage is a Private Affair. And Chief Boson's mate, Victor Mature, goes back to his post with the Coast Guard after his first leave in many months. Servicemen are learning a good deal that's outside their regular curriculum. As a case in point, we have received a letter signed by three gentlemen calling themselves the Luxem Doughboys. 
In approved military fashion, they don't say where they're writing from, but they enclose a photograph showing two muscular young men in abbreviated attire. One of them is holding a box of Lux flakes in his hand, and the other is hanging up some washing on a makeshift line. Well, I'm going to stick my neck out now and predict that soldiers with this experience will be much in demand as husbands when the war is over. And if they drop a hint that they're accustomed to using Lux flakes, well, it'll probably close the deal immediately. And with that prophecy, the curtain goes up on the first act of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner as Peggy and Victor Mature as Bob, with Jean Lockhart as Burden. Find a penny, pick it up. All day you will have good luck. She said to herself when she found the penny. Peggy said to herself that it was about time she had some good luck anyway. Hmm, I'll say it is. What kind of a life is this I'm leading? Work, eat, sleep. Work, eat, sleep. Oh, I'm getting sick of it. Yes, Peggy has a habit of saying things to herself. Mostly because she has no one else to talk to. But now she's found a penny, and her lucky day is about to begin. As she enters the store where she works, the small change mart, the chief clerk is beginning his daily speech to the employees. Good morning, friends. Ah, uh, we are all very lucky indeed to be employed by such a beneficent store as the Coast to Coast Small Change Mart. And this morning, there is one among us who is going to realize her luck even more than the rest of us. It gives me great pleasure to present Merit Award number four to that lucky girl, Miss Peggy Evans, who works at the soda fountain. Uh, please step forward, Miss Evans. <laughs> Peggy Evans, you're the first employee in the entire chain to arrive at your work 1,000 consecutive mornings on time. I therefore present you with Merit Award number four, redeemable for $2.50 in merchandise. Thank you, sir. And remember, another 1,500 punctual arrivals brings the $10 award. Keep your eye on it. Yes, sir. Now, uh, to your stations, everyone. Open the door, please, Mr. Bonwit. Gee, congratulations, Peggy. What a break, huh? Two and a half fish out of the blue. Oh, thanks, Mitzi. And just think, it only took me a little over three years. Huh? Three years and four months. <laughs> and in another five years, I'll get $10 more. In merchandise. Yeah, wholesale, too. Well, I'll be 26 then. Well, what's the beef, honey? In five years, you're going to be 26 anyway. Is that bad if they give you 10 bucks velvet? Is that an insult? Oh, and I'll have such a nice set of memories. 2,500 mornings on time. <laughs> Those will be something to tell the children about. Except if I have a child, it might make me late that morning. Oh, it's bound to. But you ain't even married. No, I'm not. I'm not likely to be. Where could I meet a man? Well, anywhere. Where did I meet Hobart? Oh, don't tell me. Was it under a rock? Oh, Hobart'll doodle Johnny comes along. Oh, who's Johnny? Nobody. Johnny's what I call him. Call who? Whoever he is. Phil, Joe, Charlie, Chuck, Jimmy. I call him Johnny. <laughs> well, what about him? Look, honey, I know lots of gals who got the same kind of job as you got, and they love it. Why? Because they got their Johnny. Oh, and that makes everything wonderful, I suppose. It sure does. You just keep laughing at nothing all the time. Yep, that's the way it is when you meet up with Johnny. Well, I don't know any Johnny, and I'm not likely to meet one around here. Unless it's that drip who whistles at me in front of Cutler's drugstore. <laughs> so that's what got you mad, huh? Oh, no, Missy. It's just that I'm fed up. They played a dirty trick on me. Be yourself, will you? Nobody's played any tricks on you. Oh, yes, they did. When they were sitting around deciding who was going to be who. And when they came to me, they said, Now... Let's make this one nobody. Let's not give her any family, any home, anything. Let's just give her one thing, a job. The dullest little job we can find. And in the dullest little town we can find, Hotchkiss Falls. Ah, oh, take it easy, honey. Your job's not as bad as all that. Why, you, you, you meet a lot of people and you, you do a lot of interesting things like mixing up Sundays and stuff. Oh, stop it, Missy. I could do my job blindfolded. Oh, no, you couldn't, honey. There's a lot more to it than you think. Oh, I couldn't, huh? Absolutely blindfolded. Watch me. Here, give me that napkin. Oh, no, no, Peggy, don't do that. You'll get into trouble. I can mix anything they want. Oh, miss. Uh, one second, lady. Peggy, take off that blindfold. Watch this. Uh, Order, lady? Well, I'd like, uh, what's the matter, theory? Did you hurt your eyes? <laughs> no, this is a new company rule. Blindfold improves efficiency. Well, what won't they think of next? Um, I'll have a jumbo banana split. One jumbo coming up. Peggy, don't try it. Banana, 
Slice it down the middle, so. Ice cream, chocolate on the right, strawberry on the left, and vanilla in the middle. Chocolate sauce, pineapple preserve, whipped cream, nuts, and a cherry on top. There you are. Well, get her. Did you see that? Nice going, kid. <laughs> okay, who's next? The blindfold marble. I don't see how she does it. Oh, miss, over here, please. Yes, sir. Order, please. Tell me, doesn't that blindfold handicap your work? <laughs> well, order something to see. Well, I'm sorry to spoil your fun, but I'll have to ask you to take it off. And I'll have to ask you to leave that stool if you're not going to order. The management doesn't allow lounging. Look, number 122, I am the management. I'm the new general manager. Oh, well, I suppose you're pretty proud of yourself sneaking up and catching me when I wasn't looking. Now, wait a well, minute. Well, you've I... got nothing to squawk about anyway. I was doing my job. I doubt that. No one can do their best work with their eyes closed. You're a sort of squirt. You're... Don't you call me a squirt. Now, what's your order? A very simple one. Take that blindfold off and report to my office immediately. Come in, please. Yes, what is it? You wanted to see me. Oh, uh, you, uh, well, you're not... Number 122. Oh, uh, well, you look quite different without the blindfold. In fact, you're, uh, well, won't you sit down? I don't want to sit down. Well, why don't you go ahead and fire me? Now, let's not be hasty. As a matter of fact, you can't fire me. No, of course because not. Because I quit. Now, look, you, you mustn't do that, miss. You... The name is Peggy Evans. Well, that's a nice name. It isn't a name at all. It's just a label that works in a store. A machine on a track that rolls along and along and comes out nowhere. I hate my name. Now, 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 look. Someday you'll get married and change your name. I won't it. get married. I won't ever get married. Well, of course you will. An attractive girl like I you... I will not. Well, then, you'll be Peggy Evans until you die, so I... Wait a minute. I'll be Peggy Evans until I die. Why, that's an idea. Well, what do you mean? I'm not going to be Peggy Evans until I die. I'm going to be Peggy Evans until she dies. Oh, now, look, no, look, you mustn't say things like that. Now, look here, Miss Evans, you take the rest of the day off, and tomorrow we'll have I a I won't nice... be here tomorrow. This is the end of number 122. Oh, but Miss Evans, And it's I... the end of Peggy Evans, too. No, now, look, wait a minute. Please, let me go. No, look, I can't let you go. Now you're hysterical. I you... am not. Let go. Miss Evans. <laughs> Yeah? Excuse me, I'm looking for Peggy Evans. Oh, yeah? Well, does she live here? Who wants to know? Well, I do. I got her address at the store, and I... Oh, the store, huh? Get in here. Listen, what is this? Hey, Joe, this guy's from the store. I don't say. Now, wait. Hey, what's going on? Who are you, gentlemen? Police department. Police? Has, has anything happened to Miss Evans? Mr. Anderson, huh? What's your name? I'm Robert Stewart. What's your business with Peggy Evans? Well, I... I'm Peggy Evans' boss. Her boss? He's the one who drove her to it. He's the one. And now I'll never be able to rent a room again. There ought to be a law against skunks like you. Will someone please tell me what this is all about? Read him the note, Joe. Let him know what he's done. Sure. This is to tell whoever cares not to bother looking for me. I'll be happier wherever I'm going. I can't go on being Peggy Evans any longer. Not after what happened at the store. I'd rather jump in the river. Mitzi can have my clothes. For the last time, Peggy. Oh, that's awful. You said it. Yeah. Now, now wait a minute. You got me all wrong. I didn't drive her to this. I... I only did my duty. I, I just told her to take off her blindfold. And now she's in the river. I hope you're satisfied, Brother Rat. New York. Oh, I always wanted to see New York. Well, here I am. And I'll never go back to Hotchkiss Falls. Never. Oh, but I wonder if I should have left that note. They probably think I committed suicide or something. Oh, well, it's the same thing. I'll never be Peggy Evans again, anyhow. Peggy Evans is as good as dead. So, now what? Hey, look at that sign on that beauty shop. Let graves give you a personality. That's it, a new personality. Well, go on in. Good morning, madam. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I need a new personality. Ah, uh, but of course. <laughs> Can you do it? But of course. Well, all right. Now, how long and how much? Uh, let me see a new hairdo, a new makeup, the right clothes, mm, uh, four hours and $150. Well, it's a deal. Oh, I can't believe it. Look at myself in that store window. Oh, that's me, all right. That's Peggy Evans. Oh, no, I forgot. It's not Peggy Evans anymore. That's finished. Well, let me see. Shall it be Diane? Dion? Hmm. Well, what about Suzanne? Suzanne. 
Oh, that's nice. So then, Vanderbilt. Oh, no, that's too common. Well, I'll think of something. What's that sign that man is painting? Maybe that'll give me a cue. Daily Star classified as... Oh, no, that's no help. What's that letter, miss? Watch it! There's paint up here! Paint! She's unconscious. Pick her up. What happened? It ain't my fault. I was up on the ladder painting, and she got right underneath. She moved the ladder. Don't bring that girl with a can of paint. I couldn't help it. Pick her up. Carry her in here. Quick. How is she, Doctor? Is she coming around? I think she'll be all right just as soon as she recovers from the shock. Look, Doc, that painter was working for the Daily Star. This puts the paper in a bad spot. Uh, will you be able to testify that she's not seriously injured? I think so. Uh, well, that ought to keep down the damages. Oh, where am I? You see, now you're in safe hands and you're going to be all right. Now, just relax. Oh, my head. Where am I? You're in my office, miss. I'm Philip Durston, the manager of the Daily Star. Oh, my head. Her head. Oh, Oh, my clothes. Look what's happened to my clothes. Now don't you worry. It's just paint. We'll buy you a whole new outfit. Oh. Hello, Baldwin, get me a waiver of damages right away. Okay. Oh, my clothes. Now, please don't get excited. Just try and relax. Now then, uh, what's your name? Peg. No. No, it's... My name's Diane. I mean, it's Susan. It's... Oh, no, that's not either. I, I don't know it yet. Well, surely you can tell us your name. No, I can't. Leave me alone. I don't know. Dear, dear. Where do you live? I don't know. Oh, look at me. Look at my clothes. Mr. Durston, may I speak to you for a moment? Mm. Oh, oh, it's even on my head. What is it, Doctor? This is much more serious than I thought. She's suffering from a temporary loss of memory. Why does everything have to happen to me? Here's that waiver of damages, boss. Forget it. She can't sign it. She can't remember her name. Holy smoke. Shall I phone the police? No, you imbecile. Do you think I want every other paper in town building up her case and spreading the story that I'm an assassin? Oh. It's on my hair, too. Oh. Now, don't whine. Uh, I mean, don't cry, my dear. We'll take care of everything. I think the only way to handle this is to notify the Bureau of Missing Persons. Why, she's only been missing ten minutes. Baldwin, look in her purse. I just did. There's nothing in it. No identification? Not a shred. Oh, what'll I do? What'll I now, do? Now, now, see here, miss. <laughs> it's on my hair. Now, whatever your name is, now you stop worrying. We'll find out who you are. We'll put your picture in the paper, and whoever you belong to will come and claim you. <laughs> Won't that be nice? No. No, you don't understand. I don't belong to anybody. Oh, nonsense. A fine-looking girl like you? <laughs> yeah, just wait till you see the great, big, beautiful picture we're going to take of you. But I tell you, it's no use. Nobody will come. Nobody will know me. Oh, yes, they will. We'll take care of you until they do. You will? Why, of course we will. And we'll ask you to remember how nice we were. Baldwin, have Miss Kingsley take her out and get her spruced up for the picture. Yeah. Yes, have her use my private expense account. Yeah. Anything at all you want, miss, you just ask. Anything? Anything. Uh, we'll take care of you. <laughs> well, it's awfully nice of you, but... Uh... You may have to take care of me a long time. <laughs> and I mean a long time. New York Daily Star, girl victim of amnesia. Do you know the girl in the picture above? If you do, communicate at once with the Daily Star. Hotchkiss Falls Gazette, small change mart boycotted by public. Manager accused of driving clerk to suicide. Sit down, Mr. Stewart. Now look, Mr. Stewart. I suppose you've read the Morning Gazette. Mr. Snodgrass, As I... district supervisor of the Small Change Mart Incorporated, I have a very unpleasant duty to perform. Mr. Stewart, the public is boycotting this store. They claim you drove that girl to suicide. But I didn't. There is some indication in the newspaper that if we were to discharge you as manager, the people of Hotchkiss Falls would reconsider. Let me see that paper. Mr. Quill will take over your duties. Thank you, Mr. Snodgrass. Hey, wait a minute. This looks like her. Like who? Peggy Evans. Look. Look at this picture. Amnesia victim in New York. Nonsense. Peggy Evans committed suicide. I fear you're indulging in some wishful thinking, Mr. Stewart. I don't care what you fear. I'll never forget her face. It's been haunting me ever since. And I tell you, this is her. No, don't be irrational, Stewart. How could it be? Here. It explains it here. She's got amnesia. Well, I fail to see the connection. Well, suppose she did jump in the river. And suppose the shock made her lose her memory. Dear, dear, we are grasping at straws. Suppose she forgot she was going to commit suicide. Suppose she swam ashore and then forgot who she was. 
And suppose she just wandered down to New York. Suppose you collect your things and get out of this office. But she isn't dead. I know she isn't. Look, I'm going to find her and bring her back here and prove to all of you that I didn't drive her to suicide. Do you think I want to spend the rest of my life with that on my conscience? And what's more, I'm going to make her tell the truth and get my job back. If you can bring back the dead, Stuart, you can certainly get back your job. I'll hold you to that, sir. Dead or alive, I'll have her in this office inside of a week. In a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Lana Turner, Victor Mature, and Jean Lockhart in Act Two of Slightly Dangerous. Now for a mind-reading stunt. You're going to meet Miss Daisy McMaisie on her way to work one bright morning. You'll hear what she says as she meets people. Right afterwards, you'll hear what she's thinking. First, she says hello to a girlfriend. Hi, Dot. Wonderful day. <laughs> Hi, Daisy. Hate to spoil the day, but you've got a run in your stocking. Say thanks a lot, Dot. Thanks for nothing. Always first with the bad news. And now, our scene shifts to the bus. Hello, Daisy. Say, you're looking... Never mind how I'm looking, Dick Bowen. And stop looking at my stocking run, you big drip. Soon, Daisy's in her office building, entering the elevator. Well, morning, Miss Daisy. Say, do you know... No, I don't know a thing today, Jack. But I know what you're grinning about. Wipe that grin off your face. Off your face. Off your face. And now, she's in her office. Good morning, Miss McMaisie. Please take some dictation, and uh, do you mind if I say... Not at all, Mr. Carlton. Do I mind? You bald-headed penguin, keep your eyes off that run. In just a minute, I'll pull off both your hairs. And back at her desk a few minutes later. Is that you, Daisy? It's Mother. I noticed that you went out the door. That... Oh! Poor Daisy. There's no doubt about it, stocking runs can wreck a girl's peace of mind. Wreck her budget, too. But the remedy is easy. Just stick to Lux. It really does cut down on runs. That's been proved by a famous laboratory the United States Testing Company, Incorporated. They found that Luxing rayon stockings cut down runs over 50%, compared with using a strong soap or rubbing with cake soap. So don't take chances. Use Lux Flakes for your stockings every night. And by the way, be sure to dry rayons 24 to 48 hours. Remember, it's Lux for good luck with stockings. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner as Peggy and Victor Mature as Bob, with Jean Lockhart as Burden. Peggy Evans, alias the girl who can't remember her name, is having a glorious time. Providing that no one recognizes her, she can go on living at the Daily Star's expense indefinitely. The possibilities are very exciting, thinks Peggy. What a break. Oh, I think after a while, though, I'd like to be recognized. Oh, only not as Peggy Evans. Let's see, who would I like to be? A movie star? Oh, no, that's too tough. A long lost daughter to a nice old gentleman? A rich old gentleman? That's what I want to be an heiress. This brainstorm sends Peggy scurrying to the public library. There, in a newspaper of July 1927, she finds what she's looking for. Millionaire baby girl still missing. Police say no trace of Carol Burton, lost at circus two years ago. Baba, child's nurse, abandons home. Millionaire baby. Hey! That could be me! <laughs> Remember something? Uh, do you know who you are? Uh, well, not exactly, Mr. Durston, but I'm sure it'll help. Well, go on. What is it? Baba. Go on, go on. Baba. Oh, what's the matter? Did you forget it again? No, that's it. Baba. Ba, ba. What in blazes the sense of remembering Baba? It doesn't mean a thing. Oh, but it must mean something. I have a feeling it's terribly important. How could it be? Ba, ba. Why, it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to you, Baldwin? Ba, ba, black sheep. Have you any wool? Shut up. Oh, wait, I... <laughs> I suddenly remembered something else besides Baba. Well? I see a circus. Holy Ike, a circus. Hold on a minute, boss. Hey, Hilla, what have you got in your files on Baba? Baba? That's right, B-A-B-A. -B -A. Call me right back. Okay. I've got a feeling this may lead to something, boss. Circus, Baba. Don't you start doing that. Circus, Baba. Baba, circus. Baba. Baba, circus. Oh, for the love of shut up. It must mean something, boss. Baba. Circus? Yeah, Hilla? 
I've got three barbers. There's a Turkish mind reader who cut up his assistant with an axe. Claimed he read her mind. And now that's no good. What else? Then there's Baba the gorilla in the Bronx Zoo. Oh, fine. What's the third? There was a nurse called Baba who was in the Burden case, 1925. That's it. I thought I remembered it. The Burden case. Boss, the Burden case. Burden? The Burden case? Yeah, the nurse took the Burden kid to the circus and lost her. They never found the kid. That's it. Bring in that file. Well, my dear, it was a lucky thing you remembered Baba. <laughs> Is it important? Important, Baldwin. Tell him to hold the front page for a replay. We've got a real story. Paper clue to missing bird and every... Cornelius Burden, the great long lost daughter, paper. Paper! What time did Burden's secretary say he'd be here? Any minute now. Good. Frankly, I'm as excited as a little boy. Reunited after 17 long years, the rich but lonely old man, the wandering waif with the golden curls. I'm a little nervous. I wonder what he'll say. Oh, why, he won't say a word. He'll look at her and hold out his arms, and his voice will break as the tears stream down his weather-beaten old cheeks. Yes? Mr. Cornelius Burden is here, sir. He's... Send him in! Send him in! Well, he's on his way in now, sir. Where is he? Which one of you muckraking buzzards is Durston? Come on, speak up. Why, I am. Oh, you're Durston, eh? Well, I'm Cornelius Burden, and this is my lawyer, Stanhope. Well, I'm glad Durston. to meet you. I broke Burnell of amalgamated copper. I turned Baron of the SLNV into a shaking old man. And by everything that's holy, I'll break you like a dry twig. Now, Durston! Durston! I'm going to put you in jail. Oh, come now, Mr. Burden. Don't try appealing to my mercy. I've got none. But, Mr. Burden, I don't think you understand. I understand. You've been part of a criminal conspiracy to defraud. Mr. Burden, all I've done is try to help you recover your daughter. My daughter. Stan Hope, tell him. All you've done, Mr. Durston, is to print a story without verification, without substantiating evidence, and without consulting my client. But I've got evidence. I've got proof. This girl has amnesia, and the only thing she remembers is Baba. Yes, Baba. Ba. What kind of proof do you call that? There must be 40,000 nurses in the country named Baba. But she remembers the circus, too. Yes, circus. Hmm. What do you think of that? Well, now, you've got me there. I forgot that my child was the only one in the world who'd ever seen a circus. If you've had the decency to consult Mr. Burden, he'd have told you he has a method of identifying his daughter. He has? You have? Certainly I have. My child's nurse, Baba. She still lives with me. She's interviewed hundreds of these, these phony girls in the last 15 years and exposed every one of them. And she'll expose this one, too. And when she does, I promise you I'll prosecute you to the full extent of the law. And then I'll find out who this girl really is. And I'll put her in the penitentiary, too. And under her real name. Well, come on. Let's get started. Wait. Uh, he's, he's not my father. Aha! Uh -huh. Heaven's sakes, Miss Burden. And don't call me Miss Burden. Uh, what makes you say he's not your father? Well, his, his face. What? What about my face? <laughs> well, if, if I'd ever seen a face like that before, I know I'd remember. It's, well, it's the kind of face you couldn't forget. Especially if you'd been exposed to it as a child. So you don't want to go home with Mr. Burden, is that it? I don't want to, and I'm not going to. Well, young lady, in my opinion, that constitutes an admission of guilt. Cornelius, shall I phone the district attorney? Certainly, by all means. Now, wait a minute. Look, my dear, you can't do this to me. Unless you cooperate, Mr. Burden will have every right to think that you're concealing something, some, uh, some guilty plan. In which you share, Mr. Durston. I do not. Don't you understand, Miss Burden? You've got to go with him. Well, all right. I'll go. But if I turn out to be his daughter, I'm, I'm going to run away from home. And I'll help you. Well, good luck, my dear. She'll need more than that, and so will you. Jimmy, come in here. Yeah, Mr. Boyden, you want me? What do you think I called you for? See that this girl doesn't try to get away. Okay, Mr. Boyden. Well, who's he? He's my bodyguard, but I'm lending him to you for the time being. Come on. <laughs> Jimmy? Yeah, Mr. Boyden, you want me? What do you think I... Uh, bring that girl in here. Come on in, miss. Come on. Here she is, Mr. Boyden. All right. Now go downstairs and keep those reporters quiet. Okay, Mr. Boyden. Uh, come in here, young lady. Now, uh, you say you remember Baba, huh? Well, here she is. This is Baba. Uh, how do you do? Hello, child. Tell me, do you remember this room? Well, I... I don't remember anything. Ah, you see, Baba, another fake. Hush. Listen, child. Carol Burden had a toy in this room which she loved more than any other. Always carried it around with her. Even slept with it at night. Which one is it? I don't know. Didn't he tell you? I, 
I have amnesia. Amnesia or no amnesia, if you don't get the right toy, I'm going to hammer at you until you find out who you really are. But that's unreasonable. You bet it is. Hold your tongue, Master Cornelius. Look around you. Here are all the toys. Take your time. Well, this is the end, all right. What chance have I got of picking out the right toy? Why, the odds are about a hundred to one. Oh, I guess I might as well confess. Oh, wait. If I confess, I'll go to jail. Oh, I, I wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Think. Think. Whatever that toy is, Burton must have just taken it out of that little safe behind the picture. It's still open. Well, that means that it couldn't be any one of the big ones. Oh, well, that's something. But gosh, at least half of them are small enough to fit in the safe. Oh, I, I wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Well, well, which is it? Don't just stand there. Which toy is it? Well, I... Oh, you'll have to give me time. Oh, time. Time. I'll go to jail if I don't get it right. Wait. Look at the toys in the window. They're all faded from standing in the sun. Well, that means it couldn't be there. It wouldn't get faded lying in a safe. Oh, the odds are going down. They're going down. Oh, but I still wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Hey, what was it Baba said? She even slept with that toy at night. Well, if she slept with it, then it couldn't be that car, or the ten soldiers, or that merry-go-round. Why, they wouldn't let her take those to bed with her. She'd scratch herself. And it, it couldn't be that violin, or the Easter egg, or that doll's house. Why, they'd be all broken. Say something. Say something. Pick a toy. It seems to me you've had plenty of time. Oh, just one minute more, please. I, I seem to remember something. Well, go on. Remember it. Please choose a toy. Which one? That one. What? That one. Uh, that one? Master Cornelius, that's it. Carol, oh, my baby, my darling, oh. Oh, Carol. Carol, how can you ever forgive oh, me? Oh, darling. Carol, my dear. Oh, what is it, darling? Tell Baba. Nothing. It, it, it's just so frightening to suddenly have a father you, you don't even know. Uh, listen, honey. I've always been afraid that if, that if I ever found you, why, you'd be such a stranger, you wouldn't want me or need me. But now, now that you don't remember anything that, that's happened to you, why, you're just like a little child. You do need me. Oh, honey, I've done a lot more than find a little girl who, that used to be my Carol. I've really found my kid again. Wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. Hold everything. This stuff ain't gonna see. No more reporters, so you might as well beat it. Go on, now. Go on. Beat it. Excuse me, limited. Outside, bud. Listen, I've got to see Carol Burden. I've got to see her right away. You hide me out. But look, it'll only take a minute. I've come all the way from Hotchkiss Falls. Out. But wait, Carol Burden is... Miss Boyden can't be disturbed, see? She's suffering with ambrosia. Out. Listen, this is important. You want to get smacked, buddy? I demand to see Carol Burton. You want to get smacked? You don't dare touch so me. No, I don't dare. Mm -hmm. Sorry, buddy. Carol Burton, beautiful heiress, to make first per public appearance tonight the Philharmonic Hall. Carol Burton. She's a fake. <laughs> Enjoying yourself, dear? Oh, golly. I'm so excited and happy. Happy, are you? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Well, for the first time in 17 years, I think I know what you really mean. Uh -huh. Oh, you're an angel. Oh, gosh. If Missy could only see me now, wanting me to stay in Hotchkiss Falls the rest of my life, to wait for a guy called Johnny who'd make me laugh at nothing. <laughs> well, I got better things to laugh at than nothing. Oh, but I wish Mr. Burton hadn't turned out to be so nice. That's what makes me feel so bad. 
Intermission isn't over yet. W will you have another lemonade, Carol? Oh, no, thank you, Father. Uh, well, then we might as well get back. All right. Hello, Peggy. Oh! How are you? Say, look, you know, I've been waiting for a chance to speak to you. Just a moment, young man. Oh, it's okay. She knows me. And I didn't kill her. What? Come on, Peggy. Tell the truth. I didn't kill you, did I? Go away. The man's mad. Jimmy! Look, I haven't slept. I haven't eaten all on the count of you, Miss Evans. Go away! Jimmy, here! Come on. Look, look, come on. You're not Carol Burden any more than I am. Carol, do you know this person? Why, I... I haven't the faintest idea who he is. You're lying, Peggy. You know you are. Let me alone. Jimmy! Here I am, Mr. Boyden. What's cooking? I am. This man here. Oh, so it's you again, huh? Listen, you. If you think I that you... I know. I don't dare. Oh! Okay, Mr. Boyden. Come along, Carol. Oh, that, that poor man. Yeah, Jimmy will take care of him. Sure, sure. He's okay. Come on, dear. Well, I hope he'll be all right. Of course. Uh, hey. Hey, you okay, chum? Oh, sure, sure. You're fine. Hey, waiter. Take care of this guy, will you? Yes, sir. Now, up you go, sir. Oh, oh, oh. Now, just sit right there, see? You'll be all right in a minute. Oh, she lied. She knows me. I could see it in her eyes. Well, don't brood about it, sir. There are lots more fish in the sea. She isn't drowned. She never was. Well, I didn't mean it like that, sir. She's a phony, that's what she is. She hasn't any more amnesia than I have. Well, are you sure you haven't got amnesia or, or something? How about a spot to eat, sir? No. A drink, sir? No. A nice, cool glass of lemonade. How about it, sir? Lemonade. That's what she was drinking. She ought to be mixing them instead of sitting here all dressed up with a glass of lemonade. Hey, wait. Have you changed your mind, sir? What do you have? I want that glass. A glass of what, sir? No, the glass. Her glass. There are fingerprints on glasses, aren't there? Well, not in the best places, sir. I... Look, get me her glass. I'm going to take these fingerprints one by one and wrap them around her lily white throat. <laughs> Millionaire gives reception for long-lost daughter. Carol Burden to meet New York society. Hooey. My dear, don't you think you should dance with all those young men? They're waiting. Well, I have danced with them, Father, but I haven't found one as nice as you are. <laughs> one, one jump over that and split. Coming up. Oh, you do remember. It's that madman. Come on, Peggy, tell the truth. Take him away. Jimmy! What's the trouble? Throw him out. Throw this man out. Wait a minute, look. I'm not leaving this house without my wife. Your what? My... Listen, Mr. Burton, she's my wife. You're crazy. You know as well as I do that I'm not your... Carol, do you remember that you're not? Oh, no, Father, I, I don't. That's the hideous part about it. For all I know, it might be true. Of course it's true. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll take her home where she belongs. Just a minute, young man. Come with me, please. Go on, Mr. Stewart. Well, when I got home, she disappeared. I was desperate until I saw her picture in the paper. I left Hotchkiss Falls immediately. Well, that's the whole story. And now, dear, if you'll get your things, we'll be trotting along. Thanks, Mr. Burden, for taking such good care of her. Never mind that, young man, and take your hands off my daughter. But she's my I wife. I know. She's your wife. But if you don't mind, we'd like a little proof. Proof? Yes, proof. That's right. Let's see your proof. Oh, proof. Uh, our marriage certificate. Here you are. Marriage certificate? Sad, isn't it? All her beautiful memories gone. She doesn't even remember our marriage certificate. Why, she was so excited when she signed it, she poked her finger in the inkwell instead of the pen. There, her fingerprints. Well, Peggy, now... Doesn't this bring it all back to you? No, it doesn't. And I don't believe I ever saw it before. You claim that this is her fingerprint? Yes, I told you. She stuck her fingers... Well, in that case, we'll just settle this matter immediately. Carol, put some ink on your finger, dear. We'll compare your fingerprint with the one on the certificate. Oh, well, that's a wonderful idea. Oh, I never thought about that. No, I bet you didn't. Now, place your hand here on the paper, dear. Her uh, right forefinger, I presume? That's right, I think. <laughs> sure, I wasn't left-handed when I was married to you. Mm, quite sure. Ah, there we are. Now, we'll see. If these... Oh. Well, Father, what is it? Why, why this is awful. Uh, these prints are identical. What? Lucky thing for me, that fingerprint. You folks were sure hard to convince. Why, this doesn't seem fair. I've, I've only had one daughter, and now I've lost her twice. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burden, but it had to come out sooner or later that Peggy Evans wasn't your daughter. What do you mean she isn't my daughter? Of course she is. 
This thing proves she married you, but it doesn't prove she's not my daughter. But she's Peggy Evans. This girl is my daughter, whatever her name was. I couldn't be mistaken about that. But, but how did she get the name Peggy Evans? That's the question. I, I don't know. Well, the people that brought her up would know. Where are they? Well, I don't know exactly. Oh, how could he know? This whole thing's a fake, a frame-up. It must be. Now, now, darling, look, don't get excited. You know what it does to you. She breaks out in a rash all over. Oh, get away from me. You mean to say that you don't know anything about your wife's background? Well, uh, you see, she had amnesia when I met her. What's more, it kept happening on and off. Why, once I came home late at night, I, I, I kissed her and she gave me a friendly smile and then said, Who are you? Oh, you... It was the, uh... It was the... It was the friendly smile that burned me up. Oh, how can you? Mr. Stewart, what was the name of this town where you met Carol? Hotchkiss Falls. And that's where we're going right now. Come, lamb chop. Leave me alone. Come along. I'm going with you. What? What for? Oh, Father, you... Why, don't you realize what all this means? At last we found a clue to your past. We can go back to Hotchkiss Falls and trace everything that's happened since the day I lost you. Oh, no. Why, of course we can. We can find all the people that knew you. I want to find out all about your past so I can protect your future. Wait, I... Uh, Mr. Stewart, I want to speak to my father alone. I'll bet you do. <laughs> Will you wait outside, please? All right. Do hurry, though, dear. You know we have a long ride ahead of us. Father, that man isn't my husband. Call a woman's intuition if you want, but somehow I know. Yes, but what about the marriage certificate and, and the fingerprints here? Oh, I don't know. All I know is that he's lying. Hmm. Well, in that case, I'll phone the police. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, let's not do that. I, um, I have a better plan. I'll go to Hotchkiss Falls with Mr. Stewart, but you mustn't come along. But, my dear, uh, you... Just the two of us. Then I can find out what this is all about. But do you think I'm insane? Let you go away alone with a man you feel is not your husband? Oh, but don't you see, if, if I'm alone with him, why, I can find out everything. I can trap him because he, well, he won't be suspecting anything. But it would be different if you were along, because he'd be on his guard. If I were to let you go and something happened to oh, you... nothing will happen. I promise you. Well, well, don't forget one thing. If he bothers you in any way, you phone me immediately. I'll, I'll sleep with my clothes on. All right, Father. And, and be careful, Carol. Please. I will. Good night, dear. Good night. Oh, and, and Father... Yes, dear? I love you very much. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille brings back Lana Turner, Victor Mature, and Jean Lockhart in Act Three of Slightly Dangerous. Meantime, there seems to be, shall we say, a slight vocal explosion going on in a house around the corner. Mary, what the blazes? Doggone Mary! Bill, darling, what is it? Mary, what did you do to my blue sweater? Why, I washed it, but it came out beautifully. Beautifully? Holy jumping catfish, look at it. What kind of a midget do you think I am to get into a pint-sized thing like that? Oh, Bill, that's not your sweater. That belongs to little Billy. Remember, I made him one just like his daddy's. Here's yours, the same size as ever, thanks to Lux. Plenty big enough even for a brute like you. Oh. Gee. Thanks. Well, daddy's ego, his faith in himself, may be slightly shrunken, but not his favorite sweater. Not with gentle Lux care. You can't blame him for getting excited, though, because it's a real tragedy nowadays when woolens are washed the wrong way so they shrink. Strong soaps and cake soap rubbing do that, you know. But you don't have to worry about woolens when you use Lux Flakes. They're safe care for sweaters, blankets, all your washable woolens. Lux Care is thrifty care, too. You get so many suds from just a few flakes. Why, one big box of Lux will do 29 sweaters. Now... Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Besides being fine performers, our stars are a pin-up girl and a coast guardsman. We'll have a chat with them after the play. Now the curtain rises on the third act of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner and Victor Mature, with Jean Lockhart as Burton. 
Bob and Peggy are on their way to Hotchkiss Falls. There, Bob plans to exhibit her to the manager of the small change mart and clear himself. But Peggy Evans has a different idea. Well, I'd better play along with him a while. Oh, but not in Hotchkiss Falls. When we stop for something to eat, I'll pull some wires out of the car or something. I've just got to. Now they've stopped at a roadside restaurant where they're just finishing dinner. You don't have to look so scared, do you? Oh, I'm sorry. It's just that it's all so embarrassing. Suppose you didn't remember me at all and suddenly you find you were married to me. Wouldn't you be scared? I think you know pretty well there's nothing to be scared about. I don't believe you. I think you're scared right now. Me? Well, you haven't even kissed me yet. Kissed you? Kissed me. Well, uh, do you want me to? <laughs> well, isn't it customary among husbands and wives? Not at all. Well, it might help us to get better acquainted. Yes, it ought to do that. Well, then. Okay. My, it uh, does sort of mm, scare you, doesn't it? Well. <laughs> well, I feel better acquainted now. Do you? No, I, I just feel better. <laughs> Tell me about us, Bob. Were we very happy? Well, yeah, I, I think we must have been. Bob. Was I a good wife? Oh, ideal. What is your ideal? Well, she has to think I'm smarter than anybody else in the world and stronger and better looking. And she has to love to dance with me. What else? Well, she has to be happy with what we've got instead of discontented with what we haven't got. <laughs> and what do you do in return for all that? Nothing. That's what makes it so ideal. <laughs> well, I, I can't imagine any girl living up to that ideal. Oh, she could if she loved me. Well, I... I guess I have a lot to learn about love. Mm, it's possible. <laughs> but you're going to teach me, aren't you? Everything I know is at your disposal. Well, where do we begin? Well, first we dance. Now get this one. This is a half rumba and half my own. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. What do you call it? The Hotch Kiss Falls Limp. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Well, look at me. I, I'm laughing at nothing. You don't uh, feel dizzy, do you? Hey, Johnny. No, Bob. Johnny. Look, I'm not Johnny. <laughs> no, I, I guess not. It, it isn't reasonable. It certainly isn't. Come on, we'd better get started. Well, what's the matter, Bob? I don't know. Something... To... I know I've got plenty of gas. Evening, folks. Having a little trouble? Yes. Is there any place around here where I can get this thing fixed? Well, there's an all-night garage. There is? Yep, but it closes at 9 o'clock. <laughs> well, well, we'll have to sleep right here, I guess. Oh, I, I don't think that'll be very comfortable. <laughs> sure it won't. I got just one room left at the motel. Motel? What motel? Right over there. I run that, too. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, wait, we, we couldn't stop there. Well, why not, darling? We'll be ever so much more cozy than in the car. But, but we can't do that. Why, of course we can, dear. I'm sure it won't be expensive. You see, mister, it's sort of our wedding night. Now, ain't that something? Uh-huh. Mm. Now, I'll take care of your baggage. Oh, thank you. Come on, Bobby, it's late. No, wait, listen, look, I, I, I haven't got any money. I lost my wallet. Oh, Bob. Now, ain't that a crying shame? Yeah, it's certainly tough. Well, good night. We'll stay right here. Oh, no, you won't. I wouldn't have it on a conscience. Uh, you can have the room for nothing. Oh, you're a darling. <laughs> nice of him, wasn't it? Giving us this room. Yeah, but look, I, I know... Well, don't... I think I'll get into something comfortable. Peggy. Yes? Uh, do you know how to play cribbage? Oh, no, I don't. But you must teach me sometime. Look, uh, don't you think this has gone far enough? Far enough for what? Well, I mean, under the circumstances, maybe I'd better go. I, I'll tell you what. I'll take another room. Oh, but there are no other rooms. Oh, don't be nervous, dear. Look, you. You've got to answer me one question. Maybe there's been a mistake here. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've got to know. Well? That night at the concert, when I called you, Peggy, you were frightened to death, weren't you? Answer me. Well, yes. Why? Well, you... You sneaked up behind me and shouted in my ear. You would have been frightened, too. But you recognize me. Now, don't deny it. You, you knew me when you saw me. Well, I had seen you before. Ah, uh, not now, so you admit it. 
Well, certainly. It was that day of father's when you were with the reporters and Jimmy punched you. I saw you from the hall. You... You don't remember me from Hotchkiss Falls? No. Oh, but what's the difference? Now get some sleep, darling. We want to get an early start. Oh, I, I've made a terrible mistake. Listen, I'm not your husband. Oh, but I don't understand. That's all there is to it. I'm I'm not your husband at all. Oh, but you must be that that marriage certificate. Well, that was a forgery, a fake. I, I thought you were a fake, too. I had your fingerprints taken off of a glass that you used and... Oh. Look, it's all right. Now, uh, don't worry, please. I, I'll take you home to your father in the morning. Now, I'm, I'm going out to the car. Good night. Good night. Oh, just one more thing. You're Carol Burden, all right. You're not Peggy Evans. How do you know? Because Peggy Evans was a whining little coward, afraid to face life. She was hysterical and selfish. And you're the finest, the bravest girl that ever was. You were willing to accept me, a complete stranger, as your husband. You left your home and your father to come with me because, well, you thought it was right. You're the most wonderful girl I ever knew. That's all. Good night. Good morning. Oh, hello. <laughs> did, did I wake you? No, I wasn't asleep, just thinking with my eyes closed. What time is it? 6.30. Well, what woke you up so early? Oh, I, I haven't been sleeping either. I was thinking with my eyes open. Bob, I, I feel that... Now, look, you'll feel better when your father gets here. My father? Yeah, well, you... Why should he come here? Well, you see, I phoned your house after I left you last night. I thought you'd want to get rid of me as soon as possible. He ought to be here any minute. Oh. Now, please, look, don't do that. I, I know I've done a terrible thing to you, but I, I can't stand seeing you cry. That's not why I'm crying. No? No. I'm, I'm crying because I'm never going to see you again. You, you want to keep on seeing me after what I've done? Yes, I do. Why? Because, because I'm crazy about you. What? You can't be. That, that's impossible. It is not. It isn't? No. Gosh, that's... That's what I've been thinking about all night. Thinking how it could never happen. Thinking what a fool I, I was to even think about it. But now you... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't touch me. I'm sorry. I guess I must be hearing things. I, I thought you said... I thought you said you were crazy about me. I did say it. Well, I'm right. You did say it. Oh, but... But there's something else I've got to say, too. Something that'll spoil everything. But... Well... I am Peggy Evans. What? Yes, I... Oh, I couldn't go on cheating you. I know what you'll think of me, that I'm a whining little coward, afraid to face life. But I had to tell you all the same. Okay. So long, Peggy. Oh, Bob. No, go away. No, I won't. Not until you've heard what I have to say. Bob, I'm not asking you to even like me again. I just want you to know that I'm not what you think. I didn't mean to make you lose your job. And I didn't mean to steal anything from Mr. Burden, honestly. I was just lonesome. And I didn't have enough sense to wait until you came along. But how could I have known that you were... Well, you were what I was lonesome for. You know, every instinct I've got tells me how to beat you over the head. Every instinct but one. I couldn't hate you, darling, unless you turn out to be a female impersonator. And I'll bet you my bottom dollar you're not. Oh, Carol, Peggy, whatever your name is, darling. Yes, Bob. Look, don't be unhappy, dear. I... I forgive you. Of course you forgive me. If you love someone, what else can you do? Bob, you are going to wait for me, aren't you? Why? Where are you going? To jail. To jail? I... Well, that's silly. Oh, but you don't know Mr. Burden. He's sweet, but he has a terrible temper, and when I tell him the truth, well, he won't rest until... There she is. Oh, Bob, he's here. Carol. Now, Cornelius, don't get excited. Listen, don't say a word. Don't tell him a thing. Carol. Oh, baby, are you all right? Oh, why, yes, I, I'm fine, Baba, but... Shut I... up. I, I mean, shut up, dear. You, you see, she hasn't been feeling very well. Perhaps if you came back later tomorrow or something. Oh, don't listen to him. I'm all right. I want to tell you that... Look, now, she had a spell or something, and it isn't serious. Nothing to worry about. Carol, what's he done to you? Uh, well, nothing, really. He's, he's just saying that because he loves me and I love him, he... He's trying to protect me. No, she's trying to protect me. I, I forged that marriage certificate. I, I even had a rubber stamp made of her fingerprints and faked that, too. I'm not her husband at all. You fiend. Why did you do it? Well, I thought she was somebody else, a girl I used to know, Peggy Evans. But she's dead. It's no use, Bob. You can't stop me. Whatever she says is a lie. Go on, Carol. Well, I... 
I know you won't forgive me, Mr. Burden, and I'd rather die than hurt you like this. You're an angel, and I'd give anything in the world if you were my father. But you're not. I I'm not Carol. I never was. I'm Peggy Evans. Oh, don't be silly. Baby. Oh, please, please, both of you. I'm telling the truth. Bob, tell him that I am Peggy Evans. Why should I? I don't believe you are. And neither do I. But... I guess I ought to know my own daughter. Well, well, we're going to Hotchkiss Falls. No, my dear. We're going home. I'll get your things. I'll help you, Mr. Burden. Oh, but I, I can't go on lying the rest of my life. I can't go on cheating. Oh, stop that sniveling, Peggy Evans. Peggy Evans? Well, then you do believe me, Bob. Of course I do. Oh, well, then you'll tell Mr. Burden. I'll tell him nothing. Besides, he knows it anyway. But he's not my father in the... What do you mean, he knows it anyway? He found out last night. He called Hodgkiss Falls. Well, then why didn't he just say so? For two reasons. It would kill him to admit that he'd been fooled. And it would kill him to give you up. You mean he wants me to go on being his daughter? If you'd a lick of sense, you'd see that. But how can he want me? I don't belong to him. Stop your nonsense. You've made him happier than he's been for 17 years. Now, come on. Show him what you're made of. All right, let's go. Here's your grip, Miss Burden. Come on, come on. Do... Do you really want me to go home with you? Of course I do. That is, if... If you want to come, do you? Well, I... I'd like to see anybody try to stop me. Hey, what about me? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, what about him? Oh, well, I love him. Well, uh, that's a fine how do you do. Oh, but I can't help it. Well, I've got a daughter. I, I might as well saddle myself with a son-in-law. Me? Certainly you. Well, I... We... Now, I'm in a hurry. I'll give you 30 seconds to make up your mind. Well, it's made up now. Oh, Carol. Oh, Johnny. The name is Bob Carol. The name is Peggy Johnny. You know... Maybe we'd better just call each other Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Maybe talking at all is just a waste of time. Before our stars return to a curtain call, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, who went to a Navy wedding the other day. And here's something that really happened. The bride was cutting the wedding cake with the groom's sword when the photographer said... I'd like to get one more picture of that. Only you'd better wash the cake off that sword. So the groom handed the sword to the bride with a flourish and said... Okay, honey. You're the dishwashing department. Now on. <laughs> well, he was very cute about it and very proud of his new bride. And I felt as though I ought to produce a box of Lux and hand it over then and there so she'd start her dishwashing career off right. She looks smart enough to know about Lux anyway, though. She won't let the wrong kind of soap ruin those pretty hands of hers. That's a good point, Libby. It's not the dishwashing you do. It's strong wash day soaps that give you dishpan hands. With gentle Lux Flakes, your hands stay soft and lovely. In fact, even if you've let your hands get that ugly dishpan look, when you change to Lux, they'll soon be soft and smooth again. That's been proved by many, many women in a whole series of tests. And it's a very easy thing to prove for yourself. So... Put Lux Flakes on your shopping list for tomorrow. If your dealer is out of it right now, he'll have more soon. Then use Lux for dishes every day and see for yourself how kind it is to hands. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Well, we'll certainly take anything else on the slightly dangerous side that Lana Turner and Chief Boson's mate Victor Mature have to offer. If I were a sailor, I'd be calling Vic Chief. Well, in fact, I will anyway. Welcome back, Chief. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here again. Sounds like a pretty exciting job you have now, Vic. Well, plenty of other guys are in the same business. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you've been doing? Well, I've been on North Atlantic convoy duty for about 11 months. Tell me, Vic, is it true that a sailor has a girl in every port? No, sir. Well, why not? Well, uh, you don't stay in port long enough. <laughs> By the way, you know, we have girls in the Coast Guard now, too. They're called spars, and we need plenty more of them. It's a swell chance for girls between 20 and 36 to serve their country. Well, the spars are doing a fine job, Vic. I'd be very glad you could spend part of your leave with us. And day after tomorrow, the entire nation will show the men of the Navy we're behind you by celebrating Navy Day. Well, we're very proud of the service, sir, and I hope to make the folks at home proud of us. Now, you've done that already, Vic. Lana, I believe this is the first time you've been here since your baby was born. It's a bit hard to realize that one of America's leading pinup girls is now a mother. Well, I have a little pinup girl of my own now. 
Has to be pinned up all the time. Uh, from what I hear, your, your picture is being pinned up more than ever. When do you go back to work in pictures, Lana? Well, I'm getting ready now, Vic. Irene, the designer at the studio, is making the clothes for my new picture now. I guess that's pretty tough work for a woman, getting a lot of new clothes. Oh, well, we can stand it now and then. <laughs> well, congratulations on the baby, Lana. And if she's as lovely as her mother, let me make her first screen test. I'll remember that. Now, what's your play next week, Mr. DeMille? Now, one of the big successes of the current screen, Lana. It's the paramount hit, So Proudly We Hail. And the stars are Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, and Sonny Tufts. <laughs> As the same stars you saw in the picture, one of the finest casts we've ever had, and the play is in keeping with the cast, an heroic story of Bataan, with Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, and Veronica Lake as the army nurses of So Proudly We Hail. I think you can hail that one very proudly, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, and Sonny Tufts in So Proudly We Hail. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The appearance of naval personnel on this program does not constitute an endorsement of the product advertised, since the Navy Department does not endorse any product. Ladies and gentlemen, every American kitchen can be one of the arsenals of democracy. Don't let munitions go to waste in your kitchen. Every spoonful of fats you have left over can be made into glycerin used in high explosives. Save all your meat drippings, bacon grease, and every bit of waste fats, and take them to your meat dealer often. Save fats and save American lives. Heard in tonight's play were Leo Cleary as Durston, Verna Felton as Baba, Eddie Marr as Jimmy, Florence Haloff as Mitzi, and Roland Drew, Walter Sonderling, Robert Harris, Ed Emerson, Mason Moltzner, Griff Barnett, Fred Mackay, Charles Seal, Norman Field, and Truda Marson. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, and Veronica Lake in So Proudly We Hail. With Sonny Tuff. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You're a... And you've lost your... Oh. Archie, the answer is no. Hold on a second. The answer to what is no, Mr. Wolf? I shall not attempt to find a blonde for anyone. You've got the man on the phone a little wrong, Mr. Wolf. He's not looking for a blonde. He's looking for a prize fighter. <laughs> Indeed. Have him come here. Okay. Mr. Wolf will see you at eight. So long. I was all set to argue with you about taking the case. You, you gave in too fast. Nonsense. I'm fascinated by the thought of anyone misplacing a prize fighter. They're usually quite large, aren't they? They are. But what this guy is worried about is not only finding his boy, but finding him alive. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolfe, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. case of the deadly sellout. That's what my boss, Nero Wolf, called it. And it almost meant curtains for the firm of Wolf and Goodwin. But let me give it to you straight right from the beginning. Although you ought to know that it wasn't until it was all over that I knew the very beginning of it myself. 
It all started in the New York flat of one Brock Rainey. Yes? The name is Jerry Fay. I'm supposed to know you? Being a very good friend of Pepe Gatto's, it's time you got to know me. May I come in? Oh, sure. You've got a problem, Miss Fay? Pepe took a fall at the garden last night against a coffee and bum named Eubanks. Right? As far as I know, Sister Gatto met his match. Please, Mr. Rainey, do me a favor. Skip the sausage meat. It happens I saw the 1200 bucks you counted out to him to take a quick dive in the first. Mm, you did. How else would I know? Okay, then here's my wrist. Slap it, Miss Fay. I'm a bad boy. Now, look, who's kidding who? I don't care if Peppy makes himself a few deals on the side. I should worry whether he gives those meat eaters on the benches a run for the ducats. What's it to me? If you're not worried, Sugar Plum, then neither am I. Also, I'm a very busy man. Not too busy to pay off, I hope. Pay off? To who? To me. For what? For keeping it to myself that you collected five grand from the Eubanks crowd for getting Peppy to take that dive. Certain people might not like to hear it. Miss Fay. Yeah? Drop dead. I don't think we understand each other. Which is just as well. Now get out of here. something Blow, else. bimbo. Okay, Mr. Rainey. Have it your way. I'll go find someone with a more sympathetic ear. Someone like Lawson. Arnold F. Lawson. So long. Wait. Where does Lawson come into this? You asking a stalling. Lawson dropped a sizable piece of change on last night's two-step. No. Close the door, Jerry. Oh, yeah. $25,000, to be exact. That's a lot of corn to lose because a cheap fight manager arranges a frame. At least Arnold Lawson might think so. Sit down. Who's tired? Look, Mr. Rainey, it goes very simply in only one way. Lawson at yet knows from nothing except that your boy Gatto lost the fight. He may suspect, but he don't know. And I really don't have to know. Glad to hear you say that. And I'll be glad to see the shade of 3,000 long green banknotes. How much? You heard me, three grand. Get out. Okay, I'm going. To the next phone and call Lawson. Look, Jerry, give me time, huh? I haven't got that kind of dough right now. I Tell can't... it to Lawson. When he gets through with you, you won't need any kind of dough. You know, I've got Gatto set for a go with Mellish, the title contender. Gatto can take him. Please believe me, he's going to take him. So? So after what happened in the Eubanks fight, the odds on Gatto will be like a war debt. We can clean up. Listen, we can make Heel, a... I wouldn't trust you from 11.59 to midnight. Get it up. Now. I'll give you six hours. After that, Lawson. So long. Come on. Hello? Hello. Rainey, this is Gatto. Hiya, Pepe. Hey, look, the boys dropped in on me at the office at Mindy's. Lawson wants to see me. What? Lawson? Look, bum, I'm the one with the cauliflower ears. You heard me. What do I do? Nothing. But... Don't but... go near him. Stay home. Let me take care of it. How? How? I what don't... do you do? I don't know yet, Pepe, but I'll find a way. How did he find out? Your girlfriend. What? She wouldn't do that. She hates the guy. Hate him, I love him. She told him. I, I can't believe it. I... I suggest you call our little doll Jerry and give her your regards for the double cross. Meanwhile, stay put in your apartment. Don't move. But, Rainy. Hello. Hello. What on earth are you mumbling about? The high cost of blunt. Indeed. Oh, you can say that again. I have no intention of doing so. Okay, be smug. But there must have been a time even in your life when knickknacks from Tiffany figured on the budget. Phooey. Uh, not to mention steak dinners and champagne. Or what did you feed your girls? Peppermint lozenges? Nonsense. Nonsense? They preferred lime. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm dying and he laughs. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes? I have decided that you are giving me a raise. Archie, this is not a period in which uh, unilateral decisions are wise. So I'll be a dope and get a raise, huh? As for your future mental attainments, you may be right. As for raise... You want to drive me to gambling? Like betting on fights or going... Okay, it's the doorbell and I'm answering it. The name's Rainey. 
You're Goodwin? I'm Goodwin. Come in. Is Wolf in? Mr. Wolf is always in. Unlike prize fighters, I guess. Come on. Thank you. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Rainey, the man who lost his prize fighter. How do you do, sir? I'm not doing so good. Mr. Wolf, you gotta help me. That will depend. On what? The fee. <laughs> I digress. Your problem is what, Mr. Rainey? Mr. Wolf, I manage a fighter named Gatto. Maybe you've heard of him. I have not. However, that is of little significance. You are having difficulty with this Mr. Gatto? I'm not having difficulty with him. I can't find him. Uh, maybe you better let me give you the whole picture, huh? Very well. Well, Gatto is an up-and-coming boy, Mr. Wolf. He had a little upset last week with a guy named Eubanks. But everybody knows, in spite of that, Gatto's heading for the big time. I think he'll prove that when he goes against Mellish. Mr. Mellish being another pugilist, huh? Uh, that's right, Mr. Wolf. Now, Peppy, that's Gatto. Peppy was due at the turf club this afternoon to meet the opposition management and go over the setup. He was due, but he didn't show. I waited all afternoon, and then I started the phone calls and taxis. The results? No results. I combed every joint I ever knew him to buy a beer in, and the score was zero. Matter of fact, nobody's even seen him for four days. You would have tried the gymnasiums, naturally? I did. Does this pugilist have a home? Yeah, 206A Rathburn Street, a penthouse on the roof. He was not at home during all this time? It's where I tried first. It was empty as a bank on Saturday afternoon. I see. And you want me to find him for you? If Pepe blows this fight, Mr. Wolf, it'll ruin his career. And the preservation of his career is worth a good deal to you? I got a check for two grand right here. Archie? I'll get it. Two thousand dollars. Very well, Mr. Rainey, I should take immediate steps. I got a cab waiting outside. We can get started right away. We? Oui. <laughs> I should remain here. But how do you expect to... Archie. Yes, Mr. Wolf. You will leave with Mr. Rainey. I need information. You might try the Rathburn Street penthouse to start with. But I've already been there. With all your apologies, Mr. Rainey, suppose you restrict your activities to pugilists. Archie is a trained observer. You are not. Archie, you will pick up whatever you can in Gatto's apartment. I especially suggest a careful check on his wardrobe. Wardrobe? If his clothes are missing, Mr. Rainey, it would indicate that he left voluntarily and deliberately, for whatever reasons he may have had. If they are not, Archie, you will phone me from the apartment after your investigation is over. Okay. I should, in the meantime, devote some thought to the subject. Huh? For two grand, all you're going to do is devote some thought? Mr. Rainey, if I were not a modest man, I would point out to you that you're getting quite a... <laughs> a bargain. Gatto? Gatto? He's not here, I told you that. I was up here before. He left the door unlocked? I had a key. Guess I forgot to lock up after I left. Now, let's look around. Bathroom? Yeah. Hmm. Empty. Hmm. It's a nice penthouse. Is that a closet? Yeah. What do you think? He's playing hide and seek? Try it. Okay. Anything in there? Nothing I'm looking for. What's that you found? A hat. Well, let's see. A lady's hat. Yeah, smart and expensive. Label reads a Madame Yetta original. That bunch of lace and feathers cost somebody a fast half a hundred. Yeah, probably one of his girls left it behind. And maybe she'll call for it. Come on, we'll take a gander out on the roof. I took a gander out there. It's bare as a bone. Uh-uh. What have we got over there by the chimney? Where? Over there. Uh, just an old awning. Got blown down in the storm last month. Be right with you. What are you doing? Looking under it. Oh, brother. You, you found him? Yeah, we found him, chum. A little late. Two holes in his dorsal development and dead as a clay pigeon. Yeah. Well, what have you got to say? Well, now at least the bookies will cancel all bets. We both save our dough. Yeah. I got a phone, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> And 
there he was, Mr. Wolf, under the old canvas awning. Hmm. Where's the hat? Oh, this is it. Mm-hmm. That's it, boss. <laughs> Snazzy number, no? Where'd you find it? On the floor of the closet. You're right, Archie. Frothy little bit of millinery caprice. Mm-hmm. Have you any idea whose it may be, Mr. Rainey? I wish I did. But you have to find out. Well, how, boss? The hat is an original. See? The label under the band reads a Madame Yetta original. Tomorrow morning, Archie, you will interview Madame Yetta. Yes, boss. And discover in your inimitable fashion for whom she made this chapeau. <laughs> Archie again, Mr. Wolf. Per your instructions, I have just talked to Madame Yetta. What did you learn? Madame Yetta tells me she made that hat for a Mrs. Lawson. Who is Mrs. Lawson? The wife of an ex-beer hustler who's in the chips and puts on airs. Lives in a penthouse of the Bradford Arms. I was just about to hop a cab and go up there, boss. Good. Keep this up, Archie. And through sheer practice, you may yet develop to a full-blown intelligence. Well, I'm trying, Mr. Wolf. And after the Lawsons, I do what? Return here immediately and hurry. How do you do, Mr. Lawson? Oh, Mr. Goodwin. My secretary tells me you're a detective. My boss might argue with you on that, Mr. Lawson. Your boss? It happens I work for Nero Wolf. I see. And you wish to see me about... About this hat. Hat? Oh, I see, yes. Yeah. Well, Mr. Goodwin, please believe me, I never wear hats like that. Would your wife be likely to say the same? My wife? Just what are you getting at? Would I seem too nosy if I asked how well you and your wife know Pepe Gatto? How well do we know who? Pepe Gatto. The pug? No, no, not such a pug. No, huh? I lost 25000 on him in the Eubanks fight. He asked me, he laid down like a dog. And did you talk it over with him? Talk it over with him? Never seen the man in my life. Not even at the fight? No, I placed the bet over the telephone. I'd scarcely have anything to do with a character like Gatto, Mr. Goodwin. You surely won't from here on out, Mr. Larson. What do you mean? Gatto is dead. You don't say. He was murdered last night. Murdered? And what would you say, Mr. Larson, if I told you that this hat is your wife's and that it was found in a closet in Gatto's apartment? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Are you implying... Not implying. That... Facts are sticking out. What time was this dumb brute done away with? Oh, I'd set it at somewhere between 5 and 7 p.m. last night. Well, you said it very conveniently, thanks. Why? My wife and I drove out of the city at 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Didn't get back until 2 this morning. And this hat? It took wings and flew into Gatto's closet? Is that the answer? No, that's not the answer. Then what is? This is. A month and a half ago, I was with Celia on a bus top. She was wearing that hat, and the wind blew it off her head. I see. And from there, we figure that somebody picked it up, and it finally wound up at Gotham. You can figure anything you please. Personally, I don't feel in any way obligated to figure anything. Darling, I was just on my way out, and... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were busy. Yes, I am busy, Celia. Wait a minute. He's not all Run that Run along busy. now, dear. You'll be late. But I want to talk Run to you. Run along, Celia. Yes, darling. Sorry. I'll see you later. Beautiful. Really beautiful. I've always thought so, Goodwin. You uh, didn't give me much of a chance to talk to her, did you, Larson? If I didn't, it's for your own good. My good? I don't get it. Celia's a sensitive person, and I won't have her bothered. And do you mean to tell me you let him scare you? Let him scare me? Say, will you stop being so fearless with my life? The guy said, don't bother my wife, so I didn't bother his wife. It was that simple. Apparently, his wife was not blonde. Answer the phone, Archie. No, you answer it. Now, you've hurt my feelings. Oh, well. Hello? I want to speak to Mr. Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf speaking. Oh? Is it true that you're interested in the Gatto murder? Who are you, and how do you know he's been murdered? The second question is none of your business. And as for the first, call me Jerry. J-E-R-I. How do you do, Jerry? J-E-R-I. Where do you call? Would you like to come to an auction? An auction? You know, going, going, gone to the highest bidder. And what are you placing on the auction block, Miss Jerry? A few facts. All in good condition and 
guaranteed to make it a cinch to snag the Gato killer. Sounds promising. Only you'll have to bid against real money. May I have the address of the auction room? You'll have no trouble finding it. Your assistant was there last night. Where? The penthouse on top of 206A Rathburn Street. The big item goes on at four bells. Yeah? Who is it? Man named Wolf sent me. Just a sec. Hmm. You're Jerry, huh? I was expecting the man named Wolf. Unfortunately for me, honey, when he's expected, I usually show up. Come on in. You? See, I'm the legs of the combination. He's the brains. It makes, uh, makes a nice division of labor. I see. You came in plenty of time. On the nose is our custom. Where are the rest of the bidders? Any second now. Mm-hmm. How many besides me are coming? One. Small auction. But big action. How'd you happen to decide on this? I knew Gatto pretty good. And you were fond of him pretty good, huh? How did you guess? Well, you've got a key to this place of his, or you couldn't let yourself in. It adds, no? Gee, you should have been a detective. Just what I keep telling Mr. Wolf. Look, tell me, Jerry, darling, this other person who was coming to the auction, who? The killer. You don't say. You sure the killer isn't here already? Look, I didn't kill him. Ah. The story you would like me to believe is that you witnessed the killing, huh? Called the killer and Mr. Wolf and said, come on, kids, you can get me either to talk or shut up, depending on who pays the most, that it? Something like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, prove you know what you're talking about. Who is the killer? Is it Block Rainey? You should also have your head examined, pretty boy. I talk for dough and only for dough. Not that I'm mercenary or anything, but... Okay. Okay, tell me this. How come you saw the killer in the act? Simple. I was here with Gatto. Called me to come see him. While I was here, the shot came through the window there from the roof. You know something, sweetheart? What? I can't understand how a girl like you, a pretty nice girl under all that uh, paint and powder and Broadway shellac, how you could do a thing like this. You were in love with Gatto, I know that, everybody does. And still you're willing to keep your mouth shut if the killer pays enough. How come? Hmm? What's the matter, honey? Did I hit a tender spot? I... I don't think you understand. Sure, I was in love with the goof. Then along comes this other dame. She's rich and beautiful, and she has everything to give him. Oh, do I know her? Of course you do. She... Jerry! Uh... Jerry. She was just about to tell me, and then the shot came through the window from the roof, boss. It's a flat roof outside. You didn't, I suppose, see the murderer? No. I caught Jerry in my arms. By the time I laid her down on the couch and got out on the roof, the killer was gone. Get right over here and bring our client with you, if you can find him. Rainey? That's right. He has a right to be in on the kill. Okay, boss. But keep away from that beer till I get there. Don't be impertinent. I should be busy phoning Mr. and Mrs. Lawson. Meanwhile, I want them here, too. Besides, one bottle won't do any harm. Ah, there they are. Let them in, Archie. You remain seated, Mr. Rainey. Okay, Mr. Wolf. Well, come in, Mr. Lawson. Come in. Mr. Wolf here? He's here. Nice of you to come. Anything to help the law. Ah, Mr. Lawson. Your wife didn't come. Uh, No, Mr. Wolf. She was out when you called. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. I left word with the butler, however. Mr. Lawson, about 20 minutes ago, a girl named Jerry Fay was killed. So? She was killed in your neighborhood, in a flat formerly occupied by one Pepe Gatto. Well, where would that be? Maybe your wife knows where the flat would be. How dare you, sir? No histrionics, please. Where was your wife when the girl was killed? I'm advising you that if there is an alibi, now's the time to state it. I wouldn't humiliate Celia by alibying for her. And the police will pick her up. But she didn't kill this girl, Mr. Wolf. You have reasons for that opinion? The best of reasons. I'd be grateful if you'd state them and let me be the judge of their excellence. One should do. This one. Celia's out in the country visiting her mother. Oh? Does that settle it? Possibly. What's her mother's telephone number? Why, uh... Merely a routine check. Well, can't you take my word? I'll take her mother's number. Well, Mr. Lawson? 
I'm sorry. I I hoped you'd buy the story. What do you mean? The mother's been dead for ten years. I see. Well, I don't. What's the idea? It's known as marital devotion, Archie. <laughs> I suppose you realize, Mr. Lawson, that in shielding your wife, you're aiding and abetting a murderer. I, I haven't stopped to realize anything. When Goodwin brought me that hat, I didn't know what to say. Oh, you pitched me a curve then, too. Oh, well, I suppose you might call it that, but... And she didn't lose the chapeau off a bus top. No, but you've got to understand. Celia's the dearest thing in life to me. Yeah, so is a lady rattlesnake to its husband. I suggest it is time for you to be objective in this matter, Mr. Lawson. What do you want to know? Tell us where she can be found. I, I have no idea. When is she expected to return home? Never. Oh? You see, we, we had an argument. I doubt that I'll ever see her again. Then we are quite on our own, Archie. To do what? Make a journey to Gatto's apartment. Gatto's apartment? She probably has a key to that popular abode. But she wouldn't go there, boss. On the contrary, I am of the opinion that that's just where she would go. Give me my hat. Don't tell me you're going to stir yourself. Ah, it's a most unpleasant necessity, Archie. But the lady in question is dangerous and not at all hesitant about indiscriminate gunplay. Get out the car, Archie. We'll make the journey to Rathburn Street penthouse with the hope that Celia Lawson will show up in time to mourn her lost love. Uh, uh, you want me to go along with you too, Mr. Wolf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rainey, I do. Uh, I trust this chair will hold me. Should. Biggest chair in the house. Mr. Wolf. Yes, Mr. Rainey? Mr. Wolf, am I to understand that the way you have it figured is that Mrs. Lawson killed Gatto, and then to keep the girl from pinning the crime on her, she killed her too? What's the matter, Mr. Rainey? Don't you think the theory holds water? Well, yes. I, I mean, of course it does. Mm, thank you. On the other hand, there is room for doubt. I'm glad to hear you say that, Mr. Wolf. Would you mind explaining? I'll explain, Mr. Lawson. Mr. Goodwin was in this room when Jerry Fay was killed. Right, Archie? Right, boss. He ran as quickly as he could out onto the roof, but your wife was nowhere in evidence. What difference does that make? A good deal, I'd say. Wouldn't you, Archie? Yes, a detail like that would give a jury room for doubt. Oh, don't be a fool. How so, Rainey? Well, I was about to agree with Rainey. I, I mean, on sheer logic. I'm afraid I miss your point, Mr. Lawson. Well, what if Goodwin didn't see her? That proves nothing. She fired the shots, and then she ran down the fire escape. What fire escape? The one a few feet beyond the chimney. Mr. Lawson. Yes? Who told you there was a fire escape there? Why, uh, Yeah, I... Yeah, who did? You can't see it from here, Lawson. Well, I, I just imagine there might be. Sensationally accurate imagination, Mr. Lawson. Allow me to congratulate you. I don't know what you have in mind. You have in mind to see your wife convicted of the murder of Pepe Gatto. And so punish them both for having dared to fall in love. I love Celia. I worship her. Yes, that's what you expected me to believe. Hoping, meanwhile, that a hat would convict her. You worshipped her until she became fascinated by a young savage animal known as Pepe Gatto. No. At that point, the worship shifted into reverse. And you went green with hate. Hate that drove you to climb that fire escape that you know so much about and shoot him in the back. You're dreaming. Jerry Faye saw you in the act. And when she was about to divulge your identity to Archie, you killed her too. Meaning to hang her murder on your wife along with the other killing. That's a lie. Mr. Lawson, I didn't bring you here to apprehend your wife. There's really no reason why she should come here. I suggested this visit in the belief that you'd betray some guilty knowledge of the place and circumstances. As you have so obligingly just done. You're clever, aren't you? Monumentally. But a little hasty. So? Why? This gun in my hand. I haven't you noticed? <laughs> of course, sir, but yours is not the only gun in the world. What? Sit still, Arnold. And don't turn around. Your wife, Mr. Lawson. Come in, my dear. Celia, what are you doing here? I came to get a hat that I'd left in Pepe's closet. It suddenly was clear to me what was in the wind. And I thought I'd better remove all evidence that you could possibly use against me. Celia, listen, you must understand I understand you... one thing only. Pepe's gone. And you took him away. Listen, please, if you let me explain, you'll understand. Yeah. Please, honey, help me. Sure, I'll help you. Oh, uh, Celia. Well, that's all, Mr. Wolf. What now? <laughs> Gee, 
Hey, why is it when you drive, it always gets so crowded outside? Will it go tough on her, boss? Why not? She killed a man in cold blood. Though she actually saved our lives while doing so. I hope that helps her at the trial. I hope so, Archie. After all, if she hadn't done what she did, what would have happened to the lobster beast? What lobster beast? The lobster beast that Fritz is making for dinner. <laughs> Hurry, Archie. It really can't be appreciated unless it's eaten hot. <laughs> have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Ann Diamond, Charlotte Lawrence, Gerald Moore, Don Diamond, and Eddie Fields. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Killer Card. Don Stanley speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night is date night, and NBC has a lively lineup of music and fun to help your courting along. Tomorrow, Dennis Day brings you a melodic and mirthful 30 minutes, and then Judy Canova gets together with her gang for a sparkling session of mountain-style song and laughter, followed by singing MC Red Foley and his friends on that exciting parcel of Western tunes and mayhem Grand Ole Opry. Here's Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and esp- I was a communist for the FBI. Many of the incidents in the story you're about to hear are based on the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. To use a simile, communism is like a time bomb, innocent enough on the surface, just a box. It isn't until you get inside that you find the dynamite intended to blow you apart. I know because for nine years I was inside the party. I met the red dynamite on its own terms. And one thing I found out while working as an undercover man, you, mister, yes, and you too, lady, you're target for that red explosion. The explosion that was my job to help prevent. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, undercover man. Dana Andrew, Mac Anderman. Story from the dental files marked The Dangerous Dollars. Young Communist League, $6,809.44. Dues paid in full. Contributions up three and a half percent. Good. The Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born? Eleven thousand two hundred. Dues in full. Contributions down point five. Notice this collection from Comrade Hart Excel is up a hundred. I was assigned to the Communist Finance Committee in charge of collections for the district, and I watched the figure of Comrade Noor's adding machine. Money, big money, from reds and from just plain suckers. 
Dues paid monthly, contributions paid as often as could be squeezed out of so-called voluntary donors. Subversive activity is expensive, and it was my job to come pay for it, and to make sure the FBI knew where the money came from, and where it Big Jumbo Red Hot, come on, get your popcorn here, mister. Be a sport, feed the pigeons. Sure. Uh, give me an order of 17 peanuts. 17's a lucky number. For a man who eats red popcorn. Oh, Jay Cox, how's business? Lousy. But I love blowing this darn whistle. That's what I like about the FBI. The agents have so much talent. Never mind my talent. Did you trace that money? Yeah, I think so. The big portion goes to party headquarters in New York, of course. But there's one other shot picked up by a special messenger. Regularly? Well, past six weeks, anyway. Who's the messenger? Who gets the money? I don't know. And the messenger I know only by number. Forty-three. The blonde woman. Tall, beautiful if you like the type, and who doesn't? Slavic accent. She's due to make a pickup tonight. Good. I'll have men waiting to tailor. Important? Plenty. This is a hot one, Matt. Meet me in my office tonight at 11. I want to give you a rundown. There's a... Come on, buddy. You've window shopped long enough. Beat it. Make room for the customers. Peanut. Big Jumbo Red Hot's here. Here, comrade. All mm. increase of 79... Satisfy National Headquarters, comrade Matt? Please them, perhaps. Satisfy them, no. Okay, comrade Nora. I think we've done enough for tonight. Let's wrap it up and... Oh, comrade Matt, it's her, 43. Well, good evening, comrade. Good evening. Good evening. Your package is there on the desk. 18,000. And $10. Count it. I'm sure it's right. Your figures are always right. A sign of your intelligence. Oh, bully for me. You're a very interesting man, Comrade Fettig. Someday we may be able to meet on more social terms and discuss your intriguing nature. Good night, Comrade. Good night. Comrade, did you see that coat? Mink. And that dress, why, it was outrageously bourgeois. Oh, she should be investigated. I don't trust that one. You forget, she's on special assignment. Undoubtedly, her clothing is a requirement. Well, it's time for us to close up. Will you walk me home, Matt? Uh, comrade Matt? Well, well I'd, I'd like to, but I, not tonight. I want to pick up some things at the drugstore before it closes. Oh, well, there's one on the way to my place. I, I wouldn't mind waiting. Well, sure, on interest because she was lonely, or could she have somehow discovered I was to meet my FBI contact that night? It wasn't until I was entering Nora's apartment that I was reassured of her motive. Come on in. I want you to meet my children. Children? <laughs> well, that's what I call them. Here, babies, come to Mama. Oh, here they come. <laughs> Holy cats. Cats. My babies. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah, it was a pretty tragic sight. A homely girl so starved for affection, she adopted cats to take the place of the children she'd never have. As soon as I could, I ducked out, and after a complicated series of turns and doubling back and forth to throw off any possible tail, I went to the federal building and up the rear way to the office of my FBI contact, Frank Jaycox. Oh, hi, Matt. You're late. Yeah, I had an unexpected delay. Uh, what is it, Jaycox? It's an MVD agent, Krasnov. He the guy 43 is delivering to? We think so. Only we don't know that he's a he. What? All we have is the name, Krasnov. Otherwise, it's man, woman, or monkey. You pay your money and you take your choice. We've got men following 43. If she takes that money to Krasnov, you'll know soon whether he's a man or not. Krasnov's sex is not the problem. What is? Sabotage. Krasnov was the commie secret police agent behind a job in a West Coast aircraft plant a while back. Look production for weeks. You got proof? Yeah. We got him nailed if we can find him. If? You are come 43 like a blanket. She'll lead you to him. Maybe, and it seems too easy. Krasnov is the Reds' top agent. Word we've gotten is that Krasnov plans to import a small but highly trained group. Specialists in arson, demolition, and murder. Whew. Yeah. It's the kind of organization we can't afford to let get started. And that's the why of it, Matt. Krasnov and that money have got to be stopped. <laughs> One 
124. Who's calling? Just a moment. Comrade Maddox and Mr. Jorgensen for you. I'll take it here. I've got it, Nora. Uh, of course, I'm sorry. Hello, Mr. Jorgensen. I didn't expect you to call me here. I know it's dangerous, Matt, but I had to talk to you fast. Oh, your wife's operation didn't go too well last night? You guessed it. Where was it done? 43 was trailed to a small resort called Skyline Rancho, up in the mountains about 100 miles north of here. The resort is a commie hang-on. No one can get past the desk unless he's a rep. Oh. Uh, have you tried another doctor? If you mean force, no. So? So we've got to get an agent inside that resort. Someone who can move around, find out which one of the guests or employees is Krasnov. Where the money is, what Krasnov plans to do with it. That sounds like a tough operation. You'd better have a good surgeon. We have. Who? You. What? Sorry, Matt, but you're the only one who can do it. As a commie, you can get in. You've got a vacation coming. Take it. At Skyline Rancho. There it was, right in my lap. It was that kind of assignment, so the first thing I did was to make sure my life insurance policies were paid up. The next thing was to get off from work without arousing suspicion. Comrade Nora, my assistant, made it easy. Comrade Matt, here are the vouchers. Matt, what's the matter? You look ill. Oh, I guess I'm just tired out. Oh, what a headache I got. You should take a rest. Oh, I can handle things for a few days without any problem at all. Good. Do you think you could? You wouldn't mind? Oh, certainly not. You know I'd do anything for you. Uh, yeah. I wonder where I could go. Oh, goodness, there's plenty of places to go, Comrade Matt. The Chateau Regal, Victor Ski Lodge, Skyline Rancho, or... The Skyline Rancho. Well, that sounds like it might be nice. Oh, no. All right, Comrade, you've made up my mind. I'll go. <laughs> Welcome to Skyline Rancho, Mr. Uh... Sibetic. Here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Mr. Hungerford, the owner. Uh, odd coincidence, you're coming to this resort? It was well recommended. I'd never heard of it. Who recommended it? I, uh, I want to write and thank them. Nora Bayless, my assistant. Why not call her? You'll get the answers quicker. <laughs> you're a clever one. Come with me, I'll show you around. Skyline Rancho turned out to be a small group of bucks and a main lot flat, heavily wooded mesa. After seeing my bag stowed in bungalow number eight, I let the suave Hungerford take me to the main lodge to meet the other guests. Oh, Hungerford, there you are. Let's go outside. Coma Benices is clear tonight, and Vega is unusually bright. Later, Charlie. Matt Svetic, Charlie Grace, are about the things in our heavens. It's just disgraceful. Which one? You met them all, but which one was Krasnov, the MVD agent? The last one I met was a squat ape of a man with black fingernails and an expression like the devil with a hangover. This is Mr. Kane, Matt Svetic. Hi. Hi. Right. Been here long? Nah. Hmm. Well, it's nice to see you're having such a happy time. Later that night, I decided to make my own private survey of the resort. I found nothing interesting around the bungalows, and the stables contained nothing but horses. But when I left the stable, I found myself pinned in the brilliance of two powerful flashlights that blinded me. It's late, Svedek. You'd better go to bed. This night air is cold. It could be the death of you. Back to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sabatik in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. So far, I was getting no place in my search for the MVD agent, Krasnov. 
All I had done was met a few guests at Skyline Rancho and from the darkness received a warning about which I was still worried the next morning as I shaved. Oh, for the love of Pete, now what? Tom! Well, how are you this morning, Mr. Spedick? None the better for that warning last night. Warning? Don't be coy. You're not the type. But I... I recognized your voice. Look, I'm on vacation. What your deal is here, I don't know and care less. Good morning. Now, what did that mean? You. Me. What are you doing in my bungalow, Comrade 43? I like being in your bungalow. Well, why? <laughs> why not? Because oh, it's early morning and now, I... Now, what have you got against morning? Oh, nothing, but... Yeah? Matt? Yeah. Uh, hello, Mr. Jorgensen. How are things with your mother? Mm, all right. She had a few early complications, but at the moment she's holding her own. Doctor's diagnosis very dangerous? Worse than expected by the symptoms. I'll let you know how things develop, Mr. Jorgensen. So for heaven's sake, stop calling me. I understand. I'll wait for your call. That bum. What is it, Matt? Oh, nothing. Mom's been a little sick, and this friend of hers keeps calling me to find out how she is. Oh. Well, let's forget other people's troubles and work on our own. Yeah, only start with you being the reason for me being threatened last night. I will if... If you sit here beside me. Okay. Now make it good, Comrade 43. I'll begin with my name. It's Connie Marachek. You know mine? Yes. And you know I'm on special assignment for the party. What? Sorry, Matt. It's secret, even to you. But it's very important to the party. So much so that when I saw you up here, well, let's say the coincidence made me suspicious. I told Hungerford. And when he saw me taking a walk around in the dark, he pulled that flashlight routine. It was his idea of teaching you a lesson. I apologize, Matt. I should have waited before saying anything to Hungerford. I agree to that. Threats give me a headache. Oh. Why don't you lie down and put your head in my lap, hmm? Let me rub your temples. Sure. Go to it. <sighs> it's a nice lap. Mm -hmm. You like me just a little, Matt? You ever find a man who didn't? I never found a man like you before. No? Connie. Mm hmm? What would have happened if Hungerford had decided I was really a spy? He'd have shot you, I guess. Oh, but you're not a spy, so let's not talk about it anymore. What will we talk about? Why talk at all? Head feel better, darling. What head? <laughs> I'd better go. But do me a favor, Matt. Those walks, don't take them. Connie gave me a smile that could have melted a ten-foot snowdrift and left me with one very positive determination to take that walk everyone was so worried about. I ran into my first obstacle in front of my bungalow, a hollow-chested plaid coat supporting two binocular cases and waving a long, jaunted brass telescope. Good morning. Good morning. Who are you? It's afternoon, and we've met, Mr. Grace. Hmm? Oh, yes, Mr. Spetic, I remember now. Oh, my goodness, call me Charlie. Everybody calls me Charlie. Good for them. Bye. Oh, oh d d don't go. I want to show you I've something. seen it. Why don't you toddle on to the main lodge, Charlie? Your aunt's waiting. Charlie Grace gone. I headed in the opposite direction, past the stables, searching for whatever it was I wasn't supposed to see. My first success was a faint path leading into the trees. A footpath. Two miles through the trees, I found Krasnow's secret. A tiny airstrip and camouflaged hangar. In the hangar, a powerful black cabin plane equipped with extra wing tanks, all full to the top. 
It was information worth a big risk. I hurried back and took the risk by calling my FBI contact, Jay Cox, from a payphone in the lobby of the main lodge. Jorgensen speaking. Jay, this is Matt. I'm sorry, but this is hot and I can't double talk it. Go. Krasnov's got a plane stashed out on an airstrip back in the trees. A cabin plane. No NC number. It's painted black. Extra tanks all full. A guy staying here named Kane. His nails are full of black grease. I figure he... Krasnov? I haven't spotted him yet. But I'm playing footsies with his messenger, 43. Her name's Connie Marachek. Marachek, got it. You'd better get Krasnov fast. Black plane, night flight, wing tanks... Long flight, probably to Canada or Mexico. Yeah. Hate to ask you to do this, Matt, but you'd better jimmy that plane first thing. Do what? You have to. We can't let them escape now. You know anything about planes? They got wings and they fly. In that case, open the engine cover, reach in and grab something. (laughs) Then what? Pull. If it comes loose, you're right. It was nearly dark when I made it back to the plane, and my luck held as I opened the engine cover and yanked loose a copper tube that spewed gasoline. It was the plane's fuel line. And that was when my luck started to run out, for across the clearing I could see Hungerford and Kane coming toward the hangar. I retreated into the dubious shelter of some boxes in a far corner and waited. Come on, Kane. Let's get this plane out on the field. Wait till I get the tool room open. I want to give the motor a last check out. Oh, let that go, Kane. You've checked it a dozen times already. Uh, but I want to be... I said forget it. Now, oh, come on. Help me roll the plane down to the end of the strip so Krasnov can take off without delay. I watched as the plane was pushed out and down the field several hundred yards. It was turned into the wind ready to take off, so they thought. When the two men headed back to the hangar, I got an idea... I tied a long piece of wire to a heavy wrench on the table inside the windowless tool room. Ran the loose wire out to my hiding place among the boxes. When Hungerford and Kane entered the hangar, I yanked the wire so it pulled the wrench off the table in the tool room. What's that? It came from the tool room. Let's take a look. It was close timing. When Hungerford and Kane moved cautiously into the tool room, I came out from behind the boxes and moved to the open door, then... Hey, what is this? Open this door! The room had no windows, so I knew the two reds were in for keeps until that door was opened. Scratch two. Next stop, Krasnov. But you have to flush a quail before you can shoot it. So back at the lodge, I dug up the last of my nerve for a bluff that had my heart pounding like a pneumatic drill. Matt, what's the matter? You look so... Connie, I, I've got to talk to you. What is it, Matt? Look... I don't know what assignment you're on, but if it's got anything to do with someone named Krasnov, get him out of here in a hurry. Why? FBI men, two of them. I overheard them talking. Where? Are you sure? I'm sure. One of them followed Hungerford and Kane into the woods back of the stables, and the other left said he was going to bring up the rest. Rest? Where they talk, they've got a whole army coming in. But they can't. That is, we have to get away before... We? You mean this Krasnov person and you? Yes, you may as well know the whole thing now, Matt. You've proven I can trust you. The money I delivered went to Krasnov for him to use in organizing a sabotage ring. Charlie, come here, quick. Of course, my dear, but do be quick. I want to plot the position of Sagittarius. You can drop the act. Matt, this is Major Krasnov of the secret police. Tell him what you told me. When Connie spoke, Charlie Grace changed, and suddenly the harmless stargazer didn't seem quite so harmless. After I told my story, the MVD agent went into action, racing to his bungalow and picking up a valise. Then, with Connie in tow, he vanished down the path to the airfield. I waited near the stables, and in 16 minutes by my watch, they were back, running. Matt, that the plane won't work. The FBI man broke the fuel line. We'll have to use a car. No, you... Huh? I mean, that is, the FBI will be watching the road. Yes, very probable. We'll have to get out of here before they move in. Wait a minute. I've got it. Take horses. You can shortcut down the mountain to Asheville and catch the train there for the city. Of course. They won't be expecting us to use horses. True. And we can charter a plane in the city. Thanks, Comrade Svetik. You've been a great help. It was my pleasure, Major Krasnov. Believe me. I 
watched Krasnov and Connie ride their horses into the darkness. Then in the main lodge, I went to the payphone and made a call that was a real pleasure. Jorgensen. Hi, Jay. Better meet the train coming in from Asheville. Couple of people on it you'll want to see. Krasnov? Yeah. I found out. He's a he. You'll know him. He'll be with Connie Marachek. Oh, and uh, he'll be carrying a valise. Take good care of it. It's full of happy cabbage. Don't worry. We'll take care of it. And while you're at it, send a squad of men up here to make a phony raid to cover my story. They'll find two men locked in the tool room of the hangar. Got it. You coming back to city? Sure. I've got to get back to my little red cabbage patch. There it was, another fragment of the story. A man's life is made up of bits and pieces. Only a purpose can give them meaning. I found my purpose in the underground fight against communism. It was no fun, but don't mistake me. It was worth it to know I was helping in the struggle to keep freedom alive. It was worth it even though it cost me my friends and made me a man who always had to walk alone. Our star, Dana Andrews, will return in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews. Many of the stories of Matt Svedek's underground war against communism are dramatizations of incidents from Matt Svedek's own confidential file compiled during the nine years he was a communist for the FBI. To protect the innocent, all names, dates, and localities have been changed. Next week, we'll bring you another exciting adventure of Matt Svedek. We hope you'll join us. G. Marshall. I've never shared a rather common phobia, the fear of planes. It comes in all forms. Some worry about takeoff, others sweat out the landing. And, uh, of course, in the last few years, the rash of one of the world's most heinous crimes has been the skyjack. I shut my eyes to them all. I prefer to react to that unbelievable moment when tons of steel are magically airborne when the peace of in-flight transports you to another world and the wonder of landing 3,000 miles away if you fly against the clock brings you to your destination almost before you took off. Still, there are times... This is your captain, Deacon Barnett. We will be traveling for the next few hours till we reach New York over water. We soon will be flying at 35,000 feet. Weather's clear. We should expect a smooth flight. Our ETA, estimated time of arrival at Kennedy Airport, 8 a.m. Angie, get that glorious rear end of yours up front on the double with the manifest. Only do it as gracefully as you know how and don't upset anyone. What's wrong, Scotty? What do you mean, green and paper? baby, don't ask questions. Just make like this is the army. Don't ask questions. Move. We are in mucho trouble. And don't forget that manifest. Our 
horror mystery drama, Deadly Dilemma, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Prince and Patricia Elliott. To the Mystery Theater on WABC. Mucho Trouble. Flight 801 out of a small South American republic whose struggle to be born has kept it much in the news. Flight 801, headed for New York. A long, long flight. Already two hours underway. What kind of trouble? Mechanical or man-made? Certainly there are no signs of it as Angie Parsons, head stewardess, threads her way down the corridor of the half-filled plane. Uh, oh, pardon me, senor. Por nada. But uh, speak English to me. I just wanted to get past you, senor. Is there something you wanted? Uh, a drink. Upstairs in the lounge. But now you are here. Would you join me? <laughs> we can't drink on duty. Oh, do you want me to stow your briefcase for you? Ah, no. Muy importante. It stays with me. Well, then excuse me. I have to get up front. Yo estoy aconjajada. Hasta luego, preciosa. Hasta la vista, señor. Oh, excuse me, sir, but if you want to light a cigarette. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did I burn you? Well, yes. Uh, no, 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 it's all right. But you can't light up here, sir. You're not in the smoking section. There's the lounge. Or we could move you back. No, no, no. I, I'm sorry. It, it doesn't matter. I, I, I lit it without thinking. I, I, I'll put it out. I, I'm sorry. I burned you. Hostess. Yes, sir? Here. This is in no smoking section. Someone with the cigarette. It's all right, sir. He's put it out. Ah, muchas gracias, senorita. I hate to complain, but I am a doctor. And obstetrician. Uh -huh. And my patients don't like it either. Besides, I have uh, <laughs> asthma. Excuse me, hostess, but do you think I could get a glass of juice or water would be all right? You travel first class as to the least you can do is have juice. I'll uh, send one of the other girls with it. Now, if you'll excuse me, the captain just called me to the cockpit. Oh, I wouldn't want to be any trouble. Oh, no trouble. I'll take care of it right away. Miss Parsons just brought in the manifest now. That's right. I'll run a check on it with you right away. I'll get back. 801 out. Angie, it's what took you so long. You said to make it casual and not to alarm anyone. What gives, anyway? Take the ship, Scotty. I'll brief Angie. Right, Skipper. Let me have the manifest. Oh, oh here you are. We, uh, we've got a problem, Angie. Nice king-size headache. I don't want to hand any part of it to you, but I've got to. Do you know any other passengers aboard this ship? Well, uh, a couple of people I recognize, regulars, guys I've met on other flights, salesmen, you know. Good. We'll check them off in a minute. First, let's concentrate on our senior Ramirez and group. First class, last minute boarders. You got them? Yes, sir. Like four. I guess all seem to know each other. Seated A, one, two, three, and four. Ramirez... Perez, Ramos, and Marcos. Check. That's like Smith, Brown, Jones, and Martin. Ramirez is Senor Simeon Aguilar, the new presidente of the troubled republic we took off from two hours ago. The rest of the guys are his security guards. But why would the president of a country tr travel on a commercial airline? Angie, honey, they've got internal problems in that little country. Even the leading seltzer couldn't settle down. He's not our main problem. Yes? I just got a security flash from control that we may be carrying some political nut, and a mad bomber, an assassin, a guy who could be ready not only to blow himself and El Presidente Aguilar to kingdom come, but the rest of us with him. I'm not quite ready for that. Uh, me neither. Angie and I are just about ready to announce it. Oh, well, hell. Who has engagements anymore? We're, we're gonna... You've got all my sympathy. Just fly the crate and let me concentrate. We've got to check through that manifest and narrow this down. But why don't we just kick out a couple of engines and pretend we have to make an emergency landing? Scotty, we're dealing with a nut. Anything out of line could trigger him. And we don't know that there's anyone like this aboard. It's only a tip. How about having one of El Presidente's guards make a tour of the plane and see if he recognizes oh, anyone who might... 
If he did know the guy, the guy would know him. And that would start the fireworks. Besides, if the other side really sent out a martyr like this, he's either someone they wouldn't know or in disguise. Look, let's take this step by step. Sure, Deke. I mean, Now, let's Captain. start with the manifest list. You have it right here. Now, this never came up for me before. But can you tell from it when each passenger booked passage? No, you'd have to get that from the ground. They'd know. Sure, it's, it's all computerized. Hold it a minute. Control, this is Captain Deacon Barnett, Flight 801. Request urgent info, priority one. That's right, urgent I received first channel, all bookings made on our manifest list prior to... Hold it. Angie, what's Ramirez's first name and his crew? Jaime Ramirez. Jaime Ramirez. Hernando Perez. Hernando Perez. Arturo Martinez and Irving Marcos. Arturo Martinez and Irving Marcos. Check me back soonest. Now, while we're waiting, let's check off your regulars. Or anyone else you think you can clear. This may be all a big nothing, but if it isn't, we'd better pinpoint this guy. Or that's what we're all going to end up. Thanks, O.B. I'll be in touch. And for heaven's sake, you keep in touch with me. 801 out. Well, what's the story? Well, between booking dates, Angie's eliminations, and a couple of million-mile oldies, it pretty well narrows itself down. How many? Seven plus three. Well, what's that mean? Well, first off, the president and his three bodyguards. We know they're armed. Wish I'd insisted they'd check them with me. Well, can't we count them out? I mean, aren't they his boys? I'll take the chance we can. So, that leaves... Um, Sister Teresa of the San Andreas Mission, returning after three years in the field. Her sponsor, uh, Monsignor Carey of the Ohio Diocese. She seems clean enough. If she is the sister herself. She has a big carpet bag, old-fashioned, with her. Well, that's a bit suspicious. Well, not if you saw the sister. They go together. She must be 70 if she's a day. What about this doctor? Dr. Alcaniz? I don't know anything about him, except that he doesn't like smokers. Either because he's an obstetrician or because he has asthma. Oh, come on. There must be some lead. I don't know. Mr. and Mrs. Jacobowitz. They went to visit their son, who's with the Peace Corps. Jim Hart. He's a mousy little schmo. He's the son of the Hart banking family. Some kind of archaeologist or paleontologist or something. So what about this Senor Ramos? I don't know anything about him. Except he is like the doctor and the nun. How's that? Well, wherever they go, they hang on to the bags they have with them. Doctor's bag, briefcase, carpet bag. Which doesn't necessarily signify anything. No, not under normal conditions. Except if you had a bomb... You wouldn't move anywhere, would you, without having it exactly the hand? I don't know. I never had a bomb. Well, where do we go from here? I, uh... I, uh... <laughs> yes, that's my little red wagon, as my father used to say. I'll check him out. Oh. I don't know. Very carefully. How long would I have, do you think, if this scare is for real? Not over half an hour. I mean, if I wanted to total this plane... I'd do it over open, deep water, like about half an hour from now. Now, I'm leveling, Angie, because what else can I do? You couldn't just deck us the, or make some sort of deal? No, this, this isn't a skyjack. This is, as my Nebraskan father used to quote from the good book, Armageddon. This man means to kill. And he expects to die in the God of Dameron. Like Hitler. <laughs> If he exists. Let me remind you again, this is only a tip, but we, we don't know for sure. Then what should I do, Deke? Okay. I'll level all the way. I'm sorry to dump this rather blood on you, Angie, but I can't do it. I'm too obvious. Same goes for Scotty, or any officer. You're just going to have to hunt them down one by one. Well, I... Uh, I think we could narrow it down a little further... The, the two guys in the Million Mile Club, I've seen them on almost every tour I've flown. The Jacobowitzes, they're sound asleep under the same blanket and holding hands. She doesn't even have a handbag. 
I put it up in the locker. Okay. They're off the list as of now. The heart kid. Now, he's an heir to millions and a mouse. He's so nervous flying over water, he can't even light a match properly. <laughs> Damn little fool burned my hand. Hey, let's see. Oh, it's nothing, Scotty. No, Deacon. Unless one of the president's personal guard is a fifth columnist, it has to be one of three. The doctor, Senor Ramos, or Sister Teresa. If it's anyone. That's the damn part of the whole thing. If I was sure this was more than a tip, if it was a fact, I could ditch this plane so fast nobody outside of this control room could handle the shock. Then when I pulled out, we could be ready to grab the guy while his brains are still scrambled. But that's almost as dangerous as a bomb itself. Busted eardrums, heart conditions. Now, you know that isn't the answer. Angie, honey? Yes, Scotty? You can handle it. Now, check out those three. And if they're clean and nothing more comes up from ground control, we can all treat it as a false alarm. Uh, right, Chief? way I figure. But don't take too much time, Angie. As soon as we're over deep water, it would be the time for anyone who wanted to to do away with the president for sure. Like I said... You got about 30 minutes. I think I'll... I'll start with the doctor. This burn gives me an excuse to get him to open his bag. Happy hunting. Just take care, babe. You're kind of important to me. It works both ways, Scotty. But everyone on this plane is important to someone. We don't want to let anyone down. Play it cool? No. You know how it is. It's always jitter time when you visit a doctor. I just wish I had a better reason to see this particular obstetrician. Now I join the rest of you as terror begins. And even if ground control is only passing on an unfounded, as yet, threat of disaster, I would be as conscious as Deke that there is on board the president of a country racked by revolution, where feelings of repression run so high that even ordinary people are no longer rational. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. He returns on WABC. The human being is a remarkably adaptable animal, but you can only adapt to what you know. How do you adapt to a situation which may not even exist? which is stewardess Angie Parsons' problem as she begins with Dr. Salvador Alcaniz, obstetrician, and possibly the opposite of his chosen profession, possibly a man with some kind of bomb destined to have nothing to do with birth, but the sudden and terrible death of nearly 100 human beings. Everything all right, Senor Medico? Uh, senorita, you are very kind to single me out. It's my job. Uh, can I get you anything? Uh, no. No, I must find my own way from now on. I beg your pardon? Oh, of course. That is a strange-sounding statement. <laughs> I must explain. So I don't want to. I have... I have just lost my wife of many years. Oh, uh, I am sorry. You are very simpatico. I knew that the moment I came on the plane. <laughs> Why, uh, why don't you take that heavy bag off your lap? Put it beside you on the seat. We have plenty of space. Oh, I suppose it is very foolish. Hang on to it as some kind of symbol. A discredited one. Beg pardon? The symbol and remaining function of all my life. Why? Oh, the secrets one divulges in the clouds of the night. My wife died of cancer. And all our skills could not save her. I am sorry. And so am I. But that will not bring her back, so I aim to work at destroying that and the other leaders of society that brings me to your country for... for my own uh, personal reasons. What reasons? Those I keep to myself. Why don't you uh, let me take your bag and make you a bed across these three seats? You could sleep no, no, or rest. No, 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 I c cannot sleep or rest. And the bag, I hold on to. Oh, but, but you mustn't waste any more time with me. As a persona, I am nothing. As a doctor, I see only a magnificent specimen, the most beautiful woman in the full thrust of her health, as the young should be. Oh, the, uh, the young can get in trouble. You? Year before last, I was skiing. I 
I hit some powder snow on a downhill run, dug in, and broke the ulna bone in my leg. I'm sure it healed as good as new. Better than this burn on my hand, which one of the passengers gave me accidentally. Okay. A bone. Oh, let me see. Ah, see. That is a nasty little bone. Let me see if I can tell. I find you something here. A little analgesic, a healing balm. So, maybe no blister, and at least nothing to hurt. No, it's very kind of you, Doctor, but I'm not worth the trouble. Oh, here the individual is. Ah, ah, no. Let me see. Yeah. So, <laughs> there we are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Strange thing, this world, is it not? The only thing that is really important is the individual. For the rest, it could disappear in a cloud of smoke for me at the soonest moment. Ah, Senor Ramos, uh, did you have your drink? Uh, yes, I did. In fact, I was, uh, how you say uh, in American, I, I had two, dos, doubles. <laughs> doubles? In so short a time? Well, I am one big. Bad boy, no? That's up to your conscience. Ah, uh, I see. But better a short life than a merry one, no? No. Why not a long life and the same? Uh, we sympathize, And <clears throat> there is no one sitting here. Why don't you join me? Don't you want to get some sleep? Mm, sleep I can get any time. The, what you say, a uh, company of a beautiful woman is at best a lucky accident. Almost everyone is asleep. Cannot I plead? Is that a good word? Eh? They will <laughs> join me. <laughs> I brought some brandy and a glass down with me. We could share it. Well, it's, uh, it's against rules still. Oh, why don't you give me your briefcase and I'll put it on the seat behind you so that uh, you can move over and I'll join you. No, 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 no problem. I move to the window seat to make room. But your briefcase was... For nada, I keep it with me. Uh, is it so precious? What's in it? The crown jewels? What it contains is my business, senorita. But <laughs> what would it... Eh, pretty mariposa like you care about business affairs, eh? Let's drink to what should be only between a man and a woman. Love, aventura amorosa de la corazón. Oh, you'd better use both hands to pour your brandy, senor. We might hit an air pocket. Oh, 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 I'll take my chance. Did not you when you sat down here with me? I just wanted to be sure you were all right. Oh, you mean you think I drink too much, eh? Mm. <laughs> Hey, I'm celebrating, my dear. Celebrating a new era. Well, death in a sense, but a new birth. What do you mean? All in this such a... Uh, such a... the right word? Uh... Yes, or, or briefcase. Ah, I see, see, see. Briefcase. In this day... Uh... Oh, <laughs> excuse me. It is the end of a long, hard struggle. But I have brandy. It is good for sleeping, for stopping the mind from from racing, for for finding a little peace. Well, I am so suddenly cansado. <sighs> Muy cansado. Senor Ramos? Senor? Out like a light. Let's see if I can... Oh, there. That's it. Senor? Hasta la vista, amigo. I hope this thing doesn't have to be carried at just the right angle. Oh, hostess. Uh, uh, yes, sister? I was wondering about my orange juice or, or whatever you have. Oh, oh I, I'm i so sorry, sister. Uh, Teresa, isn't it? Sister Teresa. I, uh, I, I just have to take this to the captain, and uh, then I'll bring it to you. Uh, no hurry. We are taught to be very patient, you know. Well, what's the word, Angie? Oh, not the doctor, I don't think. 
He opened his bag without any hesitation, and all that seemed to be in there was, you know, stethoscope, blood pressure thing, bottles. Any one of which could be nitroglycerin. Half a pint at this altitude would blow us to shreds. What have you got in your hands? I took this briefcase from Senor Ramos. I suppose I ought to be insulted in the midst of making a pass at me. You fell asleep. That doesn't sound like, like, like any mad bomber. Just the same. I'd like to get this out of my hands. He says it contains the secrets of a new tomorrow. Any sound from it? Hey, let me listen. Hmm. Well, it's quiet as a grave. Oh, that's a great simile. <laughs> Don't open it. Take it in the galley, Scotty. Put it in the sink. Fill it with water. Make sure it's well soaked before you open it. Okay, Skipper. It will do. Any more word from ground control? Uh, not really, Angie, except they don't think it's a hoax. They don't report the source. The information seems reliable. How about the nun? You checked her out yet? No, she's the last. Because it's so ridiculous. A little round, wrinkled butterball who could have been everybody's mother. Your little round butterball may turn out to be a Peter Lorre in disguise. Getting over wide open sea and I'm getting the jitters. Better take care of it now. I have a good excuse. She asked for some orange juice. <laughs> Wish we could slip a Mickey in it, just in case. Oh, just one thing about the doctor, Deke. What? I... Tried throwing him a little curve just to see if he checked out. What do you mean, the curve? Well, it, it was when he noticed the burn on my hand and wanted to fix it. it. It's nothing, of course, but it was a great excuse to get him to open his bag. Yeah, we've been over that. Except for one thing. After I got him engaged in conversation, I told him about something that once happened to me. So? Well, I once had dreams of being a U.S. ski champion. I was way in over my head, and one year on a giant slalom, I blew it but good and was... Lucky to come out with nothing more than a fractured tibia. I said to the medico that what I broke was the ulna bone in my leg. And he didn't react? Well, he... He was busy at the moment, and besides, we do have different language roots. Not in Latin. Well, I don't like it, Angie. We've got to cover that, just in case. Okay, not your worry. What the hell, we're on automatic. I'll send the flight lieutenant back to ride herd on the doctor. So we get, gods be willing, some more definite news. Ground side. How's it going? Well, what do I answer to that, honey? I'm a grown man doing a ridiculous and possibly destructive thing because a voice on the pipe threw the fear of God in us. A plain old briefcase, and I'm soaking it in the sink. If the plain old briefcase contains a bomb... Supposing it doesn't contain a bomb... Are our faces red? Scotty, what's the word? Well, the airlines are going to have one plenty mad customer named Ramos. What do you mean? Ah, oh, the poor guy. His briefcase is filled with nothing but blueprints and a mock-up of a new kind of sailing vessel that doesn't use a helm. No rudder? That's right. It's a main center board plus a rear center board with a kind of a, a tiller that controls both. It's, uh, it's pretty hard to tell. It's all washed out after the soaking. Well, never mind uh, that now. Uh, Airline will compensate him. Maybe back him. Who knows? The big deal is that this rules out him as our bomber. Too right. So that narrows it down to the nun. If that's what she is. Oh, I, uh, I guess, unless the... Uh, the doctor has some nitro in a bottle. Oh, well, you can rest easy about him. I sent Billy back to sit behind him. Can't make a move without Billy laying a hammerlock on him. But uh, how about Angie? She seems pretty well able to take care of herself. Especially with a nun. Unless the nun isn't a nun. Deke, Deke, what the hell am I going to do? That's my girl out there, and, and there are 84 people on this plane. Knock it off. I have some dependents, too, beyond our passenger list. And who wants to get killed in some senseless way that has nothing to do with any of us? I want you to take over the ship. You can take a small deck cruise and see how things size up. Uh, uh, why can't because I Because your girl is right in the middle of this. It's just the point. You're too closely involved. But we've been a team a long while, Scotty. You let me handle this. I won't let Angie come to harm any more than you would. I guess you're right. There's nothing like a neutral observer when you don't know whether a war is in progress 
or never had to happen at all. Captain Barnett is right, of course. This may still be a normal flight, upset only because it has left a country boiling with unrest. Still, the political implications are threatening. There is on board the plane a man who, from the moment he acceded to power, had to be marked for possible death. The terrible thing is that the projected manner of his death is such that if El Presidente is to be assassinated, so will everyone else on Flight 801. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Turn to the Mystery Theater on WABC. Half an hour out from the South American continent, headed roughly north-northwest for New York, Flight 801 cruises serenely at 35,000 feet. Almost all her passengers are asleep, and under normal conditions, half her crew might be. But this is a special flight. Flight control has alerted them from the ground that there may be a maniac who, for political reasons, is ready to blow the great 747 out of the air. So nice of you to bring me my orange juice. My mouth was really quite dry. I don't blame you, Sister Teresa. It's a long, tiring flight. Do you mind if I sit with you for a moment? Not at all. I'll take your bag and put it... Don't touch it. I'll hold it here in my lap. It'll be perfectly safe. It's safe where it is, and it isn't all that heavy. Please sit down. (sighs) You look so uncomfortable, can't I? No, no, I I want it this way. You must have something very important in there. I do. Really? Uh, Church relics? Not exactly. Why would you ask that? Well, uh, you have been with the mission in South America. I thought perhaps you might have discovered some relics to bring back with you. I, I mean, since you're so protective about the bag. Relics? Uh, yes, in a sense. And I am protective about it. You're going back to New York? Oh, dear me, no. My diocese is in the Middle West. I imagine I'll be assigned to Cleveland. For heaven's sake. I hope so. <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't mean that. It's my hometown. I was born there. You know Cleveland? Oh, yes. I spent several years there before I was sent on my mission. On the east or the west side? Uh, uh, On the east side. Anywhere near Cleveland Heights? Why do you ask? Oh, well, that's just where I was born. On the corner of uh, Huff and Euclid Avenues. I I think I remember there was a big convent. Oh, I, um... No, uh, I I come from a very small order. Uh, We don't live in a convent. Uh, Just one of those uh, big old houses, you know. Near the playhouse? Beg pardon? I said, is it uh, near the Cleveland Playhouse? Not far from there. Do you have the time, my dear? Why, yes, it's it's a quarter to one. It gives me 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Why, why, yes, uh, to tell my uh, beads, you know. Uh, to say a little prayer for... for all of us. You are... you're quite sure you don't want me to take that bag for you? Very sure. I've never really seen one quite like it. It was my father's. Really quite roomy. It was just the right size. Uh, they were called carpet bags, you know, because they were made out of carpet. Why, you're right. Don't touch it, please. I'm sorry. I was just interested. Is it lined inside or or just the back of the carpet? I'd love to have a look. No. There's nothing to look at, really. Nothing you'd want to see. Well, I'm really quite interested. Well, I'm sorry, but I... It would embarrass me to open it. What time is it now, please? It's about 12 minutes to. Type it. Copile is me. Oh, this is Deke, Scotty. Everything all right with you? Yeah, steady as she goes. Where are you? The tail galley. Any further news from ground control? Not a peep. What's doing out there? Your girl is talking to the nun up in first class. 
I'm going to stroll by on the way back and check things out. Yeah. And for Pete's sake, don't leave her alone with me. Uh, hold it. Uh, flight 801. Uh, co-pilot Scott speaking. What? That's for dead shooter? Good Lord. Look, look, I think we got her. Keep your fingers crossed we're in time or you're going to be out one plane, crew and passengers. Deke. Deke, that was control. The tip is confirmed. There is someone aboard with enough nitro to blow us to kingdom come. Maybe it's the doctor after all. No, it's a woman. It's got to be that nun. And Angie's with her. Deke, you've got... You fly the plane, Scotty. I'll handle this. Anything wrong, Captain? No, just stretching my legs a little. Are we over deep water now? Yeah, just passing over the Antilles. We'll be in about ten minutes. Don't be nervous. I, I, I won't be. Oh, what time do you have? Eleven minutes to one. Why don't you put your bag under the seat and take a nap? Oh, excuse me, I'm uh, needed up front. Bill. Yeah, Captain. Don't say anything. Just follow me and back me up, whatever I do. Close the curtain, Billy. Hello, ladies. Oh, Captain. The sister and I are having a nice little chat. Uh, this is Sister Teresa. Hello. Our Captain, Deacon Barnett. And our flight engineer, Bill Stokes. Hello. Pleased to meet you, Sister Teresa. Now, yeah, me too, ma'am. Well, we don't often have the pleasure, uh, and may I say, the protection of a nun aboard? I don't very often get to fly, and this is the first time ever in first class. I've never been so far up front. Well, how would you like to go all the way? I beg pardon? Oh, <laughs> I meant, how would you like to be our guest in the cockpit and see how we fly one of these monsters? Oh, that would be very exciting. Well, then, consider it an invitation. Here, I'll take your bag for you. Oh, no, I, I couldn't leave it. I'll watch it for you. I'm on a rest break anyway. No, I just carry it myself. <sighs> She's very attached to it, and she says it isn't as heavy as it looks. Oh, very well. Whatever the sister wants. We old ladies get so, so set in our habits. Oh, what time is it? Ten minutes before one. It'll have to be just a short visit. I must be back in my seat by one. Well, whatever you wish. Bill, if you'll escort Sister Teresa, Angie and I will follow. I'll go first, Captain, so I can open the door. I'm following you. She's got some kind of box in that bag. It's her. Control's confirmed. When I grab her arms, get that bag away from her. But don't open it, okay? Roger. Let's go. Oh, my. All those instruments. It looks as though there would be enough to take you to the moon and back. How can you ever... Uh, what, what are you... Grab the bag. Kenzie, uh, help her, Bill. No. I, I got it. No, don't. No. It, it just came open. There's no catch on it. What's inside? Oh, it's an animal carrier. Oh, there's a, a cat inside. I can see Please, it. Please, Captain. You're hurting me. I know it's against all the rules, and I'll have to do penance for it. But I couldn't think of poor Tommy riding back there in the luggage compartment. Twenty years we've been together, Tommy and I, and I had to have him with me on his last journey. Besides, I, I wasn't sure the air people would allow him on the plane at all. Oh, why not? Because he's dead, you see. He passed away to his final reward before I ever got him on the plane. I was taking him home to, to bury him in our little convent garden. All the nuns loved Tommy, and he did them. He'd want to be near them. A <laughs> dead cat. Oh, it'd be funny if... What the devil are we going to do now? Maybe I should have taken poor Sister Teresa back to her seat instead of sending Bill back with her. No, no, no. I, I need you to go over that manifest with me again. Scotty, uh, got a cigarette? Oh, yeah, here. Thanks. I'll light it for you. Oh. Here, get, 
Give me those. Women with matches are a positive menace. What do you mean? Haven't you ever noticed? A man always strikes a match towards him. Women always strike them away from him. I've got more spark burns. What is it, Angie? What's wrong? The burn I got from the guy who's listed as James Hart. That's the way he struck a match away from him. And come to think of it, he, he has a kind of strange voice. He could be a woman. I think Angie's got a deep. Yeah. He was just asking me when we'd be over deep water. Look, got to work fast. Scotty, are we on automatic? Yes, Skipper. Give me one of your socks. How do I... What? Don't ask questions. Angie, get me a bar of soap. Okay. I'm not taking any chances. Man or woman, I'm going to cold cock that bird. We can apologize later if we made a mistake. Okay, Angie. Above and beyond the call of duty. I'd have brought Bill, but I'm afraid two uniforms might alarm him. It's okay. After all, oh, I... Hold it. Everything all right, Sister Teresa? Oh, yes, except what are you going to do about... Oh, now, don't you worry about that. Angie and me will take care of you. I know you will. I'd say you have all my faith, except that I owe that to someone else. But I do trust you. Thank you, sister. Let's go. You go first. Stop at that seat before his and find some excuse to be busy. Okay. Once I'm past him, pow. And you grab that bag. Yes, sir, Dick. I got you. <sighs> Here goes. Oh, you don't have a pillow. I'm sorry. Let me help you get a little more comfortable. If you'll just sit forward a moment, I can... Is it one o'clock yet, hostess? I've got to know if it's... Grab the bag, Angie. Grab it fast. I got it. How about him? Her or whatever it is. Out like a light. You didn't. No, 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 no. no that's the value of the sock pacifier. It just sends you off safely for a short while to never, never land. Well, better her, uh, him, and all the rest of us. You get rid of it? Yep. Enough nitro to blow up the Elizabeth, too. Let alone us. Who is she? She's Hart's twin sister. She belongs to some way out organization. Got her locked back there in one of the galleys screaming about fascists and the CIA. And I wish she was ready to die to stop exploitation and colonial class. She saw the kid is crazy. She'd actually have killed nearly a hundred people to get rid of El Presidente who happens to be a middle of a roader. The best thing that's happened to his country in the last hundred years. Scotty, give, give me a cigarette. This one, I'll light myself. <laughs> honey. Are you, honey, are you all right? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Did you see the way Deke struck that match? Away from him. I did? Well... How are you like that? No, I, I, I was so sure. Well, yeah, piece of luck for all of us, you were. I don't know. It's one o'clock. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Sister Teresa is telling her rosary. She said she'd be praying for all of us. I think it was a lot more than just luck. <laughs> Or the positive power of prayer. Figure it how you will. The important thing is that Flight 801 is safe. And all its passengers and crew, and poor old Tommy, is headed safely for his last resting place. I'll be back shortly. State Farm is there. With a discount for drivers 50 and older. Millions of drivers 50 and older are saving... Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Lana Turner and Chief Bosun's mate Victor Mature of the United States Coast Guard in Slightly Dangerous with Gene Lockhart. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, 
Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When a manuscript called Slightly Dangerous turned up at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Studios, everyone must have stood up and shouted in unison, This is for Lana Turner. And I'd have joined in the shout if I'd been there. Certain stories seem to be made just for certain stars, and Slightly Dangerous was made for the lady who's known as Lana. Certain stars go well together, too. And I believe we have an ideal combination tonight with Victor Mature helping Lana to make the evening slightly dangerous. This is the story of a young lady who thinks she has a dull job and hankers for adventure, but finds a little more of it than she'd bargained for. The play's a delightful mixture of gaiety and drama, and that's a team we've always found unbeatable. After tonight's performance... Lana Turner goes back to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer to begin work in her new picture, Marriage is a Private Affair. And Chief Boson's mate, Victor Mature, goes back to his post with the Coast Guard after his first leave in many months. Servicemen are learning a good deal that's outside their regular curriculum. As a case in point, we have received a letter signed by three gentlemen calling themselves the Luxem Doughboys. In approved military fashion, they don't say where they're writing from, but they enclose a photograph showing two muscular young men in abbreviated attire. One of them is holding a box of Lux flakes in his hand, and the other is hanging up some washing on a makeshift line. Well, I'm going to stick my neck out now and predict that soldiers with this experience will be much in demand as husbands when the war is over. And if they drop a hint, that they're accustomed to using Lux Flakes. Well, it'll probably close the deal immediately. And with that prophecy, the curtain goes up on the first act of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner as Peggy and Victor Mature as Bob, with Jean Lockhart as Burden. Find a penny, pick it up. All day you will have good luck. Said to herself when she found the penny... Peggy said to herself that it was about time she had some good luck anyway. I'll say it is. What kind of a life is this I'm leading? Work, eat, sleep. Work, eat, sleep. Oh, I'm getting sick of it. Yes, Peggy has a habit of saying things to herself, mostly because she has no one else to talk to. But now she's found a penny, and her lucky day is about to begin. As she enters the store where she works, the small change mart, the chief clerk is beginning his daily speech to the employees. Good morning, friends. Ah, we are all very lucky indeed to be employed by such a beneficent store as the Coast to Coast Small Change Mart. And this morning, there is one among us who is going to realize her luck even more than the rest of us. It gives me great pleasure to present Merit Award number four to that lucky girl, Miss Peggy Evans, who works at the soda fountain. Uh, please step forward, Miss Evans. <laughs> Peggy Evans, you're the first employee in the entire chain to arrive at your work 1,000 consecutive mornings on time. I therefore present you with Merit Award number four, redeemable for $2.50 in merchandise. Thank you, sir. And remember, another 1,500 punctual arrivals brings the $10 award. Keep your eye on it. Yes, sir. Now, uh, to your stations, everyone. Open the door, please, Mr. Bonwit. Gee, congratulations, Peggy. What a break, huh? Two and a half fish out of the blue. Oh, thanks, Mitzi. And just think, it only took me a little over three years. Huh? Three years and four months. And in another five years, I'll get $10 more. In merchandise. Yeah, wholesale, too. Well, I'll be 26 then. Well, what's the beef, honey? In five years, you're going to be 26 anyway. Is that bad if they give you 10 bucks velvet? Is that an insult? Oh, and I'll have such a nice set of memories. 2,500 mornings on time. <laughs> Those will be something to tell the children about. Except if I have a child, it might make me late that morning. Oh, it's bound to. But you ain't even married. No, I'm not. I'm not likely to be. Where could I meet a man? Well, anywhere. Where did I meet Hobart? Oh, don't tell me. Was it under a rock? Oh, Hobart'll doodle Johnny comes along. Oh, who's Johnny? Nobody. Johnny's what I call him. Call who? Whoever he is. Phil, Joe, Charlie, Chuck, Jimmy. I call him Johnny. <laughs> well, what about him? Look, honey, I know lots of gals who got the same kind of job as you got, and they love it. Why? Because they got their Johnny. Oh, and that makes everything wonderful, I suppose. It sure does. You just keep laughing at nothing all the time. Yep, that's the way it is when you meet up with Johnny. Well, 
I don't know any Johnny, and I'm not likely to meet one around here. Unless it's that drip who whistles at me in front of Cutler's drugstore. <laughs> so that's what got you mad, huh? Oh, no, Missy. It's just that I'm fed up. They played a dirty trick on me. Be yourself, will you? Nobody's played any tricks on you. Oh, yes, they did. When they were sitting around deciding who was going to be who, and when they came to me, they said, Now, let's make this one nobody. Let's not give any family, any home, anything. Let's just give her one thing, a job. The dullest little job we can find. And in the dullest little town we can find, Hotchkiss Falls. Ah, oh, take it easy, honey. Your job's not as bad as all that. Why, you, you, you meet a lot of people and you, you do a lot of interesting things like mixing up Sundays and stuff. Oh, stop it, Missy. I could do my job blindfolded. Oh, no, you couldn't, honey. There's a lot more to it than you think. Oh, I couldn't, huh? Absolutely blindfolded. Watch me. Here, give me that napkin. Oh, no, no, Peggy, don't do that. You'll get into trouble. I can mix anything they want. Oh, miss, uh, one second, lady. Peggy, take off that blindfold. Watch this. Uh, order, lady. Well, I'd like, uh, what's the matter, theory? Did you hurt your eyes? <laughs> no, this is a new company rule. Blindfold improves efficiency. Well, what won't they think of next? Um, I'll have a jumbo banana split. One jumbo coming up. Peggy, don't try it. Banana, slice it down the middle, so... Ice cream, chocolate on the right, strawberry on the left, and vanilla in the middle. Chocolate sauce, pineapple preserve, whipped cream, nuts, and a cherry on top. There you are. Well, get her. Did you see that? Nice going, kid. <laughs> okay, who's next? The blindfold mark. I don't see how she does it. Oh, miss, over here, please. Yes, sir. Order, please. Tell me, doesn't that blindfold handicap your work? <laughs> well, order something and see. Well, I'm sorry to spoil your fun, but I'll have to ask you to take it off. And I'll have to ask you to leave that stool if you're not going to order. The management doesn't allow lounging. Look, number 122, I am the management. I'm the new general manager. Oh, well, I suppose you're pretty proud of yourself sneaking up and catching me when I wasn't looking. Now, wait a well, minute. Well, you've I... got nothing to squawk about anyway. I was doing my job. I doubt that. No one can do their best work with their eyes closed. You're a sort of squirt. You're... Don't you call me a squirt. Now, what's your order? A very simple one. Take that blindfold off and report to my office immediately. Come in, please. Yes, what is it? You wanted to see me. Oh, are uh, you, uh... Well, you're not... Number 122. Oh, uh, Well, you look quite different without the blindfold. In fact, you're, uh... Well, won't you sit down? I don't want to sit down. Well, why don't you go ahead and fire me? Now, let's not be hasty. As a matter of fact, you can't fire me. No, of course because not. Because I quit. Now, look, you, you mustn't do that, miss. You... The name is Peggy Evans. Well, that's a nice name. It isn't a name at all. It's just a label that works in a store. A machine on a track that rolls along and along and comes out nowhere. I hate my name. Now, 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 look, someday you'll get married and change your name. I won't it... get married. I won't ever get married. Why, of course you will. An attractive girl like I you. I will not. Well, then, you'll be Peggy Evans until you die, so I... Wait a minute. I'll be Peggy Evans until I die. Why, that's an idea. Well, what do you mean? I'm not going to be Peggy Evans until I die. I'm going to be Peggy Evans until she dies. Oh, now, look, no, look, you mustn't say things like that. Now, look here, Miss Evans. You take the rest of the day off, and tomorrow we'll have I nice... won't be here tomorrow. This is the end of number 122. Oh, but Miss Evans... And it's I... the end of Peggy Evans, too. No, now, look, wait a minute. Please, let me go. No, look, I can't let you go. Now you're hysterical. I you... am not. Let go. Miss Evans. <laughs> Yeah? Excuse me, I'm looking for Peggy Evans. Oh, yeah? Well, does she live here? Who wants to know? Well, I do. I got her address at the store, and I... Oh, the store, huh? Get in here. Listen, what is this? Hey, Joe, this guy's from the store. I don't say. Now, wait. Hey, what's going on? Who are you, gentlemen? Police department. Police? Has, has anything happened to Miss Evans? Mr. Anderson, huh? What's your name? I'm Robert Stewart. What's your business with Peggy Evans? Well, I... I'm Peggy Evans' boss. Her boss? He's the one who drove her to it. He's the one. And now I'll never be able to rent her room again. There ought to be a law against skunks like you. Will someone please tell me what this is all about? Read him the note, Joe. Let him know what he's done. Sure. This is to tell whoever cares not to bother looking for me. I'll be happier wherever I'm going. I can't go on being Peggy Evans any longer. Not after what happened at the store. I'd rather jump in the river. Mitzi can have my clothes. For the last time, Peggy. Oh, that's awful. You said it. Yeah. Now, now wait a minute. You got me all wrong. I didn't drive her to this. I... 
I only did my duty. I, I just told her to take off her blindfold. And now she's in the river. I hope you're satisfied, Brother Rat. New York. Oh, I always wanted to see New York. Well, here I am. And I'll never go back to Hotchkiss Falls. Never. Oh, but I wonder if I should have left that note. They probably think I committed suicide or something. Oh, well, it's the same thing. I'll never be Peggy Evans again, anyhow. Peggy Evans is as good as dead. So, now what? Hey, look at that sign on that beauty shop. Let graves give you a personality. That's it, a new personality. Well, go on in. Good morning, madame. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I need a new personality. Ah, but of course. <laughs> Can you do it? But of course. Well, all right. Now, how long and how much? Uh, let me see. A new hairdo, a new makeup, the right clothes, mm, uh, $4 and $150. Well, it's a deal. Oh, I can't believe it. Look at myself in that store window. Oh, that's me, all right. That's Peggy Evans. Oh, no, I forgot. It's not Peggy Evans anymore. That's finished. Well, let me see. Who shall it be? Deanne? Dion? Hmm. Well, what about Suzanne? Suzanne. Oh, that's nice. Eh? Suzanne Vanderbilt. Oh, no, that's too common. Well, I'll think of something. What's that sign that man is painting? Maybe that'll give me a cue. Daily Star classified as... Oh, no, that's no help. Watch that letter, miss. Watch it. Oh, there's paint up here. Hey! <laughs> She's unconscious. Pick her up. What happened? It ain't my fault. I was up on the ladder painting, and she got right underneath. She moved the ladder and... Bring that girl with a can of paint. I couldn't help it. Pick her up. Carry her in here. Quick. How is she, Doctor? Is she coming around? I think she'd be all right just as soon as she recovers from the shock. Look, Doc, that painter was working for the Daily Star. This puts the paper in a bad spot. Uh, will you be able to testify that she's not seriously injured? I think so. Uh, well, that ought to keep down the damages. Oh, where am I? You see, now you're in safe hands and you're going to be all right. Now, just relax. Oh, my head. Where am I? Uh, you're in my office, miss. I'm Philip Durston, the manager of the Daily Star. Oh, my head. Her head. Oh, Oh, my clothes. Look what's happened to my clothes. Now don't you worry. It's just paint. We'll buy you a whole new outfit. Oh. Hello, Baldwin. Get me a waiver of damages right away. Okay. Oh, my clothes. Now, please don't get excited. Just try and relax. Now then, uh, what's your name? Peg. No. No, it's... My name's Diane. I mean, it's Susie. It's... Oh, no, that's not either. I, I don't know it yet. Well, surely you can tell us your name. No, I can't. Leave me alone. I don't know. Dear, dear. Where do you live? I don't know. Oh, look at me. Look at my clothes. Mr. Durston, may I speak to you for a moment? Mm. Oh, oh, it's even on my head. What is it, Doc? This is much more serious than I thought. She's suffering from a temporary loss of memory. Why does everything have to happen to me? Here's that waiver of damages, boss. Forget it. She can't sign it. She can't remember her name. Holy smoke. Shall I phone the police? No, you imbecile. Do you think I want every other paper in town building up her case and spreading the story that I'm an assassin? Oh. It's on my hair, too. Oh. Now, don't whine. Uh, I mean, don't cry, my dear. We'll take care of everything. I think the only way to handle this is to notify the Bureau of Missing Persons. Why, she's only been missing ten minutes. Baldwin, look in her purse. I just did. There's nothing in it. No identification? Not a shred. Oh, well, I do. Well, I now, do. Now, now, see here, miss. <laughs> It's on my hair. Now, whatever your name is, now you stop worrying. We'll find out who you are. We'll put your picture in the paper, and whoever you belong to will come and claim you. <laughs> Won't that be nice? No. No, you don't understand. I don't belong to anybody. Oh, nonsense. A fine-looking girl like you? <laughs> yeah, just wait till you see the great, big, beautiful picture we're going to take of you. But I tell you, it's no use. Nobody will come. Nobody will know me. Oh, yes, they will. We'll take care of you until they do. You will? Why, of course we will. And we'll ask you to remember how nice we were. Baldwin, have Miss Kingsley take her out and get her spruced up for the picture. Yeah. Yes, have her use my private expense account. Yeah. Anything at all you want, miss, you just ask. Anything? Anything. 
Uh, we'll take care of you. <laughs> well, it's awfully nice of you, but uh, you may have to take care of me a long time. <laughs> and I mean a long time. New York Daily Star, girl victim of amnesia. Do you know the girl in the picture above? If you do, communicate at once with the Daily Star. Hotchkiss Falls Gazette, small change mart boycotted by public manager accused of driving clerk to suicide. Sit down, Mr. Stewart. Now look, Mr. Stewart. I suppose you've read the Morning Gazette. Mr. Snodgrass, As I... district supervisor of the Small Change Mart Incorporated, I have a very unpleasant duty to perform. Mr. Stewart, the public is boycotting this store. They claim you drove that girl to suicide. But I didn't. There is some indication in the newspaper that if we were to discharge you as manager, the people of Hotchkiss Falls would reconsider. Let me see that paper. Mr. Quill will take over your duties. Thank you, Mr. Snodgrass. Hey, wait a minute. This looks like her. Like who? Peggy Evans. Look. Look at this picture. Amnesia victim in New York. Nonsense. Peggy Evans committed suicide. I fear you're indulging in some wishful thinking, Mr. Stewart. I don't care what you fear. I'll never forget her face. It's been haunting me ever since. And I tell you, this is her. No, don't be irrational, Stuart. How could it be? Here. It explains it here. She's got amnesia. Well, I fail to see the connection. Well, suppose she did jump in the river. And suppose the shock made her lose her memory. Dear, dear, we are grasping at straws. Suppose she forgot she was going to commit suicide. Suppose she swam ashore and then forgot who she was. And suppose she just wandered down to New York. Suppose you collect your things and get out of this office. But she isn't dead. I know she isn't. Look, I'm going to find her and bring her back here and prove to all of you that I didn't drive her to suicide. Do you think I want to spend the rest of my life with that on my conscience? And what's more, I'm going to make her tell the truth and get my job back. If you can bring back the dead, Stuart, you can certainly get back your job. I'll hold you to that, sir. Dead or alive, I'll have her in this office inside of a week. In a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Lana Turner, Victor Mature, and Jean Lockhart in Act Two of Slightly Dangerous. Now for a mind-reading stunt. You're going to meet Miss Daisy McMazie on her way to work one bright morning. You'll hear what she says as she meets people. Right afterwards, you'll hear what she's thinking. First, she says hello to a girlfriend. Hi, Dot. Wonderful day. <laughs> Hi, Daisy. Hate to spoil the day, but you've got a run in your stocking. Say thanks a lot, Dot. Thanks for nothing. Always first with the bad news. And now, our scene shifts to the bus. Hello, Daisy. Say, you're looking... Never mind how I'm looking, Dick Bowen. And stop looking at my stocking run, you big drip. Soon, Daisy's in her office building, entering the elevator. Swell morning, Miss Daisy. Say, do you know... No, I don't know a thing today, Jack. But I know what you're grinning about. Wipe that grin off your face, off your face, off your face. And now, she's in her office. Good morning, Miss McMaisie. Please take some dictation, and uh, do you mind if I say... Not at all, Mr. Carlton. Do I mind? Bald-headed penguin, keep your eyes off that run. In just a minute, I'll pull off both your hairs. And back at her desk a few minutes later. Is that you, Daisy? It's Mother. I noticed that you went out the door. But... Oh! Poor Daisy. There's no doubt about it. Stocking runs can wreck a girl's peace of mind. Wreck her budget, too. But the remedy is easy. Just stick to Lux. It really does cut down on runs. That's been proved by a famous laboratory, the United States Testing Company, Incorporated. They found that luxing rayon stockings cut down runs over 50%, compared with using a strong soap or rubbing with cake soap. So don't take chances. Use Lux Flakes for your stockings every night. And by the way, be sure to dry rayons 24 to 48 hours. Remember, it's Lux for good luck with stockings. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner as Peggy and Victor Mature as Bob with Jean Lockhart as Burden. Peggy Evans, alias the girl who can't remember her name, is having a glorious time. Providing that no one recognizes her, she can go on living at the Daily Star's expense indefinitely. The possibilities are very exciting, thinks Peggy. What a break. Oh, I think after a while, though, I'd like to be recognized. Only not as Peggy Evans. Let's see, who would I like to be? A movie star? Oh, no, that's too tough. A long lost daughter to a nice old gentleman? A rich old gentleman? That's what I want to be, an heiress! 
This brainstorm sends Peggy scurrying to the public library. There in a newspaper of July 1927, she finds what she's looking for. Millionaire baby girl still missing. Police say no trace of Carol Burton lost in circus two years ago. Baba, child's nurse, abandons home. Millionaire baby. Hey! That could be me! Remember something? Uh, do you know who you are? Uh, well, not exactly, Mr. Durston, but I'm sure it'll help. Well, go on. What is it? Baba. Go on, go on. Baba. Oh, what's the matter? Did you forget it again? No, that's it. Baba. Ba, ba. What in blazes the sense of remembering Baba? It doesn't mean a thing. Oh, but it must mean something. I have a feeling it's terribly important. How could it be? Baba. Why, it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to you, Baldwin? Baba, black sheep, have you any wool? Shut up. Oh, wait, I. <laughs> I suddenly remembered something else besides Baba. Well? I see a circus. Holy Ike, a circus. Hold on a minute, boss. Hey, Hiller, what have you got in your files on Baba? Baba? That's right, B-A-B-A. Call me right back. Okay. I've got a feeling this may lead to something, boss. Circus, Baba. Don't you start doing that. Circus, Baba. Baba, circus. Baba. Baba, circus. Oh, for the love of shut up. It must mean something, boss. Baba. Circus? Yeah, Hiller? I've got three Babas. There's a Turkish mind reader who cut up his assistant with an axe. Claimed he read her mind. And now that's no good. What else? Then there's Baba the gorilla in the Bronx Zoo. Oh, fine. What's the third? There was a nurse called Baba who was in the Burden case, 1925. That's it. I thought I remembered it. The Burden case. Boss, the Burden case. Burden? The Burden case? Yeah, the nurse took the Burden kid to the circus and lost her. They never found the kid. That's it. Bring in that pile. Well, my dear, it was a lucky thing you remembered, Baba. <laughs> Is it important? Important, Baldwin. Tell him to hold the front page for a replay. We've got a real story. Paper clue to missing bird and every... Cornelius Burden, the great long-lost daughter, paper. Paper! What time did Burden's secretary say he'd be here? Any minute now. Good. Frankly, I'm as excited as a little boy. Reunited after 17 long years, the rich but lonely old man, the wandering waif with the golden curls. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I wonder what he'll say. Oh, why, he won't say a word. He'll look at her and hold out his arms, and his voice will break as the tears stream down his weather-beaten old cheeks. Yes? Mr. Cornelius Burton is here, sir. He's... Send him in! Send him in! Well, he's on his way in now, sir. Where is he? Which one of you muckraking buzzards is Durston? Come on, speak up. I am. I am. So, you're Durston, eh? Well, I'm Cornelius Burden, and this is my lawyer, Stanhope. Well, I'm glad Durston. to meet you. I broke Burnell of amalgamated copper. I turned Baron of the SLNV into a shaking old man. And by everything that's holy, I'll break you like a dry twig. Now, Durston, Durston. I'm going to put you in jail. Oh, come now, Mr. Burden. Don't try appealing to my mercy. I've got none. But, Mr. Burden, I don't think you understand. I understand. You've been part of a criminal conspiracy to defraud. Mr. Burden, all I've done is try to help you recover your daughter. My daughter. Stan Hope, tell him. All you've done, Mr. Durston, is to print a story without verification, without substantiating evidence, and without consulting my client. But I've got evidence. I've got proof. This girl has amnesia, and the only thing she remembers is Baba. Yes, Baba. Ba. What kind of proof do you call that? There must be 40,000 nurses in the country named Baba. But she remembers the circus, too. Yes, circus. Hmm. What do you think of that? Well, now, you've got me there. I forgot that my child was the only one in the world who'd ever seen a circus. If you've had the decency to consult Mr. Burden, he'd have told you he has a method of identifying his daughter. He has? You have? Certainly I have. My child's nurse, Baba. She still lives with me. She's interviewed hundreds of these, these phony girls in the last 15 years and exposed every one of them. And she'll expose this one, too. And when she does, I promise you I'll prosecute you to the full extent of the law. And then I'll find out who this girl really is. And I'll put her in the penitentiary, too. And under her real name. Well, come on. Let's get started. Wait. Uh, he's, he's not my father. Aha! Uh -huh. Heaven's sakes, Miss Burden. And don't call me Miss Burden. Uh, what makes you say he's not your father? Well, his, his face. What? What about my face? <laughs> well, if, if I'd ever seen a face like that before, I know I'd remember. It's, well, it's the kind of face you couldn't forget. Especially if you'd been exposed to it as a child. So you don't want to go home with Mr. Burden, is that it? I don't want to, and I'm not going to. Well, young lady, in my opinion, that constitutes an admission of guilt. 
Cornelius, shall I phone the district attorney? Certainly, by all means. Now, wait a minute. But, my dear, you can't do this to me. Unless you cooperate, Mr. Burden will have every right to think that you're concealing something, some uh, some guilty plan. In which you share, Mr. Durston. I do not. Don't you understand, Miss Burden? You've got to go with him. Well, all right. I'll go. But if I turn out to be his daughter, I'm, I'm going to run away from home. And I'll help you. Well, good luck, my dear. She'll need more than that, and so will you. Jimmy, come in here. Yeah, Mr. Boyden, you want me? What do you think I called you for? See that this girl doesn't try to get away. Okay, Mr. Boyden. Well, who's he? He's my bodyguard, but I'm lending him to you for the time being. Come on. Jimmy? Yeah, Mr. Boyden, you want me? What do you think I... Uh, bring that girl in here. Come on in, miss, come on. Here she is, Mr. Boyden. All right, now go downstairs and keep those reporters quiet. Okay, Mr. Boyden. Uh, come in here, young lady. Now, uh, you say you remember Baba, huh? Well, here she is. This is Baba. Uh, how do you do? Hello, child. Tell me, do you remember this room? Well, I... I don't remember anything. Ah, you see, Baba? Another fake. Hush. Listen, child. Carol Burden had a toy in this room which she loved more than any other. Always carried it around with her. Even slept with it at night. Which one is it? I don't know. Didn't he tell you? I I have amnesia. Amnesia or no amnesia, if you don't get the right toy, I'm going to hammer at you until you find out who you really are. But that's unreasonable. You bet it is. Hold your tongue, Master Cornelius. Look around you. Here are all the toys. Take your time. Well, this is the end, all right. What chance have I got of picking out the right toy? Why, the odds are about a hundred to one. Oh, I guess I might as well confess. Oh, wait. If I confess, I'll go to jail. Oh, I, I wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Think. Think. Whatever that toy is, Burton must have just taken it out of that little safe behind the picture. It's still open. Well, that means that it couldn't be any one of the big ones. Oh, well, that's something. But gosh, at least half of them are small enough to fit in a safe. Oh, I, I wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Well, well, which is it? Don't just stand there. Which toy is it? Well, I... Oh, you'll have to give me time. Oh, time, time. I'll go to jail if I don't get it right. Wait. Look at the toys in the window. They're all faded from standing in the sun. Well, that means it couldn't be there. It wouldn't get faded lying in a safe. Oh, the odds are going down. They're going down. Oh, but I still wish I were back in Hotchkiss Falls. Hey, what was it Baba said? She even slept with that toy at night. Well, if she slept with it, then it couldn't be that car, or the ten soldiers, or that merry-go-round. Well, they wouldn't let her take those to bed with her. She'd scratch herself. And it, it couldn't be that violin, or the Easter egg, or that doll's house. Why, they'd be all broken. Say something. Say something. Pick a toy. It seems to me you've had plenty of time. Oh, just one minute more, please. I, I seem to remember something. Well, go on. Remember it. These two dogs. It must be one of them. But which one? Which? That one or this one? Well, I gotta take a chance. A 50-50 chance is as good as any gambler could ask. And I've got to gamble. Well, come on, make up your mind. All right. I'll take that one. Will you please choose a toy? Which one? That one. What? That one. That one? Master Cornelius, that's it. Carol, oh, my baby, my darling, oh. Oh, Carol. Carol, how can you ever forgive oh, me? Oh, darling. Carol, my dear. Oh, what is it, darling? Tell Baba. Nothing. It, it, it's just so frightening to suddenly have a father you, you don't even know. Uh, listen, honey. I've always been afraid that if, that if I ever found you, why, you'd be such a stranger, you wouldn't want me or need me. But now... Now that you don't remember anything that's happened to you, why, you're just like a little child. You do need me. Oh, honey, I've done a lot more than find a little girl who, that used to be my Carol. I've really found my kid again. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, guys. Wait a minute. Hold everything. 
They stop hoiding, they're going to see no more reporters, so you might as well beat it. Go on, now, go on, beat it. Excuse me, limited. Outside, bud. Listen, I've got to see Carol Burden. I've got to see her right away. You hide me out. But look, it'll only take a minute. I've come all the way from Hotchkiss Falls. Out. But wait, Carol Burden Miss is... Miss Boyden can't be disturbed, see? She's suffering with ambrosia. Out! Listen, this is important. You want to get smacked, buddy? I demand to see Carol Burden. You want to get smacked? You don't dare touch so me. No, I don't dare. <clears throat> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> Carol Burden, beautiful heiress, to make first per public appearance tonight the Philharmonic Hall. Carol Burden. She's a fake. Enjoying yourself, dear? Oh, golly. I'm so excited and happy. Happy, are you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, for the first time in 17 years, I think I know what you really mean. <laughs> oh, you're an angel. Oh, gosh. If Missy could only see me now, wanting me to stay in Hotchkiss Ball the rest of my life, to wait for a guy called Johnny who'd make me laugh at nothing. <laughs> well, I got better things to laugh at than nothing. Oh, but I wish Mr. Burton hadn't turned out to be so nice. That's what makes me feel so bad. Hey, I've got to stop feeling like that. Why, I'm the luckiest soda jerk that ever lived. Intermission isn't over yet. Will, will you have another lemonade, Carol? Oh, no, thank you, Father. Well, then we might as well get back. All right. Hello, Peggy. Oh! How are you? Say, look, you know, I've been waiting for a chance to speak to you. Just a moment, young man. Oh, it's okay. She knows me. And I didn't kill her. What? Come on, Peggy, tell the truth. I didn't kill you, did I? Go away. The man's mad. Jimmy! Look, I haven't slept. I haven't eaten all on account of you, Miss Evans. Go away! Jimmy, here! Come on, look, look, come on. You're not Carol Burden any more than I am. Carol, do you know this person? Why, I... I haven't the faintest idea who he is. You're lying, Peggy. You know you are. Let me alone! Jimmy! Here I am, Mr. Boyden. What's cooking? I am. This man here... Oh, so it's you again, huh? Listen, you, if you think I that you... I know. I don't dare. Oh! Okay, Mr. Boyden. Come along, Carol. Oh, that's the poor man. Yeah, Jimmy will take care of him. Sure, sure, he's okay. Come on, dear. Well, I hope he'll be all right. Of course. Hey, hey, you okay, chum? Oh, sure, sure, you're fine. Hey, waiter, take care of this guy, will you? Yes, sir. Now. Up you go, sir. Oh. Now, just sit right there, sir. You'll be all right in a minute. Oh, she lied. She knows me. I could see it in her eyes. Well, don't brood about it, sir. There are lots more fish in the sea. She isn't drowned. She never was. Well, I didn't mean it like that, sir. She's a phony, that's what she is. She hasn't any more amnesia than I have. Well, are you sure you haven't got amnesia or, or something? How about a spot to eat, sir? No. A drink, sir? No. A nice, cool glass of lemonade. How about it, sir? Lemonade. That's what she was drinking. She ought to be mixing them instead of sitting here all dressed up with a glass of lemonade. Hey, wait. Have you changed your mind, sir? What do you have? I want that glass. A glass of what, sir? No, the glass. Her glass. There are fingerprints on glasses, aren't there? Well, not in the best places, sir. I... Look, get me her glass. I'm going to take these fingerprints one by one and wrap them around her lily-white throat. <laughs> Millionaire gives reception for long-lost daughter. Carol Burden to meet New York society. Hooey. <laughs> My dear, don't you think you should dance with all those young men? They're waiting. Oh, I have danced with them, Father, but I haven't found one as nice as you are. <laughs> one, one jump over that and split. Coming up. Oh, ah! you do remember. It's that madman. Come on, Peggy, tell the truth. Take him away. Jimmy! What's the trouble? Throw him out. Throw this man Wait out. Wait a minute, look. I'm not leaving this house without my wife. Your what? Yes, Mr. Burton, she's my wife. You're crazy. You know as well as I do that I'm not your... Carol, do you remember that you're not? Oh, no, Father, I, I don't. That's the hideous part about it. For all I know, it might be true. Of course it's true. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll take her home where she belongs. Just a minute, young man. Come with me, please. Go on, Mr. Stewart. Well, when I got home, she'd disappeared. I was desperate until I saw her picture in the paper. I left Hotchkiss Falls immediately. Well, 
that's the whole story. And now, dear, if you'll get your things, we'll be trotting along. Thanks, Mr. Burden, for taking such good care of her. Never mind that, young man, and take your hands off my daughter. What? She's my wife? I know. She's your wife. But if you don't mind, we'd like a little proof. Proof? Yes, proof. That's right. Let's see your proof. Oh, proof. Uh, Our marriage certificate. Here you are. Marriage certificate? Sad, isn't it? All her beautiful memories gone. She doesn't even remember our marriage certificate. Why, she was so excited when she signed it, she poked her finger in the inkwell instead of the pen. There, her fingerprints. Well, Peggy, now, doesn't this bring it all back to you? No, it doesn't. And I don't believe I ever saw it before. You claim that this is her fingerprint? Yes, I told you. She stuck her fingers... Well, in that case, we'll just settle this matter immediately. Carol, put some ink on your finger, dear. We'll compare your fingerprint with the one on the certificate. Oh, well, that's a wonderful idea. Oh, I never thought about that. No, I bet you didn't. Now, place your hand here on the paper, dear. Her right forefinger, I presume. That's right, I think. (laughs) Sure, I wasn't left-handed when I was married to you. Mm, Quite sure. Ah, there we are. Now, we'll see. If these... Oh. Well, Father, what is it? Why, why, this is awful. These prints are identical. What? Lucky thing for me, that fingerprint... You folks were sure hard to convince. Why, this doesn't seem fair. I've, I've only had one daughter, and now I've lost her twice. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Burden, but it had to come out sooner or later that Peggy Evans wasn't your daughter. What do you mean she isn't my daughter? Of course she is. This thing proves she married you, but it doesn't prove she's not my daughter. But she's Peggy Evans. This girl is my daughter, whatever her name was. I couldn't be mistaken about that. But, but how did she get the name Peggy Evans? That's the question. I, I don't know. Well, the people that brought her up would know. Where are they? Well, I don't know exactly. Oh, how could he know? This whole thing's a fake, a frame-up. It must be. Now, now, darling, look, don't get excited. You know what it does to you. She breaks out in her rash all over. Oh, get away from me. You mean to say that you don't know anything about your wife's background? Well, uh, you see, she had amnesia when I met her. What's more, it kept happening on and off. Why, once I came home late at night, I, I, I kissed her, and she gave me a friendly smile and then said, Who are you? Oh, you... It was the, uh... It was the... It was the friendly smile that burned me up. Oh, how can you? Mr. Stewart, what was the name of this town where you met Carol? Hotchkiss Falls. And that's where we're going right now. Come, lamb chop. Leave me alone. Come along. I'm going with you. What? What for? Oh, Father, you... Why, don't you realize what all this means? At last, we found a clue to your past. We can go back to Hotchkiss Falls and trace everything that's happened since the day I lost you. Oh, no. Why, of course we can. We can find all the people that knew you. I want to find out all about your past so I can protect your future. Wait, I... Uh, Mr. Stewart, I want to speak to my father alone. I'll bet you do. <laughs> Will you wait outside, please? All right. Do hurry, though, dear. You know we have a long ride ahead of us. Father, that man isn't my husband. Call a woman's intuition if you want, but somehow I know. Yes, but what about the marriage certificate and the fingerprints here? Oh, I don't know. All I know is that he's lying. Hmm. Well, in that case, I'll phone the police. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, let's not do that. I, um, I have a better plan. I'll go to Hotchkiss Falls with Mr. Stewart, but you mustn't come along. But, my dear, uh, you... Just the two of us. Then I can find out what this is all about. But do you think I'm insane? Let you go away alone with a man you feel is not your husband? Oh, but don't you see, if, if I'm alone with him, why, I can find out everything. I can trap him because he, well, he won't be suspecting anything. But it would be different if you were along, because he'd be on his guard. If I were to let you go and something happened to you... Oh, nothing will happen. I promise you. Well, well, don't forget one thing. If he bothers you in any way, you phone me immediately. I'll... I'll sleep with my clothes on. All right, Father. And... and be careful, Carol. Please. I will. Good night, dear. Good night. Oh, and... and Father... Yes, dear? I love you very much. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille brings back Lana Turner, Victor Mature, and Jean Lockhart in Act Three of Slightly Dangerous. Meantime, there seems to be, shall we say, a slight vocal explosion going on in a house around the corner. 
Mary, what the blazes? Doggone Mary! Bill, darling, what is it? Mary, what did you do to my blue sweater? Why, I washed it. But it came out beautifully. Beautifully? Holy jumping catfish, look at it. What kind of a midget do you think I am to get into a pint-sized thing like that? Oh, Bill, that's not your sweater. That belongs to little Billy. Remember, I made him one just like his daddy's. Here's yours, the same size as ever, thanks to Lux. Plenty big enough even for a brute like you. Oh. Gee. Thanks. Well, Daddy's ego, his faith in himself, may be slightly shrunken, but not his favorite sweater. Not with gentle Lux care. You can't blame him for getting excited, though, because it's a real tragedy nowadays when woolens are washed the wrong way so they shrink. Strong soaps and cake soap rubbing do that, you know. But you don't have to worry about woolens when you use Lux Flakes. They're safe care for sweaters, blankets, all your washable woolens. Lux Care is thrifty care, too. You get so many suds from just a few flakes. Why, one big box of Lux will do 29 sweaters. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. Besides being fine performers, our stars are a pin-up girl and a coast guardsman. We'll have a chat with them after the play. Now the curtain rises on the third act of Slightly Dangerous, starring Lana Turner and Victor Mature, with Jean Lockhart as Burton. Bob and Peggy are on their way to Hotchkiss Falls. There, Bob plans to exhibit her to the manager of the small change mart and clear himself. But Peggy Evans has a different idea. Well, I'd better play along with him a while. Oh, but not in Hotchkiss Falls. When we stop for something to eat, I'll pull some wires out of the car or something. I've just got to. Now they've stopped at a roadside restaurant where they're just finishing dinner. You don't have to look so scared, do you? Oh, I'm sorry. It's just that it's all so embarrassing. Suppose you didn't remember me at all and suddenly you find you were married to me. Wouldn't you be scared? I think you know pretty well there's nothing to be scared about. I don't believe you. I think you're scared right now. Me? Well, you haven't even kissed me yet. Kissed you? Kissed me. Well, uh, do you want me to? <laughs> well, isn't it customary among husbands and wives? Not at all. Well, it might help us to get better acquainted. Yes, it ought to do that. Well, then. Okay. My, it uh, does sort of mm, scare you, doesn't it? Well. <laughs> well, I feel better acquainted now, do you? No, I, I just feel better. <laughs> Tell me about us, Bob. Were we very happy? Well, yeah, I, I think we must have been. Bob, was I a good wife? Oh, ideal. What is your ideal? Well... She has to think I'm smarter than anybody else in the world and stronger and better looking. And she has to love to dance with me. What else? Well, she has to be happy with what we've got instead of discontented with what we haven't got. <laughs> and what do you do in return for all that? Nothing. That's what makes it so ideal. <laughs> well, I, I can't imagine any girl living up to that ideal. Oh, she could if she loved me. Well, I, I guess I have a lot to learn about love. Mm, it's possible. <laughs> But you're going to teach me, aren't you? Everything I know is at your disposal. Well, where do we begin? Well, first we dance. Now get this one. This is a half rumba and half my own. Oh, it's wonderful. What do you call it? The Hotch Kiss Falls Limp. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> well, look at me, I... I'm laughing at nothing. You don't uh, feel dizzy, do you? Hey, Johnny. No, Bob. Johnny. Look, I'm not Johnny. <laughs> no, I, I guess not. It, it isn't reasonable. It certainly isn't. Come on, we'd better get started. Well, what's the matter, Bob? I don't know. Something... To... I know I've got plenty of gas. Evening, folks. Having a little trouble? Yes. Is there any place around where I can get this thing fixed? Well, there's an all-night garage. There is? Yep, but it closes at 9 o'clock. <laughs> well, well, we'll have to sleep right here, I guess. Oh, I, I don't think that'll be very comfortable. <laughs> sure it won't. I got just one room left at the motel. Motel? What motel? 
Right over there. I run that, too. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, wait, we, we couldn't stop there. Well, why not, Dolly? We'll be ever so much more cozy than in the car. But, but we can't do that. Well, of course we can, dear. I'm sure it won't be expensive. You see, mister, it's sort of our wedding night. Now, ain't that something? Uh-huh. Mm. Now, I'll take care of your baggage. Oh, thank you. Come on, Bobby, it's late. No, wait, listen, look, I, I, I haven't got any money here. I lost my wallet. Oh, Bob. Now, ain't that a crying shame? Yeah, it's certainly tough. Well, good night. We'll stay right here. Oh, no, you won't. I wouldn't have it on a conscience. Uh, you can have the room for nothing. Oh, you're a darling. <laughs> Nice of him, wasn't it? Giving us this room. Yeah, but look, I, I know. Well, I think I'll get into something comfortable. Peggy. Yes. Uh, do you know how to play cribbage? Oh no, I don't. But you must teach me sometime. Look, uh, don't you think this has gone far enough? Far enough for what? Well, I mean, under the circumstances, maybe I'd better go. I, I'll tell you what. I'll take another room. Oh, but there are no other rooms. Oh, don't be nervous, dear. Look, you. You've got to answer me one question. Maybe there's been a mistake here. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've got to know. Well? That night at the concert, when I called you, Peggy, you were frightened to death, weren't you? Answer me. Well, yes. Why? Well, you... You sneaked up behind me and shouted in my ear. You would have been frightened, too. But you recognize me. Now, don't deny it. You, you knew me when you saw me. Well, I had seen you before. Ah, uh, not now, so you admit it. Well, certainly. It was that day of Father's when you were with the reporters and... Jimmy punched you. I saw you from the hall. You... You don't remember me from Hotchkiss Falls? No. Oh, but what's the difference? Now get some sleep, darling. We want to get an early start. Oh, I, I've made a terrible mistake. Listen, I'm not your husband. Oh, but I don't understand. That's all there is to it. I'm I'm not your husband at all. Oh, but you must be that... that marriage certificate. Well, that was a forgery. A fake. I, I thought you were a fake, too. I had your fingerprints taken off of a glass that you used and... Oh... Look, it's all right. Now, uh, don't worry, please. I I'll take you home to your father in the morning. Now, I'm, I'm going out to the car. Good night. Good night. Oh, just one more thing. You're Carol Burden, all right. You're not Peggy Evans. How do you know? Because Peggy Evans was a whining little coward, afraid to face life. She was hysterical and selfish. And you're the finest, the bravest girl that ever was. You were willing to accept me, a complete stranger, as your husband. You left your home and your father to come with me because... Well, you thought it was right. You're the most wonderful girl I ever knew. That's all. Good night. Good morning. Oh, hello. <laughs> did, did I wake you? No, I wasn't asleep. Just thinking with my eyes closed. What time is it? Six thirty. Well, what woke you up so early? Oh, I, I haven't been sleeping either. I was thinking with my eyes open. Bob, I... I feel that... Well, if you'll feel better when your father gets here. My father? Yeah, well, you... Why should he come here? Well, you see, I phoned your house after I left you last night. I thought you'd want to get rid of me as soon as possible. He ought to be here any minute. Oh. Now, please, look, don't do that. I, I know I've done a terrible thing to you, but I, I can't stand seeing you cry. That's not why I'm crying. No? No. I'm... I'm crying because I'm never going to see you again. You... You want to keep on seeing me after what I've done? Yes, I do. Why? Because, because I'm crazy about you. What? You can't be. That, that's impossible. It is not. It isn't? No. Gosh, that's, that's what I've been thinking about all night. Thinking how it could never happen. Thinking what a fool I, I was to even think about it. But now you... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't touch me. I'm sorry. I guess I must be hearing things. I, I thought you said... I thought you said you were crazy about me. I did say it. Well, I'm right. You did say it. Oh, but, but there's something else I've got to say, too. Something that'll spoil everything. But, well, I am Peggy Evans. What? Yes, I... Oh, I couldn't go on cheating you. I know what you'll think of me, that I'm a whining little coward, afraid to face life. But I had to tell you all the same. Okay. So long, Peggy. Oh, Bob. No, go away. No, I won't. Not until you've heard what I have to say. Bob, I'm not asking you to even like me again. I just want you to know that I'm not what you think. I didn't mean to make you lose your job. And I didn't mean to steal anything from Mr. Burden, honestly. I was just lonesome. 
And I didn't have enough sense to wait until you came along. But how could I have known that you were... Well, you were what I was lonesome for. You know, every instinct I've got tells me how to beat you over the head. Every instinct but one. I couldn't hate you, darling, unless you turn out to be a female impersonator. And I'll bet you my bottom dollar you're not. Oh, Carol, Peggy, whatever your name is, darling. Yes, Bob. Look, don't be unhappy, dear. I, I forgive you. Of course you forgive me. If you love someone, what else can you do? Bob, you are going to wait for me, aren't you? Why? Where are you going? To jail. To jail? I... Well, that's silly. Oh, but you don't know Mr. Burden. He's sweet, but he has a terrible temper, and when I tell him the truth, well, he won't rest until... There she is. Oh, Bob, he's here. Carol. Now, Cornelius, don't get excited. Listen, don't say a word. Don't tell him a thing. Carol. Oh, baby, are you all right? Uh, why, yes, I, I'm fine, Baba, but... Shut I... up. I, I mean, shut up, dear. You, you see, she hasn't been feeling very well. Perhaps if you came back later tomorrow or something. Oh, don't listen to him. I'm all right. I want to tell you that... Look, now, she had a spell or something, and it isn't serious. Nothing to worry about. Carol, what's he done to you? Uh, well, nothing, really. He's, he's just saying that because he loves me and I love him, he, he's trying to protect me. No, she's trying to protect me. I, I forged that marriage certificate. I, I even had a rubber stamp made of her fingerprints and faked that, too. I'm not her husband at all. You fiend. Why did you do it? Well, I thought she was somebody else, a girl I used to know, Peggy Evans. She's dead. It's no use, Bob. You can't stop me. Whatever she says is a lie. Go on, Carol. Well, I... I know you won't forgive me, Mr. Burden. And I'd rather die than hurt you like this. You're an angel, and I'd, I'd give anything in the world if you were my father. But you're not. I, I'm not Carol. I never was. I'm... Peggy Evans. Oh, don't be silly. Baby. Oh, please, please, both of you. I'm telling the truth. Bob, tell him that I am Peggy Evans. Why should I? I don't believe you are. And neither do I. But... I guess I ought to know my own daughter. Well, well, we're going to Hot Kiss Falls. No, my dear. We're going home. I'll get your things. I'll help you, Mr. Burden. Oh, but I, I can't go on lying the rest of my life. I can't go on cheating. Oh, stop that sniveling, Peggy Evans. Peggy Evans? Well, then you do believe me, Bob. Of course I do. Oh, well, then you'll tell Mr. Burden. I'll tell him nothing. Besides, he knows it anyway. But he's not my father. In the... What do you mean, he knows it anyway? He found out last night. He called Hodgkiss Falls. Well, then why didn't he just say so? For two reasons. It would kill him to admit that he'd been fooled. And it would kill him to give you up. You mean he wants me to go on being his daughter? If you'd a lick of sense, you'd see that. But how can he want me? I don't belong to him. Stop your nonsense. You've made him happier than he's been for 17 years. Now, come on. Show him what you're made of. All right, let's go. Here's your grip, Miss Burden. Come on, come on. Do, do you really want me to go home with you? Of course I do. That is, if if you want to come, do you? Well, I, I'd like to see anybody try to stop me. Hey, what about me? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, what about him? Oh, well, I love him. Well, uh, that's a fine how do you do. Oh, but I can't help it. Well, I've got a daughter. I, I might as well saddle myself with a son-in-law. Me? Certainly you. Well, I... We... Now, I'm in a hurry. I'll give you 30 seconds to make up your mind. Well, it's made up now. Oh, Carol. Oh, Johnny. The name is Bob Carol. The name is Peggy Johnny. You know, maybe we'd better just call each other Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> maybe talking at all is just a waste of time. <laughs> Before our stars return to a curtain call, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, who went to a Navy wedding the other day. And here's something that really happened. The bride was cutting the wedding cake with the groom's sword when the photographer said... I'd like to get one more picture of that, only you'd better wash the cake off that sword. So the groom handed the sword to the bride with a flourish and said... Okay, honey. You're the dishwashing department from now on. <laughs> well, he was very cute about it and very proud of his new bride. And I felt as though I ought to produce a box of Lux and hand it over then and there so she'd start her dishwashing career off right. She looks smart enough to know about Lux anyway, though. She won't let the wrong kind of soap ruin those pretty hands of hers. That's a good point, Libby. It's not the dishwashing you do. It's strong wash day soaps that give your dishpan hands. With gentle Lux flakes, your hands stay soft and lovely. In fact, even if you've let your hands get that ugly dishpan look, when you change to Lux, they'll soon be soft and smooth again. That's been proved by many, many women in a whole series of tests. And 
it's a very easy thing to prove for yourself. So put Lux Flakes on your shopping list for tomorrow. If your dealer is out of it right now, he'll have more soon. Then use Lux for dishes every day and see for yourself how kind it is to hands. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Well, we'll certainly take anything else on the slightly dangerous side that Lana Turner and Chief Boson's mate, Victor Mature, have to offer. If I were a sailor, I'd be calling Vic Chief. Well, in fact, I will anyway. Welcome back, Chief. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here again. Sounds like a pretty exciting job you have now, Vic. Well, plenty of other guys are in the same business. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you've been doing? Well, I've been on North Atlantic convoy duty for about 11 months. Tell me, Vic, is it true that a sailor has a girl in every port? No, sir. Well, why not? Well, uh, you don't stay in port long enough. <laughs> By the way, you know, we have girls in the Coast Guard now, too. They're called spars, and we need plenty more of them. It's a swell chance for girls between 20 and 36 to serve their country. <laughs> well, the spars are doing a fine job, Vic. I'd be very glad you could spend part of your leave with us. And day after tomorrow, the entire nation will show the men of the Navy we're behind you by celebrating Navy Day. Well, we're very proud of the service, sir, and I hope to make the folks at home proud of us. Now, you've done that already, Vic. Lana, I believe this is the first time you've been here since your baby was born. It's a bit hard to realize that one of America's leading pinup girls is now a mother. Well, I have a little pinup girl of my own now. <laughs> Has to be pinned up all the time. <laughs> uh, from what I hear, your, your picture is being pinned up more than ever. When do you go back to work in pictures, Lana? Well, I'm getting ready now, Vic. Irene, the designer at the studio, is making the clothes for my new picture now. I guess that's pretty tough work for a woman, getting a lot of new clothes. Oh, well, we can stand it now and then. <laughs> well, congratulations on the baby, Lana. And if she's as lovely as her mother, let me make her first screen test. I'll remember that. Now, what's your play next week, Mr. DeMille? Now, one of the big successes of the current screen, Lana. It's the Paramount hit, So Proudly We Hail. And the stars are Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, and Sonny Tufts. <laughs> As the same stars you saw in the picture, one of the finest casts we've ever had, and the players in keeping with the cast, an heroic story of Bataan, with Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, and Veronica Lake as the army nurses of So Proudly We Hail. I think you can hail that one very proudly, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, Veronica Lake, and Sonny Tufts in So Proudly We Hail. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. The appearance of naval personnel on this program does not constitute an endorsement of the product advertised, since the Navy Department does not endorse any product. Ladies and gentlemen, every American kitchen can be one of the arsenals of democracy. Don't let munitions go to waste in your kitchen. Every spoonful of fats you have left over can be made into glycerin used in high explosives. Save all your meat drippings, bacon grease, and every bit of waste fats, and take them to your meat dealer often. Save fats and save American lives. Heard in tonight's play were Leo Cleary as Durston, Verna Felton as Baba, Eddie Marr as Jimmy, Florence Haloff as Mitzi, and Roland Drew, Walter Sonderling, Robert Harris, Ed Emerson, Mason Moltzner, Griff Barnett, Fred Mackay, Charles Seal, Norman Field, and Truda Marson. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Claudette Colbert, Paulette Goddard, and Veronica Lake in So Proudly We Hail. With Sonny Tuff.